Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Miss Agnes Moorhead in tonight's presentation of... Suspense. Tonight, Autolite salutes the American Automobile Association and its traffic safety program as we present a dramatic report called The Empty Chair. Our star, the First Lady of Suspense, Miss Agnes Moorhead. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for the worldwide Autolite family. Since 1922, the American Automobile Association, with the cooperation of 276 affiliated clubs, has been active in helping schools develop educational programs designed to protect children on their way to and from school and to make them careful drivers upon graduation. Traffic safety is, as you know, everyone's business. So our story tonight will dramatize how we all can help ourselves and our children by driving carefully and by cooperating with traffic safety instructions. Later in the program, we will hear from Mr. Royce G. Martin, chairman of the board and president of the Electric Autolite Company, and Mr. Ralph Thomas, president of the American Automobile Association. And now, Autolite presents transcribed The Empty Chair, starring Miss Agnes Moorhead, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. Now, are we all settled down? That's good. (laughs) Miss Barbara Warner. You may call me Miss Barbara or Miss Warner, either one, which gives you young ladies and gentlemen at least two choices when you wish to attract my attention so that there'll be no need to yell out, Hey, teacher! (laughs) Besides, 10B3. 10B3 and your homeroom, high school at last. And today's the first day. Young ladies and gentlemen, truly, and today's the day it really starts. So now let's get to know each other, shall we? All of you will get up and go to the back of the room, please. I have your study cards here, and I've arranged them alphabetically. We'll start with the first row and the first seat, and as I call your names, you'll be seated. Sidney Aronson, Mary Avanti, uh, right in back of Sidney. Yes, that's right. David Coop, uh, uh, George Darley, uh, just a minute, George. Leave an empty seat. Jessica Bromley, and then skip one, and then you, George. An empty seat for David Cooper. For now. (laughs) How'd you like that, Miss Warner? Bobby. What? Uh, Nothing. I, I didn't say anything. Don't worry about a thing, Miss Warner. Home. And how'd you like your ride? Well, I'm glad it's over. And I was just getting a compliment ready for you. Oh, you were? I've never had a teacher in my car before. Mm -hmm. And? I wanted to see how one of them would react to going 65 miles an hour. Nearly 70, Bobby. And in a residential section, too. Just for the last six blocks, Miss Warner. I was going to say how I was surprised you didn't scream at me or get hysterical. (laughs) I was going to say I'm glad, since you're that kind of person, I'm glad you're going to board with my mother and me. Now you're sorry about the whole thing. Oh, no, no, I didn't mean that. I'm a good driver, Miss Warner. Yes, I'm sure you are. And this is a good car. Yes, it's it's beautiful. You mean it? Yes, of course I do, Bobby. But what about school, the traffic classes, and the sessions on safety? What about them? Well, didn't they impress you? Most of the boys and girls learned to drive through school classes, didn't you? Yes, ma'am. And reaction times, you were taught about those, and how no one's reaction time is really fast enough to cope with an emergency at high speed. You drive as if you'd forgot all about that as soon as you walked out of class. And you sound oh, like Bobby, a... Bobby! Miss Warner! Oh, that's my mother. Well, what are you two out here for? Come on in. I've got tea made. Oh, I'm so glad you're here, Miss Warner. I, I wasn't sure when you'd arrive. Mrs. Morrison, mother of Bobby, a woman in her 40s, perhaps, or younger, 
in a plain cotton house dress that hung loosely about her and her hands were almost delicate and quite thin and worn. And her fingers quickly, nervously pushed strands of graying hair tied against her temples and on her face the trace, and not yet deep, of lines of strain. Now, don't let Miss Warner carry your bag herself, Bobby. You take it. Now, take it to her room. Bobby. And then her touch on my arm and Mrs. Morrison led me into her house, into her home, and showed me the living room, neat, sparingly furnished, and said that I was welcome to use it any evening for my guests if I just let her know beforehand. She would arrange to go to a movie or call on a neighbor. Just let her know beforehand. And the kitchen and where she kept the toaster and the coffee canister and the sugar and the other things I'd need for breakfast or a snack whenever I pleased. She didn't mind a bit. And then my room. I, uh, I had Bobby fix up the little radio on your bed table. I, I thought it might be nice. A pleasant room. A summer blanket neatly folded at the foot of the bed. A window open to a small, wire-fenced vegetable garden. A desk, a chair, a pleasant room. Unpack now and change and lie down and rest. Listen to the radio. And doze. Lay off me, Ma. Leave me alone. Just lay off me, do you hear? And waken then to summer evening and to something more harsh. I'm fed up, Ma. Fed up. Do I reach your mind? Is it getting through to you? No, listen to me, Bobby. I've had it listening to you, Ma. Bobby, she'll hear you. Miss Warner will... Let hear her hear! You hear me, Miss Warner? You listening real good? Hey, Warner, wake up! Hit the deck! Wake up and get an earful! All right. We'll do that, Bobby. We'll let Miss Warner listen so you won't have to yell at her. Miss Warner? Miss Warner? Yes? Would you come out, please? I want you to... Would you please? Yes, Mrs. Martin. Good evening, Bobby. You flip or something, Ma? My son was yelling and screaming at his mother and then at you. And he said he didn't care if you heard. Go on, Bobby. Tell me and tell Miss Warner how fed up you are with your mother. I told you and told you, Ma, just lay off me. You've had experience, haven't you, Miss Warner? With boys like Bobby and, and the others he runs around with? They must confide in you and, and tell you their things that, that they won't tell their mothers. That their mothers can't possibly understand or know or share. You're younger and more experienced. And they must... Bobby? You're getting it blow by blow, Miss Warner. You stick with Ma and me, and you'll get it every night on the night. Where are you going tonight, Bobby? Who'll you be with tonight, Bobby? Where'll I find you if I need you, Bobby? If you need me, Bobby? <laughs> Look, I'm 17. And there's a joint that's got a jukebox in it. And girls with pockets full of dimes. And me, I got a car. I got a car, hot, real hot. Are you and the high school teacher here, Ma, you, you put your heads together. And maybe it'll come out mathematical where your baby boy is nights. Oh, I... I'm... I'm sorry, Miss Warner. Forgive us, please. Oh, don't mention it. He's... No, I... I want to tell you about my boy. He... He's had no father since he was eight. When he was 13, Bobby got some work around the garage after school. It helped. It, it helped out a lot. And I was glad to see it. He loved working around motors. And, well, you saw that car he built. A, a boy 17 to have built such a car. Mrs. Morrison. Yes? Has Bobby ever told you about Mr. Douglas? Uh, I don't think so. He's a teacher at our school, a manual arts teacher. Uh, no. He no. takes special interest in boys like Bobby. He's also our driver education teacher, we call him. He works with the boys and girls, and the local automobile club helps him. Sometimes I... I, I just think my, my son is wild, that's all. Well, that's just what I'm telling you. Mr. Douglas teaches safety and sanity in driving. He tries to tell the young Mrs. people... Mrs. Morrison! Hey, Mrs. Morrison! Oh, oh, hello, David. Come in. Oh, David, uh, this is Miss Warner. She teaches at the high school where you're going to go this year. Uh, Miss Warner, this is David Cooper, a neighbor boy. Hi, Miss Warner. Hello, David. I'm glad to know you. Me too. Where's Bobby, Mrs. Morrison? 
He's not here, David. Oh, out in the garage, huh? Working on that super neat job of his, I'll bet. I, I don't think so. Well, where'd he go, Mrs. Morrison? I don't know. He promised me. He promised me for sure this time. Promised you what, David? Well, he said next time he was in a race, I could ride with him. And I know there's one tonight. And he welshes out on me. But, well, he's the best, Mrs. Morrison. Real absolute best. Well, he's got all those other how guys... How old are you, David? Huh? I ask how old you were. Thirteen. What's that got to do with it? Bobby promised me. He said I was old enough now for him to break me in. Well, good night, Mrs. Morrison. Miss Warner. David's our neighbor boy. Not many years ago, I, I used to babysit for his mother. Read to him, he and Bobby. Could I, I fix you something to eat, Miss Warner? And here, this picture was taken at Lake Louise, too. You can hardly tell I'm the one in the middle, can you? The way Miss Reba and I dressed up there. Oh, it must have been very expensive. Oh, and restful. I got a lot of reading done, and I've been promising myself to get... Oh, sit still, Mrs. Morrison. I'll get it. Good evening. Good evening. Does this young man belong here? Yes, he does, officer. Uh, please come in. Oh, who is it? Now, don't get excited, Mom. Oh. I said don't get excited. Are you Mrs. Morrison? Oh, yes. Yes. I'm Officer Cleaver. The only reason your son isn't in juvenile court right now is because, as far as I know, it's the first time he's pulled a trick like he did tonight. Well, what are you talking about? In his car. Him and another one, speeding down Presbury Street. Your son headed north and the other one south, headed toward each other. Front wheels on the white dividing line to see who'd give way. Going over 70 miles an hour. Oh, Bobby. Who the other kid was, I don't know, ma'am. I can only catch one of them. Him. Autolite is bringing you Miss Agnes Moorhead in... The Empty Chair, tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. We'll continue with Suspense in a moment. Now, here is Mr. Royce G. Martin, chairman of the board and president of the Electric Autolite Company, to introduce a special guest. Tonight... The worldwide Autolite family is privileged to salute the American Automobile Association and its traffic safety program. To tell us how this practical safety program is helping to reduce traffic accidents by teaching future drivers how to be careful drivers, here is the president of the American Automobile Association, Mr. Ralph Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Martin. We of the American Automobile Association are grateful for the interest shown in our work by the Autolite family, as evidenced by this program tonight. The problem presented in this dramatization is, unfortunately, a very real one and a very common one. However, cooperating with school and community authorities, we are engaged in stimulating and aiding an active educational program to teach our young drivers and pedestrians safety first. This year alone, 3A materials and services are being widely used in grammar and high school class instruction. Indeed, will help over 12 million students. This, of course, is important to all of us. If you have a son or a daughter in school, ask about this program and set a good example yourself by practicing safety behind the wheel. If you are a student, take an active part in class, and when you are behind the wheel, be the best amongst the young drivers. Be a sportsman-like driver. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. And as an eight-year-old boy said when he was asked what safety meant, safety is thinking not to get hurt or to her, there's a definition we should all remember. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage 
Miss Agnes Moorhead in Elliot Lewis's production of The Empty Chair, a dramatic report well calculated to keep you in suspense. Friday night in a quiet room and a window that opens onto the silences of a town already asleep. Friday night and an end of summer. Last weekend before school's opening and the last book you've promised yourself to read before summer's closed. And read now to the undercurrent of voices from another oh, room right, in Mrs. Mom, Morrison's home. Right. Well, it's not that, son. It's me. I want to do my best. I try to do my best. Now, if you'd only... The night stillness. And Mrs. Morrison searched through it for the words to speak to her 17-year-old son. Saturday morning, and Mrs. Morrison has made breakfast and over coffee. Will you try and do something about my boy, Miss Warner? Maybe you could do something. Please. And dress then and go to the school. Try to save a boy. Doors open. Come on in. Oh, hello, Miss Warner. I don't want to interrupt, Mr. Douglas. I, I just... No, you're not. I'm just getting everything ready for when school opens Monday. <laughs> what are you doing here today? Anxious to get back in harness? I don't know. I, I think so. Mr. Douglas. Yes? Do you know a boy named Bobby Morrison? Oh, yes. What about Bobby? I'm boarding with him and his mother. I, I wanted I, uh, to... I, I heard the police picked him up racing last night. Yes. Some of the boys came in and told me about it. I was sorry to hear. His mother is very troubled. She asked me to help. Mm -hmm. Bobby's very bright. A real bright, intelligent boy. And not sensitive. You were going to say something else, Mr. Douglas, about Bobby. He's a boy without a father. When he was eight. Bobby's a boy who's looking for something. And he finds it in speed. And in danger, in ways that could kill him. We try, Miss Warner. We try real hard. We cooperate with the auto clubs. Uh, you know about the classes I give in driver instructions. Mr. Douglas... And I tell the kids, you kids drive like that, I say one out of a thousand of you'll be a corpse before the year's out. One out of 45 hurt, crippled. We tell them why traffic laws are made. For the protection and survival of the community. By actual demonstration, we show them what a tremendous force they're handling when they're behind the wheel of an automobile. We go out and demonstrate the different conditions, the distances it takes to stop a car on a dry and slippery pavements from different speeds. Well, together, we study accident reports and actual photographs of what happens when you're arrogant or careless with a car. Smashed cars from head-on collisions. Smashed people. We give them visual and muscular coordination tests so that they'll understand what speed and hundreds of horsepower can do to them and how to face emergencies behind the wheel. We try to make sportsmen-like drivers out of them. Uh, Miss Warner. Yes? Boys like Bobby, uh, whatever their reasons, they won't listen. N nights they gather and go out to the hub in their souped-up cars, and they dance to the jukebox, and they won't listen. The hub? A place out on State Highway 52, south side of the bridge. Used to be a kind of general store. A fountain and hamburgers. The kids picked it up, had Charlie Phillips, the owner, put in a jukebox and a big neon sign. They gather their nights for races, for... Will you take me there, Mr. Douglas? What? I want to see for myself. Tonight, around nine. I'm at Mrs. Morrison's on Benton, 853. Will you call for me? Why, of course. Thank you. And later, when I got back to the house, Mrs. Morrison said Bobby hadn't been home all day. But it wasn't unusual, she said. He'd show up for dinner. But he didn't. And Mrs. Morrison picked at her food and got up from the table too often and walked around and made excuses which could cover Bobby's not being there. A double feature Bobby had to see twice. A friend had him to dinner and Bobby forgot to call. The ordinary excuses we all make to hold back the truth for a while. And after dinner, dishes and her trying to chat brightly, but somehow sentences trailing off and not being finished. And glances through the window onto the night street and the head cocked to the sound of every passing automobile. 
And when the doorbell rang, a mother hurrying for news of her son. Oh. And the disappointment. Please come in, Mr. Douglas. Thank you. Oh, Miss Warner. Uh, Mr. Douglas is here. And the ride down State Highway 52, south through good countryside of Sycamore and Birch, across a wooden bridge, and the intrusion now upon a time of evening quiet of a thing, a wheel, an enormous wheel of red neon, a wheel whose each spoke displaced a tube of sky when it lit, one spoke after another, and when the huge and clever wheel was finally complete, a thing happened. The word hub announced itself at the split second when the center of the wheel appeared. This is the place. Let's go inside. You and your friend can have this booth right here, Mr. Douglas. Thanks, Charlie. Oh, uh, don't go away. I want you to meet a friend of mine, Miss Warner, Charlie Phillips. How do you do, Mr. Hello. The hub belongs to Charlie. Yes, ma'am. How are things, Charlie? Last night, that kid over there, you see him? Huh? That one near the music box? Gordon Matthews? Who knows what his name is? Well, that's Gordon, all right. He was in my homeroom last year. You should have made him write a few hundred times, don't play with matches. He would like to set fire to the place last night. Why, that boy's barely 15 years old. What's he doing out here five miles outside of town, this late at night? Listen, he's got a parent or two can ask that question, not me. Oh, why don't you just tell him to go home, Charlie? Why don't you keep him out of here? For the same reason you're teaching school, to eat, to make a living. Once this was a nice place. Why, there's David, David Harper. David? David? Oh, hello, Miss Warner. What are you doing here, David? David, I'm talking to you. I know you are. How did you get out here? I hitched. Mr. Douglas and I are going to take you home. I'm sorry, Miss Warner, but I... Oh, hi, Bobby. You ready, kid? What is this, Bobby? School opens Monday. Then you ask questions and ask for hands. Saturday night don't belong to you, Miss Warner. Come on, kid. Please, Miss Warner, let me go. Hey, what's the trouble? Look, uh, you'd better stay out of this, Mr. Douglas. David is going someplace with Bobby. I want to know where. Where, Bobby? All right. Outside is my car. And outside is two other cars, and the boys in them are impatient. That's how we tell each other we're impatient. You going to race, Bobby? Yeah. And down the road a few yards is a bridge. You get the picture? You're crazy. What's he going to do? Tell her. The three of them will line up abreast on the road, then they'll race to the bridge and over it. But there's only room for two cars across that bridge. That's right. One of us will have to drop back. Come on, Davy. Okay. Oh, no, you stay here, David. No. Now, listen, you can get killed. Let go of me. I would if I were you, Mr. Douglas. I'd really let him go. Mr. Douglas, hey, now, listen. What do you want, Charlie? Uh, these kids, they turn into a wolf pack. Don't get yourself into any trouble. Why, these boys wouldn't dare to... Listen, Miss Warner. Last month, an older brother, there must have been a man about 30, a very hefty fellow with muscles on his forearm. This fellow came in here and tried to pull his kid brother out of here. He landed in the hospital. Cut. There's 16 kids here, Miss Warner. But what Bobby is going to do, that, that, that race over the bridge with David, both of them can ah, be killed. the way they handle those cars, you don't know. Come on, Davy. You coming? You won't. Sure. Mary Wheeler, you start the last row, Mary, will you please? Take the seat down front. Then Judy Wilton. Then John Young, the third seat. And Martin Young. Your brothers, aren't you? I can tell. And next to the last, Audrey Zant. And George Zimmerman. There. Now, young ladies and gentlemen, here we are. 
10B3 at Alexander Hamilton High School. Oh, oh, come right in, Bobby. And so, class, this is the first day of our new school year, and this is where we'll meet to start each day and to end it. Uh, the young gentleman who just came in to visit is a senior, and his name is Bobby Morrison. He asked if he could talk to you, and I said he could. All right, Bobby. Thank you. Um, I, I guess, first of all, I want to apologize to you. All of you. Miss Warner and... Well, all of you, because of that empty chair. It's my fault. I guess you know about it. I guess you've heard. But I want to tell you how sorry I am. It was my fault. Now, uh, soon you'll be taking those driver training courses, and that way you're going to learn what safety means. That it means respecting the lives of others. Now, that's something I didn't do. And that's why you've got that empty chair instead of David Cooper. But David's going to be all right. I've been spending a lot of time at the hospital, and today they told me that. Well, that's about all, Miss Warner. And thank you for letting me say it. Thank you, Bobby. And that's why we'll save David's seat for him. He's coming back. I want to wish you all a fine, productive, and safe school year. And if there's anything you want to talk to me about, I'll always be here. You may go to your first class. Suspense. Presented by Autolite, tonight's star, Miss Agnes Moorhead, will return in just a moment. Tonight, our worldwide Autolite family has been privileged to salute the American Automobile Association and its traffic safety program. In fact, everyone who helps bring traffic safety and driver training programs to boys and girls in their school classrooms throughout the world. You, too, can aid in promoting safety by driving carefully at all times and by making sure that schools in your community are teaching traffic safety in their classrooms. Full information on programs available can be secured from your local automobile club affiliated with the American Automobile Association or from the American Automobile Association, Washington, D.C. And now I'd like to present Agnes Moorhead and our producer-director, Elliot Lewis. Thank you, Harlow. Agnes, I'm happy to inform you that you have been voted Autolite's Golden Mike Award for the best female performance of the year on Suspense. Congratulations, and here, this is for you. Oh, thank you, Elliot. As you know, Suspense has always been my favorite radio show, so receiving this award is a double honor. Thank you very, very much. Next week, a story based on fact as we recreate the excitement and violence of a fire in an oil field. The story is called Hellfire. Our star, Mr. John Hodiak. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is transcribed and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Rennie Garagank and conducted by Lud Gleskin. The Empty Chair was written for suspense by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. In tonight's story, Sam Edwards was heard as Bobby. Featured in the cast were Michael Chapin, Paula Winslow, Joseph Kearns, and Herb Butterfield. Agnes Moorhead will soon be seen in The Magnificent Obsession. And remember, next week, Mr. John Hodiak in Hellfire. And now this is Harlow Wilcox saying good night for the Autolite family with this reminder. You're always right to be careful. This is the CBS Radio Network.
And now, a tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. I only ask the place and time enough to give some small meaning to the meaningless and point to having lived. Listen now to 2462, starring Lawson Zerby and written especially for Suspense by George Bamber. I woke up on the floor, shivering. All my clothes were gone. It was like a nightmare. A nightmare I had dreamed many times before and dreaded coming true. At first, I thought I'd awakened in my own room, that somebody had taken all my furniture as well as my clothes. But then I realized it wasn't so much a room as it was a cube. An empty, sterile cube with luminescent walls that hummed with a soft blue-green light. I jumped up then and threw myself against the walls trying to find a way out. And there was none. No door, no window. Not even a ventilation tube. I banged on the walls and screamed, but no one answered me. Nothing but the smooth plastic blue-green walls that hummed with the electric current in them that gave them light and air and death. I slumped back down to the soft foam plastic floor of my cell, afraid to admit to myself where I was, and squeezed my eyes tight against the walls because I was afraid I was going to cry. Just then, the wall in front of me slid back on its tracks, and in the pale light of the corridor, I could see a large, shambling man in prison coveralls with a nine-digit number tattooed on his forehead. W what do you want? Follow me. He turned his back on me and stepped on the moving conveyor in the corridor. I stumbled after him because I was afraid to be alone. And I had to know what was happening. Where are you taking me? No talk. Follow me. I could tell by the steady movement of his jaw and the dull, faraway look on his face that I could question him all day and it wouldn't do any good. He was chewing tranquil gum. And the effect of that stuff lasts for a week. I could scream at him and it wouldn't bother him. Nothing would bother him unless I tried to escape. I knew where I was now. There could be no doubt of that. I rode behind my silent guard, up and down what seemed like endless corridors, past row on row of cells just like the one I had left. Some of them had their reverse scanners on. That means you could see in, but the prisoners couldn't see out. Some of them were sitting in the middle of their cube, staring at nothingness. But most of them were slumped on the floor asleep kept that way by somnigas, a gentle gas that kept the inmates unconscious and manageable until their cases came up. I knew one day I would wind up here, and here I was in the most scientific escape-proof termination center in the world. In here. The guard stepped off the conveyor in front of a heavy chrome door marked courtroom and pushed a button. I moved through the doorway like a schoolboy called upon to recite. The room was not much bigger than the cell I had left, and as empty. A lieutenant sat behind a desk. His plastic bars gleamed at me brightly from his shoulders. I heard my guard close the door behind us, and then I noticed that one wall was completely covered with the sleepy face of a computer. Sit down. Sit down. I did as I was told on the only other piece of furniture in the place, a small three-legged stool in the middle of the room. I wished that they had given me some sort of clothes to cover my nakedness because there was a young girl, a secretary, sitting at uh, an electro-writer, taking down everything that was said, feeding it into the computer. Your identity. Frank Smith. I said your identity. I told you, sir. Do not hold up the proceedings. Time is precious. You were issued a combination serial, social security, and telephone number that was imprinted on your forehead at birth. From here, it appears to be 108-303-715. Is that correct? That is the number tattooed on my head. Clerk, let the record show the subject is hostile. Yes, sir. Let us proceed. Case of the people versus 108-303-715. Convened in the first court at 1800 hours in this day of our world, 18 of November, 2462. 108-303-715. You are charged with two counts. One, writing non-productive literature. And two, wasting government time. 
How do you plead, true or false? I, I don't understand. Have you or have you not written poetry? I'm a clerk in the space department. True or false? False. I have here some hundred pieces of doggerel. I shall read a portion of one. See if you recognize it. In my treeless, greenless office, mid the bustling mad despair, I hunger after exile from the chrome and filtered air. Well? It's not a very good poem, is it? Did you or did you not write this poem? True or false? I hardly see Answer, what... true or false? False. Account, then, for the fact that this poem was written on your electro-typewriter. There are millions of electro-writers. As you may or may not know, each electro-writer has its own characteristics, as individual as fingerprints. An expert has identified this poem as coming from your machine. I can call him in to testify if you like. There are two shifts. I'm not the only one assigned to that machine. You are not only a poet, but you are a very stupid one. Every electro-writer imprints the date and hour of transmission. In every case, the poems were written on your machine, while you were supposed to be sitting at it doing the invaluable work of the space department. What have you to say? What can I say? You are charged with two very grave counts in this court, writing non-productive literature and wasting government time. How do you answer? How else can I answer? Guilty. 108-303-715. You insist on imposing on this court concepts of legality as ancient as 1962. In this court, subjects are neither guilty nor not guilty. They are simply productive or non-productive, social or antisocial. I repeat, are these charges against you true or false? Answer one or the other. False. Very well. Clerk? Yes, sir. Signal the judicial computer that all facts and considerations of this court are now at hand and submit the subject's work record, fitness report, sanity estimation, IQ, cooperation quotient. Yes, I watched like a sleepwalker as the lieutenant handled the thin, punched, and tabulated cards that were the history of my life. I watched with a gambler's fascination as one by one she fitted them into the monster's mouth and the lights blinked and flitted across its face, digesting my life and worth on earth and estimating in hours and minutes how much longer I would be permitted to stay. Suddenly, I realized the computer had stopped. The lights across its face were dark. The machine's mouth spat out a thin red plastic card, and the girl handed it to the lieutenant. Number 108-303-715. It is the decision of this court that you are no longer essential or desirable to life on this earth. What? On the 343rd day of the year 2462... You will be taken from your cell to the Division of Agriculture for Processing. No. Your corporal body will be reduced to its basic components. Oh, no. And your existence on Earth will be terminated. No. Oh, no, no, no. No, in God's name, give me another chance. It is a decision of this court. You can't condemn a man to die just for writing a few lines of poetry. Not for writing a few lines of poetry, for being a poet. If you were a scientist or an engineer, we could afford to overlook these recessive characteristics in your personality. Forgive the writing of a few lines of doggerel. But you are not a scientist or engineer or even a mathematician. You are a clerk in the space department. And according to your work record, not very good at that. I have no head for figures. At a time when the world is crying out a need of mechanical and technical brains, the best you're suited for is rhyming lists of words on scraps of paper. Can you possibly imagine that I our stood society... stood looking at the young place. man who was a lieutenant. Saw his eyes on me, his lips move, but no sound came out. Everything he said was true. The world was in trouble. 300, 400 years ago, they thought they were having a population explosion. They should see it now. People live as far beneath the ground as they did above. New York was built out 30 miles over the water, and people commuted to work from as far away as Ohio and Michigan. Even the deserts were populated. It took mathematical and technical brains just to keep it all going, not to mention the problem of finding new worlds in space. It must be apparent that even if you had some mechanical ability for the service and repair of computers, machines... I could try to learn. But you have no mechanical ability. Your aptitude tests show that. Well, just give me a chance to there learn. There is no time. The world needs these talents now, not a year from now, months from now. Well, all I want is to live. We all want to live. That's the whole problem. The function of this court is to weed out the people who are not necessary to the continuation of life from those who are. Artists, philosophers, theologians, and poets are not necessary. You have been found to be... A poet. I appeal to the mercy of the court. There is no mercy in a mathematical equation. Well, give me another chance, just one. Number 108-303-715, you are wasting the court's time. 
I have many more cases to deal with today. As you stand now, you are a drain on the Earth's natural resources. In exactly 20 days from now, you will contribute to them. Case dismissed. Look, I, ha I have one favor to ask. Everyone is granted one last request. What is it? I have the right, do I not, to spend my remaining days conscious? Yes, but you should request some gas. Time goes much faster when you're asleep, and then the end is not so painful. I want to spend my last days conscious. Conscious? Why? So I can write. Write? Yes, write. I wouldn't have to have an electro writer in my cell. Just an osmotic pen would do. I know how to use a pen a and some paper. I know you have no power over the decision of the court, but just this one last request is one man to another. Very well. Orders will be left that a pen and paper are to be placed at your disposal. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. No more can be granted than the law allows. You may spend your remaining days on earth conscious and writing gibberish or poems or whatever you wish. Next case. I had to bite my tongue to keep from shouting and turning handsprings all the way back to my cell. I had won the right to remain conscious during my last days on earth. The right to have one more chance at life and freedom. I realized fully how small that chance was. In the days when men still believed that crime was cured by punishment, my cell would have been a jailer's dream. The smooth plastic walls were flawless. I searched the whole cube and found no more than the first time I saw them. Not even the little pinholes that admitted the gas that finished Joe. I had hoped to dig under the soft foam rubber plastic on the floor with the point of my pen, but I dug at it and couldn't even scratch it. For what must have been five days, I studied the prison routine in hopes of jamming the door and overpowering one of the guards. But it was impossible. Once a day, the wall was rolled back and food was tossed in, wrapped in electroethylene, and then rolled back again before you could get to them. It was impossible to wait near the wall because the guards could see you waiting there and would not open it until you were well back in the center of the cell. On what must have been the tenth day, I began to have hallucinations. People began to appear in my cell and chat with me. People who had long since been dead. To stave off madness, I picked up the broken stub of my pen and began to write feverishly. I wrote a poem to the girl I had seen once when I was 14. And then I wrote about the last blade of grass I had seen. I wrote faster and faster until I was completely wrapped up in the joy of writing. Writing about all the things I could remember. Until I lost all track of time, of place, and... Oh, no. No, it isn't time. I, I still have 20 days left. Oh, 20 days, he said. Quiet, son. You still have two days to go. Well, then... What, what do you want? To talk. Mind if I come in? It's your prison. He didn't come all the way in, but stood in the door, out of sight, off the hall, but blocking my way. He was a very old man with mottled parchment skin. His prison coveralls hung on him like elephant skin. Oh, who, who are you? I'm the night duty guard. What do you want? Oh, just to talk. I've never, never seen you before. Oh, but I've seen you. Every night I've been looking over your shoulder, reading the things you write. I ho hope you enjoyed yourself. I did. I haven't read any new poetry in 50 years since the computers came in. You've got away with words. Thank you, sir. That's all right. Uh, there's one poem you wrote night before last. I wonder if I could see it again. Which one, sir? The one about a man's going to die and doesn't know why. Oh. You mean this one? Yes. Yes, that's the one. Would you mind reading it for me? My eyes tire easily. Okay. In the monumental silence of a long and pointless strife, I'm pained at my reluctance to let go this last of life. 
I only ask the place and time enough to give some small meaning to the meaningless and point to having lived. Yes, I like that. How would you like to get out of here? Are you crazy? No. Nobody leaves here alive. Guards do. But I'm not a guard. You could be. Oh, now I know you're crazy. You could be if you put on my clothes, my uniform. That wouldn't do any good. They'd still recognize me by the number on my forehead. That's what gave me the idea. Look at your number and look at mine. 108 808 715. Only the eights are different. Yes. We could take that pen of yours and make your threes look like eights. But you're an old man. I'm young. They'd recognize the difference immediately. No, 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 they wouldn't. The only one who sees me is the guard that relieves me, and he's on happy gum. The only thing he looks at is my number. As long as that's right, he's happy. He couldn't tell you what I looked like if his life depended on it. But why? I don't know why. Maybe I just like poetry. Maybe it's because I'm going to die anyway. Eh, look at me. I'm 110. Yesterday I read where they're going to start eliminating everybody over 102. It'll probably be law before the year is out. But that's, that's still a year to live, maybe more. A year of what? I can't smell anymore. My taste buds are gone. My hands and feet are always cold. That's not the real reason, is it? No. No, it isn't. Then what is? I have a granddaughter about your age. Beautiful girl. She used to write and paint some when she was young. Of course, we had to discourage it after the computers came in. You know, it just would make me feel good to know they hadn't stamped out the genes for poetry completely. I hate to live in a world where you don't get anything more than what comes blasting in at you over the telecommunicator. Well, what do you say? Are you willing? I'm willing, if you are. Oh, good. Now, listen carefully. He sat up most of the night, explaining his job to me, cross-questioning me to be sure I remembered it right. His job was simple, mostly just pushing buttons. The difficult part would be finding my way out of the huge prison without looking like I was groping and getting off the overhead rail at the right stop to find his daughter's home. Finally, when he was convinced I had it right, he left, promising to change places with me the following night. I was almost afraid to believe him. The hours of what was to be my final night on Earth crept by. The day had been bad enough, but the night was worse. A hundred times I decided the night was over, that it had all just been a sadistic trick by the old man so he could watch the agony of my final hours on Earth to pass the time. I was just about to beat against the walls and scream when... Quickly, help me out of these coveralls. I thought you wouldn't come. I had to wait till just before the end of the watch so you'd have the best chance of escaping. How much time do I have left? Uh, about 20 minutes. The day guard will be coming to relieve me soon, so hurry, will you? Uh, where's your pen? <laughs> Here it is. Uh, hold your head still while I change these threes to eights. All right, all right. Yeah. Remember, stay on the overhead rail until you get out of Arizona. My daughter is the next stop after that. Okay. Uh, there, you're finished. Goodbye. I, I don't want to say... Don't say anything. Say goodbye before I change my mind. At best, courage is a quicksilver thing. Goodbye, old man. And thanks. Quick, close the door. I did as I was told, raising my hand to break the circuit. And I watched the old man smile at me at the control board and take up his position in front of it. The clock on the board said ten minutes to five in the morning. Ten minutes before I would be released. How's it going? Huh? I said, how's it going? Everything quiet? Oh, oh, f fine, fine, fine. I recognized him as the guard that was supposed to relieve the old man. For a minute, I was afraid he recognized me when his eyes drifted across my face. But then they flicked up to my forehead, checked my serial number, and he resumed his steady, quiet chewing. I came in a little early. You can never tell about the overhead rail when it's going to get jammed up. Yes, I know. Things are a mess. 
What's that? Trouble in cell number 84. See the flashing light on the board? Oh, yes. Yes, I better turn it off. Cell 84. That was my cell. The one I just left. That meant the old man was probably banging on the walls. I see cell 84 is scheduled for termination this morning. Probably lost his nerve. They should make them all stay under Sami gas while they're here. Makes them easier to handle that way. I can't turn the alarm off. Of course you can't. As long as he's hammering on the walls and screaming that way. You better go down and see what he wants. Do, do, do I have to? Of course you do. It's the law. He might have something more he wants to say. I walked down the hall, feeling the guard's eyes on my back. I didn't dare argue with him anymore for fear that he would become concerned. It was all over now. I knew it was all over. I could see the old man beating on the walls of his cell beyond the transparent plastic wall, screaming soundlessly. He had changed his mind. He wanted to live. In a minute, he would be running down the hall, shouting for help. And in two hours, I would be dead. I raised my hand to break the electric circuit. Ah! Ah! Oh. oh, there you are. I... I was afraid you wouldn't come back. I, you, you took the poems with you, and I couldn't remember that one. All I can remember is I only ask the place. I can't remember how it ends. I only ask the place and time enough to give some small meaning to the meaningless and point to having lived. Yes. Yes, that's it. And point to having lived. Suspense. You've been listening to 2462, starring Lawson Zerby, and written especially for Suspense by George Bamber. Suspense is produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., music supervision by Ethel Huber. Featured in tonight's story were Robert Randall as the lieutenant, Bob Dryden as the old guard, William Mason as the young guard, and Rosemary Rice as the court stenographer. Listen again next week when we return with Please Believe Me, written by Ben Kagan. Another tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. They're the most Bing Crosby and Rosemary Clooney weekdays on the CBS radio network. Now... The Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California presents... Suspense! Tonight, Roma Wines bring you the suspenseful play called A Guy Gets Lonely, starring Dane Clark. Suspense is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you a remarkable tale of suspense. And with a drama called A Guy Gets Lonely... And with the performance of Mr. Dane Clark as Eddie Lewis, Roma Wines hope indeed to keep you in suspense. Have you ever been lonely? Desperately lonely? Well, there's an emptiness in the pit of your stomach that no food can remove. There's a coldness about people's faces that make you shudder. And you do silly things when you're lonely. Maybe that explains what happened to me. Maybe. Anyhow, I was hanging around the shooting gallery in one of those Broadway penny arcades that night, one of those places where you can play a game of chess, get your fortune told, have 10 shots at Hitler all 15 cents. And I was alone, as usual, thinking the dull, drab, dreary things a guy thinks about when he's alone. When suddenly an old man standing next to me said, Ah, uh, well, my aim is not what it used to be. Oh, uh, got a match, my boy? Match? <laughs> oh, sure, here. Oh, thank you. 
You uh, haven't by any chance got a cigarette to go with that match, have you, son? <laughs> of course, you'd take one. Oh, thanks again. You know, with cigarettes so scarce nowadays, the only way a gentleman gets a smoke is to buy him himself. Yep. Mm. Thank you, thank you. Ah, what's the matter, kid? You look like your ship came in, only your mother-in-law was aboard. Oh, nothing. Oh, oh, come on. Fess up to old Horace. I'm Beatrice Bearfax without the girdle. Well, I'm just fed up with this town, that's all. Oh, there's nothing wrong with this town, kid. It's like all other towns. Yeah, uh, except the one you grew up in. Well, uh, I suppose you're right. You know what you need is a, is a little diversion. Huh? Oh, here, my man. Yes, uh, yes, load sir. these guns up again, will you? Yes, sir. Both guns, chum. You'll try it again, won't you, sir? All right, sir. Okay. You know, I think perhaps I've got just the right medicine for your homesickness, young fellow. Oh, what's that? A girl. A girl? Yes. Don't tell me you've never heard of them. Well, if you haven't, bless me. I don't want to be the one to tell you. <laughs> and there we are. No, that's, that's not it. that. Here you are, sir. That'll be two bucks. Two dollars? That's right, chum. There's a war on in case you haven't heard. Ammunition's kind of hard to get nowadays. Oh, well, as a matter of fact, it's a little dark in here, and my eyes aren't what they used to be, so perhaps I'll simply forget. No, no, no. Here's, here's the money. Go on. Go ahead, Pop. Shoot. Uh, you uh, wouldn't care to make a small wager on this, would you, my boy? As I say, my no, eyes... No, 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 thanks. Uh, well, as I was saying, son... I have a splendid idea. Hmm? Now, tomorrow, being the Sabbath, my wife and I are bound for Minnewonka on a peaceful little fishing expedition. <laughs> if you'd care to accompany us, there is a faint chance, just a faint chance, mind you, that uh, I might round up a beautiful young lady who will make it a foursome. Well, wouldn't that be too much trouble? Oh, oh not at all, son. Meet me here tomorrow at nine. What do you say? <laughs> Gee, that... Well, that's swell, except that... Except what? Oh, uh, do you mind if I shoot first? No, 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 go ahead. Except that I've, I've never been fishing before in my life. Well, don't worry about it. Hey! <laughs> hey, your eyes aren't too bad. Oh, with a fish, the big thing is not so much your experience as your bait. The idea of not being alone again on Sundays what excited me. I, I didn't give much thought to the girl and until I saw her. If you've ever seen a truly beautiful woman walking toward you, you'll know what I'm talking about. First, you see the tiny gray silhouette in the distance, and then the figure seems to spring to life. Each curve rounds into place, and finally you see the smooth oval face and the, the long auburn hair dancing in the breeze. And before you know it, you, well, you're, you're in a trance, that's all. That must have been what happened to me when I first saw Jolly, because I don't remember much of anything until I heard myself saying, Oh, hey, what's that? A worm, silly. You can't fish without a worm. Do I have to? Well, of course. As captain of this boat, I promise to bring in more fish than Horace. Wow. I order you to put that worm on the hook. No, it, it, it shakes. <laughs> Rather gracefully, don't you think? Kind of reminds me of a shimmy queen at a burlesque show. Oh. There. Oh. Now you did it. Easy, wasn't it? Oh. Now drop your line in the water. Okay. Well, where's the fish? Patience, lad, patience. The fish had not had a chance to read your advertisement yet. Well, if they could only see you, Jorley, I doubt if they'd bother with my line at all. Oh, your line isn't bad, Eddie. This is so bad at all. I guess in the next few hours, I told her just about all I could remember about myself, about wanting to be an actor and leaving home and coming to this town and the disappointments and how I decided to go home while I still had some money left and how lonely I was, how terribly lonely I was. And before she left that night, she wouldn't let me take her home. I, I made a day for the next night. It's funny how quick you can get to feel that way about somebody when you're lonely. We met in the Asta lobby and after we talked for a while... Well... For a slow starter, you certainly pour it on in the backstretch. No, 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 please don't laugh, Charlie. I'm, I'm pretty serious. <laughs> about what? About you. How about me? Charlie, look. Look, I was planning to go home today. I had the ticket in my pocket, and this morning I turned it in. Oh. Look, I still want to go home, Charlie, but I want you to go with me. You want what? I, I want you to marry me. Charlie? I heard. Well? You want an answer now? Yes. It's 
No, Eddie. Oh. I'm sorry. Well, is there somebody else? No, it isn't is that, there? Eddie. It isn't anything you could possibly imagine. It isn't even that I don't love you, because maybe I do. Charlie! But you see, you... Eddie, I was going to ask you something tonight, too, and it doesn't stack up very well against what you asked me. Charlie, what? What? Oh, I know it's silly. We've only known each other for 48 hours, and it shouldn't matter, but... Oh, it doesn't matter anyway, no. Charlie, you've got to tell me. It's just an old, old story, Eddie. Such an old story that you probably wouldn't even believe it. That's the trouble. Look, I, I, I believe anything you told me. It's, it's about my mother out west and how I support her and how she needs an operation. And I was going to ask you for a thousand dollars. Is that all? Well, that's enough. Oh, Jolly, why did you put me through such a cold sweat for a little thing like that? Well, it's, it's pretty complicated. Oh, Eddie. what's complicated about it? Look, Jolly. Look, here's a ring. It's all I've got right now, but I, I wish you'd wear it. Oh, it's beautiful. An old Samoan chief gave it to me when I was in Tahiti. Go ahead, look inside. Mm. To Eddie Lewis from Question Mark. Yeah, I had that engraved in it when I got back to the States. I never did know the old guy's name. Will you wear it? Eddie, I'll meet you here tomorrow for lunch. And if I'm wearing the ring, third finger left hand, you'll know that I do. All right. Jolie. Yes? Do you want the money now? No, Eddie, no. Not now. The next day I was there waiting for her, way ahead of time again, but... This time she was late. After a half hour, I began to get worried. And then I began to get scared. And after a full hour had gone by and she still hadn't shown up, I was half crazy. And then I felt a hand on my arm and a voice speaking over my shoulder. You uh, waiting for somebody? Hmm? That's right. A lady? Yeah, what about it? Would your name be uh, Eddie Lewis? Yes. Say, what do you know about the fact that I'm... We found your name written in lipstick on the back of a bathroom door up on the 10th floor. After it, it said, ask the lobby, 1 o'clock. So we uh, sort of put two and two together. You see, I'm from headquarters, Eddie. What? I'm a detective. Detective? Listen, if you know anything about Jolie Andrews, I, I, I was supposed to meet her here about an hour ago, and she Would hasn't... Would she have been uh, wearing this ring by any chance? Well, that's right. That's my ring. Where is she? She's down at the city morgue, Eddie. She's dead. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you a star, Mr. Dane Clark, whom you have heard in the first act of A Guy Gets Lonely, a radio play by Don Paul Nathanson, which is Roma Wines' presentation tonight of Suspense. Between the acts of suspense, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. Gracious hostess, internationally known on entertaining, Elsa Maxwell's suggestions are always worthwhile. Spring is here, and nature is again bursting into life. Let's bring some of this beauty to the dinner table. A centerpiece of spring flowers will brighten your table, and there's no better way to awaken winter-weary appetites than by serving cool Roma Burgundy with the meal. This glorious wine from California goes well with almost any food. So simple, and yet how charming. A few flowers to give your table the gay note of spring. A bottle of cool, delicious Roma Burgundy as the subtle accompaniment to a savory meal. You'll enjoy the tart piquancy, the fruity, robust taste of this distinguished Roma Burgundy. Like all Roma wines, unvaryingly good, always high in quality. The result of selected grapes, slowly brought to perfection in California's choicest vineyards, gently pressed, then brought to fullest flavor by the ancient skill of Roma's famed wineries. Yet all this goodness is yours for only pennies a glass. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wines. R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. And now Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage... Dane Clark as Eddie in A Guy Gets Lonely, a play well calculated to keep you in suspense.
My mind was going round like a merry-go-round. Having an old moocher like Horace walk up out of a clear sky and introduce you to a girl like Jorley. Proposing to her after only 48 hours. And then having a cop come along and tell you she's dead. They took me down to headquarters and I was there all day answering questions and trying to dope out what had happened myself. I even told them how she'd asked me for a thousand dollars, but... They didn't pay much attention to anything I said. It's a simple case of suicide, and that's that. But it couldn't be. Jolly wouldn't commit suicide. You recognized her, didn't you? Well, I... Well, what? People don't look quite the same after they've fallen ten stories on a concrete side. But you recognized her? Yes, yes, I recognize her. But why did she write my name on the inside of that door? How do I know what women think about before they jump out the window? I'm not Mr. Anthony. Well... Look, maybe somebody followed her. Maybe somebody tried to force the door. There wasn't any lock on the door. Then it would have been that much easier. Maybe somebody... Look, Eddie, just what are you trying to make out of this? I don't know. All I know is it couldn't have been as simple as this. You wouldn't be uh, thinking about murder, would you? Maybe. Now, Eddie, this sort of thing happens all the time. Look, I'll draw you a picture. Friendless girl meets guy. They start going together. Then she asks him for money. He doesn't give. The next day, Look, she... I told you... We're I ain't doing that talking. She asks him for money, and he doesn't give, see? The next day, she writes his name on the handiest plain white surface, and... Boom. Now, how does that look to you? All right, all right. But what about Horace? Have you tried to trace him? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. We tried to find Horace. Only we didn't. Mainly on account of he doesn't exist, if you ask me. I talked to him, I tell you. He introduced us. <laughs> you don't have to go that far to explain how a man meets a girl nowadays, Eddie. Look, he did introduce us. He was an old man, white hair. It was in a shooting gallery. And he has a hobby of introducing guys to beautiful gals, and nobody knows where he lives. Oh. And the only time you ever met him was in the Penny Arcade that's so busy they wouldn't remember George Washington being in there. That and the time you were seen together by a couple of lake trout. Oh, cut it out, will you, son? All right, go on home, Eddie. I wouldn't leave town just yet, though, if I were you. All right. And, uh, Eddie. Yeah? I wouldn't push that murder theory too far, either. Why? Because you know who's the only possible suspect for murder? That's right. You. <laughs> First, I didn't know what to do or what to think. I didn't blame the cops. From where they sat, it just didn't make any sense any other way. And then all at once, I knew what I was going to do. First, I moved to another hotel, just in case. And then I started growing a full beard, and I dyed it black. And my hair, too. You see, I'm a natural blonde, so it turned out pretty good. Good enough to pass off for a night anyway. And I really am an actor. Maybe no Barry more, but enough to give a fair imitation of an accent. And I got some different clothes, and then I was ready. I began haunting that shooting gallery because I, I figured the old man had a system. But after about three weeks, I'd about given up hope. When one Saturday night, I walked into a little place off Times Square, and I saw him. My heart was jumping through hoops, but I just sort of moseyed around, tried to look as down in the mouth as I could, kept my face out of the light. I felt pretty safe with the beards, so I went over and I stood next to him. <laughs> Well, my aim seems to be off tonight. Oh, pardon me. <laughs> do you have a match? Uh, I reckon I do. Uh, sure, here you are. Oh, thank you. <sighs> my boy, <laughs> like to try your skill at the shooting gallery? Perhaps a little wager? Oh, no, thanks. I, I've just about had enough shooting to last me a lifetime. i just come back from two years in the South oh. Pacific. So that's where you got the beard. Yeah, a bunch of us fellas grew them down there. I promised my kinfolk I'd let them see it before I shaved it off. I'm not so sure I would shave it off. <laughs> it's mightily becoming to thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, where are your folks? Uh, Texas. Got a mighty nice little ranch of my own down there. I sure do miss it. <laughs> kind of lonely, huh? Oh, you all can say that again, mister. Well, son, if you'd forgive an old man for sticking his nose in somebody's business where he's got no call to... Sex, no. What's on your mind? I think I know just the medicine for you. Why, what's that? A girl. That was it. That's what I've been waiting for. First, I thought of taking the old devil out in the alley and sweating it out of him right then and there. Then I thought, no. No, there'll be a girl, and I want to have a talk with that girl. In the meantime, the old man was going on about that fishing trip. Hey, if 
you, uh, if you care to join us, my boy, I think I can promise you a very pleasant afternoon. Well, I, I reckon I couldn't do that. Uh, perhaps if you could make it tomorrow night. Well, now that might be arranged. Uh, where would you like to have us meet you? Well, couldn't you just sort of give me the young lady's phone number, tell her I was uh, fixing the call? Oh, I'm afraid, you see, this particular young lady doesn't have a phone. Well, don't think I'm not downright grateful, mister, or that I wouldn't enjoy your company, but... Uh, uh, but you'd rather be alone. Shucks. Huh? No, don't get me wrong. I'm no wolf or nothing like that, but... Well, when a fella has his first date with a gal in more than two years, maybe you can't understand what that means. But... I think maybe I get the general idea, son. I'll tell her to look for a handsome Texan with a beard. Can you be here tomorrow night at, say, 8 o'clock? Oh, I calculate I sure can. Well, then, my boy, you've got yourself a date. The next night I was there in plenty of time. I had plans for that girl, lots of plans. As I got around toward 8 o'clock, I kept looking toward the street entrance, but somehow I must have missed her because the next thing I knew... There was somebody standing beside me, and I heard a voice. Hello there. I'm Joyce Ireland. It seemed as though minutes went by before I was able to say a word. If it hadn't been dark where I was sitting, she couldn't have but helped to see that something was wrong. Because the girl was Jolly. My Jolly, who was supposed to be dead. The Jolly that I'd seen it myself at the slab at the city morgue. And somehow, somehow I managed to pull myself together and start talking. You're Johnny Farrell, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, that's right. I, it was sure mighty nice of you to come. Oh, well, that's all right. I wasn't doing anything. Is there anything in particular you'd like to do now? No, nothing in particular. Well, I thought maybe you'd like to go dancing or something like that, only I... Only what? Well, I discovered a terrible thing just before you got here, Miss... Ma'am. <laughs> you can call me Joyce. <laughs> you see, I, I left my wallet up in my hotel room. Oh? If you all wouldn't mind stopping by there with me for a minute while I pick it up, then we could... And I suppose while we're up there, I can look over your etching. Oh, or... no, ma'am. I ain't that kind. Honest, I'm not. But if, if you don't want to go, it... Oh, what's the difference? Come on, let's go. You always keep it this dark in here? Well, there's a couple of bulbs burn out. I told them to have them fixed. Oh, but well, they... never mind. Where's that wallet? In the closet there, my other suit. Say, uh, Joyce. Yes? Would you mind if I stepped in here and sort of slicked up a little before he went out? No, no. Go right ahead. I went into the bathroom and got out my razor. My plans were still the same. I excused myself a minute before we came upstairs and I made the phone call that I'd planned to. There's a couple of little extra flourishes to be added on now that I hadn't figured on before. First, I shaved off my beard. Then I went to work on the hair dye with some rubbing alcohol. It came out pretty easy. And I was almost ready when I heard her voice in the next room. Johnny! Uh, uh, yes? I think maybe I'd better go home. You mean you you reckon you don't want to go out with me? Oh, well, it isn't you, Johnny, but... Well, what is it? You'll think I'm crazy if I tell you. No, no, I won't. What is it? Well, you sort of remind me of someone. Who? Oh, just someone I used to know. Oh, but Joyce, I'm all ready to go now. Well... Only first I thought maybe we'd better have a little more light on the subject. I thought you said you didn't have any... Hello, Jorley. Hetty. That's right. Hetty, I, I thought, thought you... thought I'd never catch up with you. All right, Jorley, all right. Give. What? Come on, talk and talk fast. Who was that other girl, the one they thought was you, the one who was dead? Well, she was my sister. Sister? What happened to her? I, I don't know. What kind of a racket are you and the old man running anyway? Well, Horace is... He's my father, Eddie. He's, he's my stepfather oh, anyway. Oh, that's nice. That's very nice. It keeps it all in the family, huh? Oh, Eddie, you can think anything you want to. Nothing could be quite bad enough, but... Please believe me, I wasn't playing any games with you. No? No! That's why I sent Evelyn that day, my sister... I gave her your ring so you'd know she really came from me. I just couldn't face her myself. Face me with what? With what Horace and I had planned to do to you. The old shakedown, huh? I guess so. Evelyn was horrified anyway when she got wind of it. She was a funny girl. She belonged to one of those religious sects, and she said we'd have to atone for our sins and be punished. And <laughs> now... Uh, maybe you better start from the beginning. 
Well, that's about all. <laughs> we were awfully hard up. And Mother really was sick. And, and I'd borrowed some money once from a man I'd met. I paid it back that time, but it gave Horace ideas. He wheedled and threatened and said our mother might die. And Well, I had a couple of pretty raw deals pulled on me out here, and I just didn't care anymore, I guess. That is... Till I met you. Yeah, and so you sent your sister to me to confess all, and she jumped out of the window instead. Is that what you think happened? I, I don't know. Then why didn't you tell me what you knew then? Well, I wouldn't have brought Evelyn back to life. And Horace said we'd all go to prison, and... You see, Mother didn't know what was going on. It would have broken her heart. Yes, but you went right back at it again. Well, Horace said if he'd had just a little money, he'd go away. He'd leave us alone and go back east. And I was supposed to be the next victim as Johnny Farrell with a ranch in Texas. No, Eddie, no. Not after I met you. No, no. no. You weren't before, were you? Oh, Eddie, maybe if you knew a little more about what a girl is up against in this town, Where's you'd it? understand. Where's it? Telegram. Telegram? Well, I ah, yes. I had a hunch about you, my boy. Horace! Why, you... Oh, 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 don't try anything foolish. I'm quite expert with this little gun, as you may recall, my boy. I suggest we close the door and have a nice, quiet talk just between ourselves. That's better. So, in spite of all my admonitions, you still persist in this confessional mood, do you, my dear? Horace, what are you going to do? You young people may not see it quite my way, but... I'm an old man, and I don't fancy the notion of spending my remaining years behind bars... It's quite a penalty for extortion, you know. You're telling me. And so I'm afraid there's going to be a little accident up here. Something like the accident that happened to poor Evelyn. So you did kill her! Well, technically, yes, I did uh, assist her through that window after she insisted on making a scene. Why, you... Evelyn was always excitable, you know. Really not quite normal, I'm afraid. Oh, it's your man. Now, my dear, I want you to write a little note. See, there's paper and pen over there on the desk. And you will say, uh... <clears throat> Darling, forgive me, but it will be best this way for both of us. And sign your name. You must be mad to think I'd do such a thing. You wouldn't like to see me kill your lover here, would you? Oh, oh uh, yes, these old eyes can still tell love when they oh. see it. Charlie, look, don't do it, don't do it. Can't you see he's going to kill us both anyway? Horace, will you promise, then? Of course I will. That's it, my dear. Write it down just as I told you. There's only one thing wrong with all this, Horace. You want to know what it is? Naturally. I've already called the police. They're waiting for me in the lobby right now. And if I'm not down there in about five minutes, they'll be up here. Oh, dear. This is embarrassing, isn't it? Isn't it? I think perhaps you'd better get on that telephone, my boy. Give directions for the officers to go away immediately. Say that you no longer have any need of them. Well, all right. Hello? Hello, desk. You know those two men who are waiting in the lobby for me? Well, tell them... Tell them to get up here as fast as they can. You! Horace, no! Jolly! Why, you won't... Oh, no. Jolly! Jolly, are you all right? I think so. It's only my shoulder. Oh, darling, you shouldn't have gotten... I'd rather have had it been me than you. Look, I'll, I'll call a doctor. What's going on here? We heard a shot. Look, there's the man who's responsible for the suicide of Jolly Andrews. Oh, only it wasn't a suicide. He killed her. It wasn't Jolly Andrews. That's Jolly Andrews over here. What are you talking hello, about? Hello, hello, hello. I've got to get a doctor. Wait a minute, will you? All right. Hello? Well, look, don't you now. understand? Look, that isn't Jolly Andrews. That's dead. That's Jolly Andrews over there. You're it's... not making sense, man. Look, fellow, look. I met this guy at a hotel. Yeah? And then we went fishing, and then we put the worms on a hook. And, yeah, yeah. And then she was in a slab, and she was she was dead. Only she's not dead. She's wonderful. We're going to get married. See, I love her. And and then Horace and I were in the shooting gallery. Then I met him, and I dyed my hair, and I made a fake taxi taxi. See? And so closes A Guy Gets Lonely, in which Roma Wines have brought you Mr. Dane Clark as star of tonight's study in Suspense. Before our star returns to the microphone, let me say a word for Roma Wines, the sponsor of Suspense. Elsa Maxwell is known the world over for her great charm as a hostess. Now, here's a brief message from this noted authority. It is always a gracious act of hospitality to serve a glass of distinguished Roma wine. I suggest you try Roma California Tokay, a wine of unusual versatility. 
enjoyable any time, before or after meals. I serve it frequently with dessert or coffee. It's perfect with fruit or nuts or with any light snack. Follow Miss Maxwell's good suggestion. Try Roma Toque. A velvety smooth, flame bright wine, moderately sweet, light, yet delightfully rich in flavor. And you'll find that all Roma wines are always delicious, always of unvarying goodness and fine quality. The next time you use vermouth, sweet or dry, use Roma vermouth. Zestful, herb flavored Roma vermouth is blended, mellowed, developed, and bottled in California with all the traditional winemaking skill of Roma wineries, yet surprisingly low priced. Try Roma vermouth soon, won't you? This is Dane Clark. That I enjoyed appearing on Suspense goes without saying, all of us do. Next week's show sounds like it'll be really swell. It's a story written by one of the great contemporary masses of the art of suspense, Dashiell Hammett. And starring in it will be two of your favorite Hollywood people, John Payne and Stuart Irwin. I'll surely want to catch the one next Thursday, and I know you will too. Suspense is produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Dane Clark appeared through the courtesy of Warner Brothers and will soon be seen with Dennis Morgan in their production, God is My Co-Pilot. Next Thursday, same time, John Payne will be your star of Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In just a moment, Suspense, with Virginia Bruce and Robert Young. Hey, Mary, hmm? have you noticed there's a big dent in the left rear fender of our car? How'd it get there? What's that, dear? The dent in our rear fender. Oh, the dent? Oh, yes, of course. Well, dear, it's very simple. Yes? You see, I was going down to see Frank Martin. He's the Autolite salesman, you yes, know. Yes, yes, I know Frank better than you do. Well, Go you on. know the Autolite people, dear. They make those spark plugs you always talk about. Autolite resistor spark plugs, Mom. That's right. And Autolite makes stay-full batteries, yes, too. Yes, and... I know. And Autolite makes complete ignition systems and over 400 other automotive, aviation, and marine products. But what about that dent? Well, dear... Oh, oh, shh. Here's the Autolite show. Okay, okay, but I'm not licked yet. Suspense. Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Starting tonight... Mr. Robert Young and Miss Virginia Bruce in Anton Leader's production of Celebration, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Just a couple more miles and I'll be there. I wonder how she is today. If there were only some way to get through to her, to make her understand. Well, I can't put it off any longer. For her sake. It's a big, wide, wonderful world. <laughs> I sang. Todd was coming for me. As I packed my suitcase, I looked out of the windows. The gardens were lovely. The patio with the peasant furniture. Some of the girls were playing badminton. Some were in the pool. Todd was coming for me, and I had a surprise for him. It's a big, wide, wonderful world. <laughs> oh, let's see, where's my pink bed jacket? Bottom drawer? It was here, I think. Well, where's the white one? Oh, dear. I couldn't seem to find anything, but I didn't care. Todd was coming for me. It's a big, wide, wonderful world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Oh, I knew what he'd say. Oh, Emily. Emily, how I've missed you. He'd hold me so hard and rub his cheek on my hair and kiss me. And I'd tell him about the surprise. I'd say... Mrs. Ward. Uh, yes? It's Mrs. Halleck. Oh, one moment, Mrs. Halleck. I pushed my suitcase under the bed. Come in, Mrs. Halleck. Your husband just phoned, Mrs. Ward. He'll be here soon. Oh, Todd, such a darling. Thank you, Mrs. Halleck. You've been so kind to me. Well, I try to be to all the ladies. I just have to put on my perfume. It's passionate night. Do you like it? Mm-hmm, grand. Oh, careful, you're stirring oh. it. Oh, I can't seem to hold things. Well, it didn't break. Stand back. I'll wipe it off. Oh, thanks. Heavens, I used to fill this dress out... And now I look like a scarecrow in it, don't I? You look grand. Now, you have everything. Your hat, gloves, purse. Oh, of course. Well, you remember last time you went for a drive. Last time? Uh, oh, oh, I didn't see your suitcase. Well, I was just uh, packing it. I, I thought I wouldn't come back tonight. Well, did you want to get this bunch of letters in your suitcase, too? Of course. Give them to me. They're Todd's letters. Todd simply adores me, Mrs. Halleck. I'm sure he does. Just listen to this letter and you'll see. Darling, you are my happiness. I can't live without you. You're as necessary as... When I looked up, she was gone. She had left while I was reading. I knew what she'd do. She'd tell Todd I dropped that perfume... I think you should understand, Mr. Ward. I could hear her talking to Todd downstairs in the vestibule. I appreciate all you've done for her, Mrs. Halleck. As I told you in the letter, she would be better off in a place where she'd get uh, personal attention. (gasps) I'll take care of it. That woman, that two-faced... She came in and told me Todd was waiting downstairs. I danced down the stairs to Todd. Oh, darling. Oh, Todd. Todd. Mm-hmm. And now, if you'll excuse me, please. Oh, of course. Thank you. Emily, come here. Oh, Todd. Emily. Oh, Emily, how I've missed you. Todd. Mm-hmm. You know, dear, today's an important day. Our eighth wedding anniversary. Why, Todd, we were married only six weeks ago. What? I mean, oh, I never can remember dates. Well, we're going to celebrate. Oh, darling. Really celebrate this anniversary. We're going to all the places we used to go. The lake, Lover's Lane. Come on, darling, let's go. How can I tell her? What can I say? How can I do the things I must do? If only we could really turn back the clock. Back to before she fell down the stairs. Back to a time before the doctors told me about the pressure on her brain the fact that any operation would prove fatal. If we only could go back to those wonderful days so long ago and keep them forever. But there's no turning back the clock. Not ever. Mm, Smell those pines. Yes. Uh, Todd, didn't you wonder why I brought a suitcase? Well, yes, I did. That's because of the surprise. Surprise? Yes. I'm not going back to the club, Todd. I'm coming home with you. Wonderful, dear. And I'm going to make chintz drapes for the living room and do the bathroom over with a full-length mirror and the kitchen lots of stunning color. Now you're talking. It'll be a big job, but we don't care, do we? Of course not. But let's celebrate first, huh? If she only could understand how much that home of ours meant to me. If only she knew how deeply it hurt to see her. To hear her now way she has been ever since the accident. The way she must be as long as that pressure is on her brain. If only she could understand. Todd didn't want to go home. I saw the side of his face. He was looking straight ahead. A sad look. Closed up, sort of. Then we turned in at the lake and he cheered up. Look at that water, Emily. Yes. Have you ever seen anything so blue? No. Nothing is blue except 
your eyes. Oh, you darling flatterer. <laughs> well, here's our old parking place. Isn't it awfully quiet? You know, Emily, we could live a whole lifetime and never find anything better than we have right here. He opened the door. I'll get some blankets out of the back. I sat there while he went around to the back. I was alone again. People were always going away and leaving me alone. Oh, now, now, put a brave face on it, Emily. Powder your face and fix your lips. I opened my purse and groped around for my lipstick. Oh, oh dear, I had wanted to spill like that. I reached down to pick up my things. Lipstick, compact. And my hand touched something. A little box. It was heavy. I read the words on the label. 38 caliber soft-nosed shells. Bullets. For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Mr. Robert Young and Miss Virginia Bruce in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Who's taking the hard knocks on this show, Emily or Todd? I don't know, Billy, but speaking of hard knocks, I still haven't gotten the lowdown from your mother on who, on the knocking about, she gave the car. Say, here's Frank Martin. Now, Frank, uh, maybe you can tell me what happened to my car this morning. Well, what could happen to your car, Hap? You've got auto light resistor spark plugs, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, but I've got a big dent in my fender, too. Say, Mr. Martin, what does the word resistor mean? Well, it's like this, Billy. Autolite ignition engineered a 10,000 ohm resistor right into the Autolite spark plug that permits a wider spark gap setting and maintains it far longer than in any other spark plugs. The Autolite resistor spark plug is the best thing that's happened in spark plugs in years. A great new development of Autolite ignition engineers working with the country's leading car and truck manufacturers. When you replace your narrow gap spark plugs with the sensational new wide gap Autolite resistor spark plugs, you can tell the difference in your car. You got advantages like smooth idling and saving gas. And friends, right now you can buy Autolite resistor spark plugs anywhere in the United States. So don't delay. Get a set of Autolite resistor spark plugs now. But Frank, Mary, Billy, somebody, please tell me what happened to the fender of my car. Shh, quiet, half. Here comes suspense. And now Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Robert Young and Miss Virginia Bruce in celebration. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Everything was so lovely until I found that little box. I opened it, looked down at the bullets in it. What did Todd want with bullets? The box was only half full. I could hear Todd still rummaging around in the back of the car put the cover back on the box when I heard him coming around to the side. All set? I've got the blankets. I held the box of bullets under my purse. Come on, darling, let's get out on that beach. You lead the way. Okay, okay. I followed Todd three or four steps. And then I let the box slip out of my hand. Here we are. I'll uh, uh, spread the blankets. Come on, Emily, let's curl up and take it easy. Mm. Uh, thank you. Ah, look at that lake. Todd, um, what were you going to do with those bullets in the car? What bullets? <laughs> that imagination of yours... Oh, but I saw them, held them in my hands. The box was about half full. Come on, dear. Close to me, here. Todd, I'm sure Darling, I saw... Darling, please. My head aches, Todd. No, rubbing's the thing. Oh, you're hurting me. I'm sorry, darling. Oh, no. no. Uh, something the matter? Oh, a man. Yes. Uh, what do you want? I heard her cry as I was passing. Well, she's all right. Mm-hmm. Uh, nice car you got over there. Yes. Thought the missus wasn't feeling well. She's all right. Lonely place here, huh? Well, I'll be getting along. Where did he come from? I thought we were alone here. Alone? We, we have so few moments together, Emily. 
I get so scared. I look it, don't I? Darling, why, when you came down the stairs today, you you were radiant. Was I? Was I really? You were beautiful. Why am I like that sometimes and sometimes... You were my life, Emily. Come here. Oh. Oh, Todd. Oh, you do want me. Mm. Kiss me again. Emily. Mm. Emily, in all the world, there could never be another woman like you. You've given me more happiness than... God. God, I dream of this. I, I live for it. Yes, but... Emily, I... Don. Emily, listen to me. Don, please. Darling, the doctor said... What doctor? You know, when you went to see the doctor. But that was ages ago. You all talk behind my back so I can't hear what you say. You and Mrs. Halleck. I just asked her how you were and you must believe I love you, Emily. Oh, oh I do. That's fine. Here's where we built a sand castle, remember? And the wave melted it. Oh, Todd, that day when I was caught in the undergrowth, Undertow. But I pulled you out, dear. I was thinking. I keep dreaming about that. Sinking down into the black and, and you not there. I'll be with you always, Emily. Oh, let's always. leave here, Todd. You said we'd go to all the places and celebrate. I mean, there'll be lots of people around. People? And, yes, it'll be fun. We can have dinner at the inn. And... No, it'll be crowded, Emily, and... Uh, say... Oh, it's that man again. Uh, did you lose these things? What things? This box of Bullets? Bullets? Found them in the sand, just a few steps from your car. Thought maybe you dropped them. I dropped them. See, I told you, Todd. Those are the bullets I found in the car. Is the box half full? Well, looks like somebody loaded a gun out of it. Thirty-eight caliber, soft-nosed shell, says on the box. Oh, I'll bet I know. I, I let Ernie take the car yesterday. Ernie? Yeah, he's uh, gone in for target practice. <laughs> Who's Ernie? Why, uh... He's... Maybe he got them for you. Yeah, I figured they were yours, mister. Look like they'd just been dropped beside your car up there. Oh, uh, thanks, thanks. Well, Emily, if we're going to the inn, we'd better get started. That was too close. She nearly caught me. But it's too soon, too soon for her to know. I've got to be careful. But I can't wait too long. I have to cut the celebration short. You wait here, Emily. It's been so long since we were here. I'd better see what it's like. All right. I'll be back in a minute. I was alone again. Oh, relax, Emily. If Todd didn't come out in a minute, I'd go in after him. What I needed was a cigarette. I opened the glove compartment. Handkerchiefs, map, flashlight, gloves. No cigarettes. I pulled out an envelope. An envelope addressed to Todd at his office. My personal. I unfolded the letter. Dear Mr. Ward, Dr. Kernitz today confirmed that Mrs. Ward's condition is becoming progressively worse, and she needs more personal attention than we can give her. And since we are not equipped to care for hypomanic, patients. We request that you make other arrangements for her at your earliest convenience. Sincerely, Bertha Halleck. Mrs. Halleck! I threw the letter back in the glove compartment and slammed the door. This place is terrible. Is it? It's all run down. We'll, uh... Drive out into the country, find a quiet spot. Oh, no, Todd. Drive into town. We can have dinner at the hotel. There'll be music and we can dance. You know, excitement isn't good for you. Please, Todd. Please take me Anything in. the matter here, mister? Uh, no, no, my wife isn't feeling, doesn't feel well. Something wrong, lady? No, no, I'm all right. Oh, let's drive into the hotel, Todd. Oh, well, Okay. Wonderful, darling. Wonderful. Let's uh, drink to us, dear. To us? Mm -hmm. Oh, Todd, you do really mean it. 
more than anything in the world. Would you get the order now, sir? Yes. Uh, what would you like, Emily? Roast beef, southern fried chicken, lobster thermidor, duck with orange? Um, I'll have the southern fried chicken. Good. I'm afraid the chicken is all gone, madam. Oh, that's the one thing I want. Southern fried chicken and everything that goes with it. I'm sorry, madame. Well, maybe there's just one order left. I'll see what I can do. Uh, you, sir? Uh, lobster thermidor. Yes, sir. <laughs> A rumba. Shall we dance? Oh, yes, let's. Come on. <laughs> the way your face lights up, darling. Being in your arms again. <laughs> Oh. Just relax, dear. Oh, uh, oh, excuse us, please. I'm sorry. Well, the music isn't right, and why is everybody bumping into Shh. us? Uh, let's let's go back to our table. All right. Oh, thank heaven. There was just one more order of chicken left, sir. <laughs> I'll serve you in a moment. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. Where's my purse? Right here, behind the flower bowl. And bulging full. <laughs> what have you got in there? Your letters. Oh, no. Yes, I read them over and over. You wrote this one from Omaha. Darling, you are my happiness. I can't live without uh, you. Emily, You're as necessary as the air I breathe. Emily, people are listening. Uh, better give me those letters. No, but they're mine. You wrote them to me. Of course, Emily. Don't you but mean I... what you said in them? Certainly I do. Only, please, quiet down here. Oh, that... Awful music. And those lights. Emily, here's the uh, waiter with our food. Uh oh. May I serve you, madame? Mm. What's that? Fried chicken. Oh, Todd, you know I never eat anything fried. What the lady insisted, sir. Southern fried chicken and everything that goes with it. Well, take, take it away. I'll pay for it. Yes. Oh, maybe this once won't hurt. Very good. Here you are, madame. The lobster, sir? Uh, thank you. Not very appetizing chicken, is it? Why not try it? Go ahead, darling. Mm. Oh, there's no taste to it. Why are all these people making so much noise? Todd, take me home. I, I'm not hungry. I, I want to go home. Emily, we sublet our house three months ago. Don't you remember when you... When I want. Darling, we have no... Emily, dear, you must realize that we no longer have a place. Todd After was talking, but I couldn't seem to hear what he was saying. Inside, I, I was all stirred up. The best thing we can do is, is get out of here. Come on, darling. We got up and left. Got into our car out on the parking lot. Where are those keys? Let's see, I... Todd, are you taking me home? We're going out where we can be together. Alone, to our lover's lane, remember? Where it's quiet and peaceful. No, 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 Todd, I, I want to go home. This is our eighth wedding anniversary, Emily. We're celebrating. Oh, Todd. Where are those keys? Well, uh, maybe they're in your top coat in the back seat. No, no, me... they're not there. What makes your coat so heavy? Oh. What are you doing with the revolver? Give it to me. I'll put it in my pocket so it... Oh, here are my keys. Todd, those bullets were... Emily, please. Now I see what you... Now I know. Yes, now she knows. There's no time to lose. I've got to drive fast, get there and do it. Only she could understand. Understand that it will be better this way. Better for both of us. <laughs> Emily. Try not to get so excited. But those bullets, you said they were Ernie's. Who's Ernie? Half an hour ago, I told you I loved you. Remember? Yes, I know you did, but... Well, I do. I love you more than living. Why are you slowing down? Here's our lover's lane. You used to call it our paradise, remember? It's so, so, so dark now. Here's our magic circle under our big tree. Todd, you're... Come, darling. Come into my arms. There. You do love me. You do want to be with me, don't you? Forever, Emily. The one way we can be together forever, dear, is... No, no. No, Todd. 
Put that gun down. I want to live with you. I have to tell you, darling. Listen carefully. You're not well, Emily. You're never going to be well again. Oh, yes, I will, Todd. Yes, I, I will. I'll, I'll be a real wife to you. I'll be everything you want me to be. I'll I can't be stand third... living without you. We'll go together. Together? Yes. Now, rest against me, sweetheart. <laughs> Close your eyes. There. Will it hurt much, Todd? Only an instant, dear. Oh, the gun is so cold on my temple. Quiet now. I'll be with you in a moment. No, no, take it away. Emily, you let's kill go. me and leave me let alone. Go. Don't, I promise God, you, don't. I won't you kill, you. kill you. I didn't. Stop. I won't go through with it. God, Emily, stop, stop it! Stop it, Emily! <laughs> Slowly, I became aware of pain in my head. There was a smell, like a hospital. I fought to remember what had happened. I... I'd fallen downstairs. Oh, no, that had been a long time ago. There was a gun, Todd and I struggling. That was it. Then I heard Todd talking. Doctor, I... I want to tell you what happened. You I see... think I know, Mr. Ward. Your wife suffered a head injury some time ago, which caused the bone to press on the frontal lobe of her brain, causing acute hypomania. Isn't that right? Yes, but I used to see... I've seen many people, Mr. Ward, whose loved ones faced a living death, so I can imagine your thoughts. Yes, but you must understand, I meant to end it. Mm -hmm. For both of us. But when the time came, I couldn't. I, I just couldn't. Well, what happened was an accident. A very fortunate accident, because the bullet which uh, struck your wife's head tonight did what medical science could not do. Huh? The operations necessary to remove the bullet served two purposes, and your speed in getting her here saved both her life and her sanity. She'll... she'll be all right. Uh, after a couple of weeks of rest, and your wife is no longer a hypomanic, Mr. Ward. If I were you, I'd give thanks to whatever fate guided that bullet along the course it took. Right then, I knew that everything was wonderful, even the pain in my head. And Todd was by my side, bending over me. Emily. Oh, Todd. Emily, darling, can... can you ever forgive me? Forgive you, darling? After what the doctor said? Oh, Todd. I just couldn't live without you. I wanted us always to be together. And now we will be. Darling, isn't this our eighth wedding anniversary? Yeah. Well, then, let's celebrate. Thank you, Robert Young and Virginia Bruce, for such splendid performances tonight. Our stars will return in just a moment. What a show! And what a wallop before that happy ending. Yeah, but I still want to know who walloped my fender. Your fender hat? Yeah. Oh, that. Well, one of the boys brushed your car when he was turning around after the lodge meeting last night. Well, I'll be... I give up, Frank. Go on. Here's an important message for Autolite spark plug dealers everywhere. When you install the new Wide Gap Autolite resistor spark plugs, set the spark plug gap at 0 .040 for all cars. Let me repeat. Set the spark plug gap at 0 .040 for all cars. And friends, get a set of the new Wide Gap Autolite resistor spark plugs tomorrow if you want the improved operating performance and gas saving that Autolite resistor spark plugs have already given millions of car owners. Don't delay. Get a set of new Autolite resistor spark plugs right away. And remember, Autolite means spark plugs. Ignition engineered resistor spark plugs. Autolite means batteries. Stay full batteries. Autolite means ignition system. The lifeline of your car. In its 26 nationwide plants, Autolite manufactures bumpers, die castings, horns, instruments and gauges, 
lights, ornamental plastics, and more than 400 other automotive, aviation, and marine products. All are famous the world over for their Autolite engineered dependability. And now, here is Mr. Robert Young. It's been a pleasure to appear again on Suspense, and doubly a pleasure when it meant co-starring with beautiful Virginia Bruce. Thank you, Bob. It's been a pleasure for me, too. But there's another pleasure I'm looking forward to, hearing next week's Suspense. We all are. Because next week, Edward G. Robinson will star in an unusual story called The Man Who Wanted to Be Edward G. Robinson. Another gripping study in... Suspense. Virginia Bruce may soon be seen in the Paramount picture, Night Has a Thousand Eyes. And Robert Young appears soon in his latest RKO production, Baltimore Escapade. Tonight's suspense play was written by Phyllis Parker and Arnold Marquis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leder. In the coming weeks, suspense will present such stars as Ray Milland, William Powell, Lucille Ball, John Garfield, and many others. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. And next Thursday, same time, hear Edward G. Robinson in The Man Who Wanted to Be Edward G. Robinson. This is the Autolite Suspense Show. Drive as if your life depends on it. It does. Good night. Switch to Autolite. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, present Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Robert Taylor in the house in Cypress Canyon, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense. Radio's outstanding theater of thrills is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those better-tasting California wines enjoyed by more Americans than any other wine. For friendly entertaining, for delightful dining. Yes, right now, a glassful would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Robert Taylor, star of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's Undercurrent, in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! Merry Christmas, Jerry. How's the real estate business? Oh, kind of early with your greeting, aren't you, Sam? Well, I gotta get them in sometime. I may not see you again until next Christmas. Well, if this real estate racket gets any crazy, I'll be dead by next Christmas. <laughs> I'm glad you could get up here, though, Sam. What's on your mind, Jerry? Uh, you, you'll probably shoot me when you hear it, Sam, because I'm probably nuts. But, but doggone it, you're a detective and you're my pal, and I just had to tell somebody. Well, you sound like it's serious. That's just it. I, I don't know what it is, Sam, but... Now, listen, you you know we're agents for a group of houses up in Cypress Canyon. Mm -hmm. Those places that were started before the war never got finished. Oh, yeah. All I got in were the foundations, just mm -hmm. concrete and a couple of beams. Well, they've been finished now. In fact, I'm putting up the for rent on the last of them today. Well, what do you want? Police protection from the mob? <laughs> listen, Sam, this house that I'm talking about, it's got a number now, uh, 2256. But before, when the men went back to work on it about three months ago... Well, they just started when the foreman on the job brought me a shoebox that he'd found up on a beam. And this box had a, a what do you call it, a, a manuscript in it, a story, kind of, all written out. Yeah. Well, he gave me the thing. I read it. I didn't think much about it. I put it in my desk. But the other day, and I happened to drive by there, I saw the number on the house and what the house looked like. I thought of this manuscript. And, well, I don't like it, that's all. There's something funny about it. What's funny about it? Well, I, 
Mind you, this thing was found in an unfinished house in Cypress Canyon. House that was only just started building. All it's, right. Uh, well, listen, Sam, I want to read it to you if you got the time, and you'll see what I mean. All oh, right, shoot. <clears throat> well, here's how it begins. Uh, to whom it may concern... My reasons for setting down on paper what follows here will be abundantly clear. What here will be abundantly clear to anyone into whose possession it may fall. First, let me say that I'm a very ordinary person. My name is James A. Woods. I'm 35 years old. By profession, a chemical engineer. My wife, Ellen, was a school teacher when I met and married her in Indiana seven years ago. There's nothing in the past life of either one of us to suggest remotely any cause or reason for the dreadful thing that has invaded our lives. Our married life has been in no way different from that of millions of other average, reasonably happy, and congenial families. Three months ago, I was ordered by my firm to take charge of a rather minor project in Los Angeles, uh, Hollywood to be exact. The order was a sudden one. There'd been no time to secure accommodations and... Conditions being what they are, the inevitable result was that until day before yesterday, we'd been living in the cramped quarters of one of those characteristic California motels. Needless to say, most of our spare time had been devoted to a search for something more permanent and comfortable, but the fruits of these efforts had been financially and in every other way a geometrical progression of discouragement. Until last Saturday afternoon, only four days before Christmas... We were driving into town on our way to a movie when Ellen saw it. Jim, look. What? That sign in front of that real estate office. Oh, yeah. But yeah. don't you see what it says? For rent, furnished, two-bedroom house, close in, immediate occupancy. Yeah, uh-huh. Aren't you going to stop? Oh, Ellen, you know a sign like that. It mean right out in plain sight in front of a real estate office. Oh, yeah, but Jim... Either they want $600 a month... We'll or... never know until we ask. Well, if it's any good at all, there are probably 50 people fighting for it right back there now. Well, honey, there's no harm in trying. Now, is there? You really want to go back? Oh, it's probably foolish, but what can we lose? Okay. Oh, darling, come on, cheer up. How do you know? Maybe our luck's changed. Maybe fate's going to give us a nice new house for a Christmas present. Sorry to bother you, but we just happened to see that for rent sign outside. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, I hung it outside just this minute. Is... is the house available? Why, sure, sure it is. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is James A. Woods, and this is my wife, Ellen. How to do? Wow. Looks like it's fixing to rain. Yes, so it does, doesn't it? Well, it was one of those things. The real estate agent had just been authorized to rent the place by mail that morning, and he'd hardly had time to look at it himself and put up his sign when we drove up. It was just an ordinary little California house about halfway up Cypress Canyon, number 2256. Just an ordinary, undistinguished little house. The agent didn't know much about it. Construction on it had been stopped by the war, and it had just been completed and furnished lately. It had been vacant while somebody's estate was being settled, and... Now it was owned by a bank in Sacramento. Of course, we didn't. We didn't got care this about key in the mail along with the authorization to rent. Only one there is. Of course, you can have duplicates made. Yeah, seems to stick a little. Oh, no, there it is. Doesn't sound as though that door had ever been opened. Well, a little oil on the hinges will fix that all right. Oh, sure. Now, now here's your living room. Furniture's a little dusty, of course. You've got to expect that. It's good furniture, though, you see? Benson Brothers. Yes, uh-huh. Now, over here's a little den. Panel, you see? Radio, fireplace. Really a very attractive little room, particularly for a man. Uh-huh, yep. Now, the, the bedroom's off the living room here. Everything's all on one floor, you understand? Uh-huh. It's uh, quite nice, I think. Yes, uh-huh. You can see you get the morning sun here. There's a view of the canyon through these front windows. we got cross ventilation. That's about all there was to it. It wasn't the best place in the world. It was small and badly built, but what would you have done? We took it with as little inspection as that. It was the Saturday before Christmas. And the very same evening, we were struggling up the steps from the road with suitcases and boxes and armloads of clothes and all the endless bric-a-brac that people collect and never know they have until they move. 
Ellen began unpacking, and I began moving things around and taking the worst of the pictures off the wall, doing all the little things that everybody does when they move into a new place and try to give it something of their own Don't personality. Don't be such a sour so, puss. You know, it's a roof over our heads for Christmas. That's more than we ever thought we'd get, isn't it? Now... What in the world are we going to do with those two pictures? Uh, why don't we just leave them where they are? Jim, we can't. They're too awful. Well, all right. Put them in the closet, then. I can't. Both the closets are jammed full. No, I mean the other one in the little alcove off the den. At least there's a door there. I suppose it's a closet. Yeah. I don't know. If that isn't a commentary on the housing problem, huh? A woman moving into a house without even knowing where all the closets are. Take the pictures down, will you, honey? Bring them in here. Okay, okay. I guess you'll have to help me with this door. I can't get it open. Let me see it. Well, of course you can't, silly. It's locked. Where are those keys we found on the desk? Mm, here they are. Mm, no, nope. not this one. Sure, this one won't work. No, nope. feels like an awful solid door for a closet. Oh, and that's one solid door in the house. No, nope, this one won't do it either. Well, we'll... Just have to get a locksmith up here on Monday. I'll put the pictures behind the desk, okay? Yeah, yeah, all right. Jim, if you could just help me move this armchair, huh? Oh, Ellen, will you let it go until tomorrow? You know what time it is? Oh, but, honey, I'd like to get the place looking just a yeah, little bit. Yeah, but it's bit... almost midnight. In fact, it's, it's exactly... What was that? <laughs> Tomcat, I guess, out in the brush somewhere. Sounded near. <laughs> oh, hope that doesn't go on all night. Well, there's much we can do about it. Come on, Ellen. I'm dead tired. All right, Jim. All right. Where'd you put the toothpaste, honey? It's right in the medicine cabinet. Oh, yeah. Jim, we ought to get some firewood tomorrow. You know a fire in that living room would make all the difference Make's in the world. Cab, Sunday. Well, Monday then. Jim, I think red curtains are what we need, don't you? Mm-hmm. Mm. You know, just at least for the living room. Anyway, the ones in there now have just got to come down. Yeah, I suppose they do. What do you think of red? Well, I guess it's all... Jim. That's some tomcat. Jim, it... It sounded in the house. Oh, now, how could it be in the house, Ellen? We've been over every inch of the house. Except the closet. Now, how could a cat or anything else be in the closet that's been locked up for over a year? Oh, I don't know. It's... Yeah, it's probably under the house. A wildcat or mountain lion or something. I hear they have them in California. Jim, I don't like well, it. Well, neither do I like it, but there's nothing we can do about it tonight. Well, maybe we ought to call somebody, the police or oh, some neighbor. Oh, don't neighbors. be silly, Ellen. You act like a kid. Come on, let's go to bed, huh? Well, all right. I suppose it is silly. Jimmy, did you lock the door? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can I turn out the lights now? Yeah. All right. Good night, Ellen. Sleep tight. Good night, Jim. I don't know what time it was, perhaps an hour, perhaps only a half hour later. My mind was in that hazy borderland between sleep and a dream that's still part of consciousness. <coughs> then I was awake. <coughs> Ellen, are you all right? Yes. Did you have a nightmare or something? No. I heard it too. Well, that didn't sound like any cat. Put on the light. Yeah. It, it seemed to be out there, Jim, in, in the house somewhere. Well, I'm going to look into this. Jim, you be careful. Come on. Where's, where's my shotgun? In the den, I think. Jim. What? There. There's something wet. What? Wet? Running from under the closet door. Sticky. Hey, Ellen, don't. Don't touch it. I had to. Jim, it's blood. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Robert Taylor in the house in Cypress Canyon. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of suspense, this is Ken Niles for Roma Wines. These days before Christmas are busy ones indeed, yet smart hostesses everywhere find time for shopping and distinguished home entertaining later. The secret? Magnificent Grand Estate Wines. Presented by Roma, America's greatest vintner, Grand Estate Wines add distinction to your hospitality on a moment's notice. 
Make your holiday welcome, effortless, and in perfect taste. The brilliant clarity, full fragrance, and mellow taste of Grand Estate wines please discriminating people everywhere. For Grand Estate wines, limited bottlings by Roma, are born of choicest grapes, then patiently guided to superb taste richness by Roma Vintner skill, necessary time, and America's finest winemaking resources. Delight your guests with Grand Estate California Wines for entertaining, medium sherry, ruby port, or golden muscatel. For dining, burgundy or sauterne. So insist on Grand Estate Wines and enjoy the crowning achievement of vintner skill. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Robert Taylor as James A. Woods with Kathy Lewis as his wife, Ellen, in the house in Cypress Canyon. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. It cannot be too difficult to understand from the foregoing why I've taken the pains to set down in writing the events related here. To find in one's newly rented house a closet which cannot be opened is in itself certainly no great cause for alarm. But to be awakened in the stillness of the night by unearthly cries within that house, to find oozing from under that closet door something that is unquestionably blood, that's another matter. Perhaps others might have been braver than we. Suffice it only to say that we got out of the house in something very close to a panic and only returned when we had the moral support of two stalwart Los Angeles policemen. You uh, just moved in here, you say? That's right, officer. You can, you can see we're still unpacking and the place has been empty right along before that? Yeah, I don't know much about that part of it. You could check all that with a real estate agent, though. Well, uh, <clears throat> where is this closet? Oh, it's it's right in here, officer. And and the blood, the blood is... Where? Where's the blood? Jim? Officer, I, I swear to you, there was blood on the floor less than an hour ago. I, I saw it. Uh-huh. It, it was running out from under that door. We heard that noise, and we got up, and then we saw it. The, the door was locked. Locked, huh? Well, it seems to be all right now. Hey, uh, you folks aren't trying to be funny, are you? Is, isn't there anything in it? No, ma'am, there is not. Look, officer, we're a reputable people. You can call my firm. They'll tell you all about me. There's nothing wrong with this closet. Walls are solid. No trap doors. If you think I'm lying... You... I didn't say that, mister. Oh, you probably did hear some sort of a noise, and you got a little panicky, and... What, uh... what about the blood? It got on my hand. It isn't there now, is it? Yes. Where? I, I feel it. <laughs> now, you folks, just take it easy. You know, you're liable to hear all kinds of noises up in these canyons at night. You're uh, from the east, you say? Uh, yeah. I'm, I, I'm sorry, officer. Ah, oh, that's all right. That's all right. If you have any real trouble, call on us any time. All right. Well, good night. Good night. Good night. Hey. <laughs> You ought to have this door fixed. That's enough to scare you. Yeah, we're uh, we're going to have it fixed. We didn't say much about it after that. There wasn't much that could be said. The next day, I went down to a lot and bought a little Christmas tree and some trimmings, and we tried to pretend we were cheerful, but there was an uneasiness between us that had never been there before. Ellen seemed tired and listless. Several times during the day, I noticed her washing her hands with a, with a brush, scrubbing the one that had touched the blood. That night, we each took a sleeping pill and went to bed. It was sometime after midnight when I was suddenly wide awake and staring into the darkness. In some way, I, I knew at once and instinctively what had awakened me. Ellen was not in her bed nor in the room. The nameless thing I feared gripped at my heart until I could scarcely breathe. I opened the bedroom door and started through the house, putting on every light that I could find. There was not much to search, but I searched thoroughly. The, the living room, the kitchen, bathroom, den, even the garage. And all the time, the dread of looking where I knew at last I must look. For I think I knew from the very first time where I'd find her. It must have been a full minute that I stood before that closet door. Then, 
I opened it. She stood there rigid, her arms at her sides, her fingers extended like claws. Her hair was over her face, her eyes stared out of it. Her lips were drawn back in a grin like an animal at bay. For a moment I was frozen with the horror of it. And I stretched out my hand. <laughs> Very deliberately, she turned her head and sunk her teeth until they met into the flesh of my forearm. I'd raised my hand to strike at her, but already she'd relaxed her hold and gone utterly limp. She would have fallen unless I'd caught her. I carried her into the bedroom and laid her on the bed. Strangely, at that moment, my only thought was how I might revive her. Until I saw that it was, it was not a faint, but a sleep that she'd fallen into. A sleep as deep and heavy as though she'd been drugged. And so I left her. But for me, that night, there was no sleep. Jim? Yes, Ellen? Oh. What are you doing up so early? Oh, I, I got a little restless. i make some coffee. Oh. Oh, I had the most wonderful sleep. And I feel so rested. Do you? Mm-hmm. Jim. What? What's the matter with your arm? Oh, I I just heard it. Well, honey, it's it's terribly swollen. Let me see it. No, it, it's all right, Ellen. Oh, it isn't all right. You've got to see Dr. Wesley right away. Sure, I, I will. No, I now, will. you promise me, Jim, that you'll go the first thing this morning. How'd it happen? Oh, I, uh... There was a dog. A dog? Yeah, I I heard him trying to chew through the screen door. I went out to chase him away, and he bit me. Well, you mean there was all that racket, and I didn't even wake up? No, Ellen, you, you didn't even wake up. It was clear to me that Ellen knew nothing of what had transpired the night before. I went to my office that morning and made a pretense of going over routine business if only to restore my mind to some semblance of calm by the sight and sound of common, familiar things. Pain in my arm had become a persistent, dull throbbing. I made a late appointment with Dr. Wesley. He treated my arm with something of an arched eyebrow, and he said, Well, I've never seen anything quite like it before. That is such a rapid onset of infection. <laughs> It was dark when I left his office. I hadn't realized it was so late. Driving home, my car seemed, seemed sluggish until I saw the needle on the dashboard and realized that I was pushing it to the utmost of its speed. And I was racing home to prevent, prevent something before it was too late, before the darkness had conspired against me. For somehow I already knew with certainty that it was the darkness and the night that I had to fear. The curves of the canyon seemed endless. And then the cold fear leaped up inside me. My house, too, was dark. I went slowly up the stone steps in the road, looking, praying for some sign of light or life. There was none. The house was empty. Ellen was gone. I, I looked with the same self-torturing thoroughness, and in that closet first of all, knowing as I did so that it was hopeless. And so, alone in that empty house, I waited, powerless and helpless now, deadened in thought and will, empty as the house itself, save only for the overwhelming sense of a terrible foreboding. For some time in the early hours of the morning, I snapped on the radio, shortwave. Why? Surely a minor question now. I only know that I did. And then I heard it. Car 58, car 58, go to Laurel Canyon, the 4,000 block. A report that a man has been injured or attacked. Condition thought to be critical... Ambulance will follow. That is all. I was there almost before the police, edging my way through the little crowd, staring down at the man lying there in his white uniform under the street light. Yeah, the milkman, poor guy. I heard him scream, but when I got here, just like this, it's all nothing right, stand talk. back, stand right. back. Please, please stand back. Well, you again. I, I heard it on the radio. I, I live just down the road. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Well, what happened? Well, take a look. Maybe you can tell us. He was dead. And he was lying on his back. And his throat had been torn out as though by the fangs of some wild animal. 
It is now Christmas Eve, or rather Christmas morning, for it's a little after midnight. I've been waiting here, here in the stillness of this empty house for nearly 24 hours, waiting for the end. Already once tonight I've heard that dreadful wailing cry somewhere in the hills. I've nailed up the closet door, but that I, I know is childish and useless. My arm is horribly swollen and turning black, but that's nothing. It's another end that I foresee, as, as surely as other men foresee the rising of the sun. I hear the cry again. It's nearer now. I shall leave these notes in a sealed envelope and put it in a shoebox, in the hope that someone will give credence to these dark and terrible events, if indeed such nameless horrors can ever yield to mortal understanding. <laughs> As for myself, I feel no longer any fear or even sorrow. Only a desire that the end and the thing that I must do may come soon. And it will be soon, I know. Yes. But there is someone at the door. What do you make of it, Sam? <laughs> it's quite a yarn. But what of it? That's what I thought. Now, listen, that's not quite all of it. Huh? Clip to it's a newspaper clip. Listen. Hollywood, December the 26th. Police reported what was apparently a case of murder and suicide in Cypress Canyon sometime in the early hours of the morning. The victims were James A. Woods, a chemical engineer, and his wife, Ellen. Preliminary investigation indicates that Mrs. Woods was killed by the blast of a shotgun in the hands of her husband, who then turned the weapon upon himself. That she fought desperately for her life, however, was evidenced by the disorder of the room and the severe lacerations inflicted upon her husband about the neck and arms. This is the second tragedy to be reported in Cypress Canyon within 24 hours, the other being the unexplained death of Frank Polanski, a milkman. Well, no such murders or whatever they were ever occurred, if that's what's worrying you. The clipping, well, you have those things printed up, you know. No, no, it's not that, Sam. That story was found in an unfinished house in Cypress Canyon. No number, no nothing, just a framework. Uh-huh. Now that house is finished. When I drove by it today... Well, that's what stopped me, Sam, because it all fits. Now that it's finished, it is the house in the story, the same construction, the same vines and creepers on the lawn, even the same number. So what? A guy who knows roughly what this house is going to be like writes a yarn and loses it or something. Did he know the place was going to be listed for rental today, the Saturday before Christmas? <laughs> oh, Jerry, coincidence. Two bits you find the guy next door is a ghost story writer or something, and he's been wondering for a year what happened to that thing he wrote. Okay. Okay, coincidence. <laughs> Well, I, I'm sorry I bothered you, Sam. <laughs> Don't be silly. I liked it. It's a good yarn. Uh, that the uh, for rent sign you were talking about? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to put it up outside now. Uh-huh. Well, so long, Jerry, and Merry Christmas again. No, well, thanks, Sam. <laughs> I guess I was kind of silly, all right. Huh? <laughs> Listen, when a guy named uh, whatever it is, Woods, with a wife named Ellen, comes in to rent that place from you, then you can start worrying. <laughs> yeah. Well, so long, Sam. So long, Jerry. Come in. Oh, we're sorry to bother you, but we just happened to see that for rent sign outside. Well, yeah, I hung it out just this minute. Is... is the house available? Oh, sure, sure it is. Let me introduce myself. My name is James A. Woods, and this is my wife, Ellen. How do well, looks like it's fixing to... Yes, it does, doesn't it? Oh, 
Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, selected for your pleasure from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines. Tonight's show marks the third birthday of Suspense on the air, and this is Ken Niles asking our star of the evening, Robert Taylor, to help us celebrate. Why didn't you tell me before, Ken? If I'd only known, I'd have baked a cake. Well, Bob, all suspense parties are surprise parties. As an old hand on suspense, uh, you know that in our plays, the tables are usually turned on the star. So tonight, although it's our birthday, we're going to give you a present. Here it is, a gift basket of Grand Estate California wines from Roma, America's greatest vintner, to our distinguished anniversary guest, Robert Taylor. Thanks, Ken. You turn a nice table. And you can set a nice table with Grand Estate Burgundy in your basket, Bob. For Grand Estate Burgundy means rare dining pleasure. Adds memorable distinction to holiday dinner. Even everyday meals are outstanding in taste when Grand Estate Burgundy is served. Yes, all Grand Estate wines presented by Roma are limited bottlings of outstanding taste excellence. That I know about Grand Estate wines, Ken. But did you know that for Grand Estate wines, Roma selects only the choicest grapes? Then the ancient skill of Roma master vintners, necessary time, and America's finest winemaking resources guide the cuvee of this grape treasure to rich taste luxury. That's why discriminating wine users everywhere look to Grand Estate wines as the crowning achievement of vintner skill. Reason enough. And now, Ken, who's all set to star on Suspense next Thursday? It's that very wonderful actress and wonderful girl, Miss Susan Peters. Susan will appear as a young lady in straitened circumstances who finds herself mistaken for a very rich young lady and who is forced into continuing the deception with murder as a result. I'll certainly make it a point to listen. And uh, before I go, I'd like to thank this really great company of actors who have played with me tonight, and particularly Kathy Lewis, who played Ellen. Thank you, Bob. Tonight's original suspense play was written by Robert L. Richards. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Miss Susan Peters as star of Suspense. Produced by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Herbert Marshall in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents a new radio adaptation of one of the most famous suspense stories ever written, Mary Godwin Shelley's Frankenstein. Our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. mend my fences if it's not the senator. How's it look for you, senator? Uh, uh, going to cast your ballot tomorrow, Harlow? Why, senator, I'd no more forget to vote than forget to winterize my car. And now's the time to do it. Get the oil and grease changed, put in antifreeze, inspect the battery cable. And check the spark plugs, too. Right, Johnny Plug Check. The spark plugs are the very heart of your car's ignition system. And when they're right, your chances of starting, even in coldest weather, are better than ever. Well, I'll visit my Autolite spark plug dealer, Harlow. Do that, Senator, because he's the expert on cleaning and adjustment. And if replacements are needed, he'll recommend those world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, either standard or resistor type. To quickly learn the location of your nearest Autolite spark plug dealer, phone Western Union by number and ask for operator 25. And remember... From bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents transcribed Frankenstein, starring Mr. Herbert Marshall, and hoping once again to keep you in suspense. Hello, Victor. Hello, Mary. The Reverend Inn? 
Out in the garden as usual. Do you want me to call him? No, thanks. I'll go out. Well, all right. Tell him not to get too dirty. We're supposed to play croquet with the McDonald's at five. I'll tell him. When's Elizabeth coming home? Tomorrow or, or Tuesday, I think. You both have to come over for dinner. Love to Mary. See you later. Hi. <laughs> oh, you're just in time to give me a hand. Whew. Now oh, these Indian summers, hot, too sticky. James, i got to talk to you. Well, of course. What, anything wrong? You know, you haven't looked too good for the past month or so. Something on your mind? Yes. Oh, well, then. Yeah, let's go in the house. I'll get you a beer. We can talk. No, no, not in the house. Do you mind if we walk? Oh, of course not. Oh, wait a moment. I put my pipe over here. There we are. Might get some rain. Hope so. I won't have to play croquet. That's a nice game. James? Oh, look now, we're friends. You know you can speak to me. What's the matter? One of your patients die? You made a mistake, perhaps? No, nothing like that. Perhaps it's worse. I'm not sure. Has it anything to do with Elizabeth going away? In a way, yes. Oh, my favorite place. You know, Victor, I think of most of my sermons standing here looking across the valley. Lovely, isn't it? Got a match? Oh, thanks. Listen, I've been doing an experiment. It's very complicated. And I've almost finished. Well, that's wonderful. I think I'm a little afraid of it. I don't know. I've tried to think it out myself. I can't find the answer. Go on. You believe in God, don't you? Oh, I... I mean, because I don't go to church, you don't think that I don't believe, do you? I don't think that at all. You're a good man. I want you to promise me something. You've got to promise that you'll never breathe a word of what I'm about to tell you. You have my word. You swear? I don't usually break my word. Oh, I'm sorry. Look, I... I've made something. It's tremendous. It's impossible. But I think I've done it. And it goes against everything you believe, James. What? Oh, what have you done? I've made a... a thing. I, I don't understand. I put it together. Heart, brain, nerves, muscle, everything. I've done it. Now do you understand? A complete body. And you're upset because of that? You think that you've done something wrong? But... Oh, you're a surgeon. What you've done will help to save a life. If you've learned more about the human body, this experiment can't be wrong. It can only do good. Oh, I shouldn't worry. Last night, I made it move. I'm not certain, but I think I can give it life. Absolute life. Now do you see why I'm afraid? I've created a man. <laughs> I, uh, I'd better call Mary. She'll be worried. All right, but... Uh, I, I won't say anything. Hello, Mary? No, I'm with Victor. Now, listen, dear, I'm afraid we'll have to put off the McDonald's. Yes, I know. Well, Mary, I, I have something very important to discuss with Victor. It can't wait. Yes, dear. No, no, don't wait supper. I'll have something over here. Yes, I will. Goodbye. You don't have to see this thing if you don't want to, James. What is it? In my lab. I had an addition built on. I'm the only one who has a key. I uh, don't say I believe what you've told me, but... Uh... How do you know you can make it live? I mean, is it anything more than galvanic action? You'll see. I lock it. I always do. Oh. Is that the addition over there? Yes. Hmm. 
dark. There aren't any windows. It's better that way. Before I show you, I want to explain. This is what started it. It was mostly an accident. One of the kids brought in his dog. It had been run over, killed. He wouldn't believe it was dead. He expected me to bring it back. I gave it a shot in the heart. And then another with this stuff. A compound I've fooled with for a long time. Yes? The dog came back to life. Just for a moment. How do you know the dog was dead? No, it was. It had been for two hours. All that happened three years ago. You've been experimenting on things ever since? Yes. It's wrong. I don't know. No, it's wrong. You don't have to stay, James. What are you going to do? Try to bring it to life? I've got to. I've got to try. Then why did you come to me? I wanted to tell you. I had to tell someone you're my friend. I'm a minister. I preach and believe in the word of God. Do you want to see it? No. No, I don't, but I must. It's not terrible to look at. I've done a pretty good job on it. But it isn't quite finished. I'm not quite done with the face. Oh, my... Well? No. No, Victor. Bury it. Let it be at peace. Don't do it. Even if you can, and I can't imagine it possible, don't. Don't, don't even try. Do you realize what it would mean to me, to the world? Standing here with you, looking at that, it's easy to imagine anything. I don't want to. Put it to rest, Victor. Forget it. That's just it. I can't. Not until I find out one way or the other. Watch. What are you going to do? I'm going to show you what happened last night. I don't want to see. I don't care. I know better. Oh, listen to me, Victor. This this mustn't go on. You've got to stop it. Not yet. Not until I find out. Does Elizabeth know what you're doing? No. Why did you send her away? I didn't want her here when I made the last test. Because you're ashamed. You know it's wrong. You know what she'd think. I'm not ashamed. I think I'm a little frightened at the incredible greatness of what I've done. It's bigger than anything since the world began. If it moves, if you prove your point to me, will you will you stop then? Will you destroy it? The formulas, whatever papers you have, destroy all of it, will you? I don't know. Hand me that hypodermic, will you? No. All right. There. If I say I believe you, Victor, if... You don't have to be afraid of it. It couldn't hurt you, you know. There's only enough of this stuff to stimulate a small portion of its brain. I'm not afraid of it. I'm afraid for us all. I've never preached to you, Victor. It moved its left foot last night. Then the right. I'm going to try the arm now. Move the light over, please. Thanks. Watch carefully. Only takes a few seconds. Now. I know. That's the way it was yesterday. The movement only lasts for a moment, though. That's all. I... I... I, I don't know what to say. I, I don't even think I understand what I've seen, except that it's terrible. Because you don't understand or because of what it means? I'm afraid, if you like. I'm afraid for you, for what you've done thing lying there. You've, you've got no right. I won't allow... Oh, what's that? What? Listen. Stethoscope. It's impossible. There wasn't enough... Breathing, Victor. What have you done? The thing's alive. Auto 
Spotlight is bringing you Mr. Herbert Marshall in Frankenstein. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Marlowe, who's this Johnny Plugcheck who's always electioneering about spark plugs? Why, Senator, Johnny is a helpful hinter fighting old man winter. He's the blithe reminder to wise motorists that now's the time to visit your Autolite spark plug dealer to get ready for the cold driving days ahead. Change the oil and grease, put in antifreeze, inspect the battery cable. And check those important spark plugs, too. Because when your spark plugs are right, your chances of starting, even in coldest weather, are better than ever. And if my Autolite spark plug dealer finds my spark plugs need replacing, Harlow... Why, if they're worn out, he'll recommend a set of the world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, Senator. Like the amazing Autolite resistor spark plug. It's one of the greatest advancements in spark plugs for automotive use in the past 20 years. When you have a set installed in your car, you'll get double spark plug life, smoother engine performance, and quick starts, as compared to spark plugs without a built-in resistor. So, friends, visit your Autolite spark plug dealer soon. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now... Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Herbert Marshall in Elliot Lewis's production of Frankenstein, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. It didn't have enough. It couldn't help. Ten cc, ten yesterday. Unless the drug's accumulative. Maybe that's it. His eyes are open. What are you going to do? Now? Listen to his heart again. It's got to be destroyed. You've got to put an end to it. It's inhuman. Don't you see what you're doing? You can't give it a soul. How do you know? You can't give it. How do you know what I can give it? I've given it life, haven't I? It sees, it breathes, moves, perhaps hears. Yes. Does it hear? Ha! Look, did you see that? It blinked, the head jerked, it hears. It's aware of sound. Does it feel pain? Don't, Victor. It's not an animal. You've formed it like a man. Give it the dignity of one. I won't let you do that to it. I've gone this far, James. Put down the scalpel. What are you going to prove by that? I think you must be mad. I don't interfere with your work, James. Why? There's someone at the door. Yes. I think I'd better strap it down on the table. You won't forget your promise, will you? I'm sorry I gave my word. I'm sorry you ever told me about this. I feel I'm as guilty as you are now. Whatever took you so long? Hello, James. Oh. Hello, Elizabeth. Darling, I tried to call from the station, but the line's out of order. Oh, I'm sorry, dear. Did you have a nice time? Lovely. Everybody sends their love. That's good. <laughs> what have you two been up to? How's Mary, James? Oh, very well, thank you. <laughs> what a fine pair of sober sides you are. What did you do, darling? Break one of my good dishes? I knew I shouldn't have left you alone. Well... What are we standing in the hall for? Let's go Elizabeth, in the Elizabeth, uh, uh, I must be going. Mary will be wondering, particularly if the phone's out of order. It's raining very hard. Oh, no, no, I'll be all right. You'll take an umbrella. There's one in the kitchen. Are you going to tell her? No. You won't unstrap it from the table, will you? Not yet. All right, I'll try to come back later. I want to think. About what? You've changed since you came to see me this afternoon. You really don't care what I think now, do you? I suppose not. Thanks anyway, James. Are you going to let it live? That's funny from you. Have I the right to kill it? You've already done something you had no right to do. Something that you don't even understand. The creation of man isn't your job, it isn't mine. 
Oh, I know your bright scientific mind's laughing Here's at me. Here's the umbrella, James. But I wish you'd wait until the storm blows over. No, I, I really must get back. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'll, I'll return it tomorrow. Uh, goodbye. Well, what's the matter with him? Have you been arguing religion again, Victor? No, dear. Look, I'm doing a little work in the lab. It's rather important. Do you mind? What is going on, Victor? There's something. No, dear, nothing at all. There is... I know there is. What's the matter? Nothing, dear, really. I... I've got to get back to work now. the straps. It got off the table. It broke the straps. It's just standing there looking at me. What do I do? Talk to it? What do I say? Can it understand I've done it? I've done it? It's almost perfect. Muscular control. Coordination. I wish I'd finished the face though. It must be terribly strong. That's odd. It's not over average size. Now what? Can you understand what I say? Do you feel any pain? Are you hungry? I'm a man like you. You are a man. Do you understand? This is a mirror. You can see yourself in it. Look. It's all right. It's all right. It's angry. But it doesn't show anger in its face. There's emotion, though. It sees ugliness and is afraid. I'll have to get it back on the table, put it to sleep. That's the best way. Then use a stronger strap or chain. The eyes, just staring, they seem watery. What a marvel it is, though. I want you to come over here and sit down. Do you hear me? Come here and sit down. Come here. No, don't touch that. No, stop it. Stop it, put it down. to you. Who broke the window? The window. Oh, Victor. What's the matter, dear? What's happened? Did you see anyone? No. Did someone break in? Elizabeth, don't ask me any questions. Just do what I ask. Get your coat on. But why? Th- I'm taking you over to the Gibsons. I want you to stay there. Oh, why? Why? What is it? Oh, Victor, please. And I can't... I can't tell you about it now. You may have to stay there all night. Hurry, please. We've got to call the police. No, they'll shoot it. I don't want that. 
It's just frightened, that's all. Oh, being a fool, Victor, do you realize what it means? That thing roaming about the country? What about the children, everybody in the village? I'm going to get the police. No, please, James. Give me a chance to find it first. Then what? You do a few more experiments, give it speech, perhaps, and it happens again? It's mine. I made it. I'm not thinking of that now. It's Mary and your wife. We don't even know where it is. If it wants to kill, how do you know where it will start? All right. Just give me an hour. Let me try to find it before we call the police. If I do, I'll take it back and destroy it myself. Do you give me your word? Yes. All right. I'll go with you. Thanks, James. I'll get my rifle. Do you have a gun? Yes. But I'm not going to use it unless it... Yes, unless. That's why I'll take mine. Shan't be moment. It's getting dark. Where do you think it might have gone? It's hard to tell. It's afraid of thunder. It might be hiding in the barn. The old Hamilton place? Yeah. How are you going to capture it? Have you thought of that? I brought along a hypodermic. You're not afraid anymore, are you? No. That's strange, because I am. Not of what it might do to me, but because of the fact that I've seen it. I I know it exists. There's the barn. If it's in there, there's no way out the back way. It was boarded up, wasn't it? Yes. I'll go in. Wait out here, will you? No, I'm coming with you. No. If it's in there, if it tries to escape... Shoot it as it comes out. Oh, don't take the chance. It won't let you get near. I'm going to try. Thanks, James. I lied. I am afraid. And it's in here, hiding, waiting for me. I am afraid. I should have destroyed it. James was right. Well, what's the matter with this flashlight? Wet. Ah, that's better. What's that? In the corner. I won't hurt you. It's all right. I understand. I won't hurt you. Don't be frightened. It's going to be all right. You'll hardly feel this. It won't hurt. I'm not sure. I might have hit it. I don't know. It's gone. Yes, are you? Victor. Victor. Oh, Victor. He never recovered consciousness again. Outside, I looked for the thing I'd shot at. But there was no sign of it. I returned to the lab and burnt every paper, destroyed every single evidence of Victor Frankenstein's terrible experiment. But the result of that experiment has never been found. Nor have I been able yet to convince the authorities that such a thing ever existed. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite, world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. They are members of the Autolite family, as well as other 98,000 Autolite distributors and dealers in the United States and thousands more in Canada and throughout the world. 
Our family also includes the nearly 30,000 men and women in 28 great Autolite plants from coast to coast and Autolite plants in many foreign countries, as well as the 18,000 people who have invested a portion of their savings in Autolite. Every Autolite product is backed by constant research and precision built to the highest standards of quality and performance. So remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. Next week, a story based on fact, terrifying in its truth. The dramatic report of a man returning home to find he now lives in a frightened city. Our star, Mr. Frank Lovejoy. The program will be heard on... Suspense! Tonight's story was adapted for Suspense by Anthony Ellis. Suspense is transcribed and directed by Elliot Lewis. Music was written by Lucian Morwick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. In tonight's cast, Joseph Kearns was heard as James Gibson, Paula Winslow was Elizabeth, and Paul Fries, the monster. Herbert Marshall is soon to be seen in the RKO radio picture, The Bystander. Remember next week, Mr. Frank Lovejoy in The Frightened City. You can buy Autolite resistor or standard type spark plugs, Autolite stay full batteries, and Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Your vote is important to you and your country. If you are eligible, don't forget or neglect to vote tomorrow. Remember, one vote can make the difference. This is the CBS Radio Network. Suspense. Tonight, Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Mr. John Lund in Experiment 6R, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Friends, I know you've enjoyed trouble-free summer driving if you've replaced those old-style narrow-gap spark plugs with wide gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. Tell them why, Harlow. Tell them why. Because Autolite resistor spark plugs with the exclusive built in 10,000 ohm Autolite resistor give you a full, even spark all along the line of fire. Keep going, Harlow. You're doing great. Well, your engine idles smoother with Autolite resistor spark plugs. Performs better on leaner gas mixtures. Actually saves you gas. You're getting better all the time. Autolite resistor spark plugs cut down radio and television interference, too. So insist on Autolite resistor spark plugs. Okay, Harlow, give them the old punchline. Don't be satisfied with spark plugs supposed to be just as good. Get genuine Autolite resistor spark plugs. You're always right with Autolite. And here's a reminder, suspense may be seen on television in many parts of the country every Tuesday night. And now with Experiment 6R and with the performance of John Lund as Morris Brandt, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. Entirely fitting somehow that here in the Carlton Plaza Hotel, where he spent so much of his life, we should honor this hero of science and pay him our humble gratitude. Mr. Brandt is, as you know at this moment, in our special clinic, and it's from there that he will address us on the subject of Experiment 6R, a page in the progress of science with which his name will forever be associated. When I received his letter and heard the thrilling news that, unknown to any of us, a human volunteer had actually... <laughs> well, it was, of course, inevitable that I should call this distinguished gathering together. Uh, I won't speak any longer now because minutes are precious. Uh, we're ready. Will you speak to us now, Mr. Brandt? Ladies and gentlemen... Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Morris Brandt. 
Brandt speaking. I don't know exactly how you good people of science are going to take my little story, the history of my own part in Experiment 6R. When I finish my story, if I finish it, you will wonder, perhaps, why I wish to tell it at all. Well, something about the irony of this situation appeals to me. I'm going to enjoy every minute of it. You know, even the fact that somebody just now pressed a buzzer and I jumped to attention and started speaking is ironic. Because I guess that's how Experiment 6R began a couple of months ago. Yes, just like that. Brand speaking. Coffee, Mr. Brandt. Very well, sir. It was precisely 3.15. And 3.15 was the time for Mr. Paul Koblenz's afternoon coffee. Naturally, it was beneath the dignity of the manager of the Carlton Plaza Hotel to have the coffee served by anyone less than me, the assistant manager. And so each day, the coffee tray with its silver urn, silver sugar and creamer, silver spoons, and graceful Limoges cups was left on my desk by a waiter, ready for the humiliating ceremony. I picked it up and went in. Ah, Mr. Brent. You'll join me, of course. Well, thank you, Mr. Koblenz. A little coffee is very relaxing. It was relaxing for him. My duties only began with bringing in the coffee. I had to set the silver tray on his desk and then wait while Mr. Koblenz detached a small key from his vest chain. Then it was my job to take the key and open the small wall cabinet near the heavily draped window where Koblenz kept a supply of liquor. I would take out a bottle of expensive brandy and carry it over to the desk. Koblenz liked to dash a bit in his coffee. Ah, oh, thank you, Mr. Brett. It was this part of the silly ritual that I hated most. That locked cabinet was a symbol of Koblenz's suspicion and distrust. No one but me was ever permitted to enter his sacred office, and I didn't drink. But that made no difference. The liquor was expensive and might be stolen. By whom? By me. Mr. Brandt, I've been looking over the monthly accounts. Your latest innovation seems to be doing uh, quite well. The stag room? Oh, that was a lucky guess. I think not. Your reasoning, I believe, was that businessmen like a place to lunch by themselves in quiet and comfort. It seems, Mr. Brandt, that you have the rare talent of knowing what people want. Well, I hope so. Especially when giving people what they want can be so uh, profitable and lead to give you what you want. Yes, indeed, Mr. Brandt. You have a very successful record during your 12 years here. Perhaps too successful. Why... What do you mean? Success has the habit of making a man crave something further. I think we shall have to have a talk someday soon, Mr. Brandt. Uh, but that will be all for today. You may replace the brandy. He handed me the little key to the cabinet. He had finished with me for the day. Back in my office, I thought of what Mr. Koblenz had said. Too successful meant only one thing. He thought that I was ambitious to hold his job my only possible advancement. Mr. Koblenz was quite correct. I would do anything to have that job. Anything. Now, after 12 years of it, I was determined to have that job. Not because it was a better job, but because it was his. I didn't sleep well that night in my cramped inside room, thinking of Mr. Koblenz in his penthouse suite. But... Finally, it was morning, and the hotel came to life again, with all its problems. There were the usual two or three bad checks accepted by the night clerk, and all the other boring, commonplace irritants. The only drama of the day was brought in by the housekeeper. Um, uh, may I speak to you a moment, Mr. Brandt? Uh, yes, Mrs. Upham? It's about 1402, Mr. Brandt. What seems to be the trouble? The maids won't make up 1402. Why? The room... I know it sounds crazy... But that room is full of rats. Ra live rats? Oh, nonsense. The maids are imagining no, things. It's true. I saw them myself. Very well, Mrs. Oberman. I'll see about it. Everyone's afraid to go in 1402. So I hope you can get them out of there. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Brad. 
Live rats. What next? Room clerk, please. Hello? Brandt speaking. Who's the occupant of 1402? Dr. Tomlinson? Is he in his room? Well, when he returns to the hotel, please let me know. I shall have to speak with him. Rats. Well, it was fairly typical of the kind of problem which is automatically relayed to the assistant manager, being hardly glamorous nor important enough for the manager to be bothered with. Some difficult and taxing assignment, like uh, greeting Greer Garson, maybe, would be more fitting use for the time and talents of Paul Koblenz. As I thought about it, and him, I began to hear a sound in my head like a clock ticking. I recognized that it was almost 3.15. As busy as I was, I could sense, without looking at the clock, that it was nearly 3.15. It was time for the buzzer on my desk to sound out the call which symbolized all the tyranny, all the pompous authority and the warped, sadistic soul of... Brand speaking. Coffee, Mr. Brand. Very well, sir. Again, the humiliating ritual performing the services of a waiter to satisfy Paul Koblenz of his authority. And today he began the talk with me that he had been promising for so long. Uh, Mr. Brandt, you have been with us for 12 years, is that correct? Yes, Mr. Koblenz. 12 years and two months. And you have always impressed me as an ambitious man, a competent man. Well, thank you, sir. But you must realize that you have come as far up the ladder as is possible, at least while I am alive. Well, I don't think that... And I am a very healthy man for my age, Mr. Brandt. Eventually, you may replace me. But, Mr. But Koblenz... it will be a long time to wait, I'm afraid. A very long time indeed. Well, I'm, I'm really awfully busy, Mr. Koblenz. I... I have observed certain signs of restlessness in you during the last year or so. Restlessness? You are not satisfied to be merely the assistant manager. You dream of occupying this desk someday. My... Will that be all, Mr. Koblenz? I will tell you when you may go. You would like to have my salary, which is very considerable, instead of your own, which is a, a good deal smaller. <clears throat> I, I must say that no one is so well qualified. If anything should uh, happen to me, you would automatically be appointed manager of the hotel. Mr. Koblenz, I'm sure we I will never... will not discuss the matter further. I just wanted to, you to know that I know, as they say, what the score is. Have you finished your coffee, Mr. Koblenz? I have finished my coffee, Mr. Brandt. Good afternoon. It was exactly 3.30 as Koblenz handed me the little key to the cabinet. And I replaced the brandy. I took the coffee things back into my own office and closed the door. I knew exactly what Koblenz had meant. He had actually said, I know you would like to eliminate me in some way, and I warn you. I'm on the alert. Don't try anything funny if you know what's good for you. As if there were the slightest chance. As much as I hated him, there was nothing I could do. Mr. Brandt speaking. You asked me to call when Dr. Tomlinson returned to the hotel, Mr. Brandt. What? Oh, oh yes. Thank you. Yes? Oh, yes, sir. I am Mr. Brandt, doctor, the assistant manager of the hotel. Oh. Uh, may I step in for a moment? Well, yes, come right in. Uh, what can I do for you? Well, uh, I suppose you noticed your room hasn't been straightened. And, of course, it's not difficult to see the reason why. You uh, have them caged, I see. Oh, yes, yes, you mean my rats. They're beautiful specimens, aren't they? Beautiful. How did you get them into the hotel? Oh, the uh, cage fits into a leather carrying case. <laughs> Rather clever, isn't it? I see. Well, I'm sorry, Dr. Tomlinson, but I'm afraid those rats will have to go. Yes, dear me, I was afraid of that. It would only be for another day, Mr. Brandt. I'll be returning to New York tomorrow. I, I can't leave them now. They're the subject of an experiment that may lead to the cure of an extremely deadly disease, which, for scientific purposes, we refer to as 6R. Well, I'm you, sure, Doctor. Hey, let me show you to... something here. You see this uh, yellow powder? Yeah, take a look at this label. 
Uh, paradimethyl... Doctor, I really uh, don't paradimethylamino have... Paradimethylamino benzamine. It's commonly called a butter yellow, Mr. Brandt. You see, when a rat gets a bit of this daily in his food, he develops 6R within four months, a spreading internal growth which insidiously destroys vital tissues. And by the time the results are evident, the rat is past all hope, and in a very short time, it's dead. Yes, Doctor, it's very fascinating, I'm sure. But I'm afraid... Oh, will this powder induce 6R in a human being, too? Oh, almost certainly, but naturally we haven't been able to try it. No volunteers. I don't suppose it requires very large doses, either. To develop 6R? Oh, no, indeed. Just a very tiny bit daily, and then... <laughs> uh, Mr. Brandt, surely you understand the importance of this work and why I must have the rats with me constantly? But uh, if you insist, I shall move to another hotel, of course. No, Doctor. I represent the management, and I ask you to stay. And I'll see that your room is straightened. Well, I, I must say that's wonderful of you, Mr. Brandt. Uh... Are you interested in science? Not until now. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, uh, by the way, please tell the maid not to go near the cages. Sometimes the rats might bite, and it might be that they could transmit 6R that way. We're not sure, you understand, but it's better not to take any chances. Yes, I understand. Is that powder... I won't attempt to pronounce it. Is it quite safe in here? Oh, yes, yes, see? No one could find it here. I see. And besides, no one would know what it was. If some got lost, it looks just like yellow dust. It would only be thrown away. I have more for the experiments. Don't worry, Mr... Uh, Brandt. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry if we've inconvenienced you, Doctor. Oh, have you had dinner? Why, no, as a matter of fact. I... Oh, would you join me? Seven o'clock in the grill room? Well, I should be very pleased. Good. We'll talk some more. You know, I should think that someone who, well, is desperately ill, let us say, would be honored to be your volunteer. I know in similar circumstances... I should be proud. Until seven, Doctor. Uh, you wish to see me, Mr. Brandt? Yes, Mrs. Overman. It is very important that Dr. Tomlinson finish his stay. Yes, sir. I will meet the chambermaid in his rooms promptly at 7.15 and see to it that the rats don't frighten them. Oh, thank you, Mr. Brandt. <laughs> The doctor arrived exactly at 7. And at 7.10, while he was still sipping his sherry, I excused myself and went up to 1402. When the chambermaid was taking the soiled linens to the laundry wagon in the hall, leaving me alone in Dr. Tomlinson's room, I filled a hotel envelope with a deadly yellow powder. I was back downstairs before the soup was served. I have never enjoyed a dinner more. Dr. Tomlinson prattled on, but I didn't even hear I was thinking what a pleasure it was going to be to have coffee at 3.15 tomorrow afternoon with Mr. Paul Copeland. Autolite is bringing you Mr. John Lund in Experiment 6R. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, uh, Hap. Yes? My nephew went to camp this summer, and they taught him a lot of useful things, like how to send smoke signals with a brush, fire, and blanket. Oh? You should see the lovely charred hole in our living room rug. Yes, but did they teach him about the new wide gap auto light resistor spark plugs? No, Hap, they didn't, so I had a man-to-man -man talk with him. I told him, replace old-style narrow gap spark plugs with wide gap auto light resistor spark plugs for easier starting in cold temperatures, for smoother idling. For better performance on leaner gas mixtures, they actually save you gas. Mm, that's useful information. Right. I told him confidentially, of course, that every Autolite resistor spark plug has an exclusive built-in 10,000 ohm Autolite resistor. I said insist on Autolite resistor spark plugs now. Don't accept spark plugs that are supposed to be as good. That's telling them. I said, my boy, that mighty might, that Autolite resistor, explains why Autolite resistor spark plugs mean easier starting in cold temperatures, smoother idling, better performance on leaner gas mixtures. They actually save you gas. So insist on Autolite. And now Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage John Lund in Experiment 6R. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Brand speaking. 
coffee, Mr. Brandt? Yes, Mr. Koblenz. A waiter had just brought the tray, set it on my desk, and left. My door was locked. I took out the envelope with the powder, put a pinch of it into one of the costly Limoges cups, filled both cups with coffee from the silver pot, and carried the tray into the sumptuous office next door, the office that would soon become my own. You will join me, of course, Mr. Brent. Of course, Mr. Koblenz. Of course I would. I always had. But beginning with today, I would enjoy it. There was not the slightest alteration in the usual ridiculous routine. Koblenz removed the little key from his chain and handed it to me. I got the brandy from the cabinet. Koblenz poured a bit of the brandy into his cup and took a sip. Hmm. Mm, exceptionally good coffee today, but they make it yourself. Hmm? What? <laughs> Why, how do you mean? Oh, don't take me so seriously, Brandt. But knowing your efficiency in all matters of the hotel, I'm sure you could prepare a very unusual cup of coffee. Well, that, that's very nice of you to say, Mr. Koblenz. But I know you haven't time to waste in making coffee. Too busy thinking of ways you can work your way into my job, aren't you? Hmm? And as I told you before, you won't get it while I live, and I come from a very long lived family. Yes, surely. More coffee, sir? Nothing could possibly go wrong. I had found out enough from Dr. Tomlinson to know that humans, and I stretched a point to include Paul Koblenz, that humans responded to drugs in very much the same way as rats. That was the reason rats were used for experiments in medical research. Almost invariably, the drugs that could kill a rat could kill a man. But the powder would never be detected, only its effect. When, after months of tiny doses, Koblenz would suddenly learn that he was harboring the hidden killer, 6R. I kept the powder in my jacket pocket. As the weeks passed, it became a matter of routine to put some in Paul Koblenz's daily coffee. But try as I would to remain calm, sometimes the excitement of it would become almost unbearable, particularly at the moments when I served the coffee. Mr. Brandt, I can't tell you what pleasure this afternoon cup of coffee gives me. And of course it gives me one of the few chances I get during the day to see my busy and uh, trusted assistant. That is a pleasure too. Thank you, Mr. Koblenz. Oh, I uh, received a letter a few days back from a Dr. Ernst Tomlinson. Tomlinson? He was a guest here, I believe, for several days. Oh, really? Well, I, I don't... Surely think... you haven't forgotten. He wished specifically to be remembered to you. The gentleman with the rats. Rats? Oh, oh, yes, I, I do recall something. Yes, of course. I realize, Mr. Brandt, that I have allowed many of my managerial duties to fall on your capable shoulders... Uh, which action has perhaps given you a mistaken opinion of your authority on these premises? But really, Mr. Brandt, live rats in a room... The animals were caged? I think I should have been consulted. Fortunately, our other guests were not cognizant of the fact that we were for two days uh, zookeepers of a sort. If they had known, I'm afraid, Mr. Fenwick should have immediately replaced you. I'm sorry, Mr. Koblenz. Yes, I'm sure. The good doctor seemed quite taken by you, Mr. Brandt. Have you a personality side you've never shown me? I've always considered you rather dull. Will that be all, Mr. Koblenz? You're angry. Well, no matter. See, yes, that would be all. I'm rather tired today. Go, please. Dr. Tomlinson had written, but only to compliment me. That was good. He hadn't missed any of the yellow powder. As far as Koblenz's insulting behavior was concerned, well, there wouldn't be much more of it. Dr. Tomlinson had said there were no outward effects to 6R. The tiny admission of fatigue on Paul Koblenz's part was, I felt it. I watched Paul Koblenz grow progressively more testy and insulting. Two weeks into the fourth month of experiment, 6R... And in a way I didn't expect, the last scene began. 
Under the insurance laws of our state, all employees participating in group insurance had a yearly physical examination. The four months Dr. Tomlinson had considered necessary to allow the growth of 6R were almost completed. By now, 6R would have taken hold of Paul Koblenz, sufficiently to be recognized in the medical examination, and sufficiently to be, at that point, incurably fatal. Even at this late date, there were outwardly no signs of Koblenz's illness, which would make the announcement by the insurance doctor even more shocking. It was a nervous moment. Brand speaking. Mr. Brand, I have set aside 2.30 as the time for my visit to the insurance doctors. That should get me back to my office for coffee. After which, if you have no pressing duties, you may... Yes, Mr. Koblenz. At three o'clock, I heard him come back into his office next door. He walked rather heavily, I thought. I wanted desperately to see him at once to see the reaction he must have to the news the insurance doctors had given him. But I waited. Finally, it was 3.15. Brandt speaking. Coffee, Mr. Brandt. Yes, Mr. Koblenz. The waiter had brought the coffee tray as usual. I carried it in. Koblenz sat quietly at his desk, his face partially in the shadow from the drawn blinds. You'll join me, of course, Mr. Brandt. Oh, thank you, Mr. Koblenz. Here's the key. I set the tray down, took the little key to the liquor cabinet which stood against the wall, and bent over to open it. There was a new mirror above the cabinet. And what I saw in it made me drop the bottle. Anything wrong, Mr. Brandt? You seem startled. The cups. The cups. You've turned absolutely white as death. But then I meant to talk to you. You haven't been looking well for some time. You... you changed... I beg your pardon? You... you switched the coffee cups while I turned away to get your brandy. I always do. It is an old custom in my family. An old German custom. A very old custom. A very old and long-lived family. Have you... all this time? Yes, Mr. Brandt. All this time. Oh. Operator, connect me with the insurance doctors, please, in 308. Is it possible for you to see Mr. Brandt immediately, doctor? Thank you. It's urgent. And so, experiment 6R is finished. I am glad to have been of service to science, but I just couldn't die without sharing the the credit with Mr. Koblenz. I am sorry, truly sorry, that he could not be there with you today in his old capacity as manager of the hotel, but Mr. Fenwick saw fit to discharge Mr. Koblenz when it was brought to his attention that live rats had been permitted to spend the night in one of our rooms. And now... Thank you for your attention, and... and goodbye. I was just bringing your order, Mr. Brandt. Your friend just phoned and told me. If you'd only mentioned it before... We... Friend? Mm-hmm. Mr. Koblenz. Koblenz? But... I, I didn't order anything. Oh, now, Mr. Brandt, it's no trouble... We know now about your little custom. If you want coffee at 3.15 every day, you shall have it. Come now. It's just 3.15. Suspense presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, John Lund. In Experiment 6R. Uh, John, do you mind if I ask you a question? Why, of course not, Harlow. Okay. What do you think of auto light resistor spark plugs? Well, Harlow, let's put it this way. Yes? I can't imagine you selling anything but the best. Oh, well, now, I... Now, don't be coy, Wilcox. You just keep right on telling people that auto light resistor spark plugs are the best. Any more questions? No, John, and thank you. 
I'll also tell people that in its 28 plants from coast to coast, Autolite makes more than 400 products for cars, trucks, airplanes, and boats, including complete electrical systems for many makes of America's finest cars, batteries, spark plugs, generators, starting motors, coils, distributors. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be just as good. Insist on and get Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, Charles Lawton and June Havoc will be our stars. The play is called Blind Date. And it is, as we say, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Tonight's suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Experiment 6R was a radio play by Donald Stubbs and Harold Kahn. John Lund may currently be seen in the Hal Wallace production for Paramount, My Friend Irma. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Van Johnson, Edward Arnold, and Betty Davis. Don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring Charles Lawton and June Haver. You can buy Autolite resistor spark plugs, Autolite stay-full batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, Roma Wines present... Suspense. Tonight, Drury's Bone, starring Boris Karloff. Suspense is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you Suspense. This is the man in black here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, who tonight from Hollywood bring you as star Mr. Boris Karloff in the remarkable history of a Scotland Yard inspector who found himself in surely the most ironic predicament ever to confront an officer of the law. And so, with Drury's Bones, and with the performance of Boris Karloff, we again hope to keep you in suspense. The events that are covered in this report began on the night of December the 28th, 1910, although I didn't know it at the time. But it was on that night that I opened my eyes to discover that I was lying behind some trash barrels in a dark London alleyway. Thunder was ripping the skies apart, and the sheets of rain that were pelting on my unprotected body had soaked me to the skin. My head was aching unbearably. As I automatically tried to rise, I found I was so dizzy that I had to hold on to the barrels for support. I reached up to feel of my head. My hair was a mass of dotted blood. In my numb mind, I could feel only one urge. I had to find a lighted building somewhere where someone could get me warm clothing and call a doctor. It seemed hours before finally I saw an office building in which a light was burning and gratefully stumbled in its direction. Listen to this, Peters. Uh, There's a report from the... Why, who are you? I beg your pardon, I... Great heavens, man! Come over here by the fire. Here, here, I'll give you a hand. Here, let me help you. That's it. Uh, Good Lord. 
Look at that head. Uh, Peters. Yes, sir. Hey, you better call the doctor. Right, sir. Oh, uh, let's get some of these wet clothes off, eh? Uh, yeah. Easy now. Uh, this is very uh, kind of you. Uh, now, now the trousers. Mm. Uh, uh, there, that's it. Hmm. Robbed, eh? I suppose so. Suppose? Yes. Uh, you see, I don't know. Oh, come, sir. You must know whether or not you had a pocketbook. There's nothing here now, certainly. There's nothing? Well, who are you, by the way? Huh? I say, let's have your name. I'm... My name is... My name? I don't know my name. I don't know! I must have fainted, because the next thing I knew, I was lying on the couch in the office, covered with warm blankets and slowly returning to consciousness. My benefactor and the doctor were talking in hushed right voices here. near the bed. Uh, you say no identification on him, eh? Nothing except these. I found them under his hat, Ben. Hmm. Two ticket stubs, Drury Lane Theatre, December 24th, 1910. Have you checked there? Oh, there's no possible way to trace them. Oh, I have to call him something. Yeah. Uh, Drury, that's it. After the Drury Lane. And Terence after you, Inspector Terence. <laughs> Drury. Oh, very well. Uh, how long do you suppose this condition will last? Amnesia. <laughs> no way of knowing. I should guess a bit of rest and then some kind of absorbing work. Not strenuous, of course. You mustn't be allowed to brood, you see. Danger and this sort of thing lies in a man's working himself into a genuine psychosis from worry. I see. Uh, I say, Carruthers, why don't you put him to work here? At least until you locate his family. After all, you can't very well turn your back on the chap now that he's named after you. Well, as a matter of fact, it happens that I could use the new man around here very nicely. Oh, well, there you are. And as to forgetting one's worries and absorbing work, I can't think of a better place in the world for a man to do that than Scotland Yard. Tonight for Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Mr. Boris Karloff, whom you've heard in the prologue to Harold Swanton's radio play, Drury's Bones, tonight's tale of Suspense. This is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. When you listen to the friendly advice of Miss Elsa Maxwell about hospitality and gracious living... You realize that here is an authority who talks plain common sense all the time. I'm talking to men as well as women when I say that the finest hospitality is always simple, sincere, moderate, and natural. Never the opposite. And so I am always emphasizing that the nicest, simplest, most sincerely flattering hospitality is to serve your guests some Roma Sherry. With its golden amber color, its delicious tangy nut-like flavor. It's not only supremely enjoyable before dinner or in the afternoon, it's smartly correct. A genuine compliment to your friends and to yourselves. And please don't worry about special glasses. It is perfectly correct to use any nice glasses that are handy. Well, Miss Maxwell speaks more authoritatively than I can, but I will add this. Roma Sherry, like all famous Roma wines made from California's magnificent sun-ripened grapes, brings you all their fine flavor, aroma, and color, is unvaryingly good, always enjoyable, thanks to the age-old wine skill of Roma's noted wineries located in the choicest vineyard areas of California. Yet all this goodness and pleasure is yours for only pennies a glass. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wines. Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Boris Karloff as Inspector Terence Drury, who resumes his report on the case entitled Drury's Bones, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. It was an amazing stroke of fate that brought me to the London office of Scotland Yard on that dreadful night of December... 1910, for I'm sure that nowhere else could I have had more kindness and understanding. Of course, at first the strain was almost unbearable. I had absolutely no recollection of my past, 
had no idea who the man was who lived the first 30 years of my life. Or was it 40? Or 20? I never knew. But Carruthers judged me to be about 30, so I came to regard that as my official age. And he was ingenious in providing interesting work for me. And during the days that followed, I became so absorbed in the tide of fascinating cases that flowed across my desk that I had no time for thought or reflection on my plight. My own dossier at last week was called the inactive file and was gradually forgotten. In short, my present and my future became so interesting that I came to regard my past as a closed book. And so it was, as a full-fledged inspector, I reported one day in May of 1930 to Chief Inspector Carruthers. Oh, hello, Drury. <clears throat> Have a chair. Thanks. Cigar? Yes, I will, thank you. Hmm, Havana, eh? Decently prosperous for a Scotland Yard man, Inspector. <laughs> sure you're not involved in a scandal of some sort? <laughs> I'm sorry, old boy. Gift from my niece. Have a light. <laughs> Only one other conclusion, then. You're about to cancel my holiday. Well, as a matter of fact... Murder uh... in Soho, I suppose. No, not in Soho. In Clovelly. Clovelly? Clovelly? It's a fishing village in Devon. That's it. Mm. Bit of a resort town, too, you know. Thought you might be able to combine business with pleasure. I do need a rest, you know. Well, I have here a letter from a Mr. John Stanhope who resides in Clovelly. It seems he unearthed a human skeleton in his backyard, apparently buried there for years. Or it'll just be a matter of securing a routine report on the case, perhaps questioning this Mr. Stanhope and possibly a few of the local residents. Then you can pop down to Torquay and bask in the sun for a few days. Ever been in North Devonshire? I avoid it religiously. I'm allergic to moors. Well, what do you think of it? Mm, well, if it were anyone else but you, Carruthers. <laughs> I suppose I'd better write this all down. John Stanhope, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have his address? Oh, there's no such thing as an address in Clovelly. There's only one street. But you won't have any trouble finding it. Oh. What I hear, the townspeople will be quick enough to tell you all about the place where the bones are buried. How do you do, sir? Welcome to Clovelly. How do you do? My name is Drury, Scotland Yard. You'll want a single, I expect. Yes, if you have one. Uh, just sign the register, please. Very well. There. I understand that Mr. John Stanhope was to leave a message here for me. Oh, you must be here about the bones. Yes. Some excitement they've caused, I'll tell you. What with the Ashley Norton's disappearance, a dark mystery these 20 years and all. Who were the Ashley Norton? Lived in that house 20 years ago, they did. That would be just about the time the body was buried, wouldn't it, sir? Yes. Did you know them? Never did see her. Saw him once or twice. Strange pair they was. Unsociable. Keeping themselves to themselves night and day in that house on the cliff. No telling what went on behind them doors. What do people think went on? There's some that thinks that what went on was murder. Murder? Why? There's those who knows the reasons better than I. I'll leave it to them to tell. Very well. Let's see, uh, I signed this book too, don't I? Oh, no, sir, that's our permanent register for new guests. But you've been here before. I? Why, no, no, I... I've never been here before in my life. Oh, that's odd. For a moment I thought I'd seen you here before sometime. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Stanhope? Yes? Inspector Drury, Scotland Yard. Oh, oh, happy to see you, Inspector. Come in, please. Thank you. I uh, <clears throat> must apologize for the condition of the place, Mr. Drury. The events of the past few days have been a, a bit upsetting, to say the least. I should think so. Uh, like a spot of sherry? Why, thanks, yes. <laughs> I had rather an enlightening conversation with Mrs. Tumley at the inn last night. Oh? Uh -huh. 
Seems the townspeople are quite certain it was a case of murder involving some people named Ashley Norton. Yes, yes, uh, Roger Ashley Norton. His wife was named Sarah. Did you know them? Oh, no, 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 no. I, I'd never met them. Very few people had. You see, that was 20 years ago. The house originally belonged to my brother. He died in 1925, and I didn't come into the property until after that. <laughs> I know it's natural to jump to the conclusion of murder when one uncovers uh, human bones, but uh, is there any reason to suspect a motive? Did anybody disappear suddenly? No one but uh, the Ashley Nortons. I see. There's nothing to go on but gossip, and it's all highly circumstantial, of course. Ah. You see, my brother was renting this house to them furnished by the year, payable in advance. And so he rarely had occasion to call on them. But when the regular check failed to arrive on time, he paid them a visit. The house was vacant. And it was immediately clear that no one had lived in the place for the last few months. Hmm. Your brother made inquiries, of course. Oh, yes, yes. No one had seen or heard from them for at least two months before. And what date was that, Stanup? Oh, now let me see. Uh, that was, uh... Uh, December of 1910. I'm sorry. Oh, I... it's quite oh, all here, right. let me... Uh... No, 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 no. The, the maid will attend to it. Uh, let me get you another. Not right now, thanks. Well, would you like to examine the garden? The garden? Yes. Where the bones were discovered. Oh. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Out through the French windows. Here to the side, I take it. Yes. Uh, here, here we are. Just over here, Inspector. See. And the tree stood about here, eh? The what? The holly tree. <laughs> I, I must admit you're a jolly fine detective, sir. The gardener discovered the body while removing the dead holly tree, all right, but I, I wasn't aware that I mentioned the fact to Scotland Yard. <laughs> in my room and the inn late that night that I first began my notes. I include them now in this report, just as I wrote them then. Clavelli, Devon, May 18, 1930. The feeling that this is all a book that I've read or a play I've seen somewhere in the past has taken hold of my very soul. And the terror that grips me when I think of the future makes rational thought very difficult. But nevertheless, I have resolved to pursue the investigation until I am certain that there is no further doubt. I must discover someone who knew Ashley Norton intimately, his profession, his habits, his personality. I think I must risk tomorrow another talk with Mrs. Tumley. But meanwhile, I shall withhold any further report to Carruthers. <laughs> Now, Mrs. Tumley, you said yesterday that there were some people here in Clovelly who knew the Ashley Nortons rather well. Did I? Yes, Mrs. Tumley. Well, it might have been Effie Wilkes I had in mind. Who was Effie Wilkes? She was the Ashley Norton serving maid, sir. And where is Effie Wilkes now? Oh, she disappeared, sir. She disappeared? The same time they did, sir. And not a sight nor sound of her since. Not these 20 years. Who else? Who else knew the Ashley Nortons? Only t'other one I could think of would be Ben Sykes. Blind Ben, they call him now. But he could see Ben right enough. And where is he? Oh, he's hereabouts. Gone to Biddeford with his nephew today. But he'll be back Wednesday if you'd care to speak with him, sir. Did he work for the Ashley Nortons? In a manner of speaking, sir. He helped out with the uh, experiments. Experiments? Oh, yes, sir. Mr. Ashley Norton was quite a scientist. Or so he said. What did Ben Sykes have to do with these experiments? Oh, he got things for them, sir. What sort of things? Live things, sir. Live things? Rabbits, animals, such like things, oh, sir. Oh, is that all? No, sir. If you ask me, that wasn't all. What else? There was human beings, sir. Human beings? Yes, sir. What human beings? Why, I would say, sir, the nearest ones that came to end. What do you mean? Oh, I'm sure you know much more about this than I do, sir. 
But they do say those bones were the bones of a woman. Carruthers wired today that he expects to locate the serving girl, Effie Wilkes, within a matter of hours. That means at least that she's alive. And it also means that her testimony will complete the case. And I can no longer deceive myself as to the outcome. I don't quite know why I sent Carruthers the information about Effie Wilkes, knowing as I do that I'm endangering myself by that action. <laughs> Perhaps there's something of which I'm still just a little proud. I'm still primarily a detective. Well, I shall pursue this investigation impersonally and logically until the very last link in the chain. That link is Ben Sykes. Blind Ben. There is only one fact in which I can take some faint hope. Ashley Norton was a scientist, a presumably a doctor. I can find no faintest memory in myself of any specialized scientific knowledge whatsoever. Or well, Ben Sykes' nephew is going over to Biddeford today to bring the old man home. I shall go along and talk to him on the ride back. So you're Ben Sykes. Aye, blind Ben, they call me. But eyes are none. I can keep up with the best of them. What's your business in Clovelly, sir? I've come to ask you some questions about Mr. Ashley Norton. Haven't we met before, sir? Not that I remember, Ben. Your voice is, uh... Oh, well. What sort of questions, sir? Perhaps about the experiments. I'll say no to the experiments, sir. They were the master's private business. Very well. Did you know Mrs. Ashley Norton? Sarah Ashley Norton? I did, sir. And no finer woman ever walked the earth. Did... Did he love her? He loved her more than life itself, but... Uh, but what? Well, she helped him with his experiments. She was condemned hereabouts for that. But she helped him all through these long months until... Until... Uh, until she went away. Hi there! Look out! We haven't got enough force. Hi there! Hi there! last I remember was the sickening sway of the wagon as it overturned in the ditch to the left of the road. I must have hit my head on something and lost consciousness just for a moment. Help me with it. What <laughs> Oh, I say, there's a nasty gash on his leg there. What about the other? Take care of Ben. Right. I'll look to the inspector. Right. Yeah, you are, old fellow. Now, inspector. Don't... Inspector, you all right, oh. sir? I believe so. Here we are. There we are, sir. Thank you. Is uh. Ben all right? Oh, 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 oh. oh, he's hurt. His leg. I've sent for the doctor. Let sir. me have a look at it. Oh, yes. Sir. Mm. No, don't throw it back. Huh? Now, get me a knife. Oh, here you are. Now, help me with this. Yeah. Here. Uh. That's it. Hmm, compound fracture and bleeding pretty badly. Have you a handkerchief? Quite clean enough for a bandage. It isn't a bandage. Now, get me a small stick. Oh. That's it. Now, around here, just below the patella. Hmm. Now, hold on to that and relax it when I tell you. Yes, sir. Hmm. Tibia and fibula, both compound. Dislocation of the talus. Need x-ray immediately. What? I didn't know you was a doctor, sir. Huh? What? Neither did I. <laughs> How do you feel, Ben? Much better, Mr. Drury. Thanks to you. She, she twitches now and then. <laughs> He'll be all right once it's set. Lucky you was with us, sir. Ben, you were going to tell me about the last time you saw Mr. Ashley Norton. Do you remember? Yes, sir. I remember it well. He was going up to London, to the theatre, he said. Was he going alone? Yes, sir. Mrs. Ashley Norton had gone on ahead to do some shopping, he said. Ben, do you remember when? What theatre? Yes, sir. It was uh, Christmas Eve. And the theatre was uh, Drury Lane. Yes. Yes, I know. I guess I knew it always. Asking your pardon, sir, I'm an old man. 
And I can say things without anyone getting angry about them. Yes, Ben, what is it? Well, then, sir, you seem like a man who's running away from something. Oh, running. I wouldn't run away from it any longer, sir, if I was you. Ben, I believe you're the only one of us who isn't blind. <laughs> Hello, Drury. Well, welcome back. I say, though, the chief's been trying to get a hold of you all day. Yes, I know. Is Chief Carruthers in? No, no. He had to meet someone at the train. He'll be back soon, though. When he wants me, I'll be in my office, finishing my report. Oh, that's so. You've been on a case. Murder, wasn't it? Did you uh, catch the fellow? Yes. I caught him. <laughs> There's little now that needs to be added. Christmas Eve, Drury Lane Theatre. And Ashley Norton went alone, he said, because his wife Sarah had gone on ahead. And the medical training, it came back to me when I needed it as though it had been my life. My former life. There can be only one conclusion to this report. Sarah Ashley Norton was murdered by her husband. The case is closed. Signed. Roger Ashley Norton, formerly Terence Drury. Oh, come in, Drury. I've been expecting you. Yes. Here's my report, sir. And there's time enough for that. If you don't mind, I, I'd rather you read it now. I... I'd like to get it over with. Yes, but, um... <clears throat> you know, we finally traced the serving girl, Effie Wilkes. Yes. If you don't mind... And through her, we traced someone else. Does it really matter now? I think perhaps it does. You may show in the witness, Peters. Yes. Yes, it is. Roger. <laughs> Roger. I beg your pardon, but who... Roger, don't you remember me? I remember you? I only remember that you were someone who was once very dear to me. And now it's too late. No, no, Roger. No, it isn't too late. I'm... I'm... Sarah. Sarah. Oh, darling. <clears throat> um, uh, you see... Drury, or rather, Mr. Ashley Norton. It seems you and your wife did go to the Drury Lane Theatre on that Christmas Eve 20 years ago. And that very night, you were both to go on to Paris. Then at the last moment, you ran into some chap who begged you to deliver a lecture the next day. You agreed, and Mrs. Ashley Norton went on ahead. You were to meet her in Paris in two days. Oh. When you didn't come, I checked with the steamship company. And they said your ticket had been used. The thief who robbed you must have used it. But I couldn't know that. I thought you must be somewhere in France. The French police tried to trace you for years. Then I... I thought you must be dead. Oh, Roger. Roger. <laughs> My dear. Uh, oh, Sarah, do you... Well, do you suppose you could call me Terence? <laughs> I've got used to it, you know. And... <laughs> oh, very well, Terence. You haven't changed very much, really. I suppose you haven't either. By the way, I had excellent taste in women in those days. Oh, my dear. Oh. Oh, and can you ever forgive me? Forgive you? For what? The bones. Oh. The bones. Yes, I... <laughs> well, I suppose if that Mrs. Tumley hadn't been so nosy, I wouldn't have done it. But I was afraid if they found it in the house, it would look even worse. So that's why I did it. Did? Did what? Buried your demonstration skeleton in the backyard. Under the holly tree. What? The... Oh! <laughs> <laughs> and so closes Drury's Bones. Starring Boris Karloff, 
Tonight's study in Suspense. Suspense is produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. There is no reason at all, Elsa Maxwell says, why everyone should not have the enjoyment of Roma wines with everyday meals and when entertaining friends. These superb wines of California are so delightful to the taste, so very delicious with food, so smartly complimentary to friends who are your guests. It seems a shame to me that some people still miss out on such wholesomely simple, moderate, and inexpensive pleasure. But of course, Miss Maxwell, millions already do know and enjoy Roma wines. In fact, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wines. And that can only mean Roma wines are California's finest, always extra good, unvaryingly fine in flavor and quality, yet only pennies a glass. Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Mr. Joseph Cotton, a star of Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. Take a deep breath and let it out slowly. And once more. No, this is not a caprice. It is a thoughtful precaution. Fill your lungs well now, for you will be holding your breath for the next 30 minutes as you live through the long night with Frank Lovejoy, a tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. This is United 404, 10,000 over outer range. Request lower altitude over. United 404, this is Rockford Tower. Maintain present altitude until further advised. Over. United 404, roger, Rockford. Over and out. Rockford Radio, this is Delta 318, over. Delta 318, this is Rockford Radio, go ahead. Delta 318, request permission to radio approach. I'm over Milford Hills at 4,000, over. Delta 318, straight You stand in the airport stranded. control tower, 90 feet up in the sky over Rockford Field, waiting to go on the night watch. And you'll listen to the babble of voices that fill the crowded room in an endless series of requests. Request for altitude change, request for landing permission, request for the weather. Here is the 9 o'clock weather. Low stratus clouds over the entire Mississippi Valley, spreading out over the central states. Visibility 2 miles, ceiling 2,200 feet and lowering steadily. Smoke clouds, haze, smoke, haze, clouds, and fog, and a ceiling getting lower every minute. You look out through the tinted glass windows into the misty night, and you think of the strangers overhead, in and above the clouds. And you wonder if they, too, feel the hush as the long night begins. You wonder if the strangers with the throb of engines and the harsh rasp of many voices in their ears can feel the stillness. You look around the tower room, you look and you listen to the voices, and you're glad every time a ship touches down safely on the long, light line runways. Okay, Brother Ken, you can have it. For me, it's been a long day. Traffic been heavy? It started sort of slow, but it's building up. I got three converging on the outer marker and two inbound on the range. It's all here on the board for you. Yeah, okay. They're beginning to stack up over Chicago, but uh, that's their worry. Yeah, and they can have it. Yeah. Well, happy landings, man. Yeah, so long, Charlie. Good night, Charlie. Rockford Tower, this is TWA Flight 70 requesting weather your field. Over. Hello, TWA 70, this is Rockford. We have straightest clouds, ceiling of 2,000, visibility under two miles. Smoke, haze, and fog on the ground. Over. What is your traffic there, Rockford? Five inbound inside the 20-mile range, one Convair and two DC-7s outbound on the red, over. Okay, Rockford, uh, this is TWA 70 requesting change of flight plan to land your field instead of Chicago. Roger, TWA, I'll notify Chicago and clear you in. Give us a call when you pass the Milburn Hills. Rockford out. Roger, thanks very much. Give Chicago a call, Mike. Tell them their flight 70 is terminating here. Okay, Ken, we'll do it. 
Chicago. Rockford Radio. Rockford, Rockford Tower. This is Beechcraft Bonanza N91457. Hello, Beechcraft N91457. This is Rockford Tower. I've been homing on your range, and apparently my automatic direction finder isn't working right. I think I'm lost. Stand by, 457. Check the flight file, will you, Mike? See if he's on it. All right. Hello, Rockford. Are you hearing me, Rockford? If you are, please give me a call. This is Rockford. We're reading you fine, Beach. Hold on a second. Find anything on it, Mike? Nope, there's nothing here, Ken. No flight plan. Okay. Hello, Beechcraft N91457. This is Rockford Tower. What seems to be the trouble with your ADF? I don't know exactly, Rockford. I'm not too familiar with this equipment. But I don't think it's working right because I've been changing from one range to another just like I was told to. And I ought to have been somewhere over Minneapolis long ago. And I'm not. All right, Beechcraft. We'll work something out for you. Where are you flying from? Indianapolis. Headed on a direct flight to Minneapolis? That's right, Rockford. I set my automatic direction finder just exactly the way I was told to when they installed it. Did you make any visual checks against what your ADF showed? I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Did you check your course when you passed over the airways range stations by looking at visual ground objects like signs on the top of oil tanks telling you what city you were over, anything like that? No, I'm afraid I didn't. I thought my ADF was working, so I didn't think about anything else. Okay. Now, what was your last known position? Last known... Well, uh, I'm trying to think. I guess the last time I positively knew where I was was when I departed Indianapolis. What time was that? About 5.30, uh, maybe 5.45. 5.30? Verify that time. That would be more than three hours en route. You should be well out of my range. Yeah, I know. But I've been circling for more than an hour trying to make the ADF work and looking for Rockford. What is your remaining fuel supply? Well, uh, I guess there's no use kidding myself. I think I've got about 45 minutes, maybe at the very best, an hour. Well, here is the situation. The weather here is solid overcast at 600, visibility one mile in smoke and haze. Do you see any towns, rivers, highways that you can identify? No, I can't see anything but clouds. I'm on top. Holy smoke, did I hear that right? Yes, you did. Beechcraft, did you say you were on top? That's right, on top of a solid layer. Have been for a long time. At what altitude? I'm, uh, I'm at 5,000 indicated. About 1,000 above the clouds. Uh, 457, take a good look around you. Are there any breaks in the overcast? Can you see any holes, any thin spots in the area at all? No. No, it's solid. It's a completely solid layer. Are you an instrument pilot? What do you mean? I mean, are you checked out on instruments? Do, Do you have instrument training? No. No, I've never been on instruments in my life. I'm just lost. You look at the clock, 9.04. You look at the clock and mentally give yourself 45 minutes. 45 minutes to find him, bring him in, and get him on the ground. You check the latest weather chart and you don't like what you see. Your mouth feels dry. You reach for a cigarette as you punch the mic button and do the next thing that must be done. Rockford Tower to all planes working this frequency. We have an emergency. Repeat, we have an emergency. Please maintain radio silence on this frequency until further notice. Out. A Rockford Tower to Beechcraft, N91457. Come in, 457. Okay, Rockford. Tell me, how did you get on top? Well, it was almost clear when I left Indianapolis. I climbed straight out to 5,000 and... Later, while I was trying to get the ADF working, I found myself on top. It it just happened. Yes. Are you familiar with range orientation? No, I don't know anything about that either. I'm just a businessman with a new airplane. I know only enough about the radio to tune in the stations. 
I know I'm lost, though, and need help. These gas tanks aren't getting any fuller. Yes, I know, 457. I understand. Sure, you understand, but he doesn't. He knows he's lost and he needs help. He understands that. But he doesn't know what the odds are on getting him straightened out and over the field and then getting him down through that solid layer of clouds. You fight down a sudden urge to push the microphone button and scream at him. To tell him that nobody forced him into an airplane he hardly knew how to fly. Nobody forced him to take off on a long night cross-country in weather suitable only for experienced professionals. But you know there's no time for hindsight. There's hardly any time for hopes. So you push the black button and you try to sound calm. Hello, 457. This is Rockford Tower. Now, listen to me carefully. Are you reading me okay? Yeah. Hello, Rockford. I'm hearing you fine. Loud and clear. All right. Now I'm going to try to get a fix on you. But before I do, I want you to know what the situation is. I'm sure I can find you. I'm reasonably sure I can get you over the airport before you're out of fuel. I am not sure, though, that we can get you on the ground. Do you understand? No, no, I don't understand. I'm lost, and I'm about out of gas, and I don't understand why we're wasting time talking about it. You get me over an airport, and then we'll worry about getting on the ground. All right, but you understand this. It's my job to help find you. It's my job to help you find the airport, and I'll do everything I can to get you on the ground. But flying that airplane through those clouds will be the hardest thing you've ever done in your life. Do you understand that? Okay, I understand. Now, what are we going to do? Now, we're going to orient you by radio and bring you in over the Rockford Airport. I will tell you what must be done, but you have got to do it. I can't fly your airplane for you. Do you understand? Yeah. Okay, Rockford. I understand. You know the standard procedures for range orientation. You run over every step of them a million times for just this kind of emergency. That's one of the reasons you're up here in this modern Tower of Babel on these long nights. But you've got two strikes against you on this one. Time, you read the clock at 9.07, and a fool in an airplane. Uh, Mike. Yeah, Ken. Get your cargo control center on the horn. Ask them to set up an alert of all facilities within 100 miles. Roger. Uh, you better get them to clear all altitudes in the area below 6,000 feet. Okay, we'll do. You know, I don't know whether to try to get him down through the clouds now and then try to bring him in or whether to get him over us on top and then let him down where we won't lose radio contact if he gets too low. Well, it's souped up all across the valley, Ken. You might get him down through it, but if he's too far out, he'd have no chance of getting here under the ceiling. Yeah, yeah, and if I don't get him started, it's something he'll be out of fuel anyway, and it won't matter. Uh, I'm going to bring him in on top. Okay, I'll check weather very closely, Ken. If I hear of any breaks, I'll give it to you. Good, thank you. Hello, 457, this is Rockford Tower. Yeah, okay, Rockford. I'm going to speak very distinctly, and if you don't understand any part of what I tell you, come in and break me off. It's vital that you understand me. Is that clear? Yeah, I understand. Okay. Now, I want you to listen very closely to my range signal. Put everything else out of your mind. Listen and describe exactly what you hear. Okay. Hello, Rockford. I hear a code sound. Is that the range? That's right. What does it sound like? Well, it, it's, uh, it goes, da, da, Okay, four, five, seven. Now, is it loud or soft? It's pretty loud. Okay, that's the N quadrant. Now, I want you to tune to the Madison, Wisconsin range and tell me what you hear. Okay, wait a minute. Yeah, uh, hello, Oxford. Uh, I've got the Madison range. What does it say? It's just like the other, only backwards. Uh, da-da, da-da. That's right. I can hardly hear it, but it's there all right. Yeah, okay, 457. That's the A quadrant. Now I want you to try Peoria and then Chicago. Rockford, Madison, Peoria, Chicago. Four corners to check from. 
Four radio sounds that you hope he's reading correctly. You finish the check and he comes through without a bobble, and you know you have him fixed. You know at least his direction from you. You take a deep breath and for the first time you feel a tiny flicker of hope that you're going to find your stranger and get him in all right. But you're a long way from home and you light another cigarette and push the black microphone button hard. Now listen carefully, 457. I'm going to run a check procedure on you. I want you to take up a northeast heading, turn your volume down as low as you can and still receive my range signal. At the very moment you detect a change in signal strength, either higher or lower, advise me. All right, Rockford. I'll do my best. I'm not sure that I... I'm not at all sure. Hello, 457. Can you hear me? Do you hear me, Beechcraft 457? Rockford. Yes, I read you now. I lost you for a second, but I hear your range signal now. Did you get all of my last transmission? Yeah, I think so. I think I can do it. Hello, Oxford. My gauges indicate empty tanks. There's some gas left, I know, but I have no idea how much. Do you know where I am? I'm quite sure of your direction from me, and I believe I know how far out you are within, say, 20 miles. If what you've told me is correct, I estimate you have 30 minutes fuel remaining. I believe your gauges are indicating normally. Now, try to concentrate on doing just what I've told you to do. Yeah, okay, Rockford. I don't want you to think I'm ungrateful. I realize you can't afford mistakes. But I can't last much longer. I'm not trying to hurry you, but the gauges say empty, and my son is getting sick. You didn't say anything about having any passengers aboard. How many are there of you? Just my son and me. Is the air rough? Is there turbulence? No, no turbulence. Uh, the air is smooth. But you said your son is getting sick. Yes. You see, he's only nine, and he's getting scared. That's what's making him sick. You don't say anything for a long minute. You just stare out into the miserable night, and your thoughts are not nice. You think of your own kid and you thank God he's home safely in bed. And you know now, if you didn't know it before, that you've got to bring these strangers home. You reach for the microphone button, but before you push it, the voice is back What's on your speaker. What's happened, Rockford? I, I can't hear you anymore. Did you hear me? I, I was talking to you and you didn't answer. Hello, Rockford. Come in, please. I'm reading you. 457, I heard everything you said. Now listen to me carefully. You should be approaching my west course close into the station. I want you to listen closely and describe any change in your signal. I won't call you. You call me when you hear anything change. Okay, Rockford. Hello, Rockford. The signal is much louder now, and I'm getting more of a continuous tone in my earphones, although I can still hear that other signal. All right, 457, that's fine, that's good. Now, listen carefully. Turn your volume down a little more, and when you no longer hear that other signal, and when the continuous tone is loud and clear, and when you hear nothing but the continuous tone, at that time I want you to turn right to a heading of 93 degrees magnetic. Is that clear? I, uh... Yeah, I think so. You think so? You've got to know so. When you hear nothing but a tone, when there's nothing but a loud buzz in your ears, I want you to turn right to nine three degrees on your compass. Do you understand me? Yes, I understand. Turn right to ninety uh, to nine three degrees on the compass when I hear a loud tone. That's correct. The tone is strong now. I don't hear the other signal. Nothing but the tone. Shall I... Yes, turn right, turn to 93 degrees, and advise. Advise? Advise when on course, when on 93 degrees, advise. Uh, Roger. Advise when on... I'm on course now, on 93. All right, good. Chicago Control Center has everything cleared on the 6,000. They're monitoring the calls, too. Okay, Mike, thanks a lot. What's the time? Uh, 9.40, straight up. 9.40? That's 12 minutes to make it in. Hello, 457. 
You're approaching the range now. You're almost over the station. The range is about two miles from where I'm sitting. The signal you hear will continue to increase in volume until you cross the range. At that time, it will fade out quickly. For a moment, you may hear nothing. Then it will increase again rapidly. Now, at the very instant your signal fades, I want you to make an immediate left turn to a heading of four or five degrees magnetic. Take that heading and advise. Understand? I understand. Mike, get on the phone and alert the local police and fire departments. Tell them what we've got and to be on the lookout for a fast move. Roger. Get all the lights on in the field, the runway markers. When we get him down through this, he won't have any time to spend looking for the field. Okay, will do. That is, if we get him down through it. You light another cigarette. You watch the clock on the desk. You try to keep your mind clear, to think ahead, to think of everything that can possibly happen, and the waiting is worse than anything yet. You keep reaching for that microphone, wanting to call him to ask him why he doesn't tell you he's over the range. And you know he hasn't called you because he isn't over the range yet. And you wait, and you wait, and then it comes loud and clear. Rockford! Rockford! I'm over the range and starting a turn. It's just like you said. It's exactly the way you said it would be. Roger, 457. You're doing fine. Now come left to 45, straight and level. Hold it until I tell you different. I'll call you back. I think you got him, Ken. Well, if he's where he ought to be, we should hear him in about 20 seconds. I'm going out the platform and listen. Call me if he calls in. Okay. You stand on the steel grating of that tower platform and you try to hear over the sounds from the field below. You strain your ears for a sound that should come to you out of the southwest. And you've never wanted to hear anything so much in your life. And then you hold your breath. You stop breathing to hear better. And it's there. A single engine singing a quiet, sweet sound and approaching directly on course. You flick your burning cigarette out into the black space and stumble back into the tower room. You grab the mic and you almost shout into it. Four, five, seven, four, five, seven. This is Rockford. You're over the field. I hear you clearly. Start a 360 turn immediately and orbit in your present area. Beginning of 360. For God's sake, tell me what to do. This engine is ready to quit. You snap a look at the clock. Nine, forty-six, five, maybe six minutes more if you're lucky. Six minutes at the outside to get him lined up properly for a straight-in approach, to talk him down through 4,000 feet of solid clouds. Six minutes to bring off a miracle. You waste 15 precious seconds debating the best way to do it. All along up to now, you've planned it this way. A good, steady, full-scale power approach, nose up a little, flaps down just enough, power on exactly right. Your mind has told you that this was the ticket, the only answer. With a good steady airplane, no turbulence to speak of, well-trimmed and hands-off, he might just make it. He might. But suddenly you're not sure. Maybe if he could pull his power, slow her down, trim her slow and steady, a touch of flaps, that might be the answer. That might do it. It would save precious gas if he missed his approach or he goofed up in the clouds, he could get back on top for another try. Maybe. You push the microphone button hard and try to sound calm. 457, I hear you plainly. You're circling the airport. There isn't time to talk this out. You'll have to do exactly what I tell you the first time and do it right. There simply isn't time enough. Oh, wait a minute. Do you have chutes? Do you have parachutes aboard? No. No parachutes. <laughs> All right, uh, 457. We'll have to do it this way. Now listen to what I have to say. You don't have to talk. Just listen. Come around to a due west heading. Due west. As you do, start slowing her down. Slow her down and trim her up for a power approach. A normal power approach, do you understand? I understand, Rockford. Don't talk to me. Bring her around, head west, with the power on. Slow her down, flaps down to approach position. Trim her up, make her steady. Advise when you're headed west and slow down. Ten. Fifteen. Twenty. Where is he? Where is twenty-five? Five. Four, five, seven. Are you there? Four, five, seven. I'm trying to get her steady. 
I'm trying to do what you told me. All right, four, five, seven. Don't talk. Advise when on course. Rockford, I, I'm on 270 now. Slowing down. I don't know. I just don't know. I know you don't know. All we can do is try. I understand. I'm down to 80 now. Flaps down and power on. Roger. Continue trimming her. Trim her down good. Adjust your power and trim her until she's descending at a steady 500 feet per minute. That's 500 per minute. Trim her good, do you understand? Trim her so good that she will let down at 500 feet per minute with your hands off. Do you get that? With your hands off. I understand. Now, 457, you're going to bring her around very slowly and precisely to an east heading. You're going to handle her very gently so she won't fall off on you flying so slow. You hear me? Yes, I hear you. Let her continue to settle at 500 feet a minute. Just bring her around slowly to the east, recover, and then take your hands off the controls. She won't fly with my hands off. She will fly. She'll fly better than you can. Now listen to me. When you are eastbound, hands off. She will descend slowly into the clouds. After you're in the clouds, do not touch the controls. I don't think I... Then don't think, do as I tell you. Now, when you get in the clouds, everything will change for you. You will think the airplane is all wrong, that it's doing everything that it shouldn't do. If you leave it alone, it will start a slow spiral to the left, but I don't think it'll be enough to do any harm until you've broken out under the ceiling. Now, whatever it does, you will think it's going to the right or up or down or even spinning... But it won't be doing any of those things unless you make it do them. Now, don't touch it. Now, are you eastbound? I'm eastbound, yes. Take your hands off the controls. But I... Take your hands off now. Okay. Hands are off. Now, let her have it. Let her fly herself. Ken, the ceiling's under 600 feet. That doesn't give him much time to recover and get his bearings when he breaks out. Oh, but... It... But it's all we can do. It's all anybody can do. You sit there waiting, only too aware of what can be happening in the cabin of Beechcraft 457, sweating out each second of time with a terrified pilot and his deathly scared kid. You wonder if this man, this stranger, and yet no longer a stranger, can keep his fantasies under control for that long letdown. The lonely, long letdown through total darkness with nothing but a great fear for a companion. A minute goes by, and another, and then... Rockford! Rockford! It's turning, Rockford! Turning! Airspeed's high! It's going higher! Get off those controls! Cut the throttle! I've got the throttle closed! She's slowing down fast! I can't see! I can't... Well, she's going to stall. Give her the throttle. Slowly, keep your hands off except the throttle. She'll climb back out on top if you keep your hands off her. Two minutes wasted. More than two minutes because he couldn't believe what you told him. You had him and then you lost him. And now, if the teacup of gas still in his tanks holds out, if he gets back on top, you still have it to do all over again. You begin to feel the long night closing in on you. He's almost calm when he calls you back this time. You can almost hear his sigh of relief. Hello, Rockford. I'm back on top now. Good. Maybe we have time for one more try. Now, let's try it with the power off this time. You may lose your engine before you can it's get... It's no use, Rockford. It's just no use. I can't do it. I was fine until I got into those clouds. I just couldn't sit there and do nothing. I just couldn't. I know I can't do it again. Listen, there's time. There's time for another try. Forget it. The engine just quit. That's it, Rockford. Well, you can still do Forget it. Forget it. You're wasting your time. 
I just want to say thanks for trying. Hello, 457. Hello. Hello, Beach. Hello, 457. He can't hear you. His hands froze to the mic. Yeah. You better hit the crash button. Roger. The Rockford Tower to all planes awaiting landing instructions. The emergency is over. Normal radio procedure is now in effect. Rockford, over and out. Rockford Radio, Delta 216, rest. WA-70, request permission. Suspense. In which Frank Lovejoy starred in The Long Night, adapted by Sam Pierce from the Atlantic Monthly Story by Lowell D. Blanton. Listen. Listen again next week, when radio's outstanding theater of thrills brings you another tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed in Hollywood by William N. Robeson. Included in tonight's cast were Stacey Harris, Byron Kane, Court Falkenberg, Sam Pierce, and Jack Crucian. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Paul Barron. Sound patterns by Ray Kemper and Bill James. With Jack Benny and his gang back on the air each Sunday, there's just no excuse for a frown. Later on today and every Sunday, get in on the fun on the lighthearted Jack Benny Show. It's always a joy to hear. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed over most of these same stations by Indictment. In just a moment, Suspense, starring Charles Lawton. Hi, Billy. Hi, Dad. You're working kind of late on your bicycle, aren't you? Yeah, the old bike hasn't been getting going just right. Boy, did I puff up 2nd Street this morning. <laughs> just like the car, Billy, till I had that new Autolite stay-full battery put in. Well, my boy, you just keep at it. I'm going in and coast along with Autolite batteries, spark plugs, and ignition systems on the suspense show. <laughs> Dad, if you want to listen to the Autolite show, you'd better stay out here in the garage with me. Why? Mom's got her bridge club in tonight. What? Why, yep. she doggone well knows I want to hear Charles Lawton. Buy all the drinks my stay-full battery doesn't eat, I... <laughs> Take it I... easy, Dad. Here comes Charles Lawton. Suspense. Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Starring tonight, Mr. Charles Lawton in Anton Leder's production of An Honest Man, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Sleep. I lay in bed that night listening to the stillness and loneliness of the empty house and tried to bring my mother back to me. Freddy, my son, I must leave you now. I know that you will miss me, but you needn't, for you are strong. I shall not be worried about you. I have taught you well. Taught me well. For the first time, the meaning of those words became clear to me. The tears dried in my eyes, my jaws clenched. That was the woman, my mother, to whom I'd been closer than anyone else in the world. Indeed, I'd been close to no one but my mother in all my 44 years. And after the tears, a flood of memories passed before my eyes. And after the memories came the realization that I was glad. 
My mother was dead, and I was glad. <laughs> the next day at the store, I worked in a sort of a haze of happiness and well-being. Dora smiled at me once or twice, but we were both very busy. During the rush hour, Mr. Kelser came in to help out, as he always did, and about a quarter to ten, he said what I realized that I'd been hoping to hear all day. You got your day's receipts totaled yet, Freddie? I'm just finishing them now, Mr. Kelsey. Yeah, then I think I'll knock off. When you get through, just put the money in the safe and lock it. I won't go to the bank till afternoon. Yes, Mr. Kelsey. You can both close up whenever you're through what you're doing. See you tomorrow. Yes, Mr. Kelsey. Good night, night Mr. Kelsey. Uh, $123.14. Check. Mr. Kelsey sure trusts you, don't he? He should after 26 years. 26 years? You've been working here that long? Sounds like a long time when you said. It doesn't seem that way to me. Well, I guess it's quitting time. Oh, boy, are my feet tired. 26 years. You gonna put out the lights or you want me to? Oh, I'll do that. Okay. Well, I'm leaving. So long. Um, Miss, uh, Dora. Yeah? May, may I ask you something? Sure, what is it? Well, uh... Oh, isn't it a beautiful night? Uh, you sure that door's locked? Oh, yes. I was just wondering... Mm. I was wondering if you'd mind if I walked home with you. It's a little out of my way. Well, sure, uh, why not? Oh, but say, don't you have to get home to your mother? Oh, gee, Freddy, I'm sorry. That's all right. Must have been a terrible blow to you. Yes. It was. And you taken care of her all that time? Twenty-six years, but you mustn't think that that was a hardship. You see, I owe everything in the world to my mother. Everything that I am or ever will be. Oh, I know what you mean. I always say, a, a person's Miss mother... Laura, I've never told this to anyone. Say, but I've been meaning to ask you, the way you always call me Miss Dora, and I mean, the way you talk, it's so refined. Really? <laughs> I bet you had a real good education once, didn't you? No, not formally. But you see, my mother was a governess, and she always tried to give me the same advantages as she would the children under her care. My mother was a highly educated woman. Well, I knew it must be something like that. Anyway, you don't have to call me Miss Dora. I mean, <laughs> seeing we're kind of old friends. Oh, uh, say, what was it you was going to tell me before? Oh, that was something about my mother. Something she taught me. Uh, I'll never forget uh, it as long as I live. You happened to remind me of it when you remarked how Mr. Kelsey trusted me. Well, what was it? Uh, well, it was just before my 11th birthday. There was a motion picture that I wanted to see very badly. It was something about cowboys, I think. But my mother said we couldn't afford it, and so I, I took ten cents from her purse, and she found it out. What'd she say? Well, she uh, whipped me. It was the only time she ever did, and, until I could hardly walk. <laughs> she said I'd done the worst thing that anyone could ever do, that I had been dishonest. I was a thief. <laughs> you dishonest. Oh, that's a laugh. I never knew anybody more honest in all my life. Well, look at the way Mr. Kelsey yes, always... Yes, but only because of what my mother taught me. I've been grateful to her all my life for that I always will be. Oh, yeah, I know what you mean. Well, they say honesty's the best policy, and I guess it is all right, but... Now, you take Tom Bass. What about him? Well, I wouldn't exactly say he's dishonest, but... He's sure having a lot more fun than you or me. But, Dora, I'm, I'm sure you'll agree that there are more important things in life than just having fun. Oh, sure, of course. I didn't mean it like that. And what I mean to say is, you, you couldn't admire a fellow like this Bass, could you? Tom Bass? Oh, I should say not thinks he's so smart with his wisecracks and his cheap jokes. I wouldn't give him the time of day. Is there anyone, that, that is to say, any man you do admire? Yeah, not me. Oh, I admire you, of course. Do you, Helly? Well, sure. <laughs> but if you mean, do I go out steady with anyone? Uh-uh. Uh, have you ever thought of the kind of man that you would go steady with? My dream man? <laughs> oh, sure. But you just don't find them growing on trees. 
Not that kind. What kind, Dora? Oh, when I say dream man, don't get me wrong. I don't go for those glamour boys. I've been around enough to know better than that. You just give me a nice, easy-going fellow with a steady job. <laughs> that, that, that sounds like a description of me. <laughs> and a little money put away in the bank. That's the kind of fellow I want. Did you say money? Well, sure. A fellow's never going to get very far if he doesn't have a little late aside for a rainy day. Oh, yes. Uh, Isn't that right? Yes, I suppose that is right. But uh, how much money do you think such a fellow ought to have? Oh, thousand dollars. You know, just something for kind of a little nest egg. Little, oh, yeah, yes, 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 of course, yes. Well, here's where I live. Thanks for the walk. Dora. Yeah? If you were to find such a man... Who? A man with a steady job and money in the bank... Oh, him. I mean, would you would you consider, I mean, would you... Uh... Would I what? Oh, oh, I get it. Well, sure, if I thought I could make him happy. Oh, I know you would. Why not? Well, till uh, death do us part. <laughs> <laughs> It was strange that she should have said that when death had parted me only a few brief hours before the, uh, from the only woman in my life, my mother. And now so soon after there was another woman, but she was there, that, that, that thousand dollars, that stood in the way. With all the expense of the funeral still to be met, I knew that it would take me at least two years to accumulate such a sum. And Dora was a warm and attractive girl. I couldn't expect her to wait that long. It wouldn't be fair, so by... By the next morning, my first fond hope had turned to black despair. I hardly noticed Tom Bass when he sauntered into the store. Hiya, honey. What are you doing that's new? Oh. Oh, hello there. What do you say, pretty boy? I beg your pardon. <laughs> What's the matter? You in love or something? Say, remember that horse I told you about last week? Horse? You remember Revelation. I told you to get down on him at eight to one. Oh, yes. Well, what did I tell you? Well, to tell you the truth, I, I have had a number of things in my mind lately. He won, chump. He won, just like I told you he would. Now, ain't you sorry you didn't get a couple of bucks down on him? Oh, yes, yes, but really, I don't know very much about horse racing. Never but... too late to learn. Say, give me a hot pastrami on rye, will you? Uh, mustard? Yeah. A little lettuce? No, skip that. You want it to go, or you can... I'll eat it here. Say, how come a guy like you ever learned to make such good sandwiches? They're the best in town, no kidding. My mother taught me. That effect. My mother taught me everything I know. Yeah. Say, hey, must be good to feel like that about your old lady. I haven't seen mine for ten years. Here you are. Thanks. Is your mother dead? No. I just took a powder when I was a kid. I couldn't stand it around there anymore. You couldn't stand it around your own mother? Yeah. All she ever did was yap, yap, yap. Huh. Why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do that? Finally, one day I told her what she could do and I beat it. But how could she get along without you? What did she do? I don't know. Same old thing, I guess. Waking the laundry. Say, yeah, uh, look, Freddy... <laughs> Pay her for the sandwich tomorrow, okay? All I got's a 50. Well, if you won't forget, I, I did have to remind you last time, you know. I, I have to take it out of my own pocket. <laughs> You're a good guy, Freddy. Say, in fact, you know what? I think I'm going to let you in on something. Oh. Freddy, listen. I got a tip so hot it's burning the seat of my pants. Hmm? Avalanche in the third at Santa Rosa today. Strictly a drugstore job. What? They're going to give him the needle. I got it from his trainer oh. myself in person. Avalanche can't any more lose that race than I can sing high C. You know what the odds are? A hundred to one. A hundred to one. A hundred to one. That's what I said. But do, you, do you mean to tell me that if someone were to bet ten dollars on this horse, they'd win back a thousand? You ain't just bird calling. You put a tenner on that beetle and you'll have one thousand bucks in your hot little hand by tonight. Oh, I wish I could, but I don't have ten dollars or anywhere near it. I, I don't get paid until tomorrow, you see. Oh, out of five. Here you are, Dora. Thanks. Hey, Freddie. What's the matter? Yeah. You can always lay your hand on a ten when you want it, can't you? I can. How? Oh, oh, no, 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 no. That's Mr. Kelsey's money. Oh, not till tonight. What Mr. Kelsey don't know, he's going to hurt him, is Oh, no, I, I couldn't do anything like that. Okay, I'll be back. But think it over, friend. One thousand skinneroos, and that ain't horse feet. One thousand skinneroos. <laughs> For 
suspense, Autolite is bringing you Mr. Charles Lawton in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Dad, I don't know what's coming next, but this story's got me in the mood to expect anything. Yeah, anything but invite a woman's bridge party in on Thursday night. <laughs> Still peeved at Mom, Dad. Well, I... Cheer up. This car radio is operating hunky-dory. Thanks to your new Autolite Stay Full battery. Besides, Mom's partner probably just trumped a race. So, uh, let's listen to Frank Martin, the Autolite announcer. Yes, the new Autolite Stay Full battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. This greater liquid reserve practically eliminates one of the major causes of battery failure. Car owners tell us it's the greatest battery ever built. The greatest battery ever built. Money cannot buy a better battery for your car. You know, Billy, the boys over at the service station tell me that these Autolite Stayfuls are really setting up some long time between drinks records. Yeah, Dad, I guess it's like having a camel under your hood, huh? <laughs> oh, better than that. An Autolite Stayful only needs a drink three times a year in normal car use. So, friends, see your friendly neighborhood Autolite battery dealer and order the new Autolite Stayful battery for your car. It needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And there are the important advantages of extra plates and fiberglass insulation that means so much to long battery life. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Charles Lawton as Freddy in An Honest Man, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Well, of course, I could think of nothing else all morning. My mind was in a whirl. A thousand dollars, with a thousand dollars, I could propose to Dora. I could propose to her that very night. At the same time, was the appalling thought of what I'd have to do. I, I would have to take ten dollars from the cash register. Ten dollars that was not mine. That would be stealing. I, I would be a thief. <laughs> thought I wondered perhaps Tom Bass was right it wouldn't be stealing if I put the money back and by tonight I'd have the thousand dollars I could put it back but that was it that was the difference when I'd taken the money from mother that time I had no prospect of replacing it but this way this this way it, 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 so the next time I went to the cash register to make change I slipped ten dollars out of the drawer and put it into my apron pocket after that, I found I was perspiring and my hands trembled so, so that I nearly cut myself a dozen times working at my sandwich board. And I saw Tom Bass coming through the door. Tom! Tom! Yeah? What's the matter? Not the ten dollars. The ten dollars? Oh! Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, now you're getting smart. Give it to me. I'll place it on yeah, that. Yeah, but Tom, are you sure? Are you absolutely sure? I tell you, the nag is in at a walk. I got a few skins down on this one myself, don't oh, forget. All right, but when will I get the money? Six o'clock tonight, the latest. I'll bring it around myself. Give me the ten. Yeah, I, you, you won't forget, will you? Forget? With a thousand bucks in my kick, how could I forget? Relax. You got nothing to worry about. Freddy? What was you and Tom talking about just now? Oh, he was just telling me about some horse or other. Well, you better be careful how you talk to him about horses. Why do you say that? Well, that's the way he makes his living, ain't it? Yes, I should rather imagine it is. Oh, Dora. Yeah? Would you care to, that is, when we're through work, would you, would you care to go somewhere with me this evening? Go where? Oh, my Freddy. Uh, Are you asking me for a date? Yes, I suppose I am. Oh, Freddy, that's real cute. I might even take you up on you, it. You mean that you will, you, you will go? I might. I'll <laughs> tell you at quitting time. Why can't you tell me now? Oh, something might come up. What could come up? I don't know what could come up. Anything could come up. One of us might drop dead. <laughs> strange sense of humor, Dora's. But I, I get used to that, you know. Anyway, she had practically said yes to the date. So I, I passed the rest of the afternoon busy with thoughts of the good fortune that was awaiting me. At five, Mr. Kelsey came in, and shortly thereafter, there was a rush of customers that took up all my attention, so that it was with something of a start that I looked at the clock and saw that it was nearly 6.30. But Tom had said six no later than six. Still, it was quite understandable that in a transaction of such magnitude, he might have met with some unforeseeable delay. 
So I tried to compose myself to remain calm and to wait, but the minutes and then the hours passed. By nine o'clock, I was in such a state I could hardly conceal it, and yet I had to. I had to, and then suddenly at 9.30, I saw him. He was walking rather hurriedly, I thought, along the opposite side of the street, and throwing caution to the wind, I dashed from behind the counter and out of the door. Tom! Tom! Oh, hi, Freddy. <laughs> For a minute there, I didn't recognize you. I'm so sorry to trouble you this way, but it was so late, I thought you might have forgotten. Uh, no, no, I, I didn't forget. Did you have the money with you? Uh, look, uh, Freddy, I've been meaning to come in all evening and tell you about that, but uh, I didn't know how to say, say it. Say what? Ah, it's getting so you can't trust nobody nowadays. Believe me, kid, I feel as bad about this as you do. Well, 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 well Tom, that what That lion trainer, he never done a thing to that horse. The bum come in last. You mean that we lost it? My money's gone. Yeah. Lost? Oh, don't take it too hard, kid. You stick with me and I'll have that ten back for you, double and triple by the end of next week. You know, somebody wins, somebody loses. You know, take it easy now. Mother. Mother. Help me. I'm a thief. I turned back to the store automatically, but even now, I could hardly grasp the full extent of the catastrophe which had overwhelmed me. All I knew that tomorrow was payday, and I could only prevent Mr. Kelsey from finding out until yeah, what then. What happened to you? Uh, what was that, Mr. Kelsey? You looked like you'd seen a ghost or something. You went charging out of here a couple of minutes ago. Oh, yes, I thought I saw someone I knew, someone I'd known as a child. Oh, yeah, that happens to me all the time. Does it? Well, it's pretty late. You can both beat it if you want to. I'll check the receipts tonight myself. Hey, what you doing? I dropped uh, a knife. You want us to go? Yeah, you might as well. I'll be here late anyway. I'll close up. Well, that sure don't make me mad. Gee, I've been ready to drop for the last hour. Mr. Kelsey, I'd be glad to check the receipts for you. You don't have yeah, to. Yeah, I know, but I got an order to come in tomorrow. I got to go over the books for the last six months. Seems I got some kind of beef with the tax people. Oh, come on, Freddie. Let the boss do a little work for a change. Anyway, I thought you had other plans for tonight. Yes, I did, but... Uh, Mr. Kelsey, I'd rather you let me do it, really. It wouldn't be any trouble. Well, if that's the way it is, I'm leaving. Uh, shove me over that ad machine before you go, will you, Dora? Yeah, sure. Uh, night, Mr. Kelsey. Night. Dora. Good night, Mr. McWilliams. What's the matter with her? You two been having trouble? Oh, no. Mr. Kelsey. Hmm? I do not like to have you checking the receipts all by yourself. I don't like it either. But it's got to be done. You run along now. I'll see you tomorrow. But I don't want you to do it. Look, Freddy, thanks for trying to help, but just leave me alone, will you? I got a lot of work to do tonight. No. Stop. Say, what's eating you? I told you once... Now, I've always done it before. It makes me feel that you don't trust me, oh, you see. Oh, Freddy, what kind of way to talk is that? <laughs> I've been trusting you for 26 years, haven't I? Why should I stop tonight all of a sudden? Mr. Kelsey. Hmm? Uh... 118.37. Hey, that's funny. We're $10 short. See, I knew what he would say next. I knew that I had to stop him before he said that awful word. Ten dollars short. Now, how could... Freddy, what are you doing? Freddy? Fred... I washed my hands most carefully at the sink and dried them on my apron. And I bent over Mr. Kelsey, or, or rather, <laughs> Mr. Kelsey's body, and, and, and I removed from his pocket the sum of $32.50, the exact amount that would be owing to me in salary on the following day. Of this sum, I put $10 in the cash register. Then I left the store and went home. It was all right now. Everything was all right. I was not a thief. <laughs> I was so exhausted when I got home and just dropped and just dropped in my bed. I, I must have fallen asleep that way because I was fully clothed when I was awakened some hours later. Yes. 
Yes, well, 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 who is it? It's me, Dora. Let me in. Oh, yes, of course. Mm. Oh, Freddie, I'm so glad I found you. Mm. You've got to help me. You've got to do something. Why, of course, my dear. What can I do? Freddie, Mr. Kelsey. Mr. Kelsey's dead. Oh, yes. I'm sorry that had to happen, Dora. Believe me, I am. How can you stand there and be so calm about it? Freddie, he was murdered and they got Tom for it. They say he did it. They mm. got him down at the police station right now. Tom? Tom Bass? Yes. Tom said he was just mm. going by the store and he saw the lights on and he went in. And then he found Mr. Kelsey there with a, a knife in him and, and he didn't know what to do. And just then the cop on the beat walked in and, and they arrested him right there. Well, I can hardly believe a man like Tom Bass could have any good reason to kill Mr. Kelsey. Well, that's what I said. That's what I've been telling the cops for the past hour. He may be a little shady, I said. Well, he may have done some things that wasn't exactly right, but my boyfriend wouldn't commit murder, I said. He wouldn't. Your boyfriend? Yeah, I said... Oh, gee, Freddie, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to... Yes, but you told me that there was not anyone. Well, there, there wasn't, honest. That's the truth. I, I'd just been out with him two, three times. I didn't know he meant anything. I, I didn't even think I liked him. But when I saw him down there and I saw what they were doing to him, Your well... Your boyfriend. Oh, Freddie, please. Please, don't be mad at me. I, oh, I was half crazy. I didn't know who else to come to. you got to do something for him. Dora. What? Do you love him? Yeah. Yes, I do. I see. Well, I left her there and started for the police station. Tom Bass meant nothing to me, of course. It meant less than nothing now. But, of course, Dora, that was something else again. I, I didn't know exactly what I should do, but the sergeant helped me to make up my mind. Well? I understand that you have a prisoner here who is accused of killing one Henry Kelsey. That's right. You his mouthpiece? Oh, no, no, no. I am, I, well, at least say I, I was an employee of Mr. Kelsey's for 26 years. Mac Williams? Frederick Aloysius Mac Williams. Yeah, we know about you. We may want to ask you a few questions tomorrow. But you got nothing to worry about. We got our man. You have all the evidence you need? Of course we got all the evidence we need. But why would we be holding him? Mm. We caught him red-handed. And he's got a record since he was 14 years old. Oh, dear, 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 dear me. But supposing that I had positive evidence that the prisoner Tom Bass did not kill Mr. Kelsey? This had better be good, I'm warning you. Uh, tell me, it would be uh, dishonest to withhold that information, wouldn't it? You're doggone tootin' it would. <laughs> I mean, you see, it would be like stealing, wouldn't it? I mean, it, it, it would be stealing. It, it, it's stealing another man's life. But are you trying I'm to sorry, kid somebody? No, no, no. I've never been more serious in my life. All right. If you know so much, who did kill Kelsey? I did. Poor Dora. I'm afraid she'll have to wait a year for Tom Bass. It seems the police frown on his method of making a living. Well, as for me, a great calm has settled over me. Oh, such a calm as I've never known before in my life. Soon I shall be joining Mother. She will smile when she sees me, and I know that she'll be proud of me, and she'll understand. She'll understand that whatever faults I may have had, I was not a thief. <laughs> Thank you, Charles Lawton, for an extraordinary performance. Mr. Lawton will return in just a moment. Say, Billy, Charles Lawton was certainly in the groove tonight. I'll say. Hey, Dad, here comes Mom. I just huh. thought you two'd be out here puttering you and your bikes and batteries with Charles Lawton on the suspense program, too. Mary, did you listen to suspense? Why, of course I did. 
You're always talking about your Autolite Stay Full battery, so I thought I'd listen to Suspense and get the real bags. Oh, what, what about the Bridge Club? Oh, they came early so we could all listen to Charles Lawton. Uh, mm. My guests are just leaving now. Well, Dad, I guess we men can't win. What do we do now? Why, finish your evening right, gentlemen. Listen to the Autolite announcer signing off. So remember, folks, Autolite Stay Full needs water only three times a year in normal car use. That's another reason why everybody is switching to Autolite Stay Full Batteries. Autolite means batteries. Stay Full Batteries. Autolite means spark plugs. Ignition engineered spark plugs. Autolite means ignition system. The lifeline of your car. And now, here again is Mr. Charles Lawton. It has been a great pleasure to appear again on Suspense. And I'm certainly looking forward to listening next week when Anne Southern comes to the microphone as a deceiving wife who learns a lesson the hard way. It is a story titled, Beware the Quiet Man. And it's a gripping study in... Suspense. Charles Lawton may currently be seen in Paramount's The Big Clock. Tonight's suspense play was written by Robert L. Richards, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Anne Southern in Beware the Quiet Man. Suspense Show. We congratulate the United States Coast Guard on the celebration of its 158th anniversary this week. Good night. Switch to Autolite. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you A Ring for Maria, a suspense play starring Mr. Cornell Wilde. Oh, John, it's a beautiful ring. So you like it. A nice Uh, diamond, huh? John, I can't tell you how much. Oh, Maria, I would have done more for you and long ago, but for my business trouble, like like a stone around my neck hangs that. I know, John. The store. Yes, the store. That's why it's necessary to do this thing tonight, for both our sakes. Oh, John. It was crazy of me, I know, but I was worried the way things were between us that perhaps you didn't love me anymore. But no, I... After tonight, Maria, there will be... Other moments like this, many of them. When we get our money from the fire insurance company, we we needn't rush back into business again. After all, we have been working hard for nearly ten years. We'll go someplace, enjoy ourselves first, together. I can hardly believe it. Only, only I wish that tonight was over with. When I think of what we must do. There's nothing to worry about, Maria. In the morning, you will be at your aunt's home in Minneapolis, and I... I will be here to handle everything myself. Don't you see? You'll be safe. And if I wasn't sure of everything, would I be willing to stay alone and face all the questioning? Oh, John. You're willing to do this for... For for both of us, Maria. For our future. Now I can tell you how much this ring means to me. As long as I live, I will never take it off. Now I will go finish packing my bag. She kissed me before she went. And then I sat there on the couch and rubbed away at my mouth. She always smelled like laundry water, I thought. She was so big, older than I was. Now she had never appealed to me as the kind of woman I should have. 
If I hadn't been so frightened by America when I first arrived, I would never have married her at all. But Maria and the marriage settlement her father offered, <laughs> he wanted her to have a nice boy from the old country, he said. Yes, Maria and the money seemed to go with this great new land. No more slaving for a living. I could start a business and this big blonde would work. But now our business at this store had gone to pieces, so burn the store. With the fire insurance money, I, I would have a chance for the kind of life I deserved. Oh, it was smart touch to give her the ring. Without blinding her eyes, she'd do whatever I wanted her to do. And afterwards, there'd be no trouble divorcing her. I had tested her in quarrels. She was the kind that takes her beatings silently. In just a moment, Mr. Cornell Wilde in the first act of A Ring for Maria. Well, ringing in the new year early, Harlow? Why, no, Hap. Those are only the three chimes. What three chimes? The three chimes a year an Autolite Stay Full battery needs water in normal car use. Harlow, you deserve life for that. <laughs> and I'll take it if it's the longer life of an Autolite Stay Full, because the Stay Full gives 70% longer life, as proven by tests conducted according to SAE minimum life cycle standards. You're positive, Harlow? Positive is the word. Half every positive plate in the Autolite Stay Full battery is protected with fiberglass retaining mats to reduce flaking and shedding and keep the power-producing material in place. You've sure got your battery problem solved for 1951, Harlow. Right, Hap. And friends, for the new year, see your neighborhood Autolite battery dealer and have him install an Autolite Stay Full battery. A battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with a ring for Maria and the performance of Mr. Cornell Wilde, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. Before I left the house, I told Maria to be sure and telephone her aunt in Minneapolis that she was coming. Then I stopped in at a bar and ordered a whiskey. When the bartender wasn't looking, I spilled this whiskey all over my shirt front. Next, I telephoned my friend, Frank Laszlo, and told him to stop in at my house at 11.15 on his way home from his restaurant. He would be my alibi. I was getting ready for the part of the plan I hadn't told Maria about yet. I wasn't going to tell her. That part... That part she was supposed to guess. Joe? Oh, I'm so glad you're back. I tried not to think of it, but... John, you look... What's the matter? I, I can't do it. What? I... I can't go. I can't trust myself. I, I even had some drinks to get up my nerve, but... No, I, I, I've been through too much all these months worrying. Oh, you have been drinking. I can smell it. You never drink. I told you. I, I had to do something. I tried to pretend that I was brave, that this thing tonight, because it meant so much to us, I, I would go through with it. But I can't. I, I can't. It takes a stronger person than I am. Oh, but, John, if you mean the fire burning the store, I'm glad we're not going. It was a terrible thing anyway. I'm glad. What are you glad about? The insurance is our only hope. Do you know what it means? Without it, we, we have nothing. It's the end of, of things of you and me, of everything. I, I will have to go away alone. I couldn't go on with you knowing that I'm a failure as a man. John, it is not the end. Let them take the store. We'll begin fresh again. No, no, it, it was the only thing. Now we shall fail. I shall just go somewhere and disappear and you... Yes? Yes, John? What about me? That's what I hate to think about. That I, that I must leave you. If only this thing tonight could be done. It's so simple. It's all arranged. We would have had happiness. John! John, let me do it. You were willing to stay behind and face everyone while I was safe at my aunt's? Why shouldn't I be willing to do as much now that this strain has proven too much for you? You stay here, John. I will go to the store. I will do it myself and then get on the train. It will be as we planned, only... Oh, to, 
Just don't talk like that anymore. About leaving me. No. no. <laughs> I, I was just talking. I was just talking. <laughs> It was 11.15. Maria had been gone 20 minutes when I heard Frank's ring at the door. Good. I would keep him a half hour and by then the fire should have been discovered and someone would call me. Hello, Frank. Come in. Come in. Uh, good evening, John. It's so nice of you to let me come so late. Uh, does the letter mention my mother... How is she getting along? Yes, and your brother and his wife all are well. Ah. Come, sit down here. I have poured a glass of wine for each of us. Thank you, thank you. Uh, where is Maria? Asleep? No, she went out to visit friends. At least that's what she said. You think I should suspect her, perhaps? Oh, no, no, John. Everyone knows how Maria feels about you. Yes, of course. I about her. A good girl, Maria. But here, you want the letter. Here. Ah, here yeah. it is, Frank. Go ahead, read it. I'll pour some wine. John, a whole bottle of wine we put away. I'll never be able to sleep. And it's nearly midnight. Now, don't be foolish. It's wine, not that ink you sell for coffee. <laughs> You'll sleep. Well, I'm off. Uh, thanks for calling me no, about no, the letter. No, don't go, Frank. I don't get to see you often. Uh, your phone, John. Uh, answer it. I will find my way out. Uh, well, all, all right, Frank. It is nearly midnight, eh? Uh, seven minutes to. Uh, good night. Good night. Hello? Hello? Hello, is there someone on the line? What is that? Who? Who is it? What did you call for? Oh, John, I'm murdered. What? What, what happened? I fell afterward in the dark, in the fire. I, I don't understand if you were burned. I beat at them. I beat at the flames on my dress and put them out. I got up the stairs and ran from the store. Did you remember to lock the door? I, I don't know. I was in pain, I tell you. I walked and cried. I, I didn't know what to do. And then I saw a little bar... I waited till it was almost empty, and that's where I am now. In the telephone booth. Oh, John, please come. Do something for me. But if, if you're in a bar, the people, the, can they see? No. No, I, I took my coat off when I went into the store before I went down to the basement. That's why the fire burned through my dress so quickly. Now I have my coat on. I can't tell. I can't tell. Maria, Maria, do you hear me? Yes, John. I'm coming. I'm coming with the car. Wh where is the place? A little bar. Clock Street, near the railroad yard. Yes, yes, I know. Uh, leave the place and wait for me behind the freight loading platform where it is dark. I'll be there in 20 minutes. Don't talk to anyone. Don't let anyone see you too closely. Do you understand? Yes, John. Hurry. Hurry. Yes? Is this the home of John Markov? Yes. Are you John Markov? Yes. You operate a stationery store at 410 Wells Street? Yes, that, that's my place. Why? What, what happened? Now, this is the police department. There's a fire there. You better get right down. Fire in my place? How, how how bad is it? How did it start? What's burning? Don't know any answers like that yet, Mr. Marco. I understand it's just striking out now, and they haven't been in the place yet to look around. But you better get down there and help check. Uh, shall I get word to them that you're coming? Well, yes, of course, right away. Uh, Mr. Marco. Yes? Uh... You've been home all night, Mr. Markov? Well, yes, why? You'd better hurry down. Yes, yes, I will. Yes, yes, but which would I go to first? To Maria, who sounded in such pain she might tell everything to the first person who found her? Or to the store, where the fire people and perhaps the police were waiting to talk to me? I wanted to go to the store, but I didn't dare. I didn't dare to leave Maria alone. It was nearly a, a half hour after midnight when I drove up to the alley where I told her to wait. Maria, Maria, here. Hurry. I can't, John. I... Get in, come on. John, a doctor. Right away. Right away, John. Maria, how badly are you burned? Are you sure it's... John, bad. 
Maya, listen to me. The police have called me by this door, and they are waiting for me there. You understand? The police? The police are waiting? But, but you will take me to a doctor first. You will. How can I, Mari? I told them I would be right down. I'd lost time driving to pick you up first. It will look suspicious. Very suspicious if I'm delayed. But, but I must. What will I do? Mari, I, I must leave you someplace in the car and go the rest of the way in a cab. I will get through with them as quickly as possible. And then I will be back for you. I can't. I can't wait any longer. You have to, Maria. Don't you understand what it means? You must promise that you will that you will stay in the car quietly until I call. All right. All right. So, uh... You wouldn't know anything at all about how the fire got started, eh? No, I, I w would not, sir. And uh, you were home with this friend from 11.20 until nearly midnight? Uh, yes, that's right. I I was home with my friend Frank Laszlo. He owns that restaurant right on the corner there. He always closes up uh, by 11, and tonight he stopped in to uh, read a letter I received from friends of ours in the old country. All right. We'll talk to Mr. Laszlo. In the meantime, Mr. Markov, you better drop in at the fire marshal's office in the morning at 10 o'clock. You mean that I know? I don't mean anything. Well, certainly. Anything I can do to help, I'll be there, of course. Of course. It had taken a half hour of the talking. I knew from their manner that they had found the kerosene or smelled it. Then I was back at the car looking at Maria. She appeared unconscious, but when I started to drive away... You were gone so long. I couldn't help it, Maria. It wasn't pleasant, I, you know. No. No, Dr. John. So he can do something for me. All right, all right. John, how are you talking to me? To frighten me? Frighten you? What about me? Don't you think I am frightened? What do you suppose will happen if I take you to a doctor? He'll want to know everything, and he will have to report it. But somewhere, John, I must have treatment. Where? Name the place where taking you won't be the same as going straight to the police. Well, then, the police. Anybody, anybody who will help. John? John? I couldn't answer her. I was trapped now, I thought. All I had to do was bring her in for help anywhere. No doctor, no hospital would treat her without reporting the case to police. And to take her home. <laughs> if the police caught me bringing Maria there, if they found that she was burned, and I was helping her. For hours, it seemed I drove that night wandering, thinking, trying frantically to find some solution. While Maria stared straight ahead not speaking. Sometimes she would cry. Then it was quiet again. She slept. I wanted to get away from other cars, from people. So I turned onto an old dirt road that led along the river. When I got to a dark spot, I stopped. John? Yes, I'm here, Maria. Uh, are we at the hospital? No. And there is no doctor? No, there is no doctor. There's no hospital. And there is not going to be any. You got yourself into this, and you got me into it. When you are found burned, it's prison for both of us. John, John, I said prison. Separate prisons, thank goodness. Anything to get away from you. Now do you understand? Now let me hear you say John again. Once more before I go. Yes. Once more. But let me touch you. Let me just touch you. What are you doing? John! Get back. Take your hands away from my face. John! John! Somehow, I got out of the car and away from her. It must have been with her last strength that she attacked me because she, she fell back. But then when I stopped to look back, she was out of the car, standing unsteadily on the ground. I called, but she didn't hear. She turned, and I saw that she was trying to reach the river edge. She was weak, 
rock sagging under her weight. But she kept on and made it almost. At the very edge of the river, she slumped to the ground in a kneeling position. I started for her, but inside of me I felt only jelly. And then as I stood there, I saw she was doing something with her hands, as if wringing them. Then I realized she was taking off the ring, the diamond ring she had said she would keep on as long as she lived. It must have slipped from her hand because she started pouring around in the dirt. Then she got it turned and threw it at the car with all her strength. With the effort threw her off balance, and she slowly fell backward like an old doll into the water. She was gone. God. Now I was out of it. They wouldn't be able to touch me. Free. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Cornell Wilde with Irene Tedro in A Ring for Maria. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Harlow, what are your plans for the start of a new year? Same as usual, Hap. I always get the start of the year with an Autolite Stay Full battery. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. But aren't you going to welcome the year in? Why, sure, Hap. Year in and year out, there's nothing more welcome than the dependable starting power and extra convenience of the Autolite Stay Full battery. You be the life of the party, Harlow. Hap, my good man, you can't beat the Autolite Stay Full for longer life. Seventy percent longer life, in fact, as proven by tests conducted according to SAE minimum life cycle standards. Aren't you going to raise your champagne glass, Harlow? You mean fiberglass, Hap, because every positive plate of an Autolite Stay Full battery is protected with a fiberglass retaining mat to reduce flaking and shedding and keep the power-producing materials in place. But, Harlow, everybody's going to... To start the new year by having their neighborhood Autolite battery dealer install an Autolite Stay Full, a battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Cornell Wilde in Elliot Lewis's production of A Ring for Maria, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Early in the morning, I went to a police station. I had decided it would look odd when Maria's body was found if I had not reported her absence. They took her description and then... How about jewelry? Did she have any she might be wearing? Uh, only her wedding ring and earrings. Uh, gold earrings shaped like a hoop. Nothing else? Uh, nothing. All right, Mr. Markov. We'll call you the moment we hear anything. Well, I think she'll be walking in on you soon. That's our experience in these cases. I breathed easier when I left the station. <laughs> I had almost told him of the diamond ring. I didn't want to because I had failed to find it when I made a hurried search before leaving the river's edge. But I knew the spot, and when things quieted down, I planned to go there in daylight and search again. It was worth too much to let go. Just now, the only thing ahead of me was the visit to the fire marshal's office at 10 o'clock. But I wasn't worried about that. Let them ask their questions. I had an alibi. I was home when the fire started. And the only person who could implicate me in any way was dead. Yes, I had to admit, things had turned out not bad. Not bad. Oh, yes, sir? Oh, my name is John Markov. I'm to see the fire marshal this morning. Oh, yes, Mr. Markov. Just a moment. Mr. Markov is here, Marshal. Very well. The marshal is coming out, Mr. Markov. Uh, good morning, Mr. Markov. Had a lot to think about. Yes, I've heard. 
The fire, and then this morning early you reported your wife missing, didn't you? Yes, I was going to tell you about it, too. I was already informed, and I'm afraid I have what may be bad news for you, Mr. Markov. The police think they've found her. Found her? How? Where? Very unusual. You reported her as alive only last night, yet this morning, a half hour ago, her body was found floating in the river. The description tallies exactly. Floating? You mean... You mean she was drowned, Maria? I don't mean anything of the kind. Come along, Mr. Markov. Police are waiting for you to make positive identification at the morgue. I didn't like the way the marshal talked or acted with me. It made me feel as if something had gone wrong. But I told myself to stop worrying. They could know nothing, especially if Maria was dead. But what did he mean talking as if she wasn't drowned? I was still thinking about this when we got to the undertakers. Two men were standing outside. They noted that the marshal and something told me they must be detectives. Then one of them spoke to me. You're Mr. Markov? Uh, yes. I'm Sergeant Holbrook with the Homicide Bureau of the Police Department, Mr. Markov. We'd like to take a look through your car. Is it here? Why, sure. Go ahead. And uh, Let me have your keys. Do you mind? Yes. We might have to move the car one reason or another. Uh, yes, sir. All, all right. Come uh, along yes. this way, Mr. Markov, for the identification. Well, Mr. Markov? It's... it's her. It's Maria. But how... what happened? What happened was a tragedy, Mr. Markov. But uh, do you see those marks on her body? Yes, yes. Those marks are burns. And there was a fire in your store last night. But I don't understand you. You, you think Maria... Marshal, can I talk to you for a moment? Oh, yes, Sergeant. Look over here. Mr. Markov, did you know your wife telephoned her aunt in Minneapolis last night and told her she was arriving for a visit there this morning? Did you or didn't you know that, Mr. Markov? You're awfully slow answering very simple questions. No, 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 I, I did not know it. I see. Well, anyway, she did, Mr. Markov. You might like to know how we found out, would you? Why, yes. You see, when your wife wasn't on the morning train at 7 o'clock, her aunt got worried and telephoned your house but got no answer. I was at the police station reporting Mario's absence. That's right. At 9.30, your wife's aunt telephoned again, but this time to your place of business. Naturally, she was told the line was out of order. Now she really was worried, and that's how we found out about it. She telephoned the police. I talked to her. Did you tell her that Mario... No, Mr. Markov. I knew a body had been found that answered the description of Mrs. Markov, but I wasn't sure yet. I'm only sure now. But Mrs. Markov's aunt told me something else. It seemed that your wife was very happy about a gift you gave her last night. And naturally, as women will, she had to talk about it. She told her aunt. You remember the gift? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. It slipped my mind in all this that has happened. The ring, you mean. The diamond ring, you mean. That's right, Mr. Markov. She was wearing that ring, wasn't she, when you last saw her? Uh, yes, yes, I forgot. She must have been wearing that. That's right. And she left the house before the fire, naturally. About 11, you reported. And you never saw her after that until this morning, here? No, I, I did not. You're sure? You're very sure of that? Yes, yes, I'm sure. Then how is it, Mr. Markov, that when we looked at your car just now, we saw something that had been caught in the rain scupper that runs along the side of the body over the windows? And this, Mr. Markov, is what we found stuck in there along with some loose, fine gravel. This diamond ring. What of it? The coroner's physician found no water in your wife's lungs. She didn't drown. In his opinion, she died from heart failure, directly superinduced by her pain and burns. How did this terribly injured woman get to the river, miles from the scene of the fire? The diamond ring tells us the answer. She was taken there and thrown in. Thrown in by you, who watched her die, even though you might have perhaps saved her life by getting medical aid for her. But I didn't throw her in. She fell in, I tell you. She fell in. It was an accident. No, Mr. Markov. We don't talk the same language. In mine, the death of your wife was murder. Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Cornell Wilde. 
Well, see you next year, Harlow. Okay, Hap. And in the meantime, don't forget. Uh, don't forget what? That Autolite makes over 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original factory equipment on many leading makes of America's finest cars. Electric windshield wipers, starting motors, voltage regulators, coils, distributors, wire and cable, generators. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. And because all Autolite parts are original factory parts... You can be sure you're right, because you're always right with Autolite. Next week on Suspense, Mr. Mickey Rooney, a star of Alibi Me. And in weeks to come, you will hear such famous stars as Ginger Rogers, Eve Arden, and Ezio Pinza, all appearing in tales well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Bluskin. A Ring for Maria was written for suspense by Lewis Pollock. Cornell Wilde is next to be seen in the new RKO Technicolor production, Sons of the Musketeers. And remember, next week on Suspense, Mr. Mickey Rooney in Alibi Me. This is Harlow Wilcox again to wish each and every one of you on behalf of Suspense and 96,000 Autolite dealers from coast to coast a happy and prosperous new year. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations present... Suspense! Tonight, Autolite brings you Mr. Dana Andrews in... If the Dead Could Talk. A suspense play produced and directed by Anton M. Leder. Friends... You know what happens when you take a fish out of water? Sure, it dies. Well, by Cornelius, the same thing happens when your car's battery runs out of water. It lies right down and quits. No water, no life. So what did the Autolite people do? They made the Autolite stay full battery with an extra large liquid reserve. Gave it more room for more water. Result, the Autolite stay full battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Think of it. Autolite stay full batteries need water only three times a year in normal car use. Just like that, Autolite practically eliminates one of your major battery bothers. So, friends, be right with Autolite. Switch to an Autolite stay full battery tomorrow. And now, Autolite presents Dana Andrews in a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. They'll never know how it happened. No one will ever know. I knew I was going to have to kill him almost from the first. That's how I am. That's what my blood is. I couldn't change it even if I tried. We were on a circus train, the three of us in the trapeze act, going from Tulsa to St. Louis. Fran had asked me to come and sit with her, but she had something to tell me. When I went over, she was staring out the window into the night. And the dim train lights made her features kind of kind of soft and blurred. And I stood watching her getting all choked up like I always did. Wanting to freeze this picture of her in my brain with all the other pictures. Then she saw my reflection on the window glass and she turned. Oh, Joe. Hi. Well, sit down, Joe. Sure. What's the secret? Joe, I can't keep it inside me a second longer. If I do, I'll bust. Hmm? Tommy and me have been talking about getting married. Hi, you kids. Huh? <laughs> oh. Well, honey, did you tell them? Uh, as she told me. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> That's all? Just congratulations? Well, you know Joe's a man of few words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what do you think, Joy Boy? At least we'll be able to keep her in the act now, huh? Yeah. That's probably the only reason he's marrying me. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, the way I figured, it had to be one of us. And Joe, you're my pal. I couldn't let it happen to you. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and then Tommy threw his arm across my shoulder. I felt every nerve in my body tighten up, like somebody was turning a screw. And I thought, so this is how your life goes smash. Rattling through the night on a dinky train with a circus fat lady sitting across the aisle munching chocolates. I didn't know what I was going to do. Not then. At first, I, I tried to go on just like before. When we got to St. Louis, Tommy and me shared a room in a theatrical hotel like always. And the three of us went on through our routines on the high trapeze, like always. Yeah, that part was the same. That part was as natural as breathing. But the other things, like the looks they gave each other, the long walks together. Oh. And nothing worked for me. Drinking myself blind, taking out a different girl in the show every night of the week. Nothing worked. I still woke up in the middle of the night, shivering, my heart pounding and crying her name. Fred! 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 Uh, Joe. Joe. Joe, what's wrong? Huh? Oh. Uh, nothing's wrong. You were yelling in your sleep. Uh, I'm okay. You sure? Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. Oh. What are you getting dressed for? It's the middle of the night. I'm going for a walk. But, Joe, Look, you... I want to go for a walk, so I'm going for a walk. Joe, Fran and I were noticing you. Noticing what? You've been going at this nightlife pretty hot and heavy lately. For a fellow who works on a trapeze 60 feet up and without a net, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> well, that's not so good, Joe. What's the matter? You afraid someday I won't catch you, Tommy? Look... Why don't you take it a little easier, kid? It's all right to have a good time. Good time? So that's what I'm having. <laughs> what do you know? I walked the dark, empty streets for hours. I didn't know where I went or why. Why did it have to be him and Fran over and over again? Why did it have to be him and not me? And then... It was like coming out of a sleep, almost. I realized that for a long time I'd been looking through the lighted window of an all-night pawn shop, looking at a gun. At first, I started walking away fast. Then I turned back and went into the shop. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Now, that revolver in the window there, the black one next to the binoculars. Oh, yes, that's a beauty, ain't it? Yeah, I want it. Good enough. Can't go wrong on that one. You got your permit, of course. Uh, no, I... I was just passing through town. I didn't have time to get one. Well, uh, I'm sorry, mister, but I can't help you. I've got a hundred dollar bill that says you can. You've just bought yourself a gun. It was after three in the morning when I got back to the hotel. The gun was in my top coat pocket. As I walked through the lobby, the circus fat lady was sitting on the big sofa, counting the faces that went through the revolving door. She stopped me as I went past her. Turning in, Joe? Yeah. Lucky you can sleep. Wish I could sleep. I started for the elevator, and then it hit me. How dumb can a guy be, walking into the lobby like that, being seen going up to the room? Is that all you want, Joe? That he should be dead, no matter what happened to you? Don't you want friend? Don't you want to live? I turned back and started out again. Uh, no, Patsy, I guess I won't go upstairs after all. Oh? Nothing to do till tomorrow afternoon, anyhow. Maybe I'll take in an all-night show. I haven't seen a show since I was a little girl. Can't fit in the seat. I went around to the back of the hotel. Tommy and me room three stories up next to the rusty fire escape... It was so quiet there, I could hear the pounding inside my head. The first rung of the fire escape was a good ten feet off the ground. I jumped for it and pulled it down. It made enough noise to wake up half the building. I scrambled up into the shadows. I expected the lights to start going on in every window. But nothing happened. So, when I started up the fire escape, I started up for Tommy. Tommy. 
I reached the landing. The room was dark. The window was closed. I, I tried raising it, but, but it was locked. <clears throat> Why did everything have to go bad for me? Oh, wait a minute. He never locked the window before. Why did he lock it now? What was he afraid of? How could he know what was inside me? Well, suddenly I had to do something, so I smashed the window with my fist. I didn't care. Let him know it was me. Let him know what was coming. I reached in, unlocked the window, went over the sill. I took the gun out of my pocket. I could feel the blood running warm down my arm. And then I saw that he was gone. The room was empty. I sat down on the bed. I, I felt weak in my knees. I sat there a long time, numb. Then I heard a key in the door. It was him. He'd come back. I put the gun back in my pocket. I held it there. And the door swung open. I saw him, framed in the light from the hall. And I thought, now, do it now. For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Mr. Dana Andrews in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. You know this spell of freezing weather that drifted over sunny California by mistake last week? <laughs> I'll see. Well, bye, Cornelius. I haven't had so much fun since my Autolite Stay Full battery last needed water, and that's a mighty long time ago. You mean you enjoyed the cold, huh? You bet. Listen, I was purring along up in the mountains in my Autolite-equipped car, you see, when I spied a stricken stranger stuck in the snow. He had on a raccoon coat and a coonskin cap, and he was looking under the hood of his car, muttering, water, water everywhere, not a drop in my battery. <laughs> Friend, I said to this shivering shambles, if you had an Autolite stay-full battery in that thirst-starved convertible, you'd be singing how deep is the ocean instead of how dry I am. <laughs> what do you mean, asks he. So, of course, I told this chap that Autolite stay-full batteries have an extra-large liquid reserve. Autolite stay full batteries, I said, need water only three times a year in normal driving. You get that, pal? Only three times a year. And then I explained that thanks to extra plates and special fiberglass insulation, Autolite stay full batteries have extra power and extra long life, too. Uh, but, Harlow, uh, did you get the poor fellow unstuck? Sure did. I just happened to have an extra Autolite stay full battery in my trunk. So I lent it to him until he could get one of his own at his nearest Autolite dealer's. I'll sure switch to Autolite, he said as he zoomed off. And I answered, you're right with Autolite. Right, Harlow. But right now, suspense. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Dana Andrews as Joe in a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I held the gun in my pocket. The door swung open and I saw him framed in the light from the hall. And I thought, now, do it now. When'd you come back, Joe? A while ago. Uh, where's that light switch? Don't turn the lights on, Tommy. What's the matter with you? I said... What do you got against lights? How can you just sit there in the dark? You know, Fran and I wonder what happened to you. We were out looking for you. I held tight to the gun in my pocket. I followed him with it as he moved around the room, stopping at the dresser to comb his hair, whistling because he was getting franned and it was such a good feeling. And all I had to do was just squeeze the trigger. Come on in. Say, honey, Fats tells me that you... Oh, you got back, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, what did you do to yourself? Look at that arm, Tommy. His arm, it's bleeding. Hey, I didn't notice that. Joe, you take your coat off. I'll get some towels and mercurochrome from the bathroom. What'd you do? Get yourself in a brawl? No, not exactly. Tommy, I... where's the mercurochrome? Hurry up. Oh, I'll show you where it is. Get your coat off, Joey. Yeah. I hurried to the dresser, dug the gun out of my pocket and put it in the drawer. Fran came back with an armful of stuff. Her fingers started to probe my arm while she was rolling up my sleeve. Look what this guy did to himself. Joey, you big silly kid, you. What are you fighting for? Tommy, get enough... Hey, what happened to this window? Well, that's how I, I cut myself just now. I, I thought it was stuck. You know me, long on muscles and short on brains. Well, it's all right. Just a little cut. Our boy's going to be all right, Tommy. The show goes on, doesn't it, Joey? Sure, sure. Oh, such a sweet, helpless guy this is. 
We got to take better care of our boy, Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, our Joey's just a great big kid. He likes to go on adventures with silly blondes, but there's nobody got wrists like this man to catch my Tommy when he flies through the air with the greatest of ease. You know, Joe, I wouldn't trust Tommy's life in anybody's hands but yours. And she leaned over me and I could smell her hair. And her warm breath danced around my eyes. And him and that whistling. Why shouldn't he whistle? He had the world. He had Fran. There. How's that feel, Joey? Her talking into my face. Smoothing my hair. Now, don't you punch any more windows in the nose, you understand? Didn't she see what she was doing to me? Didn't they see what was happening to me? How could two people be so blind? Couldn't they see? Feel better, Joey? I asked you. Leave me alone. Leave me alone! So I went walking in the streets again, burning inside like a guy with a 105 fever, still smelling the perfume in her hair, still hearing her voice in my head. It was after four in the morning when I got back to the hotel. Nobody in the lobby. Nobody but the room clerk, taking a snooze at the desk. This time, Tommy was in bed, asleep. I sat on the edge of the bed for a long time, listening to his breathing. <clears throat> then I went to the drawer and got the gun. I laid it aside for a moment, and I scattered the stuff on the drawer like a burglar would. He was looking for something. Then I went over to where his pants were hanging on a chair. I guess I got a little excited. As I grabbed for the pants, the chair fell over. I waited, my heart hammering away like it was trying to break loose. But he didn't wake up. I found his wallet and his pants. Then his watch on the nightstand. Then I went over to the broken window, looked down. It was dark. Not a sound. Tomorrow, all the cops in the city would be looking for the burglar who came up the fire escape and killed his victim when caught in the act. I went back to the dresser for the gun. I went over to the bed. I wouldn't let him take her away from me. Simple as that. I raised the gun barrel level with his head. My finger curled round the trigger. I felt a tiny nerve start throbbing in my wrist. I squeezed the trigger. What is this? Are uh, you, Joe? Yeah, yeah. Go to bed, Joe. Okay. When Tommy gone back to sleep, I broke open the gun. It was empty. But it had been loaded before. They must have found the gun after I left. But why had they taken the bullets? I didn't understand. How could they know anything? All of a sudden, I was afraid. I put the wallet and the wristwatch back. I put the gun back in the drawer. What was I going to do? I flopped down on the bed and tried to think. But somewhere along the line, I fell asleep. I slept until almost noon. When I woke up, Tommy was gone. I dressed and went down the hall to Fran's room. She was gone. At the desk, they didn't know what had happened to them. I went down to the armory where we were playing. They went around there. It was getting close to the matinee. I went to the dressing room. No sign of either of them. Then, just a few minutes before we were to go on, the door burst open and they were standing there. Oh, we, we thought we weren't going to make it. That's no kidding. Where are you? Just feast your eyes on the little gold ob object third finger left hand, sometimes called a wedding ring. Oh. Oh. Well, aren't you at least going to say bon voyage, weren't you? Oh, sure, sure. Best of everything. Fran left to change into her costume and Tommy started getting ready. Happy as a lark. And I felt the hate choking me till I couldn't breathe. Burning in me like fire. Then I realized something that sent the cold shivers through me. If I went up on that trapeze today, and if his life depended upon my catching him, he would die. It made me sick thinking about it. Everybody's got to have some kind of belief. 
I grew up different, not like most people. The only belief I had was the act. I had to keep the act clean. I couldn't let it happen that way. But it would happen. If I went up there, it would happen. Three minutes. Okay. Well, we better be getting out of here, Joey, huh? Well, Joe, come on, come on. They're not going. What? What are you talking about? I'm not going on. Can't you understand English? But, Joe, I'm not going got... on. He couldn't do anything with me, and the time was running out. He left, and I thought, what I'd better do is just pack and leave and never see either of them again. Then, just beyond the door, I heard him whispering to somebody. I knew what it was. He was putting her to work on me. I didn't want to see her. I went to close the door, but she was already standing there, her hand on the doorknob. But it was the wrong hand. It was the hand with a ring on it. His ring. Is it something to do with the act, Joe? No, nothing with the act. Well, then... Don't ask me to go out there, Fran. You know we can't go on without well, you. Well, do what you can. Fake those triple plays. Look pretty and swing hard. Just don't ask me to go out there. Joey, what's wrong with you lately? Look, don't... I'm worried about you. You've been acting so funny the last week or so. What were you doing with a gun, Joey? I, I... We found it in your dresser last night. It scared me to death. I made Tommy take the bullets out. I, I just bought it for protection, that's all. Protection from what? Joe, you've been so moody, so melancholy. I'm so afraid you might hurt yourself. You, you think that's why I bought the gun, to hurt myself? Gosh, I hope not. I could... That's our cue. Come on, Joe. She moved up close to me. Her hand touched the side of my face. Soft and warm. We'll be waiting for you. We won't go on without you. She left. I didn't know what to feel. Inside me, some of the hate was unwinding. I didn't want to hate him. I began thinking maybe I could, I could get by today after all. And after today, I'd just beat it and never see him again. I began thinking how lucky it was that everything had gone wrong last night. I started for the door. And then I, I saw the two of them behind some props, kissing each other while they were waiting for me. I'd never seen him kissing her before. I felt cold and empty. I went back into the dressing room. On the table was the tube of Vaseline I used to hold my hair in place. I stuck the tube into the waistband of my trunks. I didn't worry anymore about hurting the act. The act went off like clockwork. It always did. It was such second nature to us by now. The precision climb up the ladders to the two little takeoff platforms, me on one side of the ring, the two of them on the other. I felt good like I always felt up here. I knew what was going to happen, but I wasn't fighting it anymore. When it came, it came, that's all. And then it was time. All the easy stuff was over. We were ready for our big specialty. Tommy's triple somersault. Ladies and gentlemen, your kind attention, please. It is once again my privilege to present the most breathtaking trapeze stunt in all the world. Six I was already on the lower trapeze, the lolling on the crossbar. It was Tommy's stunt, so no one noticed me. I reached up into the waistband of my trunks and flicked the cap off the tube of grease. I pinched the tube, and a coil of Vaseline spurted into my palm. I greased my wrists until they were as slippery as a pair of eels. That was where he was going to hang on to. Where he was going to try to hang on. the great Joseph. The slightest miss will mean instant death. Tommy signaled that he was ready. I was ready, too. I turned lazily on the bar until my head hung down. I was dangling by my legs, flexing my arm, my eyes running over the row upon row of tiny upturned faces. It was a matter of seconds now. 5,000 pairs of eyes watching. 5,000 hearts starting to speed up. Even the peanut and popcorn boys had stopped. Just the roll of the drums building up, louder and louder, without looking. I knew Fran was putting on Tommy's blindfold. 
In another second, I'd swing around and face them and begin the count. I began turning. What happened? I turned quickly. Fran was alone on the platform. For a split second, I, I couldn't figure it out. And then I saw Tommy falling through the air. He grabbed at a guy wire as he passed, and he held on. He slid down the wire, spiraling down in a sickening, crazy corkscrew, down all the way to the bottom, but never letting go. He landed in a huddle at the bottom, but then he picked himself up. So he was all right, nothing broken. Except the way he held his hand, you could tell it was as raw as if he'd cut it open with a knife. I swung around and looked up at Fran. She caught my eye and formed the words, my fault, with her lips, and then, sorry. Then she had made him slip. She had kept him from swinging out on that trapeze. But why? I swung back. All of a sudden, I wanted to get down. I wanted to get away. But while my back was turned to her, she must have passed along the signal because suddenly I heard... Ladies and gentlemen, this unforeseen accident will not in any way change our spectacular triple somersault. The event will continue with the great Thomas's understudy... I guess at first I was just too shocked to think. This was something I'd never figured out. Sure, she'd done the trick before, but then there was a split second in which she signaled me to drop my head and begin the count. And then before I could get my own desperate signal back to her to, to stop, not to go ahead, the black mask had dropped over her eyes and I was cut off from her. Friend, don't do it! Don't do it! But the drums had already begun that thunder. My voice couldn't reach her now. She'd swung the empty trapeze out into space. The count had begun. One, as she let go. Two, as the trapeze made its arc. Three, as it returned. Twice more, the empty trapeze would swing out, and then on its return, she would grab it. Friend, don't do it, don't do it! But I knew she could only hear the drums. If there were only some way to stop the drums. <laughs> I heard the terrified roar of thousands of throats, and I knew it was death. And who is the next of kin of the deceased? Look, officer, I, I told you I'm only the manager of this outfit. Why don't you ask those two over near the body? They know all about it. They're, they're part of the act. I told you I'd get to them. Now, how exactly did the deceased... Listen, officer, why so many questions? It wasn't murder, you know. It was just an accident. Slipped and fell off the trapeze. I guess it was the excitement of seeing Tommy take that bad spill. Why can't you just put it down as an accident and let it go at that? Look, I'm only following the rules, mister. I don't tell you how to run your circus. Yeah, yeah, but when you're all finished with your questions, it'll still add up to the same thing. An aerialist named Joe Crosby was accidentally killed while giving a performance. Just as simple as that. Yeah. Poor Joe himself couldn't tell you any more. Even if the dead could talk. Thank you, Dana Andrews, for a splendid performance. Mr. Andrews will return in just a moment. Uh, hello. Yes, Hap? A uh, question. Shoot. Do you ever run out of words? Oh, now, Hap, be sensible. How could any guy run out of words with those sensational auto lights stay full batteries to talk about? <laughs> I got my answer. Why, Hap, those auto lights stay full batteries have the start of a jackrabbit, the power of a bulldozer, and the life of a redwood all wrapped up in one. And to top it all off, they need water only three times a year in normal car use. So, friends, when you buy a battery, buy the best. Switch to Autolite, makers of over 400 automotive, aviation, and marine products in 27 plants from coast to coast. Autolite, the lifeline of your car. Always remember, Autolite means batteries. Stay full batteries. Autolite means spark plugs. Ignition engineered resistor spark plugs. Autolite means ignition systems. The lifeline of your car.
And now, here again is Mr. Dana Andrews. My thanks to Tony Leader for the opportunity of appearing again on Suspense. It is always a pleasant and rewarding experience. And you'll have a pleasant and rewarding experience, I'm sure, next week when radio's outstanding theater of thrills brings you Robert Montgomery in another gripping study in... Suspense. Dana Andrews appears through the courtesy of Samuel Goldwyn, producers of Enchantment. Tonight's suspense play was adapted by Larry Marcus from the short story by William Irish. Music was composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Bluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. In the coming weeks, Suspense will present such stars as Fibber McGee and Molly, Charles Lawton, James Wyman, James Mason, and many others. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Next Thursday, same time, hear Robert Montgomery. Remember, you're right with Autolite. So switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Roma Wines present... Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Sheldon Leonard and Mr. Elliot Reed in Feast of the Furies, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness in entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Sheldon Leonard and Elliot Reed in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! I just followed the orders. I did just like I was told. After all, when your boss tells you, we... Well, I didn't exactly want to do it, but... It's good pay, and I like good pay. Oh, boss, money's not everything, they say. Well, what happens if there ain't any, and then I ain't got no clothes and no food or... I did just like I was told. I I took the man where I was supposed to, and I I watched him a little while, and then I walked away and left him. He sure was a little fella. I felt kind of sorry for him in a way. He he looked harmless to me. Kind of sad, too. I wanted to be his friend, but... Well, I, I had a cock him once over the back of the head. Yeah, made a funny sound. Guess it didn't hurt him much, though. After I tied him up and sat him up in the car beside me, he, he came to in a little while. Oh. Oh. Well, hello. <laughs> hey, you feeling better? My head, it hurts. Yeah, I guess it will for a while. There's a lump. Well, I guess there would be. I'm, I'm sorry, little fella. My hands. They're tied. My feet are, too. Yeah, they sure are. I tied them. But why? Well, I didn't want to get rough again. You're such a little guy. I don't even know you. <laughs> well, I don't know you. Who are you? Oh, just call me Casey. My... My last name, well, it don't matter. Casey? I don't know anybody by that name. I don't... Oh, my head. Now, look, we could have a nice trip out of this. This is a beautiful drive. Can you see out there? See, we're driving right along next to the ocean. Where are you taking me? 
Oh, it's not far now. Don't start acting up. I want this to be a pleasant trip. I like company. Sure, but my hands, they hurt. Couldn't you just loosen the rope a little? I don't think I should. Now, you might try something and then... Well, I don't think I better. I don't have any money, you know. Oh, now you don't think I'm a thief, do you? Oh, I, I can't figure it out, that's Now, all. never you mind. You just lean back and enjoy yourself. Hey, gee, that ocean is big, ain't hey? Just look at it. Look at those waves. Why, they, they never stop. They just keep flapping. Uh-huh. Casey. Yeah? Got a cigarette? Yeah, sure thing. Sure, I'll, I'll even light it for you. Thanks. Oh, that's all right. I want to be your friend. Well, that is, if you let me. Sure. We'll be friends. Just no rough stuff. Oh, no. No rough stuff. <sighs> Gee, the cigarette tastes good. Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, your name is Sam, ain't it? Yeah. Why? Well, uh, I just wanted to make sure. What do you mean? Well, uh, I gotta be sure I got the right guy, just like he told me. Who told you? Oh, never mind, never mind. Are we going far? No, not much further. Hey, you can even help me look for the place. What place? They fished there in the summer. Summer's gone now. Won't be anyone there. there there'll be a sign. It'll be on your side of the road. It'll say... Cook's Place Live Bait. A big sign. Hey. I smell something burning. I don't smell anything. Oh, now look at you. See what you've done. You're trying to burn that rope. Oh, guess I gotta stop the car. But my hands, they're numb. I'm disappointed in you, Sam. Well, you only burn the ends of the rope. There's no harm done. Gee, you can't trust no one these days. I'm sorry, Casey. I won't do it again. Sun's going down fast. I guess I better step up. You gotta be on time. Meeting someone? No, not just me and you. There'll be no one else. It's getting cold. Wish I had some coffee. Yeah, I sure would like some too. But couldn't we stop at the next stand we see? I wouldn't try anything. Well, I'll think about it. Look, we're coming to a place. How about it? I don't think I better. No, there's, there's too many people. I'll get some on my way back. You'll get some. But me? What about me? Gee, Sam, I'm sorry. You ain't ever coming back. <laughs> Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Sheldon Leonard and Elliot Reed in Feast of the Furies, a radio play by David R. Gillespie. Roma Wines presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of Suspense, this is Truman Bradley with a cooling suggestion for you men who've had more than your share of hot weather lately. It's simply this. Loosen your collar, saddle back, and enjoy America's smartest, coolest summer drink, Roma wine and soda, iced. So cool to come home to. Yes, no matter how hot the day, Roma wine and soda offers you quick, delicious, thirst-quenching refreshment. A cool, tempting treat for the whole family. And when friends drop by these sultry summer evenings... Nothing could be more delightful to serve than tasty to sip, easy to prepare Roma wine and soda. Now here's all you do. Just half fill a glass with Roma, California Burgundy, or Sauterne, or any other Roma wine type you prefer. Then add ice. Fill with sparkling water and stir. For a sweeter taste, simply add sugar. And remember, because Roma wines are selected from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines... A cooler made with Roma is better tasting every time. 
So, when the occasion or the weather calls for cool, satisfying refreshment, try Roma Wine and Soda, iced. Insist on Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma Wine. Discover for yourself why more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. And now, Roma Wine brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Sheldon Leonard as Casey and Elliot Reed as Sam in Feast of the Furies. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. So the little fella kept me company all the way to the place. He didn't try anything, and oh, we got along swell. I, I turned left off the highway, and I drove for about a mile over that old dirt road, and then I saw the sign, Cook's Place... Live bait. And there was the wharf, just like you said. There wasn't anyone around, and so I stopped the car right near the beach. The wind was coming up across the beach, and I wished I'd have brought an overcoat for Sam because he was actually shaking when I untied his legs. And then we started to walk toward the wharf. Oh. Well, don't fall down. My legs. They've been tied so long. Gee, it's cold. Hey, I'm sorry, Sam. I'd let you have my overcoat, but... Well, then I wouldn't have any. That's right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What are you counting? The poles under the wharf. Poles. Hey, come on. We, we got to walk over there under the wall. Might not be so windy, Dan. Yeah. What time is it? It's quarter after seven. Yeah, I'm just on time. Look, Casey. I don't understand all this. Oh, don't think about it, Sam. We just got a job to do, and let's get it over but with. But out here, there's no one. The wharf's deserted. Hey, look, I just do what I'm told. I, I get paid for it, and I don't ask questions. I know that, Casey, but don't you see? I don't know you. I, I've never done anything. You're all mixed up. Come over here and sit down by this pole. The tenth pole from the end of the wharf, he said. Sure, Casey. Sure. The sand's wet. I can't help it, little fella. You're gonna... Untie my hands now? Yeah. I'm going to untie them. But remember... Okay, Casey. I'm no fool. You're twice as big as I am. Well, just remember that, then. <laughs> Gee, you got skinny wrists like a woman's. <laughs> I tied this pretty good, didn't I? Yeah. That better? Oh, much better. What a relief. Thanks. You better rub them good. Yeah. Bring back the circulation. Yeah, yeah. See, I gotta tie them again. Only back of the pole. No, Casey. No. But I got to them's orders. Whose orders, Casey? Whose orders? My bosses. Everyone's got a boss. Yeah. How about me being your boss, Casey? How about it? I already got a good boss. What's he pay you, Casey? Well, all well, that depends. You could work for me. I'd pay you much more. You ain't got no money, Sam. Yes, I have. You think I'm dumb, don't you? No, I don't. You're smart. Plenty smart, believe me. Well, I'm not dumb. I get by. Look, Casey. Work for me. Forget about your other boss. I'll give you anything you ask for. I know you're kind, little fella. You're crooked. You better just forget it. Come on. Come on, now, back with your hands. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, now, good and tight. No, oh, please, Casey. It hurts. It ain't gonna hurt long, Sam. No. Why not, Casey? Why not? You'll see. Look, I'm awfully cold. Couldn't you build a fire? Well, I never thought of that. I, I guess I could, but... No, 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 we gotta be alone. We're alone? 
There's no one here. It's getting dark. The people will see and they'll wonder. There's no one around. You said so yourself. Uh Uh-uh. Smoke travels and the people see it. I was a bum once and smoke got me in trouble. Please, kiss. No, I'm smart, see? Not from books, mind you. Just from living. Casey, I'm starting to get wet. Yeah. Yeah, now, now, now that's something I don't know about. Them waves out there, they don't ever stop. They come in and they go out. In and out, in and out. What? Look, Casey, will you be my friend? Now, ain't that a silly question? I am your friend. I like you, Sam. Then tell me why... Why we're here, you and me. All I know is that I had to bring you here. I was to be here at a quarter after seven, which I was. I was to tie you under this wharf, to tie you to the tenth pole from the end of the wharf. Well, you tied him. And now I got to go up and sit on a pier for exactly three hours. Three hours? It's a long time. Oh, I don't mind it. Only you're cold, huh? Say, what's your boss's name, Casey? Jake. Jake. Jake Larkin. Yeah, that's it, you know him? Yeah, I know him. He's a fine boss. Look at those waves. They keep creeping up. They're getting closer. Just never stop. Casey, can I tell you something? Will you listen? Really listen? Oh, sure. Anything. I do know Jake Larkin. He's my brother-in-law. I married his sister. Her name was Clara. Clara Larkin. My wife. We had good times together. Good times. She wanted me to be somebody. And I tried. Tried awfully hard. But I just couldn't make it. Yeah, sure, I know. That's like me. You know, I never could get any place either. Yeah, Casey. Like you. Well, anyway, she kept after me. Night school, correspondence courses, work all day and study all night. But it just wasn't in me. I'd come home nights, dog tired. And it was hard to face her. We just weren't getting any place. Oh, that's too bad. Then you do understand. Why, sure I do. Well, then one day, she was taken sick. And before I knew it, she couldn't walk anymore. Paralyzed from the waist down. My beautiful wife. Oh, gee, that's too bad. Hey, how do they ever figure that in three hours it'll be high time? Casey, you said you were my friend, didn't you? Yeah. Then you've got to listen to me. My whole story, all of it. Will you do that? I guess so. Well, I kept on working and coming home nights and sitting with my wife and listening to her. And there she was, cooped up in one room, staring at four walls, waiting for the night watching for the day. It wasn't a very shiny world for her. This was our life for five years. And I want you to hear it. Will you listen? Go ahead, Sam. I'll listen. One night I came home, tired, discouraged. I could hardly get up the steps. And I... part way. Tired? No, not very. And you? No, dear. How could I be lying in bed all day? Don't, dear. I'm sorry. Doctor was here today. Good news? No. He said there wasn't any use in his coming anymore. Darling. Just as well, Sam. There'll be no more doctor bills. I don't care about the bills. 
I want you to walk. I know you do, dear, but if I can't, we must make the best of it. That's easy to say. Sam, come and sit here beside me. Hold my hand like you used to. My poor darling. Sam, do you love me? Why do you ask that? Because you never tell me anymore. Don't you know? I want to hear it. I love you, Clara. Oh, Sam, I'm sorry if I've nagged you. I wanted you to be something you couldn't be. I was wrong. Don't, Clara. You'll lie here all day imagining things. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I could live my life over again? Maybe this pain is a punishment. Stop it. Will you, Clara? All right, all right, Sam. Why don't you go for a walk or to a movie, maybe? I've been away all day. Can't we just sit and talk without getting morose? My brother dropped in today. Jake? What did he want? Nothing. He usually has a reason for coming around. Oh, well, he, he only... Well, one. how is Jake? <laughs> I suppose he was bulging with money as usual. Dressed fit to kill. He did look nice. I don't want his kind of dough. He just wanted to help me, Sam. How? Oh, get another doctor. Well? It wouldn't do any good. I've had other doctors. They all say the same thing. That's not the reason you turned him down. Yes, it was. No. You turned him down because you have a husband who's too proud to accept charity. No. A husband who'd much rather see his wife suffer. Oh, you're not fooling me, Clara. He wanted something else, too. No, Sam. He wanted to take you away, didn't he? Didn't he? Yes. Why didn't you go? He's no good, you know that. He's your brother. Plenty of easy money. Might make you walk again. You should have gone. Now, please, Sam, I don't want to talk about it. Re read to me. What do I read? Here. Here, read this. Poetry? Oh, it's beautiful. I can't read poetry. Oh, come on, now. Here, start here. Well, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and, and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with a breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, it is. Who wrote it? Elizabeth Browning. She must have been lovely. Yes. Look, look Sam. What, what is it? There, there's smoke coming from under the door. What? Here, put your oh, robe on. Sam. Hurry, Clara. Sam. Wait, here, I'll help you. No. Here, now, put your robe on. I'll open the door. The stairs are on fire. Clara. No, Sam, you can't carry yes. me. It's four flights down. Yes, I can. <laughs> Don't struggle, Clara. Here, put this over your head. Sam, let me stay here. What? Don't you see? It's better this way. Let me stay here. Are you mad? Here, put your arm around my neck. You can't carry yes, me. Yes, I can. Hold on to me. Don't you understand, darling? I want to stay here. I'll always be helpless like this. If I stay, you'll be free. You'll have a chance to be something. You're coming with me. No. We'll go down the stairs. Sam, let me stay. Do you think I'm a murderer? It wouldn't be murder. No one would know. I'm giving you a chance for a new life. Take it. No! Never get 
down the stairs together, Sam. If, if you go alone... You hold this over your head. Do you understand? Goodbye, Sam. Clara! Stop struggling! Clara! Stop! Clara! Clara! did that for me. She deliberately broke away from me and threw herself into the fire. Gee, well, what about you? Oh, they were able to get me out all right. But she... Oh, gee, that was bad, little fella. Then you do believe me. You do believe that it wasn't my fault. Oh, sure. She wanted to die, didn't she? Yes. I think about such things, too. If you believe me, then. Untie me. Let me go. I can't. Jake would be mad, and he's my boy. No, he'll never know. It's funny, ain't it? I mean, the way she died, and, and now you're going to drown? No. Untie me, Casey. Don't you understand? Jake wants me to die because he thinks I left his sister to burn to death. But you know the truth now. You can save me. Well, it wasn't your fault. No. Untie me. But I got my orders. I can't go back on them. But this is really murder, Casey. Do you understand that? Well, no, little fella. I'm only doing what I'm told. I gotta keep my job, don't I? They'll find out, Casey. And you'll be punished. Well, Jake told me not to worry. He'd take care of me. Let me go to Jake. Let me tell him my story. You can do that for me, can't you? No. Jake don't want to talk to you. Casey, be reasonable. Hey, if you keep yelling like that, I'm going to have to hit you. You idiot! Don't you understand, you blind, stupid... What did you call me, little fella? I didn't mean it, Casey. I didn't mean it. I don't like what you called me. I heard that one before. I thought you were my friend. I am your friend. Untie me. I gotta be going. I done everything just like Jake told me, and now I gotta be going. Casey. So long, Sam. Casey. Casey. A dog. Casey. So I walked off, Jake, just like you told me. Well, it was my fifty dollars. Hey, hey, boss, can I have my... Your fifty dollars. Do you know what you've done? Well, what did I do? I, I did just like you told you me. You murdered an innocent man. Why? Because you told me to. After he told you what happened to my sister, didn't you realize he was innocent? Well, I did just like you told me. Oh, Don't you... be sore, Jack. Oh, you idiot, you stupid, stupid idiot. What did you call me? Wait a minute. Don't pull any of that on me. Stay where you are. You called me that name, too. I don't like that. Casey. Hey, Casey, remember, I'm your boss. I thought you was my friend, too. Casey. Oh, don't pull a gun on me, boss. Oh, stay away from me. <laughs> oh, stay away from me. <laughs> Casey. Casey, that's right, Jake. No. My name's Casey. Not what you said. Hey, Jake. Hey, Jake. No. No. No, I, I ain't got no boss. No. Now I ain't got no boss. (laughs) 
Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. Here's America's choice for what to serve guests these hot, sultry summer evenings. It's Roma Wine Lemonade. A tall, tempting treat of thirst-quenching frostiness that lowers your temperature and raises your spirits with the first few thrilling sips. Delight your family or friends with a praise-winning Roma Wine Lemonade. You simply place ice and the juice of half a lemon in a tall glass. Pour three-quarters full with Roma California Burgundy or any other Roma wine type you prefer, then fill with water and sweeten to taste. You can prepare Roma wine lemonade in a few seconds and enjoy its cool refreshment for hours. Remember, Roma, America's favorite wine, costs no more than ordinary wines. So insist on Roma, America's first choice. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, for a delicious Roma Wine Lemonade. Sheldon Leonard will soon be seen in the Frank Capra production, It's a Wonderful Life. Elliot Reed appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, producers of To Each His Own. Next Thursday, same time, Roma Wines will bring you Mr. Michael O'Shea as star of Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Produced by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you a story of murder in the Roaring Twenties, The Windy City Six, starring Mr. Fred McMurray and featuring Red Nichols and his five pennies. Before our play begins, here is a word about Autolite from our good friend, Harlow Wilcox. Well, hello, Senor Wilcox. Greetings, Pepito, my popular purveyor of potent and peppery plates. How goes? <laughs> Who knows? I am too filled with excitement, like, uh, oh, like, uh... Like an Autolite stay-full battery is filled with quick, dependable starting power and long life? <laughs> si, si, si. Well, why the glee, my merry muchacho? Could it be your Autolite stay full, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use? Si, si, amigo, because with it, I never worry. <laughs> and what's more, Pepito, the Autolite stay full gives longer life, as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. <laughs> this is longer than my father's siesta? Ah, oh, there's no siesta with the Autolite stay full, Pepito. Those fiberglass mats protecting every positive plate prevent shedding and flaking. And keep the stay full power filled for you. For me? Sure. You and every motorist who visits his neighborhood Autolite battery dealer for an Autolite stay full. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Because you're always right with Autolite. And now with the Windy City Six and the performance of Mr. Fred McMurray, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. It all happened some time ago. By some time, I mean those days when moonlight on the Ganges was a must at the country club dance, when our nurse was considered snappy repartee, when it wasn't entirely unfashionable to be seen in a raccoon coat complete with flask when the Harvards and the Yales met in deathless combat. Maybe it'll lose a little something in the translation, but it's worth a try. Anyway, as it happened, we were playing in a little pad on Oreo Street. Crazy Jack Fisher's high hat. It was a speech, but then what wasn't at that time? When the breeze was off the river, you could hear the riff notes of the Windy City Six blowing uptown. Reading from left to right, there was Corny Peters on horn, Rip Jackson on alto, Thurber Jones on the licorice, Tinkle Hobson on the Baldwin, Red Moore slapping, and me on the skins. I'm Carstairs Hamilton, sometimes known as Rimshot, but more often as Ham. 
So we'll keep it that way. Ham? Yeah, Corny? You uh, booted the beat three times in that last set. What is it? Well, uh, every time I slide a glim over at that skirt of table 13, my ticker skips a beat. Maybe my sticks caught the fever. Oh. Well, those two playboys with her are Bull Hurley and Red Rock's Farrell. <laughs> hey, get ready to whistle again. They want to talk with you. Talk with me? That's what they said. Go on now. Keep the customers happy. Oh, okay, Corny. Uh, somebody said you wanted to see me. I guess maybe it was a mistake, so I'll it just... It wasn't no mistake. Sit down. Uh, yes, sir. See this girl? Well, to tell you the truth, I don't think I haven't noticed her. Uh, how do you do? Hello. You've been staring at her all night, and last night, and the night before. Oh, I might have been looking this way, but I'm nearsighted. You ought to be in George White's scandals. Now, let me give it to you straight, bad ears. We're taking care of this girl for a very particular friend. So lay off her, huh? Because if you don't, your poor old mother's going to have some place to take flowers on Sunday afternoon. Your grave. Back at my drums, I tried not to look at the girl, but I could still see her in my mind. Soft, dark hair. None of that shingled bob stuff. A real Marcel finger wave. A warm, young face. Lots more that curved down into a fur coat that must have set somebody back a whole truckload of upstate scotch. Once in a while, I sneaked a quick peek, and every time she was looking at me. And suddenly, I got scared, and I lost up a couple of beats. Tony got so mad, he blew up. But it didn't make much difference then. Our engagement was over. The Windy City Six broke ranks and went into Plan B. There we are, everybody. We're all under arrest. I headed for the kitchen. That was always the best way out. In the hallway, a small blonde guy was lifting a couple of shaking hands to his face, and his eyes grew as large as two hard-boiled eggs just before he got it. When I got out the kitchen door, I could still see that big, black-haired, vicious-looking guy peering out into the night, trying to see who it was that passed him in the hall while he was busy killing I hope he hadn't seen my face. I ran for a while, and then I slowed down to a walk. The first few snowflakes of winter were starting to fall, and the world was pulling on that wonderland slipover. I turned my Chesterfield collar up around my neck and noticed I was still holding a pair of drumsticks. I thought it over for a minute, then I threw them into the darkness beyond the streetlight. I made up my mind that from now on I was going to stay out of joints like the high hat. When I finally got back to my rooming house, there was a surprise and a fur coat waiting for me, sitting on the front stoop. I uh, tried to ignore her. You blind or something? I suppose you get dozens of girls sitting on your step and I waiting for you. Hey. Huh? Oh. Were you, uh, looking for me? What do you think I've been sitting out here in the cold for? Selling subscriptions to the Police Gazette? Sit down. Uh, won't you come inside? It's safer out here. I haven't forgotten the way you were looking at me at the hi-hat. Oh? Say, uh, tell me, how'd you get out of that raid so quick? How do you think? I was with Red Rock's Pharaoh. They don't touch him. Oh, yeah, of course. Mind telling me your name? Cora Lee. Two E's. Two E's? That's pretty. Tell me, uh, Cora... What do you want with me? How'd you find my place? Crazy Jack gave us the address. Farrell and Hurley sent me to get you. To get me? Look, I don't know anything. I didn't see anything. I told you I was nearsighted. 2040. They got a place up in the mountains. They decided to throw a holiday party. They want a band. Isham Jones was busy, so all you guys are being picked up. Huh? I lost my drums. Don't worry. They'll get drums. Let's go. Are you going with me? Somebody has to show you the road. Alone? Look, we can talk all about it on the way. And don't get any ideas, because I might send for reinforcements. And these reinforcements will make a marine landing look like Isidore Duncan's finale. You got anything brave to say? I'll bet you I'm ready before you can count to a hundred. By twos. I put the chains on my old marmon, buttoned up the Isinglass curtains, cracked a bottle of antifreeze, and we started off. 
The snow was swirling down faster than ever and was better than three inches deep by the time we were 40 miles out of town. Cora was under a blanket, cuddled up next to me like she meant it, her head on my shoulder. But it wasn't as romantic as it sounds because under the blanket, Cora was shaking. And it was the kind of shaking you don't get from being cold, but from being scared. I should have known then that something was terribly wrong, but I had to learn the hard way. Cora? Huh? Cora, why do you hang around with bozos like Red Rocks Farrell and Bull Hurley for? For the same reason you play in places, like the high hat. The best offer I got. Also the worst. Look, suppose I just kept going now. Somewhere out west, Chicago maybe. Would you go with me? They'd never let us get away with it. What do we lose trying? You don't belong with those guys. You belong where the air is clean and you only take a drink when you want and love when you... Please, don't. What's the matter? Did I say something wrong? Look, why don't you hit me on the head and throw me out and just keep going? Throw you out? Of course, I wouldn't throw you out to save my life. Oh, Ham, don't say that. About an hour later, we passed through the town of Norrisburg and arrived at a big private estate called Haywill Manor. The big party was going strong. The rest of the Windy City six boys had preceded me, all under escort. The man who answered the door was the one person I never wanted to see again. When I'd seen him last, he was killing a man at the high hat. Well, Cora, I see you got him. <laughs> You got a pretty smart way of leaving a raid in a hurry, Sonny. Kitchen door. I hope nothing happens to your luck. Kitchen door? I I, I didn't go out the kitchen door. I uh, I always leave by the basement window. Mm. (laughs) I hope for your sake you're right, Sonny. Mike, he's a genuine nice guy. Well, nice guy. I think you'll like this party. Lots of drinks, lots of girls, and lots of happy music, huh? Oh, sure, sure. I'll do my best, Uh, did you get my drums? Oh, don't worry about drums. If we don't have them, we'll give you a couple of <laughs> skulls to be there. <laughs> now go on, pour yourselves a drink and get warm. Cora, who is he? Big Mike Donovan. This is his place. He's to the rackets what Dempsey is to boxing. Yeah? Well, I'm going to tell you something about him. I hear the human life means nothing to him. That he'd kill anybody. So you heard it. Don't go broadcasting it all over the place. You want to stay alive, don't you? Well, it's always been one of my chief aims in life. Then keep what you know under your hat, you dumb drummer. The party was big and it was bouncy. Cora was sitting in a corner looking scared. Big Mike Donovan, Bull Hurley, and Red Rock Farrell were gathered at the bar drinking an uncommon amount of liquor and looking our way every time they wanted to laugh. Herbert Jones began to get nervous and his clarinet developed an off-key squeak. Three men put down their drinks and came over. Which one do you think it is, Bull? I got ten bucks, says it's a saxophone player. He's got a shifty look. Yeah, I'll take the bet, because I don't think he's the guy. Uh, which one would you pick out, Red Rock? Who else? The drummer. Yeah, he's afraid to look at us. I think you're wrong, too. I'm putting my money on the clarinet player. It's elementary. Every time he looks over at us, he shakes. Every time he shakes, he squeaks in the high notes. Are these the signs of a guy who don't know nothing? Maybe you're right, Mike. Look at him shake now. <laughs> hey, you, with the clarinet. He... Yes, Mr. Donovan? What's your name? Jones, sir. Thurber Jones. Well, Thurber Jones, me and Bull and Red Rocks think you're a lousy clarinet player. Oh, I- I'm doing my best, sir. We got an idea we can show you how to play it better. Come with us, sir. Well, well, well I- I- I'll do better, sir, if you... If you'll just I me... said, uh, come with us. Hey, wait a minute. They walked outside. And that was the last time I ever saw Thurber Jones alive. The rest of us were as jumpy as cats, and we played for two hours without a break. Everybody was getting stoned, but I didn't dare take a drink. Then Big Mike called an intermission while they served the buffet dinner. But everybody was so drunk that nobody ate much. Big Mike began to be loud and noisy, and he was started waving a gun around, boasting what a great shot he was. He kicked open a couple of French windows. 
and out in the lawn of all things stood a giant snowman. Just watch, just watch. I'll blast every lousy button off his lousy shirt. <laughs> He did it all right. Four pieces of coal shattered and vanished into the snow. Everybody cheered and then turned back to the food and drinks. Everybody, that is, but me. I couldn't take my eyes off the snowman. Because running down its crystal white front was red blood. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Fred McMurray with Red Nichols and his five pennies in the Windy City Six. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hey, Senor Wilcox, how about a tortilla? Why, sure, Pepito. I'll always talk to you about that great Autolite Stayful battery. <laughs> How about a tamale? <laughs> Why wait till tamale? Today and every day, you'll get quick, dependable starts with the Autolite Stayful battery, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Well, enchilada, maybe? Your Aunt Chilada, your Uncle Manuel, and Grandpa, everybody loves the Autolite Stayful. The battery that gives longer life, as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. Glass of tequila, senor? Fiberglass, Pepito, because fiberglass retaining mats protect every positive plate of the Autolite Stay Full battery to reduce shedding and flaking and keep the Stay Full power packed for perfect propulsions. But what is this in English? It means visit your neighborhood Autolite battery dealer for an Autolite Stay Full. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Fred McMurray in Elliot Lewis's production of The Windy City Six, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. During the years of the big thirst, homicide was an art. Sometimes it was Tommy guns against a wall, sometimes it was a concrete overshoe in the bottom of the East River, or maybe an ice pick in the heart. But out on the snow-swept lawn of Big Mike Donovan's mansion that cold December night, I was looking at the chilliest bit of murder any crazy hooligan ever thought up. A bleeding snowman. Only, now it wasn't a snowman. You better get back inside. You'll freeze out here. Uh. Yeah. It's Thurber, Cora. Thurber Jones. Oh, the poor little guy. He played the sweetest clarinet he's to St. Louis. He was always loaning money to guys. He loved everybody. He never hurt a soul. Who did it, Ham? Who did it? Who else but your playmate, Donovan? But why, Ham? Why? You tell me why. You helped bring all of us up here, didn't you? Oh, but not for this. Believe me, Ham, not for this. I suppose you don't know that Mike Donovan killed a man in a high hat tonight. Well, I, I heard him bragging about it a while ago. It was somebody who hijacked a truckload of Mike's liquor. Well, somebody saw him. And I guess... I guess he figured it was one of us. Who saw him? It, well, I, I guess he thought it was Thurber. You mean it wasn't? I, I don't mean anything. I'm getting cold. Why don't you go back inside and join your killers? Ham! Go on. You've worked this side of the street for all the laughs you're going to get. Oh, Ham, I'm not the same as they are. I don't blame you for thinking what you do, but I, I wish you wouldn't. Yeah, all right. Let's just say the jury's still out on you. Look, look, I'll prove to you I'm not like them. Here, you'll need a fast car. What are these for? They're the keys to Mike's car. It's in the garage. Take it down to Norrisburg and come back with all the cops you can find. Hey, Bernie! That's Mike. Cora! That's Mike. Where are you? Oh, hurry, please, go. I want them to get what's coming to them. I want them to get it good. Yeah, but what about you? Hey, Cora, who are you talking about there? Oh. Come on, back to the party, baby. Go on, go on, before all of you wind up like Thurber. After 
after she'd gone inside with Mike, I made a beeline for the garages and back. Just as I got the keys and the ignition, somebody... In case you don't know it, Flea Brain, this is Mike Donovan's car. Oh? Well, I, I guess I must have made a mistake. Uh, hey, take that gun off my head, will you? Mike hires me to do nothing but sit in the back seat of his car. Now I might get a raise. Yeah, well, I always like to see somebody get ahead. Uh, the gun... I might get a raise because Mike wouldn't like you to leave his party without first you telling him what a nice time you had. Oh, you, you got me wrong. I, I was going to write him a bread and butter letter first thing in the morning, honest. Hey, well, about the gun. Shut up before I shove it through your stinking skull. I start walking. The next thing I remember was being kicked through the door of the big house. The party kept right on whirling. Nobody paid much attention. Nobody except the boys in the band. And they were beginning to get the idea. Slowly they stopped playing and then people began to turn around and look. Reminded me of a ring of faces about to watch a hanging. What's this all about, Chick? The creep here tried to lift your car. He even had the keys. Where'd you get them? I, uh, I sort of found them. Hey, you can't do that to one of my boys. Shut up, you. I said, where did you get them? I told you I found them. Where did you get them? <laughs> I didn't care whether I lived or died right then. And when somebody kicked me twice in the kidneys, the choice was made for me. I was sure I died because everything went black. When I came to, I was still lying in the same place and the body was still going on. Nobody even looked at me as I staggered to my feet and wiped the blood and the booze and the glass off the best I could. I stood there holding onto the bar, wondering what to do. Wondering what it was all about. Can you still walk, stupid? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess so. And Charleston, back to your drums and stop playing. Okay. You know something, blockhead? I didn't want him to stop. I think Big Mike's got something special in mind for you later. None of the boys in the band even looked at me when I got back to my drums and picked up the beat. Corny and Rip and Tinkle acted as if I were dead already. We played all through our sheets twice without a break. None of us dared stop. We knew somehow we were playing for our lives. Make that a Long about dawn, the party turned into a noisy crap game and nobody paid much attention to our background music. Cora was with them, sort of moving in and around. I saw her whisper something in Bull Hurley's ear and then later she did the same thing to Red Rocks. Then she sort of sauntered over by the band, not looking at us, but we all heard what she said. Boys, keep your eye on Mike Donovan. When he goes over to Red Rocks, get ready to move. It'll be your only chance to get out of here alive. Make it good. We all looked at each other and kept right on playing, waiting to see what she was talking about. Pretty soon it began to make sense. Are you dirty here? Making a pass at my girl. I made a pass at your girl, Mike? Just tell me that you and Red Rocks both made passes at her. And I'm going to break both of your necks. No, wait a minute, Mike. That's our cue, boys. Everybody up. Hey, hey, Mike, don't forget your music sheets. Boys, this way. Out through this door. Yeah, I got it. Come on, boys. Phew. This air feels good. Yeah, Yeah, it'll feel better a hundred miles from here. Where's your car, Hal? It's right over there, parked in front. Come on, come on. Yeah, I'll be right with you. Go ahead. Cora. Go on, get out of here. You'll never have another chance. I'm not going without you. Come on, Ham. Don't just stand there. I'll be all right. Yeah, for how long? One of those ready boys in there will start shooting his guns again and you might get in the line of fire. What if I do? I deserve it for being so dumb. Ham, we'll all be killed if you don't move. Well, Cora? I'd only get you in trouble. Yeah, I believe you, but I want to take you anyway. Come Ham, on. for God's sake. Look, lady, tell him you'll come with him, please. Oh, Ham, come I on. wanted anything but a dumb $35 a week drum player. Oh, I get it. Well, that tears it. I'm washed. But I never knew how wonderful a dumb $35 a week drum player could be. Huh? I'm coming with you. 
We all scrambled over to my mom and climbed in. Red and Rip in the back seat, Cora in front, me at the helm, and Corny on the crank. Come on, baby. What's the matter with it, Ham? Hell, it's ten below zero. Give it another whirl. For guys, sakes, make it go, Ham. Uh. Oh, no, we can't get stuck here. Well, just take it easy. It'll catch. There. Uh. Come on, Corny, get in. What did I tell you? Like a Swiss watch, huh? Let's get out of here. Hey, hang on, we're off. It's Mike. They're coming after us. Yeah. Anybody hit? No, but we're going to have to move faster than this. Well, don't worry. I've got her souped up to where she'll go 50. Hold on. By the time we got out onto the slick, icy road, a whole car full of hooligans were coming right after us with guns blazing. The gating on his hand! I didn't know anything about guns, but one thing I knew was how to handle my marmot. It didn't weigh much, and I figured to pull into the next curve, climb the coal on, skid into the snowbag, and bounce off onto the straightaway. If that heavy roll tried to make it at the same speed and hit the snowbag, I was sure to go right on through. Ham, look out, the curve! Grab on, kids, this is it! Several courses later, I fluttered an eyelid open and ventured a peek. Somewhere I'd miscalculated, because we were now stacked against a giant tree right on the edge of the road looking down into the valley. And down there, a hundred feet below us, was a pile of something that had once been a rich, expensive automobile full of rich, cheap thugs. And around it, no one stirred. Ham, oh, darling, are you all right? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so, Cora. How about you? I'm all right. How about the rest of you? I'm okay. Shaking up, that's all. I busted my lip. Look. I'll never put my base back together again. Well, at least we're all alive. Except poor Thurber. Well, what do you say we get out and take a walk into town? This is a job for the John Laws. Well, that's the coda. It was the last engagement of the Windy City Six. We went out with a full arrangement and a big finish. It was in all the papers. Maybe you saw the spread. The boys on the front page, Mike Donovan and company in vital statistics, and Cora and me in the social columns. <laughs> yeah, we did it. Complete with old shoes and new rice. Oh, uh, if you ever happen to get up Norrisburg Way on a curve that turns on a steep hillside... With an old scarred tree looking down into the valley. Take five and listen. Maybe you can still hear an old clarinet squeaking on the high notes. Or if the light's right, maybe you could even catch the pale ghost of a big gunman with homicide in his eyes looking around. Looking around for a drummer who saw him kill. Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Fred McMurray. Ah, Pepito, that was a great meal. And what's the matter, Senor Wilcox? <sighs> I'm too full to talk. And if you could talk, Senor? Then I'd tell all about the more than 400 products made by Autolite for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original factory equipment on many leading makes of America's finest cars. Electric windshield wipers, starting motors, voltage regulators, coils, distributors, wire and cable, generators. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite, original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Autolite. 
Next week, we celebrate the return of the first lady of suspense, Miss Agnes Moorhead, in a play we call The Death Parade. And then on February 22nd, in answer to your many requests, Backseat Driver, repeated for you with its original stars, Fibber McGee and Molly, all on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Bluskin. Portions of this program were transcribed. Tonight's cast included Mary Jane Croft and Edmund MacDonald. The Windy City Six was written for suspense by E. Jack Newman and John Michael Hayes. Frederick Murray may currently be seen in the RKO picture, Never a Dull Moment. And remember, next week on Suspense, Miss Agnes Moorhead, as a woman who finds a letter warning of death and has only three hours to deliver it. A tale we call The Death Parade. Buy Autolite Stay Full batteries, Autolite Standard Type or Resistor Type spark plugs, Autolite Electrical Parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. Nearly half of the people who died in America last year were victims of heart disease, our number one killer. This week, the American Heart Association appeals for your support to combat and conquer this scourge. Send your contributions to Heart, care of your local post office. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations present... Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you Frederick March in The Night Reveals, a suspense play produced and directed by Anton M. Leader. Friends, for that Memorial Day trip, install an Autolite Stay Full battery in your car and relax. An Autolite Stay Full battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use? Yes, sir, only three times a year. Why, it makes a camel look like a drinking fountain. And in addition, an Autolite Stay Full battery has extra plates for extra power. Protected by fiberglass insulation for stronger life and longer life. In recent tests conducted according to the life cycle standards of the Society of Automotive Engineers, Autolite Stay Full batteries gave 70% longer average life than batteries without all these features. With an Autolite Stay Full battery, you need to add water only three times a year in normal car use. So remember, you're right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents Frederick March in a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I uh, should have known before that Something was wrong, gentlemen. You should have known by your eyes. It was a queer look in staring at me one minute and avoiding me the next. Well, I, uh, I came home late one Monday night, and they were asleep. My son Johnny and my wife here, Marie. I lay in bed reviewing my day's work. Uh, I'm an investigator for the Herkimer Fire Insurance Company. And while thinking about the fire on 2nd Avenue, I fell asleep. And suddenly I... I was sitting bolt upright, wide awake, with a strange feeling of being alone in the room. I looked toward Marie's bed. It was too dark to see. I called, Marie. Marie. No answer. Got up, walked to her bed. Quilt was bunched up. I pulled the covers down. The bed was empty. In the bathroom? No. She wasn't there. Not in Johnny's room, either. Johnny was alone. Marie wasn't in the apartment. I, I put on a light, I looked at my watch, it was two in the morning. I got dressed and I walked out, rang for the elevator. It was nothing, of course, it was nothing important, but my heart kept hammering away. Morning, Mr. Jordan. Kind of late for you. Yeah, to... yeah, good morning, Steve. Did, uh, you see my wife get on? Well, yes, Mr. Jordan, about half an hour ago, I'd say. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, 
You see which way she went? Oh, yeah, she went towards 3rd Avenue. Said she was going to the... Yeah, went to the drugstore, I guess. <laughs> That's right. There's one over on 96th Street. Open all night. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Ah, that was it. She, she went to the drugstore. I was worried over nothing at all. But I, I didn't know what to do quite. I, I didn't want to follow her, but the elevator boy was watching me. And so I strolled easily along towards 3rd... I stood on the deserted dark corner. I looked up and down the street. And then I saw her coming. She was walking toward me briskly. Harry! What are you doing here? Well, I got up and saw you were gone. Oh, I, I just... couldn't sleep. I had a dreadful headache, so I decided to go down for some aspirin. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. The drugstore on 96th Street. Yeah, but you were coming from 97th Street. Oh, I took a little walk. I thought some fresh air would do me some good. Yeah, it's a nice night. I've only been gone about ten minutes. Steve says you're gone about a half hour. It was only ten minutes. What time is it now? 2.35. I've been out for almost 15 minutes. Oh, it's more than... It was any... about 15 minutes. No more than that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess so. Everything seemed all right, but still I felt something was wrong. We got into our apartment and we both went to bed. Just lay there. We didn't say anything. Listen. Huh? A fire. A fire. Yeah, not far. Over east a couple of blocks. By the river, I'd say. That's my district. A fire. Well, what the... Hello? Hello, Harry. Sorry to wake in the middle of the night. There's a bad one over near you between 2nd and 3rd. Maybe a total loss. Between 2nd and 3rd, Mr. Palmer? An, an apartment building? Yeah, 98th Street. Uh -huh. 340 East 98th. I uh, called you because I'd uh, like you to go there direct first thing in the morning instead of coming to the office. Uh -huh. Okay. I'll meet you there. You're okay, Mr. Palmer. Good night. A fire on 98th Street. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't see Marie in the dark, but I knew. I, I knew she was staring at me. I was very tired. Good night, Marie. Good night, Harry. <laughs> For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Mr. Frederick March in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hey, hello, Otto. Hi, Hap. Say, uh, this week I've been helping my brother-in-law get the car ready for Memorial Day. For a whole week? No, no. While he was pushing her up the driveway, I just told him no need to wear yourself to a frazzle. Just get a new Autolite Stay Full battery. Needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Why, an Autolite Stay Full battery has more liquid reserve than a camel with water on the knee. <laughs> sure, sure. Yes, sir, I told him. Forget those holiday worries. Just remember, the extra liquid reserve in an Autolite Stay Full battery means less danger from evaporation. For real performance, just install an Autolite Stay Full battery. It needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And all that time he was breaking his back, pushing the car up About the About that time he straightened up and gave me a dirty look. How was I to know he'd excited his sacroiliac again? And anyway, he shouldn't have anything but an Autolite Stay Full battery in his car for long, trouble-free operation. Uh, did he tell you then he'd buy an Autolite Stay Full battery? He sure did, but emphatically. Fine, fine. And now, let's get back to suspense. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Frederick March as Harry in The Night Reveals, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Well, uh, the next morning... I went over to 98th Street to inspect the remains of number 340 and to see if there was evidence of anything suspicious about the origin of the fire. Mr. Palmer was there. Yeah, there it is. Got it. Guess we'll be paying off on this one, all right? Mm, completely burned out. Anyone hurt? A few, but no one dead. Lucky they just installed the new fire escape. Just the walls left. Hey, hey that, that fire must have been quite a sight in the height of its glory. Yeah, yeah, quite a sight. Say, those walls look pretty bad. Might collapse almost any time. Yeah, the building will have to be erased. Gee, that, that fire did a good job. 
Oh, there's the commissioner. Uh, hello, Parmenter. Jordan. Hi, right, Mr. Morrell. You know anything about the fire, Commissioner? No, no, not a thing. Well, now that you're here, we'll, we'll take a look. No, I wouldn't go in there, Jordan. Those oh, I walls can take are... care of myself. Maybe you'd better not go inside. Don't worry Harry. about me. I, I know fires as well as anyone. You stay outside, Mr. Palmer. I'm, I'm going in. I went gingerly into the blackened, ruined hallway, ashes and debris up to my ankle, until I reached the remains of the stairway. Underneath were several baby carriages, just twisted pieces of metal. Burned fragment of something fell nearby. Come on back, Jordan. I'm all right. I poked around near the carriages, sifting through the fine, clean ashes. Something caught my eye. It was a blob of yellow metal. I picked it up, and then I worked my way out. She's burned through, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, clean through. Nothing left of her. Did you find anything? No, nothing much. Fire started in the hallway, all right. It... Worked its way up. Cellars untouched. Uh, what's that in your hand? Oh, oh, that's just a piece of metal I found. Yeah. What do you think, Commissioner? Yeah, it's probably one of those gadgets they have on baby carriages. Yeah, I guess you're right. It isn't anything. But it was something. I had run my fingernail across this glob of metal. It looked like gold. I would examine it in detail later at home. How are you, Johnny? Mama says I was bad today. Harry, you're home early. Yeah, I got through sooner than I expected. I. What is it, Harry? Your locket. You're not wearing it. You've never had it off before. My locket? Well, I... Don't you remember? Daddy, can I go over and see Davy Taylor for a minute? Yeah, yeah, Johnny, go ahead. All right. Gee, Daddy. Well, you shouldn't have done that. I didn't want him to go. He hasn't had his dinner. Never mind, Johnny. What... What'd you say happened to the locket? Well, I gave it to you. To me? Well, I put it in your pocket to have it fixed. The catch was loose. I don't remember. I put it in your pocket, Harry. I forgot to mention it to you. I wanted you to take it to the jewelers and get the catch fixed. I just put it in your coat pocket while you were shaving. When? Yesterday. Yes, yesterday morning. Well, it should be in my pocket now. I wore this suit yesterday, too. Nothing in my pockets, Marie. Well. Marie. Yes, Harry? anything uh, wrong with you? I'm perfectly all right. Not a thing wrong with you me. You look worried, as if you'd got something on your mind. It's nothing. I've just been having a headache. Maybe you ought to see a doctor. No. Really doesn't amount to much. Well, I think I'll take a, another look for the locket. Which, which uh, suit did you say you put it in? Your blue suit? I think. Or... Maybe it was the gray, though. I... I couldn't make it out. What had she done with the locket? Had she pawned it? She given it away? Then I remembered something. I went in the bathroom, locked the door. I looked at this shapeless little glob of yellow metal. I rubbed the blackened spots away until all of it was gleaming. I took a nail file out of the medicine chest and began to file it. I kept filing until I had enlarged the crack to the full length of the piece of gold. And I slipped the nail file inside and pried, pried it open. Tiny fragments of glass and then, then I saw a piece of scorched paper. It was a photograph. It was a picture of my son, Johnny. This glob of metal was my wife's locket. I put the locket and the picture in my pocket and walked out. All through dinner and afterwards, I watched her. She seemed very uneasy. Finally, I went over to my pipe rack, where I kept several books of matches in a jar. There weren't any there. And now I knew she was watching me, watching me closely. I looked behind the rack. There wasn't a match around. What the devil happened to all my matches? I, I have a match. Here, let me light it for oh, you. Oh, did, did you take the matches out of the jar, Marie? Well, I... Did you? Yes, I needed them in the kitchen. Shall, shall I light your pipe for no, you? No, I'll light it myself. I picked a match out of the book. It was a clean white match with a, with a green head. I struck it against the side. The match spluttered up into a yellow flame, fringed on the bottom with, with blue. Marie stared at it, and 
until I felt the sharp bite of the flame on my thumb. Oh. Burn yourself? No, it's all right. Would, would you like a nice hot cup of tea, Harry? No, dear, I don't think so. I watched her. Her hand casually brushed along the table and picked up the matches. Marie, huh? leave the matches on the table. I, I, I need them. I'm rather short of matches. The pilot isn't working. Is this the only book of matches in the house? I have to get some tomorrow. Where, where are you going, Harry? Just get a drink of water. No. No, I'll get it for you, Harry. Never mind, Marie. I'll get it myself. I went into the kitchen. There was a paper bag alongside the gas range. Matches all thrown in helter-skelter. Books of matches and safety matches all mixed together. I walked back and sat down in my chair. You've been, uh, you've been having headaches lately. I'm, I'm just tired. That's nothing serious. How'd you like to go away for a few days, take a vacation? I'll get a maid to take care of Johnny and me. It'll do you a lot of good. No. No, I don't need a vacation. There's nothing wrong with me. But Harry, there is... Yeah? Uh, there's nothing the matter with... You were about to say something else. I've got to go into Johnny's room and see that he's covered. He always throws the covers off. I sat there looking after her, and then I glanced about the room. There was the pack of matches lying open on the table. I closed the cover. And then I noticed her purse lying nearby. It was bulging. Harry! What's the matter? My, my purse! Yes, yes, your purse. Here, look. Full of matches. A dozen books of them. And these newspaper clippings. Give it back to me. Why are you saving these clippings? Why do you carry all these matches with you? Well, I... I, I bought the matches in the store. A, a dozen for five cents. These newspaper clippings. Fire on 112th Street causes severe damage. And all these others. Why are you saving these clippings, Marie? Why, there, there's nothing wrong in that. I'm interested in your work. I intend to keep a file on fires. Uh, it'll help you in your work. That's very considerate, Marie. Oh... Harry, you're so good. Why should this have to happen to us? About midnight, I went to bed. Marie didn't follow me. I lay in the semi-darkness, wide awake, trying to think what I should do. Couldn't collect my thoughts. Every time I closed my eyes, I could see the flame of that match. Yellow and blue crawling along the matchstick. Drink this, Harry. It'll help you sleep. Oh, uh, what is it? It's cocoa. It's very good for you. Uh, I'm not the one that's having trouble falling asleep. We both couldn't sleep last night. I'm taking some of this myself as soon as I go to bed. All right, leave it on the nightstand. Well, be sure to drink it while it's hot. Yes, Mary, I will. Good night. Darling. Good night, Marie. Coco. And then suddenly I knew. I looked around quickly for something to pour it in. There was a radiator pan. It was empty. I poured the cup of liquid into it. Then I lay back and waited. I waited for her next move. About an hour later, I heard the door open softly and Marie tiptoed toward my bed. Harry. Harry? Are you asleep? I didn't answer, but breathed evenly. She hovered over me for a moment, and she tiptoed out, carefully closing the door behind her. I jumped out of bed and hurried into my clothes. Quickly, I poured the cocoa from the pan into a bottle, put it in my pocket, and I grabbed my coat and I followed her. I rang for the elevator. She had only a few minutes headway. I'd catch up to her easily, and then... then we'd have a showdown. Steve looked at me with controlled amazement. Hello, Steve. Hello, Mr. Jordan. My wife went down a moment ago, didn't she? Yes, Mr. Jordan, just took her down. She went toward 3rd Avenue, didn't she? Why, uh, I think so. She sort of stopped for a minute and then turned towards 3rd. I had to get back to the elevator because you were ringing. When I reached the corner, I looked up and down 3rd Avenue, and then I saw her. She was walking north. I crossed to the other side of the street and followed her, keeping at a distance. At 98th Street, she turned east. Down the middle of the block was the remains of last night's fire. 
She stopped in front of the gutted building for a long time, just stood there, looking at it. Then she walked inside. I waited a few seconds and then followed her. Murray! Who's there? It's me, Harry. Harry! Why did you... Come along, Marie. We'd better get out of here. The police. I took her hand without a word. She came along. We walked home in complete silence. We both knew. When we came to our apartment house, I stopped and rang for the elevator. In the light of the hallway, I could see her face. My wife's face. Ashy gray. Her eyes brightened and painful. You run upstairs, Marie, and I'll... Uh... I'll be along in a minute. Harry, where are you going? I'll be right back. Please, Harry. Don't, don't do anything. You run along, Marie. You're not going to... No. I'm only going to the drugstore to get something. I'll be back in a few minutes. I came home a half hour later. She was waiting for me. Did... Did you do it, Harry? Please, please, Harry, tell me. I've got to know. I had the cocoa you gave me analyzed. Oh, I'm sorry. I had to do it. Don't you see? I couldn't help it. It's very easy for the druggist, especially when I told him what I thought was in it. That stuff that makes you sleep through an earthquake. Please, try to understand, Harry. You must understand. Is the kid asleep? Uh-huh. Johnny's all right. I was sorry for Marie. She looked so haggard and worn. It wasn't her fault. I was sorry for myself. My head was roaring. I wasn't feeling too well. I kept seeing sparks in front of my eyes. I, I closed my eyes for a moment. <sighs> let's go to bed, Harry. Marie, look, we can do something. Now, let, let's burn up every match, every match in the house. We'll, we'll never bring another match in. No! No, Harry, we can't do that. You don't want to. No, no, not now, Harry. Strange, isn't it? Huh? That this should happen to me. Me, a fire inspector. That's funny. Give me the matches, Marie. All the matches. No, I can't do that. Give them I to won't. Me. Please, please don't, please don't take them. I'll do anything you want, anything. Where did you hide them? Tell me, where are they? Inside the range behind the paper bags. I dropped her hand. <laughs> she sank to the floor in a huddle, weeping. <laughs> And then I went into the kitchen and got all the matches. Please, Harry. Don't burn them up. Look, Harry, look. Look up. See? I'll light each book of matches one at a time until they've all gone up in smoke. The yellow flame licked its way down the matches. The cover caught fire and blackened. I watched her look at the flame with dazed eyes. Listen. Listen, Harry. You hear? Just someone in the hall. It's more than someone... Something's happened. Something has happened. I'll take a look. The house is on fire! Yeah, Marie, wake up, Johnny. Johnny! Johnny! You have to hurry. The flames are coming up the stairs. There's an upward draft. What's the matter, Mother? The house is on fire. We've got to get out. It's too late to go down. We'll have to go up through the roof. Oh, I, I hurt my leg. Come along, come along, Johnny. Mother. She'll come along. No. No, I want to wait for Mother. It's all right, Johnny. Go along with Daddy. I'll, I'll follow you. No, I, I won't go. I won't go without you, Hold on Mother. to my arm, Marie. Come on. Give me a hand, Johnny. Don't be scared. The fire won't hurt you. It won't hurt you at all. You're safe with me. We made our way upstairs. Very slowly, because of Marie's sprained ankle. Finally, we got to the roof. There were some firemen on the next roof about ten feet separated the two buildings. Don't get panicky. We'll get you off safely. Are we going to have to jump across, Daddy? Mother won't be able to jump. Her foot... It's all right, Johnny. Don't be scared. They're putting a board across between the two roofs. We'll just walk across. All right, now. One at a time. Tie the rope around you and come across. Johnny, Johnny, you go first. Here. Now don't be afraid. There. Rope will hold you in case you slip. Mother, you got to go first. I'll go right after you. Johnny! You promise? Go ahead, Johnny. Mother will follow you. And don't turn around. I'll keep walking. 
Oh. All right. The kid's safe. Now you, lady. Oh, be careful. The board. Oh. Hey, the board slipped off. Hurry, one of you guys, and get another board. Coming up. Your mother's going to be all right. You pushed the board off, Harry. I saw you do it. No, I, no, I didn't, Marie. I didn't. I, I... All right, mister. Just tie the rope around her. Now, don't be afraid, lady. And don't look down. All right. Ready? I'm ready. Okay, boys. She's all right. Now you, mister. All right. That's right. Tie the rope around you. All set? Okay. On the ground we stood there, the three of us, watching the fire. Great flames shot out, stabbing at the sky. The top of the roof was burning now. A red flame crawled along, searching out the inflammable spots. And the wind was helping. All this time Marie was shaking, shaking violently. But not with cold. I, I pitied her. And then she, she threw up her hands and shrieked. No, 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 darling, don't. I can't stand it. We can't go on this way. Police! Police, come here. Don't do it, Marie. There's no need to let the police. You don't know what you're saying. You, you... Police! What is it, lady? Hey, you better calm down now, you. Officer, pay no attention. She no, she... no, no, it's no use, Harry. Officer, these awful fires, they're not accidental. There's a, a pyromaniac, a criminal. I know who it is. You got to arrest the person. Arrest so there won't be any more. All right, lady. What is this? Who is the pyromaniac? The criminal is my husband, Harry Jordan. This man here. Arrest him. <laughs> well, that's... That's about all there is to the story, gentlemen. And then I was brought here. <laughs> she must have sounded kind of, well, painful for you to hear it all over again, Marie. No. It was all right, Harry. I wonder, uh, I got a cigarette. Could I, uh... No. I'll light it for you, <laughs> Harry. You don't have to worry. I won't try to keep the matches... She'd been awfully good to me, gentlemen. You'll take good care of her, won't you? She tried everything to help. Hid the matches so as to keep them from me. She even tried to give me sleeping pills so I wouldn't... It's all right, Harry. I'm sorry about the locket there. Must have fallen out of my coat when I was in that building at 98th Street. I... It's all right, Harry. You can buy me another one. Sometime. You can't blame anybody for liking fires. It's not their fault. Fires are beautiful to watch. So bright and clean. They burn up all the filth and dirt. They're magnificent to watch, especially the big ones. The way the flames roar and crackle, lighting up everything around you. The beautiful fire. The beautiful fire. <laughs> Thank you, Frederick March, for a splendid performance. Say, Arno, you and your brother-in-law are still friends? Why, of course we're friends, Hap. We have so much in common. Both of us think an Autolite Stay Full battery is wonderful. Why, it needs water only three times a year, normal car use. 
And he appreciates the fact that Autolite Stay Full batteries are made by Autolite, the makers of over 400 products for cars, trucks, airplanes, boats. In 28 Autolite plants from coast to coast. Yes, sir. And Autolite also makes complete electrical systems for many makes of America's finest cars. Batteries. Spark plugs. Generators. Starting motors. Coils. Distributors. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. The lifeline of your car. So, folks, don't accept electrical parts that are supposed to be as good. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now here again is Mr. Frederick March. It's been a real pleasure appearing on Suspense tonight and working with this fine cast, especially Jeanette Nolan, who played Marie. And I'm looking forward with great interest to listening next week when radio's outstanding theater of thrills brings you Joan Crawford in The Ten Years. Another gripping study in... Suspense! Frederick March is soon to be seen with his wife, Florence Eldridge, in the new film, Christopher Columbus. Tonight's suspense play was adapted by Sigmund Miller from the story by Cornell Woolridge, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Leith Stevens. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leder. Next Thursday, same time, hear Joan Crawford in The Ten Years. You can buy Autolite Stayful batteries, Autolite resistor spark plugs, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Roma Wines presents Suspense. Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, Roma Wines bring you a star, Mr. Gene Kelly, in a suspense play that tells of fear and suspicion and dangerous adventure on the long highway from California to New York. And so, with death went along for the ride, and with the performance of Gene Kelly as a man named... George Javery. We again hope to keep you in suspense. Front, boy. Front. You take Mr. Brown to 314? Yes, sir. Uh, I want a room. The name, sir? George Javery. But uh, I haven't got reservations. Oh? Well, I think we can fix you up, Mr. Javery. If you'll sign, please. Uh, sure. <coughs> Excuse me, friend. Yes? I couldn't help hearing your name, Javery, hmm? Well, that's right. In the relation to Frank Javery of Cincinnati? Well, mm. not that I know of. Oh. <laughs> kind of a funny name. No offense, you understand, but I just thought, you know. Sure, I, I know. Been doing quite a lot of traveling, haven't you, Mr. Javery? Huh? <clears throat> I see all them stickers on your bags. Oh. Oh, yes, I, I've been out of the country. Room 610, 450 a day. Will that be all right, Mr. Javery? Sure. <laughs> you, uh... Going to stay in Reno very long? Uh, just overnight. Going east? Uh-huh. You uh, driving? Yeah. Say, what do you want to know? Uh, thought I'd tip you off to a good place to eat, see? <clears throat> you uh, like steaks? <laughs> when I can get them. Better stop at Harry's place, then. Best steaks between here and Chicago. Here's the address. I wrote it down for another fellow this morning, but he left before I could give it to him. Oh, well, well thanks. You, uh... Driving back east alone? Yes. Say, uh, what did you say your name was? <laughs> I didn't, but it's Brown. Steve Brown. Well, look, Mr. Brown, if you want a free ride east, why don't oh, you just... Hey, no, no, no. I'm heading up to Portland, see? Oh, well, well, have a good trip, Mr. Brown. Same to you, Mr. Javer. Thanks. Don't forget to stop at Harry's place, Mr. Javer. I think you'll find it a very interesting spot. Very interesting. 
the drapery. What is it? Did you notice a fellow with only one arm? Oh, no, where? I didn't think you did. He said he was a friend of yours. But don't have nothing to do with him, Mr. Javery. He's no friend of yours. He's no friend of anybody. Don't have nothing to do with him. Oh, here's your drink, Mr. Javery. Thanks. Oh, did your friend find you, Mr. Javery? What friend? Uh, one arm fella. He was looking for you. He said I should keep my eye out for you. A one arm fr- uh, one arm man, Mr. Javery? I know. There's no guest at the hotel that answers that description. I tell you, I seen him coming out of your room, Mr. Javery. I don't know how he got in there, but I seen him coming out. You heard me. I'm checking out. If there's anything wrong... Oh, no, there's nothing wrong. I'm just checking out, that's all. But at three o'clock in the morning... Look, I, I said I'm checking out. Now, now, please get my bags out to the car. Just put them in the back of the car. Yes, sir. Now, look, kid. For the last time, do you know? I don't know nothing, Mr. Jeffrey. Honest, I don't know nothing. Okay, okay. Here. Gee, look, here he comes now. Hey! Hey, wait a minute. Thanks, Mr. Jeffrey. You, uh, going east, mister? Oh. Oh, it's you, huh? Say, what's the big idea? What big idea? Now, listen to me, my one-armed friend. I can't help having one arm, mister. All right, all right. But what's the idea of following me around? You've been following me ever since I got here. Oh. But I'm sorry about that, mister. So am I. Now, what about it? Well, you see, I'm kind of down on my luck. So I'm hitchhiking. I got to get east, and I heard you were going east, so... Oh. You are going east, ain't you, mister? Well, yes. Yes, I am. Do you mind if I come along a piece? Oh, all right, hop in. Say, uh, there's one thing you haven't explained to me yet. Uh, What's that? What were you doing in my room? Hitchhiking? I was never in your room. The bellboy said he saw you come out. I don't know what he said, but I was never in your room. Oh. Well, it's kind of late to start driving, I guess. I don't mind. I am used to night work. Oh. Say, uh, I don't think I got your name. Jones. One arm Jones, they call me mostly. You traveling far, Mr. Jones? Uh, as far as St. Louis. Uh-huh. Have you been in San Francisco lately? No. No, I came by way of San Diego. Why do you ask, Mr. Javery? Oh, nothing. I thought I might have seen it. Uh, what's the matter? How did you know my name? Your name? <laughs> That's an old hitchhiker's gag. Hang around a hotel lobby and find out who's who and maybe where's heading, see? Yeah. See? There doesn't seem to be much traffic tonight, does there? No. Are you looking for something? Oh, just reaching for a cigar. Get your hand out of your pocket. I, I was Get only... it out, I said. You don't have to pull a gun no? out. No? All right, Mr. Jones. Come on, let's have it. What's your game? Game? Yeah, your game. Come on, spill it. I don't get it. Neither do I. I suppose you haven't been tailing me ever since I checked into that hotel. Well, I, I explained about the hitch. Get out. Out of the car. You heard me. Okay. But, Mr. Jamer... What? Don't be too surprised if you see me again sometime. Good night, Mr. Javery. Tonight for Suspense, Roma Wines bring you a star, Mr. Gene Kelly, whom you have heard in the prologue to Death Went Along for the Ride by Henry Denker and Ralph Berkey. Tonight's adventure in Suspense. In this brief intermission in the play, let's imagine we're listening to a conversation taking place at the smart Coral Beach and Tennis Club in Bermuda. An American about to depart for the States thanks his Bermudian friend for the gracious hospitality shown him, and in particular for the especially enjoyable wine his friend served. He remarks how much he'd like to be able to get some of that same wine at home. The Bermudian chuckles as he says, but my friend, that wine you enjoyed so much, it comes from the great wine districts of your own California. It is Roma wine. Yes, friends, many Americans are still not aware that Roma wines are so highly rated in many foreign lands that they are imported to be enjoyed as rare luxuries. But here in America, we can still enjoy these superb Roma wines as a daily pleasure. 
well within reach of the most modest purse, with no high import duty, no expensive shipping costs included. That's why Roma wines cost you so little. Have you been overlooking the enjoyment these richly satisfying Roma wines offer? As a delectable beverage at any time? As the addition that can make any meal an occasion? As a sure-to-be-appreciated offering to your guests when you entertain? You get some idea of the great worth of these fine Roma wines when you learn Roma wines are America's largest selling wines. I'll spell the name for you. R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage our star, Gene Kelly, as George Javery, in Death Went Along for the Ride, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. All right, put him up. Come on, get him up and step out in front of those headlights where I can see you. Come on, before I let you... Shoot, mister. Well, I'll... What do you want? Not to get shot right now. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I... Kind of jumpy, aren't you? Yeah, maybe. Uh, were you going into this joint here? Well, I was. <laughs> well, come on, I'll buy you a cup of coffee. <laughs> I think I earned it at that. Well, howdy, folks. Good to see somebody out kind of late, eh? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, black coffee, huh? How about you? The same, I guess. Look, uh, I'm sorry I frightened you. Say, what's your name? Eileen. Eileen Harrison. What's yours? George Javery. Say, uh, what are you doing walking along a million miles from no place at this time of night? <laughs> I started driving east in the $50 jalopy yesterday like a fool. It just fell apart on me. I was coming in here to phone or something. Well, how far east are you going? Greenwich, Connecticut. I'm going to New York myself. Uh, you're welcome. I mean, if... Well, I... Oh, 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 look, if you don't like me, you can always get out and start to walk again. What have you got to lose? <laughs> well, all right. Thanks. And I could use a little company right now. Here you are. Piece of pie? Piece of pie, bud? Huh? Oh, oh no. How about a hamburger? We got good hamburgers, you know. We got. No, no, no. Just be quiet a minute, will you? Be quiet? Yeah. What's the matter? Shh. Shut up, another two of you. Sure, anything you say. Say, what's the matter with you? I'm listening for something, that's all. What? There he comes. Hey, where are you going? That wasn't it. You know, what's going on, bud? You hot or something? No, there's a car out there. It's been following me for the last 200 miles. Yeah? How'd you know? I know it. I took a side road. He did, too. I tried to duck him, and he hung on. He kept following me. I, I'm sure that... Listen. Listen, that must be it now. No, he, he's not coming in. He's waiting. For what? Me. Look. Look, Eileen, here are the keys to the car. Go out and drive it up the side entrance. I'll be waiting at the door. All right, No, but... no. Go ahead. He won't hurt you. Hurry. Okay. Hey, mister, you ain't in trouble, are you? I don't want no trouble, no, my friend. keep your shirt on. You'll be all right. Here. Don't you want your change? No, I'll keep it. Hop in. I'll slide over. Thanks. Look back now, baby. Seriously, that other car following us. I don't think so. Say, look, pal, I don't want to be nosy, but... Uh, Eileen, I, I wouldn't kid you. I don't know what it is. Is anyone following us? No, I don't think so. Uh-oh. Oh, uh, lights. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean it's someone following us. No? How fast are we going now? About 60. All right, watch. Hey, please be careful, George. I'll be careful. Is he coming? Uh-huh, I think he's gaining on us. Yeah, I thought so. Well, we'll see how much this guy wants to play. He had a pretty big car, you know. Yeah, I know. Is he still gaining? Closing up pretty fast. Oh, I can't stand this much longer, and I'm going to do something about it. What are you going to do? I'm going to pull to one side, slam on the brakes, and see what happens. Hey, George! I'll force him into the ditch if I have to. It's what he's trying to do to us. Hang on. George! He's passing. I'm trying to. Come on, let's get out of here. He... He must have been 
didn't kill. Yeah. Did you see him as we hit? Just for a second. You notice anything about him? Not much. Well, I did. He was a man with only one arm. <laughs> This is that Harry's place that guy told me about. You sure you like steak? Who doesn't? Well, this is the place for you, then. Finer steaks the side of Chicago, they tell me. Come on. A table for two, sir? Uh, yeah, please. Right this way. Well, I like the whole thing to monster this. Right here. Here's a nice table right by the window. That's fine, thanks. And, madame? Thank you. Uh, two steaks, please. Uh, both medium rare. All right? Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir. George, to get back to our little problem. Our little problem? All right, so it's your problem and I'm stuck with it. Are you sure you don't have any enemies? How could I? I've been out of the country for over a year. I didn't have any when I left. Well, could there be any connection with that work you were doing with the Chinese government? Oh, not a chance. I, I uh, well, look, I don't know any secret plans, and I have no agent X-9, and, well, all that's out. Well, maybe it's all just a coincidence. Oh, sure. A one-armed guy tags me all over Reno, and then says he's a poor hitchhiker. Then he acts like he's trying to pull a stick up, and then a hundred miles beyond where I've dropped him, he shows up in a big Cadillac. Just a coincidence. Call for Mr. Javery. George. Telephone for Mr. Javery. Call for George Javery. Yeah. Another coincidence. What do you suppose? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. George, don't. Come on, we'll both go answer it. Uh, are you Mr. Javery? Yeah. Well, that's good. They've been trying to reach you all day. All day? Yes, this is about the tenth call we've had for you. Uh, the phone booth is right this way. One little coincidence after another. Calling me all day at a joint I've never been in before in my life. George, don't answer it. Now, look, you just keep an eye out while I'm in the booth. All right. Uh, oh, <laughs> pardon me. Why, of course. Hello. 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 Can I help you, sir? Why, yes, I had a call in this wire. But... I'm sorry, but your party seems to have disconnected. Did you call them? Uh, no, 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 forget it. Was it, George? Come on. Let's go out to the car. Well, what was it? I don't know. Whoever it was, as soon as I answered, they hung up. Come on. Come on. There's a guy following us. The guy I bumped into at the phone booth. Oh. That's what that phone call was for. Get in the car, quick. Here he comes. Oh, oh Mr. Javery. George is pointing something. It's a camera. Thanks, Mr. Jeffrey. Hey, what's the idea of taking pictures of me? It's a hobby. I'll send you a print at the morgue. Come on, George, have fun. This is one of the really bright spots of old Chicago. Yeah, a little too bright. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we present direct from 10 weeks run in New York, the world famed sharpshooter, Professor Glittenheimer. This is going to be all right, George. He's good. I saw his act in Hollywood. He's quite a comedian. Well, that's swell. A little comedy had come in handy now. Oh, George, you promised me. Come on, relax. Okay. He shoots at the light bulbs, and whether he hits them or not, they always break. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, blindfolded. <laughs> he didn't even aim at it. Sure, that's the point. Later, he's going to shoot straight up, and the bulb in the back of him will break. <laughs> and now, over my shoulder, the left shoulder. No, no, the right shoulder. That's harder yet. <laughs> It's shattered. I don't know. Come on, Eileen, we're leaving. Please, ladies and gentlemen, please. The performance will continue. Keep proceeding, please. Oh, please, please wait, sir. Don't leave. I I'm terribly sorry. Won't you stay and finish your dinner? Uh, please, sir, our, our apologies. A most regrettable accident. Yeah? Only it wasn't. Wasn't? Wasn't an accident. That comic up there shoots blank cartridges. Well, of course, but... Yes, and what broke my glass was a bullet. 
And it didn't come from the stage. One dollar. Thank you. Good old Bear Mountain Bridge. We're almost there. Yep. With any luck, we ought to be in New York by 10 o'clock. And the way you've been driving, I don't see how anyone could have followed us. Oh, why do you think I was driving that way? Gee, it's a beautiful night. Look at that moon. Yeah. Let's stop a minute. Why? Oh, I don't know, just to look down at the water. All right. Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen the old Hudson River. I guess I'd better turn off the lights. I'm not sure I'm allowed to stop in the middle of the bridge. Come over here by the rail, George. Gosh, isn't it lovely? Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Oh, look at that boat down there. It looks it looks a little... I wonder how far it is down to that water from here. Oh, I guess about 150 feet or so. I'm awfully glad you decided to come this way. Why did you? Oh, it's less traffic and not as many cars as on the George Washington Bridge or the tunnel. And, well, it's less chance of being spotted. You still thinking of that? That's kind of hard to forget, isn't it? Just the same, I wish you would. It's not doing... Uh, look, look. What? It's a car, and it looks like it's going to pull up behind us. George, you, you don't no, think... No, it... I, I don't know, but if some monkey's looking for trouble, he's going to get it because I've had enough. What are you going to do? Now, look, I'll crouch down in front of the car here where he can't see me. He'll pull up behind us so his headlights will be on us if he's up to anything funny. Now, he's beginning to pull over now. Now, look, okay, okay, you talk to him, stall him, then we'll see. All right, but George... Hey, don't you know you're not allowed to stop in the middle of the bridge? Why? I just stopped a minute to look at the water. You alone? Why, yes. Oh, I thought I saw a man standing here with you just now. No. The California plates on your car, ain't they? Yes, I, I just drove through from the coast. Oh. You pick up any hitchhikers on the way? Uh, anybody that looks like this? Like what? Like the guy in this picture. Well, that's the picture someone took it. I thought so. All right, sister, where is he? Right here, bud. George, look out, he's got a gun. Why, you... Now, let's see how good you are without a gun. George, the railing, he's trying to throw you over. He's dead! Come on, kid, let's go. Well, we made it. Home at last. Home? This is the Bancroft Hotel. It's the only home I ever had in New York. Boy, take these bags. Now, sir, if you leave the key, I'll have your car garage for you. Yeah, sure. Here you are. Thank you. George, I could go home, you know. What? Travel out to Connecticut this time of night? <laughs> it isn't that far. Come on, you get a good night's rest right here. Then you can catch an early train in the morning. Well, all right. Yes, sir. You'll uh, wish a room then, sir? Uh, two rooms, please. Yes, sir. Will you sign here, please? Mm-hmm. Thank you, Mr. J... Oh, Mr. George Javery. What about it? N nothing, sir. Only uh, we have your reservations. Reservation? But I, I... Oh, I get it. Another coincidence. Sir? Uh, skip it. George. Eileen, uh, look, uh, maybe you're right. You, you better go on home. George, you're coming home with me. I I'm sorry, Eileen, but... This is journey's end, and I'm going to see it through. Well, then, so am I. Eileen. Please, George. Okay. Okay, come on. Well, what do you know? What? Our friend, sitting over there by that post. The man who took the picture? Yeah, yeah. Last act coming up. Oh, clerk. Yes, sir? Uh, what room do I have? 706, sir. Oh, that's fine. The lady? Yes, sir. Room 614 for her. Front boy. This way, Mr. Javery. Going up? Six, please. George, shouldn't you call the police or something? And tell them what? Oh, I... I don't know. Now, look, honey, you get a good night's sleep, I'll be okay. I mean, after all, this is New York. Six out... Good night, darling. Good night. Good night.
Servant? It's right this way, sir, to the left. Here we are, sir. Just put the bags over there, son. Uh, will that be all, sir? Yeah, here you are. Thank you, sir. Hello, George Javery. <laughs> Took you longer than I expected. Brown, a man I met in Reno. What are you doing here? Waiting for you. And the name ain't Brown, that's Javery. Javery? Yeah, George Javery. <laughs> Javery, I can't think you thank you enough for what you've done for me. What I've done for you? Sure, you've been a great help. All right, let's have it. Look, Javery, you've come to the end of the road. But I think you're entitled to know why. <coughs> you don't know me, do you? I'm Bill Malone. Oh, Scarface Malone. Yeah, only I don't have scars anymore, see? That's the point. Took me two years and a lot of pain to get a new face. And I didn't get it just to look good in the coffin. Know what I mean? No, I'm afraid I don't. After a guy in my business has been away for a year or two, he's not always welcome back, see? And he generally finds out about it with a bullet in the back. That's why you struck me as a good idea. Oh, I did, did I? Yeah. I don't believe in taking chances, see? The boys thought I was coming east under the name of George Javery. Oh. So the one-armed guy and all the rest... Yeah, he was one of my boys. And you were kind of rough with him, Mr. Javery. Well, he wasn't exactly playing beanbag himself. Jerry, he wouldn't hurt you. I just sent him to tell you so I'd have a line on where you were. After you dusted him off, it was just a break for me that you went to that steakhouse. Otherwise, I might have lost you. A candid cameraman, too, I suppose. Yeah. After I lost Jerry, I figured I wouldn't take any chances. Send a picture around to the boys. Like the guy that took a pot at you in Chicago. And the guy you tossed over the bridge. The boys that were out to get me, see? Only they didn't know all the time it was you. No chances, know what I mean? Yeah. Only I can't exactly say I'm glad to have been of service. So if you drop that gun, I'll go. Not yet, Javery. There's just one thing more you can do. Yeah? Stand over by that window. What for? Stand over there and drop your hands. The boys wouldn't quite understand it if you had your hands up. The boys? Yeah. The ones I've been telling you about. When I pull up that shade, they're going to take a pot shot at me through that window. When they do, they'll get me. Only it'll be you. They'll never know the difference. Now, over to that window. They know you're already here, so move. You uh, don't mind if I sort of stroll, do you? After all, this is a surprise. Come on. Over to that window. And if I don't? I'll plug you. And if I do? You see, Malone, that's the trouble with your system. No incentive. You know what I... Don't make a move. George, is anything wrong? George! Get over there in that corner. Don't hurt her, Malone. He's going to lock the door, that's all. Taking no chances, see? Then here's some light so you can see what you're doing. What are you... George! George! Oh, George! Oh, Oh, it's all right, Arlene. It's all right, darling. (sighs) Well, there lies our nemesis, the late Mr. Scarface Malone, otherwise known as the guy who never took chances. But he's dead. Yeah, yeah, smart guy, but he made just one mistake. He forgot that the door is right in line of fire with a window. George, what are you going to do? I'm going to call the police and explain this little drama to them. After all, I think it's about time people stop taking pot shots at your future husband. Don't you? And so closes Death Went Along for the Ride, starring Gene Kelly. Tonight's tale of Suspense. Mr. Kelly appeared through courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of The White Cliffs of Dover. When entertaining guests at your home, are you able to go into your aroma wine cellar and say, which would you prefer, this delightful sherry or this sweeter, heavier port? Whichever of these or any others of the many equally fine Roma California wines you offered your guests, they would find you had poured a world of satisfaction into their glasses. If you are not one of the millions already enjoying these good Roma wines... Don't put off this great treat another day. 
You'll be surprised at the tiny cost your Roma wine dealer will ask for such great enjoyment. Only pennies a glass by actual check. Now you can boast of your own private wine cellar, your private Roma wine cellar. And then, inspired by the great qualities of Roma wines, you'll add your voice to the swelling international chorus that says, Roma wines are truly magnificent. Let me repeat the name, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Gene Kelly. I hope you enjoyed our suspense show this evening. I always feel that it's a pleasure and privilege for me to appear here because most of us who act for a living consider this to be radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Next week, I know you will want to be listening when your star will be Mr. Orson Welles, who will appear in the Dark Tower a play written by those two very distinguished gentlemen, Alexander Wolcott and George S. Kaufman. And now just one more word. Fellow Americans, the attack for victory is on. You help make the victory more certain and bring it sooner when you buy more war bonds. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Orson Welles in... Suspense! Presented by Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Miss Dorothy McGuire in Last Confession, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Friends, millions of masterful motorists have been made merry by the miraculous magic of those magnificent marvels, wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. They let your engine idle smoother, perform better on leaner gas mixtures, actually save you gas. They cut down on television interference, too, and have up to 200% longer electrode life. Backed by the research and engineering know-how of Autolite, Autolite resistor spark plugs today are used as original equipment in many of America's finest cars. So, friends, don't be satisfied with spark plugs supposed to be as good. Get genuine Autolite resistor spark plugs. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. And here's a reminder. Suspense on television may be seen in many parts of the country every Tuesday night. And now, with last confession and with the performance of Dorothy McGuire, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. Oh, isn't that horrible, Edna? Let's see. Gee, is that the way they found him? Yeah. That's the way they found him. Oh, it was knifed. All twisted up like that. Lying there in the mud. Who? who do you suppose is guilty? They didn't even find the knife. They'll never find out who did it. Oh, sure they will. No, they won't. Oh, Jesse, put that paper down. Every time something awful, awful happens, you have to read all about it down to the last detail. No, I don't. Yes, you do. What can you see so fascinating in horrible things? They make such a bad impression on you. <laughs> Remember when we went to see Johnny Belinda in the movies? Yeah. You could hardly talk for a week. That imagination of yours. Oh, look. It says here they found a lady's glove. Black. Size five. Hey, that's my size. Well, see, it could be anybody. Size five is my size, too. Just think how many people could have done uh, it. Ah, they'll find out. Somebody's conscience will begin bothering them, and, and then you'll see. A person that would do a thing like that wouldn't have a conscience. Besides, maybe he deserved it. How do you know? Everybody has a conscience. They'll get whoever it was. Don't you worry. I wonder who did it. I wonder who it could have been. Mm, it's funny how murders affect me. Even... Reading about them in the papers or listening to the radio. When someone's killed, I always feel like I did it. Still, how can one person kill another person? How can he? Human flesh and blood. And then, not to confess it, how can he stand that guilt? 
Could I ever kill someone? You wouldn't think so. You wouldn't think I'd be the sort of... Well, then, nobody is ever the sort of person to be a killer until he's killed someone. I don't know. Every time something like this murder comes up, I keep thinking maybe... Maybe I did it. Maybe when I was asleep or something, I got up and, and did it. Edna? Hmm? What day was he killed? What day? Yeah, what day? Tuesday. I think it was. It says here someplace. Wait a second. Uh, in the woods, four miles from the city limits of... No, no, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, here it is. Police believe Howard was killed sometime between 5 and 7 p.m. on Tuesday, July 12th. Tuesday, July 12th. How can they estimate that closely? Oh, they can, all right. Oh, is that his picture? Yeah, here. Here, you take it. Thomas L. Howard of Los Angeles, who was found dead in Woodland Grove here last... No, tonight. Poor Tommy. Tommy, did you know him? I went out with him once. Hey, did, did you turn off the heat? Huh? Did you turn off the heat, Jesse? The house seems awfully warm. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I didn't turn the heat off. It's roasting in here. Imagine turning on the heat anyway during the summer months in Los Angeles. Well, it was chilly in here this morning. Hey, Edna. I can hear you. Keep talking. Well, look at him. At who? At this picture of Howard, the man who was killed. <sighs> what about him? Let's see. Yeah, so what? What about him? He's just like him. Who? Remember Henry Hackers, the boy I used to go with, the one on Morella Avenue, the dark-haired one with the funny kind of eyes? You mean the one who... Yeah. Oh, oh, sure. But Tommy didn't look anything like Henry. You're crazy. Look at that hairline and the cleft in the chin. Oh, for Pete's sake. Well, now, don't tell me you don't see any resemblance. It's just like Henry Hackers. Well, a little, maybe, but... Oh, gee whiz, Jesse. You've got the darndest imagination. <laughs> Henry Hackers. He sure wasn't what you'd call good looking. He had a cute smile, though, and sort of funny little way he'd brush his hair out of his eyes. And then he'd walk with one shoulder just a little higher than the other. Henry Hackers. <laughs> he was such a nice boy. Although, I never thought he'd want to get serious. A man can make you feel so guilty if you don't love him. Just because he loves you, he thinks. And that awful thing he said the last time. When was that? When was that? But, Jesse, I... I can't help it. It's just the way I feel about you. But at least let me call you. You, you might change your mind. I won't change my mind, Henry. But you can't do it, Jesse. We had something, you and me. We made such a swell couple. I had wonderful plans well, for us, Henry, Jesse. Well, Henry, I can't help it. But the way I feel is just the way I feel. It's been getting too serious lately. If you know what I mean. And when a slight flirtation grows out of hand, things can happen that'll only make people awfully unhappy when things don't work out. Slight flirtation? Well, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. But I thought it was a little more than a slight flirtation. The nights I laid awake thinking about it. Oh, us. don't get sore. Well, I want you to know this, Jesse. I just want you to know it and remember it as long as you live. You've done something to me that's beyond repair. And if something should happen to me, and believe me, it very well might... I just want you to know you're responsible. Henry! What a horrible thing to say. It's like... It's like a curse. Now, if you want, I'll drive you home. Responsible. Telling me I'd be responsible. Ah, oh, poor Henry. I should have talked to him again after that. He kept calling. But I felt so guilty. Wouldn't it be funny if instead of this Tommy fellow here, it was Henry that got killed? Between 5 and 7 o'clock on Tuesday, July 12th. Tuesday, July 12th. Let's see. Tuesday, July 12th. I came from work at 4, and I told Edna I was going out and I wouldn't be back. Now, where was I going? Gosh. My memory. Where was I going? What's the matter with me? Where was I between 5 and 7 on Tuesday, July 12th? Gosh, that wasn't so long ago. I should remember that. I remember later that night. I remember at 11 I was in bed because uh, Wednesday I had to be down to work an hour early to get out those new invoice forms. Hey! 
You know, if they hauled me down to the police station right now and began asking me, where were you on Tuesday, July 12th, between 5 and 7 p.m., I wouldn't have a thing to say. <laughs> Edna? Hey, have you read a little Abner yet? Edna, listen, put down that paper. <laughs> yeah? Look, now, now, don't laugh, will you? At what? At what I'm going to say. What I'm going to ask you. <laughs> Go ahead, I won't laugh. Do you remember where you were on Tuesday, July 12th, between 5 and 7 p.m.? Why? Do you remember? Well, let's see. Sure, July 12th. Uh-huh. Sure, I went shopping over at Rawkins, and then I ate dinner, and then met Carl Maffaletti, and we went to a movie. Gee, that's funny. What? Well, you remember so easy. Oh, well, I know it was Tuesday, because Tuesday was the day they had the sale at Rawkins. That's why I went shopping that day. I can't remember at all. What do you mean? Do you remember what I did between 5 and 7? I was gone all day, honey. I just explained well, that. Well, it's funny, but I can't remember a thing during those two hours. Well, well, I must have done something. I, I just didn't die between 5 and 7 on Tuesday, oh, July 12th. Oh, forget 12th. it, Jesse. I'm going out on the fire escape and take the sun. If the phone rings, get it, will you? Sure. I haven't talked to him for such a long time. I'm going to call him. It's the least I can do after all the times he called me and... I didn't even answer the phone. Hello? Mrs. Hackers? Yes, who is this? This is Jesse Larkin, Mrs. Hackers. Yes? Is Henry there? Henry? Yes, is he there? If this is your idea of a joke, Jesse, it's in terribly bad taste. A joke? I'm not joking. I'd like to talk to him. I know how you feel about the way I treated him, Mrs. Hackers, but really... I don't I... know what's the matter with you, Jesse. I don't know whether you're crazy or what. You know that Henry is dead. Dead? Henry Hacker is dead How could I forget a thing like that? It's simple forgetting your coat in a restaurant Or your purse in a movie But forgetting the boy you used to date The boy you refused to marry just a few days ago Forgetting he's dead oh, It just doesn't happen Henry, dead How? I'm responsible, just like he said, like a curse. Just like I took a knife out of the kitchen drawer and deliberately plunged it into his heart. Yeah, but could I? Could I murder? Actually murder? With a knife? Kill? A black glove, size five, was found at the scene of the crime. Only one. Just one black glove in the drawer. Oh, Jesse. Oh. oh. What'd I wear on Tuesday? Oh, there'd be tears in the dress from the twigs. And mud, baby, from when I dragged them. No. Oh, everything's all right. My blue dress. The seam on the sleeve and the hem and the mud on the skirt. I did it. There lies poor Henry. Henry, face down in the mud in the woods. And I did it. I did it. I did it. I did it. Autolite is bringing you Miss Dorothy McGuire in Last Confession. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hi, Harlow. All set for fall driving? Ready, set, and raring to go, Hap. Put in those peppy, powerful, pistol-packing, wide-gap, auto-light resistor spark plugs. How's that? Smooth. That's the word, smooth, for smoother idling. Your motor purrs like a cuddly kitty with auto light resistor spark plugs. I take it easy. That's the word, easy, for easier, breezier starts in cold temperatures with ALRSP. Hey, you've improved. That's the word, improved. Improved engine performance on leaner gas mixtures. You save gas with auto light resistor spark plugs. Know how? No, how? Right. Auto light engineering know how and research made the thrifty auto light resistor spark plug possible. Twenty millions have been sold. <laughs> 
How much longer can this last? 200%, Hap. Autolite resistor spark plugs have up to 200% longer electrode life. Oh, my gosh. Ohm is right. The exclusive Autolite 10,000 Ohm resistor engineered into every Autolite resistor spark plug makes possible easier starting in cold temperatures. Get on the ball for fall. Get Autolite resistor spark plugs. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage... Dorothy McGuire in Last Confession, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. This is where the paper said I left him. Oh, I don't really remember the place, not really. It's like being someplace you think you've been before and you're not sure. I've got to find out. I've got to know. Gosh. I wonder why I picked a place like this. All these bushes. Oh, might be snakes and all sorts of dangerous things. Stand where you are. <gasps> what? Okay, you don't move. Just stay right where you are. Lieutenant Fleming. Oh. Hello, Lieutenant. What are you doing here? Oh, just... Just curious, really. You know, I, I read about it in the papers. What's your name? I'm just curious, that's all. What's your name? Jesse. Jesse Larkin. Mm, okay, Jesse. Run along. You ought to know better than to hang around a place like this, especially so late at night. Well, it was the glove size, the black glove. I, 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 I know a girl that wears that size. Is that so? Uh, yeah. Uh, have you found the murder weapon yet? Not yet. It's pretty essential to find, isn't it? I, I mean, to prove somebody's guilt. Yeah. Sometimes they save us all the trouble, though. Come in and confess. Oh. Say, it's terrible, isn't it? A nice young man like that. Yeah. Well, there you are. You still don't know who did it. Well, we've got it pretty well narrowed down to one of his girlfriends. Oh. Hey, you run along now. I wouldn't worry too much about the Tommy Howard killing if I were you, Jesse. Howard killing? Oh, no, I won't. Howard. He called him Howard. Why? Why would that lieutenant call him Howard? I've got to buy a paper and found out if, if they know that it really was Henry Hackers. But then Mrs. Hackers told me and... Oh, I'm so mixed up. I'm, I'm forgetting so many things. Henry's last name was Hackers. Henry ha no, Henry Howard. Henry Howard. Yes, that was it. I remember when Edna showed me the paper, that's what it said. Henry Howard. His girlfriends, the officer said. Henry didn't go out with very many girls. Let's see, there was Fran Gilbert. I know he took her out a couple of times. And uh, Barbara. Barbara, what was her name? Oh, I gotta see them. I gotta see whether they've got alibis. If none of them did it, then it must have been me. When I gotta be clever about it, not let them know what I'm after. I'll say, real casual. By the way, Fran, what were you doing between 5 and 7 p.m. on Tuesday, July 12th? Well, it's been a nice chat, honey. I still don't know who you are or what you're doing here, but it's been real nice. Well, I told you, I, I heard you were an actress, and I've always wanted to be oh, one. Oh, come on, and I... leave us on up. You hear about Henry, what's his name? Henry. Yes. Something about his estate? Uh, well, he left me nothing but the memory of two miserable evenings over some warm beer. Uh, no, nothing like that. I was just sort of wondering what you were doing between 5 and 7 on Tuesday, July 12th. Between what and what on when? 5 and 7 on Tuesday, July 12th. Wait a minute. Are you a cop gal or something? That was the time the paper said that Howard was killed. Howard? Look, blue eyes talking in circles makes me dizzy. You're either crazy or a cop or a digger with an angle. Whichever it is, I'm surprisingly uninterested. Scoot. Well, all right. If you're sure you know what you were doing... Just to ease your mind, my lady, I was swabbing decks on the USS New Mexico with a vacuum cleaner, and the Navy will back me up. Satisfied? Well, thank you. Goodbye. It was nice meeting you. Oh, no. 
She's got an alibi. She didn't do it. She couldn't have. She didn't even remember Henry's last name. I don't quite understand, Miss Larkin. I'm from the Los Angeles Police Department, Miss Keeley. What do you want? I'm a policewoman, you understand? Yes. I'm interested in a Henry... Uh... Hackers? Yes. Yes. You knew he was found four miles from the city limits in the woods? Henry? Henry Hackers is dead, but... Well, you're talking about the Howard case. I don't know a thing about that. Where were you and what were you doing between the hours of 5 and 7 on Tuesday, July 12th? See here, I don't see any reason for answering any of your questions. Do you have a warrant? Well, I thought it best to make this a, an informal visit. I thought perhaps I wouldn't need to go into any legalities. Uh, we can make this very simple without a lot of complications. Now, what were you doing between 5 and 7 on July 12th? I think you'd better talk to my lawyer, Miss Larkin. I'm answering no questions without his permission. Good day. Very well. Goodbye. I'll be seeing you again. Goodbye. Just remember, we have your name on file. All of them have alibis. I knew they would, really. And that leaves only me. I must have done it. Henry was right. I am responsible for his death. I deserve what I'll get. I'll deserve it when they sentence me and the judge and no one to stand by me. No one in the world but Edna. Edna. I'll tell her everything. She'll understand how it is. Jesse? Say, where have you been? Where did you go? I've been so worried. I, I, All right, I I'll tell you. I'll tell you everything. I've got to trust you, Edna. You're the only one in the world I can trust. Well? Well, you, you know the murder in the papers. Yeah, what about it? It was me. What? Yes, it was me. You're out of your head. No, I wish I was, Edna. Honest, I wish you I was. You ought to see a doctor, kid. Honest, I mean no. it. No, uh, we were out there together in a car. I remember it so clearly. And he, and he started getting fresh. Uh, but I mean fresh. And I slapped him. Well, I had this knife with me. I, I don't remember where I got it, but I had it in my purse. And I, I stabbed Jesse. him. And I stabbed him. And I stabbed him. And then I, I realized what I'd done. And I was terribly sorry, Edna. Oh, I was awfully sorry. But I had to get rid of him. So I dragged the body to the woods. Inside, away from the highway. And I left him there. And I took the knife... But I forgot one of my gloves. Jesse. Oh. Jesse, we've been roommates for three years, honey. I, I would have sworn you couldn't have dreamed of anything like this. Do you honestly believe I always it? had a violent temper. You know that, Edna. Not to kill. Well, I did. And now the only thing is I can't find the knife. Where would I have put it, Edna? No, Jesse. Jesse, you stay here. Will you promise to stay here until I come back? I can't, Edna. I've got to confess. I couldn't live with a thing like that on my conscience. Promise I me. I couldn't. Please, Jesse, promise. You're not to leave the house. Well, all right. If you say so. See what kind of a person I am? I couldn't even keep a simple promise to my best friend. I had to go. Maybe after I confess this... this terrible headache will go away. Oh, there it is. The police station. Well, I certainly will deserve what I get. I hope they give me the maximum penalty prescribed by law. Yes? Oh, hello. Are you in charge here? Almost. What can I do for you? I'd like to confess to the Howard murder. Who do I see? Jesse, may I talk to you? Certainly, Lieutenant. Sit down. Thank you. Uh, Jesse, I... Well, your case is solved, isn't it? Yes. You don't seem to feel too good about it. I don't. I don't, Jesse. Did you find the knife? Yes. Ah. 
Jesse, we have a couple of visitors for you. I think after you've seen them, you'll feel much better. Uh, that's what our doctor thinks. Visitors who? Uh, uh, Mrs. Hackers, will you come in, please? Mrs. Hackers. Jesse. Oh, don't hate me too much, Mrs. Hackers. You're going to be released, Jesse. The police can take no action on your case, and not at the present time. Mrs. Hackers here read about your confessions in the papers. She called us and told us you couldn't have killed oh, Howard. Jesse, my poor child. Why did you call her Mrs. Hackers? Jesse. When you knew I deserved it? When you knew I killed him? Your only son? Tell him the truth, Mrs. Hackers. You didn't kill Henry, Between Jessie. five and seven on July 12th... Oh, Jesse, don't I, you remember where you were? I was... I was... No. I can't think. I can't remember. Now think, Jesse. Try to remember. Between five and seven on July 12th. Now, if you remember, everything will be straightened out in your I mind. I can't. The flowers, dear. You were I, crying. I, you cried when I put down the flowers. The flowers. You cried, Jesse. Don't you remember? The flowers. The funeral. Yes. Henry's funeral. Oh, I remember. I... I cried when you put the flowers down. That's right, dear. I, the doctor I, says maybe you oh. felt guilty inside or something because he was dead. But you're going to be all right. Yes, Jesse. Apparently, you just blotted those two hours out of your mind. Doc says sometimes it happens that way, as some of us. Your mind just blots out a thing that's too painful to remember. Yes, but then... My dress and the gloves. Oh, no, I must have somehow. Uh, just, I must have. Uh, just a minute, Jesse, please. I, oh. All right. Come in, please. Oh, Edna. Hello, Jesse. Edna, oh, I'm so glad Jessie, you came. Jesse, Jesse, you promised me you wouldn't leave the house. Edna, I couldn't have done it. I couldn't have. Mrs. Hacker said I was with her at Henry's funeral between 5 and 7 on July 12th. The only thing I can't figure out is my missing glove and my blue dress. Jesse, I, 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 I didn't want to tell you because I was afraid to, but that day on July 12th, I borrowed your blue dress and your gloves. You borrowed them? I had a date. I, I knew you'd be wearing your black dress to the funeral, so I... Oh, Jesse, I kept quiet when it looked as though nobody else was going to be blamed for it. But... Uh... Edna! I don't believe it! It's true, Jesse. I... If it hadn't been for you, I'd never have told anybody. I didn't know that all these days you've been convincing yourself Edna, that you... Edna! Edna! When I went out, when I told you not to leave the house... I went and got the knife. I buried it in the vacant lot. And I brought it to the police. Poor Edna. All that killed. But I want you to know, Jesse, that Tom Howard was no good. And if anybody ever deserved... Can I please go now? Yes. How do you feel now, Jesse? What? How do you feel? Poor Edna. She was your roommate, wasn't she, Jesse? Not just a roommate, Mrs. Hackers. She was my best friend. Come on, dear. I'll take you home. Mrs. Hackers. Yes, dear? How, how did Henry die? Of pneumonia. He died very peacefully. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry for all the trouble I caused. I'm very sorry. Suspense presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Dorothy McGuire, in Last Confession. Notice the day is getting shorter, Harlow? Did you say shorter? Don't use that no. word around here. We're only interested in things that last longer, like Autolite resistor spark plugs. Those famous fast-firing, wide-gap spark plugs that have up to 200% longer electrode life. And Autolite resistor spark plugs let your engine run better on leaner gas mixtures, actually save you gas. Autolite makes complete electrical systems for many makes of America's finest cars. Batteries, spark plugs, generators, starting motors, coils, distributors. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. Get Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite.
Next Thursday for Suspense, John Lund will be our star. The play is called Experiment 6R, and it is, as we say... A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! Tonight's Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Last Confession was a radio play by David Ellis. Dorothy McGuire will soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox picture, O Doctor. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Charles Lawton, June Havoc, Van Johnson, and Betty Davis. Oh, and don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring John Lund. Buy Autolite resistor spark plugs, Autolite stayful batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. Your National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis has only enough money to last two more weeks. Help now. Send dimes and dollars to polio care of your local post office. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Herbert Marshall in tonight's presentation of... Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents the story of a man who, having no fear, attempted his own death. A new dramatization of C.E. Montague's Action. Our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Mr. Wilcox? What? You here already? Yes, sir, Mr. Wilcox. It's Johnny plug check time again. Well, so it is. Cold weather's coming, and that means Johnny's around to remind you motorists to get that car prepared for winter now with a tune-up, change of oil and grease, antifreeze. And don't forget to check those important spark plugs, too. Yes, sir, Johnny, because the spark plugs are the very heart of a car's ignition system. When they're right... You'll start quicker and surer every time, even in coldest weather. So visit your Autolite spark plug dealer. Right, Johnny. He's a tune-up expert and a specialist on spark plug cleaning and adjustment. And if replacements are needed, he'll recommend a new set of ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, like the amazing Double Life resistor spark plug. To quickly learn the location of your nearest Autolite spark plug dealer, phone Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents Action, starring Mr. Herbert Marshall, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. It happened very simply one Monday morning. I woke up and there was a slight numbness all down my right side. The arm, fingers, a good deal along the leg. Rather less in my foot and just a little in the head. I lay still for a moment to let it pass off, but it didn't. And I suddenly knew that it wasn't going to. I'd heard about such things. Other chaps at the club, the office. Now it had happened to me. I remember getting up. I could still stand, walk, dress and shave. But the numbness went on. That morning, instead of walking, I took the tram to the office. It was a pleasant autumn day. And there were a lot of young people aboard, healthy young people. The conductor moved down the passageway, collecting fares. Yes, please. please. Yes, please, sir. Wellington Avenue, please. That's uh, Thrupney, sir. Right, you are. Well, now, we don't take buttons, sir. I'm sorry, I, I thought... That's I... quite all right, sir. 
does rather look like silver. And let's see. Ah, here's a threepenny bit, sir. Thank you. In off his feet. Your best. His tact and sympathy were perfect. And I have a new care now. Sight, too, was that going? Sight, touch, the whole sensory business, losing precision, entering on the long slope to decay. I don't think I got much work done that morning, though in a way what I did was good for me, kept my mind off things. I had a quarter to one appointment with an old friend, Adrian Tillett, whom I hadn't seen for a month or two. We'd arranged to meet at my club. I was a little early and sat in my usual place to wait for him. I say, Bill. Yes? Did you hear about Chitterhouse? They brought his birdie back to England yesterday. Yeah, I know, yes. You've done some mountaineering yourself, haven't you? A bit. <laughs> Blast if I know what you fellows see in it. Bloody awful way to die, if you ask me, falling off a mountain. I suppose there are worse ways. Uh, try to tell that to his wife. Well, I, I'm feeling a bit peckish. Will you join me for lunch? Thanks very much. I'm waiting for someone. All oh, right, sure. Hello, Ben. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. No, you haven't. I've just got here myself. Oh, 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 hold on. Teddy. I say, you look seedy. Feeling all right? Yes, splendid. Come along, we'll have a bite to eat. Good. I'm famished. That's better. Cigar? Uh, thanks. What, what about you? I, I don't think so. Uh, look here, Val. Is anything wrong? I mean, well, you... You look like a dying duck in a thunderstorm. Something I can do? I'm afraid not. Serious? I suppose it is. In a way. If you uh, want to talk about it... I'm, I might as well. I woke up this morning... And I felt numb. On the right side, I must have had some sort of a stroke during the night. Have you been to the doctor? No. I don't think I shall. You know as well as I do what he'd say. Oh, my dear old boy, you can't let a thing like that uh, just go. I don't intend to be an invalid for the rest of my life till it. I've seen this happen to people, so have you. End up in a bath chair, being fed by some harridan nurse who won't even let you wipe her own nose. No thanks. What are you going to do? I don't know yet. The big thing seems to be... How long? How long does a thing like this take? Men like you, you live to be a hundred. You're an active chap. There's no reason on earth why... You... Oh, that's just it. I don't follow. I don't want to live to any age like this. I... Say, uh, why not come up to my place on Friday? Spend the weekend. Change of... Air will do you good. No, I really don't think I... Uh, don't be an idiot. Marjorie's dying to see you. She, she always complains that you've given us up. Now, I'm going to expect you. The, the stream's awfully good this year. We'll do some fishing, right? Right, thanks. Thanks, Tillett. The rest of the week passed, and the sensation of numbness remained with me. Sometimes a bit more or less. At nights, I thought. I thought a great deal. On Friday, I drove down to Weybridge. It was obvious that Tillett had told his wife about me. It didn't matter much, except I found myself annoyed at her solicitude. I suppose she couldn't help it. But it was one of the things that definitely made up my mind. I knew what I was going to do. And I told my old friend. We were on the bank of the stream. He just landed a nice trout. And we sat down for a smoke. I've made up my mind what to do, Tillett. Oh? Yes. I wondered. Had an idea you were up to something. You been uh, rather quiet, you know. I'm sorry. Is it any better? No, no, not the same. I had a dream just before I came down here. I'm... I was climbing. It was on a crag that became steeper and steeper as I went up. First it was vertical, and then it overhung more and more until I was actually climbing a reverse slope. It must have been awkward. Oh, it's been done, you know. Has it? Yes, I've read about it, but I've never done it myself. What happened in your dream? 
I fell. Woke up. Uh. I thought a lot about it. It's that margin of safety, you know. One does a lot of climbing, and if you're any good at all, you don't slip in the really difficult places. But supposing you... you pair away at the margin of safety. An experiment. What could you do before all the margin was gone? If you didn't care. I don't know. I haven't tried climbing. If one cut out the old fear of death, one could do some amazing things. Is that what you're going to do? I think so. Yes. Look for one of those crags? Yes, I've, I've never done that. I know of one I'd like to try. Zenal, the Schallihoch. It's a ridge of the Weisshorn. Sounds impressive. Oh, there are higher mountains, but not many more interesting. If you want to be a human fly, why not try the chalk pit down the road? Straight up and down. Not so far to fall. I <laughs> wouldn't do. No. It wouldn't, would it? I'm not going to say anything, Bell. There's nothing one can say, really. I wish you wouldn't do it. And I understand why you think you must. When will you leave? Next week. The snows will be coming at the end of the month. Not much sense in making it too dangerous, is there? No, not much sense in that. Ten days later, I arrived at Zanal and met an old guide I'd known for many years. His name was Gaspar. And he knew the mountains of the Alps as very few men know them. He and his wife ran the hotel, and after dinner, it was my first night there, we talked over a cognac. Ah, uh, it is good to see you again, my friend. I repeat, what a surprise, and so late in the year. I remember July was my month, wasn't it? Ah, those days. We did some fine climbing, you and I, fine. And where shall we go this time? My time is my own, and now yours. The amateurs have gone. We shall climb for sport, huh? Perhaps so. I, uh, I want to try the west side of the Charlie Hook. Good, good. Hope you won't be upset, Gaspar. First time I go up, I mean to do it alone. Alone? Yes. Did you say the west side? That's right. May I speak of something I've noticed? Of course. When I saw you today, I, I, I noticed something, a, a slight limp. You have been in an accident? Uh, no, just a little stiffness. You have done some climbing since we last were together? Not much. But the west side of the ridge, for a man out of condition, is that wise? I don't see why not. When do you plan to start? Tomorrow. I have never tried it myself. I'll give you a full report. Yes, I hope you will. The last man who tried it never came back. He fell. And we still have not found the body. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Herbert Marshall in Action. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. The frost is coming, so be wise. Now is the time to winterize. Right, Johnny Plugcheck. Time for that winter tune-up. Change of oil, grease, and some antifreeze. And check those important spark plugs, too. Ah, yes. Spark plugs are the very heart of your car's ignition system. And when they're right, you'll start quicker and surer every time, even in coldest weather. If replacements are needed, your Autolite spark plug dealer will recommend a brand new set of ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. Like the Double Life Resistor spark plug. The greatest spark plug advance for automotive use in the past 25 years. It gives smoother engine performance and quick starts for twice as long as spark plugs without a built-in resistor. And the resistor spark plug is only one of a complete line of Autolite spark plugs, ignition engineered for every use. So when you're getting your car winterized, make sure... To check the spark plugs, too. See your nearest Autolite spark plug dealer this week. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. 
And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Herbert Marshall in Elliot Lewis's production of Action, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. That night, before I went to bed, I sat for a little while alone in the smoking room. I had nothing to do, no goodbyes, no last letter to write, no will to be made. That was done and accounted for. I felt my right arm and leg with the fingers of my left hand, still numb. That strange, unfeeling feeling. After that, I read for a bit, then turning out the lamp, went to my room. The next morning was dazzling, the soft green valley meadowland sparkling, and above against the bluest of skies, the mountains. The autumn sun was warm, and as I decided to travel as lightly as possible, I was glad for that. Leaving the hotel, I made my way past the cow barn, the tiny post office, and on toward the path which led gently upward. I must have been walking for about five minutes when he caught up with me. Herbert. Oh, I, I nearly missed you. you. You were gone before I knew you. Oh, good morning, Gaspar. Uh, a beautiful morning for your climb. I, I thought if you did not mind that I would walk with you to the bridge. Well, I don't mind in the least. My wife was worried. I'm sorry to hear that. About you. My wife is a woman who has premonitions. <laughs> you know women. Yes, she needn't have worried, you know. As I told her, you are one of the best. Still, she could not understand why you would suddenly appear and decide to climb the most difficult place on the mountain. Surely she knows mountaineers. Yes, she knows them. And she knows they do not attempt such things without a little practice of flexing of unused muscles. I'm in splendid form, Gaspar. Up there. That is where you go, huh? The bulge. Yes. And when you have conquered that, you will come back? What an odd question. Exactly what I told my wife. She had a premonition that all was not well with you. You'll have to reassure her, won't you, Gaspar? Yes, I shall, my friend. I'll say goodbye here. Yes, I... I wish... You will be all right, Herr Bell. Remember to conserve your energy, and when you reach the top... Come back to us. You will come back. Yes. Good luck. I left the old guide with the wooden bridge and walked on. The place I'd picked to climb was on the west side of the Charlehawk. It's a dip in the ridge that joins the Weisshorn to the Charlehorn. The lowest point of the dip is over 12,000 feet. The last part of the rise to the ridge is a wall of ice that undulates like a sheet of hammered copper, concave at one point, convex at another, and at two or three parts it overhangs. How much I did not know, but you could see it. And it was the underside of that overhang I was going to climb. I would try to do it honestly, get to the ridge and prove that in this small matter, where there is no fear of death, a man can do more than he knows. My timetable began quite on schedule. Three hours work up to the Apeteta Alp from Zenal. Three more up from the Alp to the foot of the ice wall. Half an hour for food, another half an hour for final preparations. Then I was at that point, the wall of ice. And above the great Overhanging bulge. It stood out above me like, like a gigantic blister on the face of the ice. Must have been 40 feet in diameter. And it jutted so much that a stone dropped from its outermost point would only have touched the slope again some hundred feet lower. 
to reach that outermost point, I knew I would have to climb for about 20 feet as you climb up the underside of a ladder that leans against the wall. And I would have to make the ladder, rung by rung, fashion each one out of ice with my axe held in one hand while with the other hand on both feet I'd cling to the three rungs already made. Each rung would have to be like a, a letterbox in a door. Big enough for the toe of my boot to go into, but shaped so that when my hand entered, the fingers could bend down inside and grip as you grip the top of a fence. Then I was there, and the overhang was before me. The work was amazingly hard. I'd only carved five letter boxes and used them, and an hour had gone. Five more, and daylight was failing. My left hand was chilled, almost dead with the ice it had gripped, and my right hand swollen and sore from the constant use of the axe. My right knee began to shake uncontrollably, and I almost laughed, chattering teeth. I looked up, and some eight feet above was the goal. Beyond it, I could see nothing but a tranquil sky with a rose-colored flush dying out of it. And suddenly, very clearly, as a complete matter of fact, I knew I couldn't get up those eight feet. My strength was going. I was about finished. And then, because the will is there until the end, I, I tried again, tried, but the axe barely scratched the ice. My left hand was frostbitten past feeling. Only five more feet to go, but five more than I could drive myself to. This was the finish then. What I'd set out to do, and now it was the end. I'm done. I didn't know why. I was still holding on. Holding. And it was queer. Something was very queer. I felt little chips of ice stinging my cheeks as they slid down from above. Was an ice avalanche coming? <laughs> what did it matter? Let the ice do what it wanted. My business with it was done. Then, then there was a sound, annoying, a hissing sound. I saw the ice axe slide over the bulge overhead and move out over my head to drop far below. Someone was above me. And suddenly, I don't know why, there was, there was a lightness in me. No more dream, no more dying. I had to go up. Up and quickly. No longer the tear in cutting the steps. Now they were marvels of inadequacy. I didn't think about it. Just ice cuts deep enough for a footing to raise up to cut the next. And the next. And it must have been three minutes. Perhaps less. When my chest came up to the dead center of the bulge and I... I saw what I had come for. It was a woman. Dangling at a long rope's end. Her body revolving a little as it hung against the steep ice and holding the rope, perhaps 80 feet above her, the man. His ice axe driven well into the slope behind, holding well with one hand, the other gripping the rope. Cut the rope, Teddy, cut it. I'm done. It's killing me, cut it. You must. You, you can get down. The children think of... You must. It's killing me. Well, hold, sir. Hold on. Sorry, I'm coming. Hold on. I felt like a fool. Absolute freedom from uneasiness concerning my own plight. For I still wasn't up myself. But I never liked heroics. And this sounded horribly, disgustingly heroic. And I kept it up. And I had to. There in two minutes. Hold on. One minute more. Just one. Almost. Hold on. Hold on. Half a jiffy. I'm just there. And I'd arrived over the bulge, a foothold on an upward slope. I cut a big step close to where her feet hung, planted my own firmly in it, and took her weight on my shoulder. 
slowly the man about paid out the rope till she was by my side, standing safe. You're... you're quite a happy sight. Have you got her? All right? Yes. Right as rain. Give us a moment or two, then dig in and we'll come up. Yes. Yes, all right. <laughs> The last daylight was gone when the three of us stood on the level roof of the ridge. I tried my best not to look at him or at her. These are things best not observed. I think she stayed in his arms for a long moment. I... But we... Well, you understand. Thanks. Thanks for our lives. Oh, Lord, I just happened to be there. Luck, that's all. Yes. Luck. I suppose we'd better push off. Getting a little chilly. It was luck. There was a full moon, and the downward trail was something else from the way I'd come up. We none of us spoke. I don't think a single word all the way back. And then, the village, the hotel, and she was put to bed, alive, tired. It was only after that in the smoking room that I learned their names. His name was Gollan, Theodore Gollan. The woman upstairs, his wife, Hilary. And because he seemed to feel himself under some sort of obligation to me, I told him about myself. My crime? Why? And when I finished, he said... Look here, I'm a doctor, and I know about such things. Tell me, when you were making that last climb over the bows, did that numbness cramp you? Or did you notice it? No. It had been there, but not the last ten minutes. When you were in action. Action? Yes, I mean doing something, something you're absorbed in, lost in. Yes. I see. Now, that's the way it should be, you know. What you've got, the uh, numbness, that will stay with you, but uh, does it matter quite as much as you thought? No. I don't think so. You won't try that sort of thing again? No. Then it's going to be all right. Yes. It's going to be all right. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. This is Harlow Wilcox again, speaking for Autolite. It's always good to welcome back our longtime friend, Herbert Marshall. Bart, we enjoyed every minute of tonight's story. Thanks, Harlow. And may I compliment Autolite for the excellent programs to come. Next week, Van Heften in The Shot. And the following week, Jeff Chandler in an exciting story... My true love's hair. We can certainly depend on Autolite for wonderful entertainment. And friends, the greatest names in industry depend on Autolite for over 400 products for cars, trucks, tractors, planes, and boats. In 28 plants from coast to coast, Autolite makes such products as the famous Autolite Stay Full batteries, ignition engineered Autolite spark plugs, both standard and resistor types, Autolite starting motors, generators, coils, distributors, voltage regulators, wire and battery cable, and Autolite original service parts for all Autolite electrical systems. So, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. Next week... The story of a duel, an incomplete duel, since one of its participants chose to wait and owe his adversary the shot. Our star, Mr. Van Heflin. That's next week on... 
Suspense. C.E. Montague's action was adapted for suspense by Anthony Ellis. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Featured in the cast were Ellen Morgan, Harley Bear, Herb Butterfield, Richard Peel, and Ben Wright. Herbert Marshall will soon be seen in Riders to the Stars, Ivan Tor's Technicolor production for United Artists. And remember, next week, Mr. Van Heflin in The Shot. You can buy Autolite resistor or standard type spark plugs, Autolite electrical parts, and Autolite stay full batteries at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This week and every week is a good time to hire the handicapped. Surveys have proved that properly placed handicapped workers are steady and reliable. Consult your state employment service and hire the handicapped. This is the CBS Radio Network. Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Victor Mature in tonight's presentation of... Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents a true story. The tragic and mysterious history of the most famous early California bandit, as told in The Love and Death of Joaquin Murrieta. Our star, Mr. Victor Mature. Hi, Senator. How's life in the legislature? Well, it's all right there, but not in my automobile. How's that, Senator? My car bucks like a cantankerous constituent, Harlow. <laughs> Sounds like spark plug trouble, Senator. You know, if spark plugs aren't functioning properly, you just can't get the smooth and economical performance you expect from your car. Well, how do I veto the trouble? Just visit your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer. He's an expert on cleaning and adjustment, and he services all makes of cars. But suppose my spark plugs are worn out and need replacing, Harlow. Why, then your Autolite spark plug dealer will replace them with a set of super smooth, world-famous, ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, either standard or resistor type. So, friends, pick up your phone and call Western Union by number. Ask for operator 25, and she'll gladly tell you the location of your nearest Autolite spark plug dealer... The man with ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents transcribed The Love and Death of Joaquin Murrieta, a true story starring Mr. Victor Mature, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. Whomever it may concern, I leave this letter to explain how, with justification, the son of a grandee in Mexico, the son of wealth and prestige and courtesy, can be turned into an outlaw and a killer. The beginning was near Calveras in a peaceful summer evening, given over to the singing of birds and the peaceful occupation of such as I, a peace which was interrupted. She's gonna die. Now let's get away from here. Joaquin! Help me! Help me, Joaquin! Joaquin, where are you? Joaquin! I need you! Come to me, Joaquin! Carmen? Carmen? What have they done to you? Help me. Oh, God. Take me. Home that 
I would die in our home. Yes. Of me up. No. I cannot. Carmen, the, the moving is not good. Help me. Help me. Carmen. Carmen. fighting have you done? They've killed Carmen. What is this? She fought them, and they killed her. But why, man? For nothing. We were where we were. That is why. At our claim. I was working, and they came. I recognize one. That O'Brien from down the stream. He said to me... We want this claim. You have no right to it. And I said to him, clearly, I, I, I have right. All in California have rights. It's written down that way. But they left their horses, and O'Brien beat me for my words. Two of them holding me, and O'Brien with his fist and then his gun. In great braveness. When I went down, it took me much time to get up. So much I don't know. But I heard Carmen calling me. That I came to her. And they had heard her. And she died. What did you do with her, Joaquin? First I cried with her until now my tears are gone. Then I swore to her that never would I rest until I avenged her. Avenge her? The life that will lead to? That is what you want, truly? Yes. More than anything. There is nothing else left. I know your feeling. I am with you, Joaquin. How did she die? By this knife. That of O'Brien. Yes. I remember him. Here it is. And I plan to return it. Not as part of the justification, I remarked that my wife, Carmen, and I left Sonora, Mexico to go to the California gold fields with dreams of happiness and wealth. And when we arrived in that country, we found it invaded by many without faith or decency of law to govern them. They wore their evilness as they wore their beards, without shame, professing only hatred for our people, seeing in us only a conquered race without any right or privilege. Thus came about the death of my wife and bad fortune, not my own instead. I believe that I died partly the night she died fully. Part of my mind went with her. And that which I kept would allow nothing but hate and desire for revenge, revenge to come to it. Later that same night on the road to the place where I was sleeping, I saw a figure riding towards me. This was the first time I was sure that that part of my mind had gone with Carmen. The moon was high and white. And when I saw this man was one of them, I knew it was O'Brien. Amigo. Amigo, I'm lost. Which is the way to Calveras? Oh, you're way off, way off. <laughs> what, what is this way off? Hey, you're going in the wrong direction. Calveras is that way. Which way? The shadows, amigo. It's uh, hard to see which way you point. Well, I don't see why it should be. Right back there. 
What's the matter, amigo O'Brien? My name's not O'Brien. Let go my bridle. What, what do you want? You, you don't need a knife to find the way. No, amigo. No. No. Leave me go. You stay, amigo O'Brien. Leave me go. I've done nothing to you. What you've done to me. What have you done? You've killed half of me. Now you will do something else for me. And then I looked at him. And with the moon right, I saw it was not O'Brien. And then I knew I was a killer. And that a price would be put on my head. Those things were true. And I quickly drew around me those who had been hurt also, though none so deeply. We have come, Joaquin. You were cautious. We never rode together until we were near this place. That's good. Who came with you? Manuel Garcia? Yes, Juan. Greetings, Joaquin. What I hear of you must have been very hard, of very much emotion. That part's finished. You choose to ride with us, Manuel? I am here, Joaquin. For what other reason? To smell the night air? What they did to your brother, is it enough? Enough. He bought a horse from them and committed the crime of riding him home. On the way, others stopped him, accused him of stealing the horse. They tied him to a tree and horsewhipped him. Then, without the privilege of being conscious, they hanged him from the same tree. Would you judge that to be enough? Welcome, man. I will kill well, Joaquin. Who else, Manuel? Luis Guerra. Yes, Manuel. Here is one you do not know, Joaquin, but he is conditioned. Luis Guerra. Good evening. You're young, Luis. Young enough to come to California with my mother and father. The land of gold. What you found instead? They are dead. Our claim is worked by others. Is it enough, boy? To ride with us? You are young, and none of us know how long we will ride or how long we will live. I saw them die. It was enough. Pedro Gonzalez and Fernando Fuentes. And there were more, lots more, all carrying hate in their hearts. We left that place all pledged to do the same thing. Revenge for the wrongs done to us. is bringing you Mr. Victor Mature in The Love and Death of Joaquin Murrieta. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Harlow, you mentioned both Autolite standard and resistor type spark plugs. Right, Senator, and both are ignition engineered by the same Autolite engineers who design complete ignition systems used as original equipment on many of our finest makes of cars, trucks, and tractors. Well, what's the Autolite resistor spark plug, Harlow? Why, Senator, it's the greatest advance in spark plugs for automotive use in the past 25 years. It is? It surely is. The built-in Autolite resistor makes possible such amazing advantages as double spark plug life, smoother engine performance, and quick starts. And the resistor spark plug is only one of a complete line of Autolite spark plugs for every use. And my nearest Autolite spark plug dealer has them, eh, Harlow? You can bet your Homburg on it, Senator. Friends, see your Autolite spark plug dealer for a spark plug checkup soon. 
To learn his location, just phone Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Victor Mature in Elliot Lewis's production of The Love and Death of Joaquin Murrieta. A true story, well calculated to keep you in suspense. There was much killing near Calveras, and soon much looting. I searched for O'Brien, whose knife I carried, but found him not. Then there was more killing in many places, San Jose, Marysville, and many others. In the beginning, I had an excitement so great that I cannot tell it. But during that time, I listened, and I didn't hear the bird. The excitement started to pass away, and I found that I followed my men instead of leaving them. It was after an attack near Oras Timbers that Manuel Garcia and boy Luis came to me when we were at camp near the ranch of San Sebatero. They knew I no longer received satisfaction. What is it, Joaquin? You do not drink with us, you do not laugh. In seriousness, Luis and I have been speaking of this. You're not like before. In the raids, you only watch. You do not fight. There's nothing. I, I have good men. And a leader who listens for the call of a bird. There has been talk of this. Let them think what they wish. What is it, Joaquin? We are your friends. Uh, Tell us. Look, I have no stomach for it anymore. For what, man? For all the killing. This? This I hear from you? You who brought us together? Who was something very barbarous in the beginning? Was something very brave yes, in the beginning? Yes, yes, Juan. From that one you hear all this. I'm going back to Calveras. Oh, yes. To listen for the bird... Or to fight the posse that was so cowardly as to drive us away. My mind is set. Back to Calveras? Why? Is it truly the bird? Joaquin? In this, to me, there is something more personal and, and terrible. More than to any of you. In the beginning, it was part of me. Yes, yes, call it the bird. But now, this general killing, one camp, then another. To me, it only builds a reputation for our people that's not good. There is much gold that builds, too. It has a reputation. I didn't start for gold. I started to kill a man, and I haven't found him. You have found many. None who is personal. And that I don't like. The O'Brien, whose knife you carry. Yes, O'Brien. That I could go back and find him, then I would join you again. You go alone? That is not my choice. One to go with me. If your mind is set, I will go. There's a smaller price on Luis's head. He's not known so well. I'll go, Joaquin, if that is what you want. Thanks, Luis. I waited many weeks so that I would not have to ask you. If I had known, Joaquin... Thanks. I wish the morning would come so that we could leave... Luis. Listen, Luis. Juan. What, Joaquin? What is there to hear? Nothing, my friends, nothing. You do not comprehend. I knew my thinking was right from the omen of the next morning. A golden sunrise and a soft south wind. Luis and I did our journey in leisure and without hiding. And in four days we reached Calveras, which had increased to a city of tents and rough buildings during the time we'd been gone. This place has missed us. We had it burned to the ground. Perhaps we'll come back someday. I hope so. For now, look around for uh, anyone who seems to recognize us. I am looking, my friend. But for anyone who would not know Joaquin Murrieta, the 
town was filled with strangers. We clearly found this to be the truth. All had heard of Joaquin Murrieta, but none alive had seen him. Luis and I found sleeping room on the border of the town. And for three days, I searched for O'Brien. On the fourth night, I heard news of him. Luis, wait. Yes? Luis, we will have a drink in this place. Come. Before I got here, and I'm glad of that, you get crazy people like Murrieta out killing nobody safe. Well, he was chased out of here, and he'll be chased till he's dead. <laughs> will I, Luis? Who knows? I heard he had a pretty good reason for going on the war path. That his wife was killed. Joaquin? That ain't true. He was trespassing where he didn't belong, working a claim that didn't belong to him. Joaquin, help me. Help me. Luis. No. Help Luis. Joaquin, no. I didn't hear that part help of it. Me. Well, I did, and from a man that ought to Joaquin, know. Matt O'Brien. He knew him, was there when it started. Help Says me. Says Marietta was born killer. Help me. O'Brien, he's in a new posse now that's going to start out hunting for him. Well, I'm glad it's O'Brien and not me going out to hunt Marietta. Joaquin, no. Let go, Luis. What I hear, he's got a bunch of cutthroats big enough to beat it. Oh, Buenas noches, yes. senors. Pardon the intrusion. I heard you speak of two things close to me. Well? This Matt O'Brien, who is a friend of mine, and the other is uh, Joaquin Murrieta. What about Murrieta? Well, I've just come from the south, and I heard where this Murrieta is. I would like to tell Senor O'Brien. Well, uh, there's a price on Murrieta's head. Why should you want to help somebody else get it? Senor, I am of the same people, and I don't sell my people. Murrieta, he was sent crazy by what happened. The rest of us are not crazy. Where'd you hear he was? To the ranch San Sepateras. You know where? <laughs> See, but I tell only Senor O'Brien. Senor, there's no reason for that gun. How do I know who you are? You all look the same. Come on, Sam, keep him covered with me. Take his gun. Yeah. All right. You want to go to Matt O'Brien, do you? Si, senor. Then Sam and me will take you. Go on. You say it was south. Why? We're selling horses. Where? Los Angeles. How'd you hear about Marietta? From a friend of mine. Hey, you don't talk straight. We'll see what Matt O'Brien has to say about this. Help me. Help me. Help me. It was a rare situation with many possibilities. I'd seen Louis slipping away when I went to the table of these men. And I knew clearly that he would come to my aid if he could. But my worry was that he would come too soon before these men could take me to O'Brien. Then my worry was that he would not come at all. Lamp's on. He must be home. Joaquin! Hey! What? Thank you, Luis. For nothing. O'Brien will come out with this noise. You want my gun? No, friend. I have his knife, and that's as it should be. Oh, what's the matter? There. Stay here, Luis. Joaquin. What happened? Help me. Help me. Uh, there's been some trouble, senor. Help me. What was the shooting for? Some Joaquin. men, they took my Help. gold, senor. I, I'm shot. Get Help. out of those shadows where I can see you. See, si, senor, me. but don't shoot. Keep Help coming. See, si, senor. <gasps> Murrieta! Remember well, O'Brien. No. Remember well. Joaquin!
that moment to this, Luis and I have been only a jump in front of the posse. But last night, we heard them ride by as we lay hidden. And all this day, we have heard or seen nothing. We've rested, feeling safe. And I've used the time for the writing of this history, which now is ended. I know the debt can never be paid. There is no way ever to avenge Carmen's death fully. But I've done my best. But now I've had enough. I hope to follow this letter soon to Sonora and take up the peaceful life of a gentleman again. My loss will never be. What is it? I think I heard something. I don't know. Where? From below. How close? I don't know. There. Look, a horseman. Won't we ever stop running? Come on. Luis, above us. Look. This is no good, man. That way, Luis. Then towards the grove. Hey. Wait. They're there, too. What did this day of rest do to us? that was the end of the history that was written there in a canyon which is now a residential section of Los Angeles but supporting details are scarce and rumors are many and varied there were those who said that Murrieta did die that day there were others who said that only one body was found and that there was some doubt as to who it was and there are others who said that during the following days, a rider was seen in bloody clothing traveling by night. It could have been Murrieta, they said, moving toward Mexico, perhaps following the sound of a bird, but no longer a voice. Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Victor Mature. This is Harlow Wilcox again, speaking for Autolite, world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. That's why during these early months of 53, the Autolite family joins together in saluting the leading car manufacturers who install Autolite products as original equipment. Our Autolite family is made up of the nearly 30,000 men and women in 28 great Autolite plants from coast to coast and in still other Autolite plants in many foreign countries. Our family also includes more than 18,000 people who have invested a portion of their savings in Autolite, as well as 98,000 Autolite distributors and dealers in the United States and thousands more in Canada and throughout the world. Our Autolite family will salute the Plymouth Division of Chrysler Corporation on the next Autolite Suspense television program. If you live in a television area, check the day and time of suspense on television so that you'll be sure to see this program. Next week, the Roaring Twenties and the violent people who occupied them. As with song and story, we tell about... St. James Infirmary. Our star, Miss Rosemary Clooney. That's next week on... Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Portions of the program were transcribed. 
The Love and Death of Joaquin Murrieta was adapted for suspense by Gil Dowd. The guitarist was Jose Barroso. In tonight's story, Harry Bartell was heard as Luis, William Conrad as the narrator, Virginia Gregg as Carmen, Joseph Kearns as O'Brien, Harley Bear as Juan, High Aberback as Joe, and Jack Crucian as Manuel. Victor Mature appeared by arrangement with 20th Century Fox, producers of Taxi, starring Dan Daly. And remember next week, Miss Rosemary Clooney in St. James Infirmary. Tonight, Autolite is pleased to congratulate the Boy Scouts of America and their leaders on their 43rd year of guiding boys to a future of fine citizenship. This is the CBS Radio Network. In just a moment, Autolite presents Suspense with John Garfield. Hello, Mr. Wilcox. Well, hello, Mary. Where's Hap tonight? Anaheim, Azusa, or Cucamonga? Oh, no, Mr. Wilcox. <laughs> He's giving a speech at his club tonight. And he was scared to death, too. Didn't know what to talk about. Well, why doesn't he talk about those bang-up, bonus-built Autolite stay-full batteries? Why, by Cornelius, he could talk a whole evening about them. For Autolite stay-full batteries have got something that practically eliminates a major cause of battery failure. You know what it is? Why, sure, they have... No, 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 no. Now, please, don't steal my thunder, Mary. Oh. Autolite stay-full batteries have an extra-large liquid reserve, which means, in plain old Wilcox language, that Autolite stay-full batteries need water only three times a year in normal car use. Why, by Cornelius, everybody ought to get an Autolite stay-full battery. They'd be enthralled, enthused, and thrilled. And thrilled? Oh, no, Mr. Wilcox, but shh, here comes suspense. Suspense. Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Starring tonight, Mr. John Garfield in Anton Leder's production of Death Sentence, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. It's hard to tell where it first started. It was six months ago that I nabbed a killer, Maxie Dunn, and cashed in 15000 in reward money. Sure, I knew that Maxie worked for Lou Cromwell, but the killing was a private affair, so I didn't think Lou would be upset. Right after I got the killer, I took a small job that meant going to Brazil. But the trouble started before then. By the time Maxie Dunn was arrested, the chips were down and the wheel was already spinning. Anyway, that's how Lou Cromwell would put it... And Lou would know because he knows his gambling. He runs the gambling in this town, along with a lot of other things. I hadn't been back in town ten minutes when I ran into Brad Cummings, a local columnist in front of the region hotel. Well, 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 you're back in town. How are you, Tommy? Hello, Brad. How's the column? Oh, great, great. Don't even have to write it anymore. I'm reusing last year's stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Say, Tommy, I'm just going to a cocktail party in the hotel. Come along. Well, Whose party? Lou Cromwell's. Say, hey, he'll be surprised to see me. Oh, you will love it, Tommy. Come on. Okay, let's go to your party. Oh, you're so exotic. Hiya, Tommy. Hiya, Tommy. Hiya, Tommy. Hiya, Tommy. Hiya, Tommy. Hiya, Tommy. What do you say, fellow? What do you know? Well, it doesn't look like Lou's showing up yet. Well, what's he celebrating? Well, he hasn't said yet. Say, uh, why'd you come back, Tommy? Why shouldn't I? It's a nice town. Sure, except when Lou Cromwell doesn't want it to be. Meaning? Oh, nothing much. I'm only a columnist, Tommy. And like I said, I'm using last year's news, so I'm still interested in Maxie Dunn. Oh, it's a dull story, Brad. The cops couldn't find Maxie, so the widow of the guy he killed hired me. I dug up a tip on Maxie's hideout and brought him in. There happened to be a 15 grand reward, so I had myself a custom-built vacation. I guess I was just born lucky. <laughs> Lou may think you ought to die the same way. Well, I can take care of myself. Besides, why should Lou worry about it one way or the other? Well, you have done some work for him. Well, sure, sure. I'm a private investigator. I work for anybody who'll pay me as long as the job's on the level. And those I did for Lou were, too. You don't have to argue with me, Tommy. 
But I told you a year ago not to get mixed up with Lou. A man has to pick one side of the fence and stay there. He can't play on both sides. I don't know, Brad. I've done pretty well at it. <laughs> Until now. But Maxie was Lou's right hand, so I don't think he liked it. So he didn't like it. In the meantime, I'll... Tommy! Oh, yeah. Oh, hello there, Muggsy. Tommy. Lou wants to see you. Lou? Well, how did he not... Okay, never mind. Where is he? Not here. He wants to see you across the street in his office. Oh. Well, let's go. Back in a few minutes, Brad. Have a drink for me. Sure, Tommy, sure. I'll uh, drink to your health. How are you, Lou? Hello, Tommy. Nice to have you back with us. Nice to be back, Lou. Seems to me you heard pretty fast about me being in town. You know how it is, Tommy. People drop in here and gossip, and I hear things. Sit down. Thanks. Cigarette? Sure. Have a nice vacation? Good enough. <laughs> I guess you're just naturally lucky, Tommy. A long vacation and 15 grand to spend. <laughs> now me? I didn't get a vacation. I had to work pretty hard, and it cost plenty trying to save Maxie Dunn. And now it's very inconvenient finding someone to take his place. Well, if you're offering me the job, I'm not interested. <laughs> I'm glad to see you haven't changed. But seriously, Tommy, you... Uh, Shouldn't have turned Maxie in. Oh, I'm sorry I inconvenienced you. No, it's not only that. You know how it is in this racket. Either you keep rolling sevens and stay on top, or you're on the bottom. It uh, don't look so good for me to let one of my boys take a rap. Oh, he had it coming. Possibly. Maxie was dumb to pull that personal job. But if I let you come in and grab off my boys, somebody will start thinking that Lou Cromwell is slipping. Oh, I never thought of that, Lou. Uh, what's the pitch? Well, let's see. Maxie goes to the gas chamber in seven days. That's just how long you have to live, what? Tommy. What? Lou, you're punchy. Maybe. But you and Maxie are going out together. Now, look... You've got seven days, Tommy. No more. You can take care of the job yourself then, or we'll handle it for you when the time's up. Play it your own way. I could get the DA in my corner. I don't think so, Tommy. You and I have just had a friendly talk. Nobody's made any threats. Besides, you won't win playing that way. Maybe. And maybe there are other ways to play. Not this time. You know, I like you, Tommy. Ordinarily, I'd even like to see you win. But once in a while, the house has to rake in a few chips to stay in business. Yeah, but you better tell the house man to keep his foot off the brake. I'm playing to win, Lou. <laughs> I knew you would. That makes it more interesting. I get tired of playing with plain suckers. Well, I got a party across the street. Care to come along? I've already been there. It's not much of a party. It'll get better. I'll see you around, Tommy. Don't start brooding about the seven days. Make the most of them. Oh, you need any money? No, thanks. I'll make out all right. Good. Go out and have some fun. <laughs> it's a great life, Tommy. As long as it lasts. <laughs> For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Mr. John Garfield in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Mary, let me tell you about a most wonderful experience I had this afternoon. Why, sure, Mr. Wilcox. Well, I drove my car into a nearby service station, and the attendant, new man, you see, uh -huh. he said, uh, check your battery, mister. Well, by Cornelius, this is the chance I've been waiting for ever since my grandfather traded his horse for a Stanley oh, steamer. Dear. Young man, I says, that gorgeous hunk of battery you're looking at is an Autolite Stay Full. Why, that Autolite Stay Full battery hasn't needed a drop of water for months. And I'll bet you a $40 fedora it doesn't need water now any more than a goldfish needs a raincoat. Did he take your bet, Mrs. Mr. Wilcox? I should say not. Bub, he says to me, you can't trick me. I'm an Autolite dealer. Well, I'd rather bet a barrel of bucks on a three-legged horse than bet an Autolite stay-full battery needs water. 
What's more, says he, that Autolite battery is built to last longer than batteries without stay-full features. It's got oversized electrical capacity, plus fiberglass insulation, and it's one of over 400 automotive, aviation, and marine parts made by the Autolite people in their 26 nationwide plants. Chew on that a while, mister. He says to me, imagine the nerve of this guy, Mary, stealing my sales talk. Me, Harlow A for Autolite Wilcox. Well, you just go feel sorry for yourself, Mr. Wilcox, while I listen to suspense. And now, Autolite brings back to a Hollywood soundstage, Mr. John Garfield as Tommy Cochran in Death Sentence, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Seven more days to live. I wouldn't admit it to Lou, maybe not even to myself, but it was almost that simple. Sure, I could go to the police, but I didn't have any proof that Lou was out to kill me. And I knew that sooner or later, no matter where I went, one of Lou's boys would catch up with me. As I rode down in the elevator, I kept remembering one of Lou's gang who turned state's evidence once and got off with three years. Ten days after the guy checked into the big house, he was knifed to death in the prison yard. And they never found out who did it. That's the way Lou operated. Patient, deadly. Well, there wasn't any point of making plans with a guy like that. I'd pretend to follow his advice about having a good time. All I could do was keep on my toes and watch for an opening. Main floor, sir. This is as far as we go. Hmm? Oh, thanks. It, it's about as far as I go, too. I didn't know just where I was going for the first stop. But uh, sometimes it's better if you just play it off the cuff. I guess I was still thinking of the next spin of the wheel as I walked out of the building. I didn't even notice the taxi standing at the curb or the... Hey, oh. why don't you look where you're going? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I hope I didn't hurt your traveling case. No, but I thought you were going to stumble right off the curb. I guess I was thinking... Say... What? You're beautiful. <laughs> well... I hope you'll live forever. Thanks, I'll try to. Yeah, um... If you find out how, uh, uh, let me know, will you? Uh, where are you going? Huh? Well, now, really? No, I mean uh, the traveling case there. Oh, to Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara, huh? Well, that's not a bad idea. Uh, tell me something. If you had just one week, where would you go? Well, I do have about a week, and I'm still going to Santa Barbara. All right, honey. Uh, thanks for the idea. Maybe I'll run into you again. <laughs> you must... Hey, that guy bothering uh, you. Uh, well... Oh, hello, Muggsy. Look, will you be a darling and help me bring these bags up to Lou's office? I threw a few things into a bag and headed for Santa Barbara. Seemed like a good place to wait for that opening. Lou would never think of me going to a pleasure resort so near. Anyway, three hours after I left Lou's office, I was on a plane bound for Frisco. That's right, San Francisco. When I got there, I rode around for an hour and a half in three different taxis, then caught another plane out for Salt Lake. From there, I swung back to Santa Barbara, checked in at the Swank Ocean Club Hotel. I was pretty sure I'd shaken anybody who may have been watching me. I could count on maybe two days before Lou's boys caught up with me, and by that time, I might have a plan. I uh, wandered around on the beach a while, keeping my eyes open for the other reason I had picked Santa Barbara, and then when I went inside, I saw her, sitting there at the bar. It was the same girl, and she was alone. Well, I beg your... Hello, pa- there. Oh, it's you. So you did come to Santa Barbara. Well, you told me, remember? I only suggested that... Yeah, I know, I'm kidding. Mind if I join you? <laughs> Please do. I'm Tommy Cochran. Tommy Co- Well, hello, Tommy. My name's Helen Ludlow. Helen, huh? Uh, maybe it's silly, yeah, but I, I was feeling like a kid in the wrong schoolhouse, until I saw you sitting there. I know that sounds like the usual... No, lo- I know what you mean. In fact, I felt the same way. Good. So now we're both happy. <laughs> I guess we are. Are you here on vacation? Mm, not exactly. I retired yesterday. What about you? I guess I retired too, in a way. I've seen you somewhere, Helen, but I just can't remember... Probably in a show. I'm a dancer. Sure, that's it. And top of the roof, last fall... Uh-uh, of the- bad guess. That was my kid sister. She had a second lead in it. I'm strictly chorus. Strictly chorus? Mm. 
Well, you need a new manager. How about having dinner with me tonight and we'll talk about your career? Well, I don't know if... I... All right. Good, it's a date. Look, Tommy, we met each other entirely by accident. But suddenly we're friends. I mean, really friends. At least, I feel that way. Yeah, I know what you mean. Go on, Helen. But we don't know anything about each other. And that's the way it's got to be. I won't ask any questions, Tommy, and I can't answer any. If we keep it like that, then... Maybe everything will be all right. Okay, it's a deal. I don't even know why I feel this way. Tell me if you find out. After all, I'm not a kid 16 years old. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah, well, I've known a couple of girls myself. What are you doing this afternoon, Tommy? Would you like to go horseback riding? Uh, horse? Why, sure, why not? I've never been on a horse, though, but you can always pick me up. <laughs> then it's a date. Sure, how would you like a drink first? That's a wonderful idea. A drink to the present. No past, no future. So Helen and I rode horseback in the afternoon, had dinner together, and then danced until early morning. It was great, except that it's hard to be with a girl like that and not talk about the future. I wanted her in my future, only I didn't have any. Maybe she sensed it. I hadn't seen any of Lou's boys. I kept looking around trying to spot them, thinking maybe the guy next to me might even be the one. I kept trying to forget them, and it wasn't too hard with Helen around. She was someone I'd been looking for all my life. And now maybe I'd found her too late. Every minute had to count. And I was still waiting for an opening. I got up early the next morning. Helen and I were going riding before breakfast. And for once I wasn't thinking about Lou and his boys until I walked across the lobby of the hotel. Hello, Tommy. Huh? How are you? Wow. Hello, Lou. Keeping awfully late hours, Tommy. Or else you're up early. Maybe a little of both. What are you doing here, Lou? Checking in. I just got off the plane. But don't let it bother you, Tommy. <laughs> you still have four days left. By the way, what room are you in? 425. Now, that's coincidence. They gave me 427. You can knock on the wall whenever you get lonesome. I won't get that lonesome, Lou. Well, you never know. Anyway, let's not talk shop. Why not enjoy ourselves? <laughs> While we can. All right, why not? They tell me it's fatal to worry. I didn't see him again that day. Helen and I took that ride, went swimming in the afternoon, and then drove down the beach for dinner. The next day was about the same, except we ended up at the hotel for dinner, and dancing, of course. <laughs> Funny, I'd never cared much about dancing before. You know, you're very good at it, Tommy. Even terrific. Dancing? Uh-huh. Oh, I used to be a gigolo. Tommy, did you really? Yeah. No, I'm kidding, <laughs> Helen. I've been a lot of things, though. Yes, so have I. Anything besides wonderful? Mm, everything but that. Things have been <laughs> rough sometimes. It's that kind of a world. It may not look it in a place like this. Soft lights and white tablecloths. Nice, clean people eating nice, clean food. But down underneath, it's still rough. You can forget it, though. While the music keeps on playing. Yeah. How long are you... How long are you planning to stay in Santa Barbara, Helen? Uh, about a week. You? A week? Why'd you come? I... I can't tell you. And please don't ask me any questions, remember? Let's... Let's enjoy it while we can. Yeah. Well, let's eat. Oh, I wish it would last forever. I mean this week. Maybe this is forever, honey. Here we are. No, oh, thanks, Tommy. What's this? You didn't order champagne, did you? No, I, I... They must have made it. Oh. I sent it over, Tommy. I thought you might like it. Nice of you, Lou. Thanks. Well, do I get to meet the lady, or are you starting to hold out on your old friends? Helen, uh, this is uh, Lou Cromwell, Miss Ludlow. I... How do you do? You two make a lovely couple... You both seem to be having a lot of fun out there on the dance floor. That's right, we were. I'm glad to hear it. Have all the fun you can while you're here. <laughs> Life's too short to waste any of it. Don't you think so, Tommy? Well, three more days went by. I was still on my toes, but nothing had opened. I was like a fighter whose opponent wouldn't come out of his corner. I spent every minute with Helen. We weren't kidding ourselves any longer. 
We knew this was the biggest thing that ever happened to us. We'd both been kicked around a lot and made mistakes and played the game on a bluff, trying to get things we thought we wanted. And now we knew we had what we wanted. Only I knew how long it would keep. And there were times when I thought Helen guessed it. Maybe it was because she didn't ask any questions, as though she already knew the answers. Finally, it was nearly noon of my sixth day. I had a date for an early lunch with Helen, so I walked down the hall to her suite. I guess I was about ten feet away when her door opened. All right, honey. And we'll leave it that way. Just see that you deliver in two days. Thanks, though. I'll try to. Tommy. You haven't changed rooms, have you, Lou? Tommy, it's all right. I, I knew Lou before I came here. That's right, Tommy. Helen and I are old friends. Oh? Huh? I thought I introduced you. <laughs> that was just a little idea of mine. I've got to run along now, Helen, unless Tommy has something he'd like to talk over. No, Lou, just run along real fast. Take it easy, Tommy. It may not make you live longer, but you'll be happier. See you around. Would you like to come in, Tommy? Thanks. All right, let's have it. How do you happen to know Lou Cromwell? Oh, Tommy, doesn't everybody know Lou or know of him? Yes, but you know him. How come? Well, I was the dancer. I met him somewhere. You know how it is. Yeah, I know how it is. Why didn't you tell me the other night when he sent us the wine? He obviously didn't want me to, and I don't see how it mattered. What did he mean before about you delivering in two days? Tommy, Tommy, I can't tell. Why don't you leave it that way? I can't answer questions. You've got to, Helen. You know how I feel about it, Jen. I, I thought you felt the same way. Oh, Tommy. It's too late now for that no question stuff. I don't have the time. You've got to answer. I... Please. Try to understand, Tommy. I came here in the first place because of Lou, because he forced me to. What do you mean, he forced you? Because of my sister. What are you talking it's about? It's true, Tommy. She, she's just a crazy kid, and she got mixed up in something. Lou could make it tough for her if he wanted to. I mean, really tough. Okay, so he forced you to come here. Why? To do something I didn't want to do, but that I had to. What? I can't tell you, Tommy. I didn't want to. Believe me, I have to, and that's all. All right. All right. I believe you. Oh, Tommy, I guess we're the kind of people who never win, no matter what. Helen, I've done some pretty foolish things, been around a lot. I know what you mean. But it's never been like this. I've, I've never been in love with anybody before like this. Oh, that goes for me, too. Will you do something for me, something important? Why, darling? Marry me tonight. Tommy, Please, I... Please, honey. I don't know. I... What do you say? I never wanted anything so much. And I ought to have just one thing I want. We both ought to. All right, Tommy. Tonight. We were married at 8 o'clock with a hotel musician playing Oh, Promise Me on a pint-sized organ. And then Helen went to her suite to change for dinner. At least that's what she thought. But I had a different plan. I was going to make my own opening and take her along. Oh, I ordered the dinner, all right, and made a big noise about it in the dining room and... Then I went straight to my room. A charter plane was already warmed up and waiting at the airfield. And I had a taxi at the rear door of the hotel. This was going to be a fast break. And I wasn't even taking any luggage. Nothing. Except Helen and me. And a 38 automatic strapped on under my coat. It was about a half hour later when I finally went down to Helen's suite to pick her up. She didn't answer. So I tried again. The door was unlocked. Helen. It's Tommy, Helen. She wasn't in the sitting room or the bedroom, so I finally opened the door to the bath. I looked around, but she wasn't in sight. Then just as I started to leave... She fell. She'd been propped up in the tub behind the shower curtain. But she fell out, hitting with a horrible, limp sound. She was dead. Strangled. I... I stepped out and pulled the bathroom door shut, using my handkerchief to wipe off the knob without even thinking. I, I, I didn't feel anything, except maybe a numbness that still hurt. Lou had seen how I felt about her, so he'd done this. I had it done. I try to brush the fog out of my eyes and think... not about her lying in there. What... or what might have 
In. No, I, I wasn't even thinking about my seven days. I, I had something else on my mind. Finally, I stepped out into the hall and started for Lou Cromwell's room. But I had only gone a few steps when I heard two guys coming, and they sounded like cops. I stepped into the hall linen closet and pulled the door shut. Some guy calls up and says this thing was just been killed, and we'd find the killer still there. I don't know. I got it then. Lou had not only killed Helen, he called the police and said I did it. It didn't take long to reach his room. Oh, it's you, Tommy. I thought it was one of the boys. No, no, it's me, Lou. I'm a little surprised at this visit, Tommy. Where's your new bride? Why'd you do it, Lou? Oh, you've already been there then. I uh, thought you'd stick around longer after you found things. So the cops would get there? Well, something like that, maybe. You didn't have to do it that way, Lou. Not to her. Why'd you do it? You mean you don't know? You should have gone back to that party with me last week. Why? Because then you'd have found out about my surprise, Tommy. I made the announcement that I was going to marry Helen Ludlow at the end of the week. So... So that's what you were forcing her to do. Oh, well, let's just say that I proposed and conditions were such that she accepted. When I got here, she wanted a couple of more days and I gave it to her. But today, she double-crossed me and married you. Two double-crosses. You can see the position that put me in, Tommy. It's bad for business. Tell me, Lou, did she know about me? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, she knew. I guess she thought the two of you could break the bank. Sure, Lou, you had to do it. But you made some mistakes. You made one... What's the gun for? Oh, I just feel more comfortable holding it this way, Tommy. Don't let it bother you, though. Go on. What were my mistakes? One of them was not thinking I'd come here to your room and find you alone. But the big one, the big one was when you killed Helen. You shouldn't have done that. Well, now, Tommy, don't let it get you down. Maybe I can fix it. It's too late now. We've all had our last chance. The way you'd put it, the bets are all down. And the wheel's starting to slow up. Well, well. Maybe you can tell me what number it's stopping on, Tommy. Sure, Lou. The house takes everything. What? It's already stopped on double zero. Hello? Desk... Desk clerk? <coughs> I'm... I'm a stranger in town. How do I find the chief of police? Thank you, John Garfield, for a splendid performance. Mr. Garfield will return in just a moment. Mr. Wilcox, you look all out of breath. Did suspense get you? Me? Out of breath? Why, I only need three breaths a year in normal Wilcox use. What? I mean, Autolite Stay Full batteries need water only three times a year in normal car use. My, I'm glad you got that straightened <laughs> out. <laughs> well, friends, here's something I'm really straightened out about. If you mean to make the most of your next battery buy, if you want to practically banish one cause of battery failure, then hie yourself down to your nearest Autolite dealer bright and early tomorrow morning and get your car a brand new Autolite Stay Full battery. Why, your friendly Autolite dealer will be downright delighted to put a wonderful, dependable Autolite Stay Full battery in your car. Don't delay. Get your ding-dong daisy of an Autolite Stay Full battery right away. And friends, remember... <laughs> Autolite means batteries. Stay full batteries. Autolite means spark plugs. Ignition engineered spark plugs. Autolite means ignition system. The lifeline of your car. And now, here again is Mr. John Garfield. It's been a great pleasure to appear here tonight with this great cast of suspense actors... And I'm expecting almost as much pleasure next Thursday when radio's outstanding theater of thrills brings you Anne Blythe and Edmund O'Brien in Muddy Track, 
Another gripping study in... Suspense. John Garfield will soon be seen starred in the Roberts production Force of Evil, presented by Enterprise Studios and released through Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Tonight's suspense play was written by Lou Lusty and Les Crutchfield, with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. In the coming weeks, suspense will present such stars as Rosalind Russell, Agnes Moorhead, and Ronald Coleman. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. And next Thursday, same time, hear Edmund O'Brien and Ann Blythe in Muddy Track. This is the Autolite Suspense Show. Drive as if your life depends on it. It does. Good night. Switch to Autolite. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week. The Columbia Broadcasting System. The thrill of the night time, the hushed voice and the prowling step, the crime that is almost committed the finger of suspicion pointing perhaps at the wrong man, the stir of nerves at the ticking of the clock, the rescue that might be too late or the murderer who might get away, mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure. We invite you to enjoy stories that keep you in... Suspense. For Suspense, tonight we present... The Lord of the Witch Doctors by John Dixon Carr. The drums were beating that night. The Lord of the Witch Doctors was on his way. Twenty miles off the East African coast... Fanned by the blistering heat of the Indian Ocean lies the island of Zanzibar. Here, many years ago... To be exact, in the year 1889. Three nations were rivals for Imperial German Eagle. At Mogadishu were the Italians. A mixed population boiled along that coast. Portuguese, Arabs, Swahili. On the island itself, Sayed Khalif, Sultan of Zanzibar ruled the remains of a once mighty empire, Mohammedan Bantus of the tribe of Zeng. Look over there in the moonlight. That white building, patched and rotted, was the palace where Sayyid Khalif lived with his fat wives and his captive lion. Not far away on the hill overlooking the harbor stood the British Residency. The British resident, or crown official, held uneasy sway against German and Italian influence. And at the residency on that hot night long. Martha. Yes, Father? Uh, Come away from the windows, please. But, Father, those drums are on the mainland. Never mind. Twenty miles from here. I'd rather you stood back. It's the fires I don't like, sir. You can see the red light all this distance. Having a beano of some kind. You better stand back too, Mr. Harris. Oh, look here, sir. Yes, Mr. Harris. I've been your diplomatic attaché in this place for three years. Couldn't you call me by my first name in private? Just as you please. Lower the sun blinds and turn down the wick of that lamp. You don't think there's any danger? There's no danger whatever, but... Nero seems terribly restless tonight. Only natural, my dear, with the drums going. Everybody seems restless. This has been going on for days. You begin to get in your nerves. 
So you feel it too, eh? And I do wish they had Carlick wouldn't tease Nero. Jab at him with the meat fork and that kind of thing. If that lion ever got loose... Mm, something... Nerves, my dear. Nothing but nerves. Let's face it, sir. There's something very queer going on over on that mainland. Well, suppose there is. All we know is what Nyoka knows. This great witch doctor, whoever he is, has been making a triumphal progress to the coast. The whole bush is afraid of him. You alarm me. Nyoka says he's got horns. He can make himself seven feet tall, like stretching an accordion. Oh, really, Bill Harris? Well, I don't say I believe it. I say it might be dangerous. Now, for instance, could this be one of Dr. Schmidt's tricks? Mm, Dr. Schmidt is a friend of ours. Yes, he's also head of the German East Africa Company. Mm, Dr. Schmidt is a gentleman. Look at that coast over there. He's got every native chief in his pocket. Dr. Smith assured me that the German emperor has no more territorial claims in East Africa. We get our trade concessions from Saeed Khalif. Saeed's our only friend, but we can't even be sure of him. The Germans give him trade gin and a grand piano. The Italians give him three new wives for his harem. What do we give him? I have no instructions from London about the situation in this island. No. Somebody in Whitehall probably forgot to post them. For the last time, Mr. Harris, I will not hear His Majesty's government criticized like that. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, the, these things take time. If there's any danger, we'll be notified in due course. Listen. Well, they're only our own natives. They beat their own drums, you know. Somebody went past that window. It's probably only Nyoka, my dear. Surely you're not afraid of our own servant. No, but I... Nyoka, listen to me. Don't hang on to that big curtain. You'll pull it down. Now stand up straight and tell me. What is it? He here, Bona. He here, yes, please. Who's here? Big witch doctor here, yes, please. He come up past in moonlight. He walk slow, boom, boom. He got big teeth eat with me outside front door now. What was that? Drums have stopped. <laughs> Nyoka's right, sir. We have got a visitor. There's somebody coming down the hall. Better turn down that lamp, Martha. I... I can't seem to find the lamp. My fingers are all thumbs. There's a revolver in the table drawer behind you, sir. I don't need it. Stand perfectly still, all of you. Now, please, friends all, don't be alarmed. Are you English? That's right, miss. Born and bred in Streddon. Hey, which of you is the British consul? I am the British resident, sir. My name is Richardson. May I ask the meaning of this tomfoolery? Well, fully? that's just what I'm here to tell you. Or maybe I'd better show you. Now, observe me right hand. I hold it up so, and as I live, a lighted cigar. But perhaps the lady doesn't like smoking in the drawing room. Now, look here. There's nothing up my sleeves. I wouldn't deceive you for the world. I turn over me hand, and would you believe it? A glass of water. Is this man insane? Father... I think he's trying to tell you he's a magician. That's right, miss. Direct from the Egyptian hall, Piccadilly. Animal taming and magic. That's my line. Then you're the famous witch doctor that's got all the natives in an uproar? Nobody else, young fella. Yes, well, you tell us what you mean by this nonsense. Scaring everybody when there's no danger. No danger? I suppose you haven't heard about Saeed Caliph and his Gatling guns? Gatling guns? Kindly presented by Dr. Otto Schmidt. And believe me... All you've got is an appointment with a Gatling gun, unless my nonsense steps in. Here, take a look at this. But you can't be from the British Foreign Office. Well, that's just what I am, Governor, and going up in the world, don't you think? <laughs> By the way, I'd better give you your instructions. The envelope's pretty dirty and a little bit smelly from being under my furs and devil paint, but... Uh... Read it, sir. Go on and read it. Foreign Office, Whitehall, British Consul, Zanzibar. Bearer of this letter, the great Mephisto. That's me. Real name, Barney Hicks. They must be out of their minds. Are they? Listen, old man. I've been three weeks in that jungle with a Swahili interpreter. I've been bitten and stung and fried to death. But Schmidt or no Schmidt, I've got those native chiefs just where I want them. You see what happens when I announce I'm a friend of the great white queen... Why, you'll have him eaten out of your hand. Well, that's true. And all we've got to do is get around Sayed Kelly if here on this island. But do we need to get around him? The young lady be good enough not to speak until you're spoken to. Oh, I'm sorry, Father. Say it may be lazy and as fat as a hippopotamus. He's rather a fine old boy. Is he? You said something about Gatling guns. Now, listen. Here's the game. Father, I don't like this. 
I've never heard Nero's restless as oh, that. Never mind, Nero. Go on. Well, I came over here tonight in a steam launch. Tomorrow I'm paying my state visit to the great Sultan Sayyid Caliph. Now, you present me as your friend and a friend of the great white queen. And I do my best tricks at <laughs> Is anything wrong with your native boy? My girl, be still. You're not afraid of our witch doctor friend, are you? No, I good Christian. Here, what are you doing? Come out from under that sofa. But, Buana, I see something. I look out through windows. That's see Buana Baldhead coming up past. Buana Baldhead? That's Dr. Schmidt. Dr. Schmidt? Well, he mustn't find me here. Yes, I quite agree. This is, uh, this is most irregular. Is there a back way out of here? Yes, through that arch. Stay in the back room. Nyoko will show you. Me go with witch, Doctor. Yes, hurry, please. I know, like, Never I mind know, what you like. like. You go. All right, Master. It's all right. They've gone. Yes, about time, too. Well, good evening, Dr. Schmidt. Pleasure to see you. Always a pleasure to see you. Ah, my friends. I wish I could say it was such a pleasure to see you. Isn't it, Doctor? This at any time but now. Uh, do not mistake me, I beg of you. No, it is that confounded line, Nero. Always I say it will happen, and now it has happened. What about Nero? My friends, I regret. He has made his kill. He has tasted blood. <laughs> What's that? Uh, you permit that I sit down and take off my sun helmet. I am not young, and I'm tired. It's not Sayyid Kelly. Yeah, yeah, it is so. He has teased that line once too often. Oh, poor old boy. He was our friend. He's not dead. Yeah, yeah. I regret. Yeah, he is dead. Sultan of Sansabar is dead. Oh, God. But how did the lion ever get at him? He drank too much pomba. That was his trouble. He got drunk and think he can do too much. So he opened the door and went to the lion's cage. Into the cage? Yeah. Would you believe it? Not easily, but it is true. Over the palace there is what you call gnashing of teeth. His son Nobius in tears. Did you see this happen, Doctor? No, no, no. I, I go there later and they tell me. It. It's all of us because of some foolish toy. Doomhead story. That he has been struck over the head and thrown into the cage by someone who did not like him. Well, that's more likely, if you ask me. My friend, it is foolishness. Everybody liked old man. He was a father to his people and a kind friend. Doctor, are you telling us that, say, he may, may have been put into that cage unconscious? It is what one African the soldier says, yeah. Well, then he may still be alive. Life? It is impossible. It's more than possible. A lion may maul an unconscious man, but it doesn't often kill him. This is vital. Vital to Saeed himself and others as well. You're a doctor. Can't you go and make sure? My friend, I regret. I am not that kind of a doctor. Harris, you may be right. I think I'd better go myself. Is this a good idea, sir? I'll stay here and uh, entertain Dr. Schmidt. <laughs> Unless, of course, he wants to go, too. Uh, no, 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 I, I thank you. I, I do not like sights of that sort. I, I have a tender heart and I have illnesses. Besides, you can do nothing. I tell you, he is dead. Yes, we'll see. Uh, Martha, you'd better come with me. Your nurse's training may be of some use at last. Of course. Um, hadn't we better go the back way and speak to Nyoka? Yes, Nyoka mustn't be troubled in that back room. A very good evening to you, Dr. Schmidt. Ah, uh, Mr. Harris, they have good hearts... They're so foolish. I would give my own right arm to aid that poor man. But, well, we must have philosophy. We must cheer up and bear it. Yes. Now, Doctor, we're all alone. So we are. So we are. We must sit down and have a nice, comfortable chat. Yes? Definitely, yes. Oh. <laughs> I wanted to have a word with you anyway. Ah, so? About what, Mr. Harris? Oh, various things. I am happy to give you all the time in the world. I, I like talking to young people. It makes me feel young again myself. Like, uh, Nobi? Nobi? Sayyid Caliph's eldest son. The new sultan. Ah, one fine young man. Or a savage. Yes, but, uh, weak. Easy to manage. And very fond of his father, too. It's a wonder he didn't have the lion shot after they got the body away. <laughs> shot a bit but, my friend. <laughs> I beg your pardon, Emil. I, I do not consider the matters funny. No, no, no. I, but uh, shot with what? These brutes, they have nothing but uh, loading muskets. Kill Nero with those? No. Suppose they had Gatling guns. 
Pardon? Uh, just suppose that, of course. Of course. Well? Ah, my friend. Catlings would be of no better use. You only wound. To kill a lion, you must reach the eye or heart with a high-power bullet. What is the matter with us? Why are we talking of these things? Talking of death, you mean? Of Said Khalif, who gave all the trade concessions on Zanzibar to the British? My friend, I was talking about express rifles. Look here, don't you find it warm in here? Yeah, yeah, a little. Yes, it uh, smells of animals' fur, doesn't it? I'll just raise those sun blinds. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, you must not trouble yourself to do that. It's no trouble. I, 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 I beg of you not to trouble. It, it is not necessary. Doctor, you've been mopping your forehead ever since you've been here. A little fresh air never hurt anybody. Here. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Isn't that better? Much. Much. Uh, why not sit down, my boy, and we have a nice chat? Fine enough night. No smell of the animal's cage here. My friend, you talk like a hunter. Yes. Or a victim. Yes, it's a fine night. At least for this part of the world. Fire still burning on the mainland. I wonder if that's a good sign. Of what? I wish I knew. And the sea is like skim milk under the moon. And... Good Lord. What is it? What makes you jump? Look there, in the harbor. My friend, I see nothing. Perhaps if I take off my spectacles and vibe... Why, man, you must see it. In the harbor, out at the left there, beyond the shadow of those big palm trees. Don't you see our riding lights? It looks like... By George, it is. It's a warship. It is only a German gunboat, my friend. Only a very little German gunboat. German gunboat. My friend, you must not be so distrustful. Uh, that is not kind. Uh, let me get a telescope. But I tell you who she is. It is nothing. She is on what you call a goodwill tour. You're not angry. Angry? <laughs> oh, my friend. Well, I, I did not know. I, I could not guess. Uh, that is, uh, the England is our heart to understand. <laughs> we know that ourselves. I, I, I tell you something in confidence. The Germans are sensitive. The British object it. The natives feel too strong. I tell the gunboat to go away. I fire an express rifle. It has a sound. Boom! You cannot mistake one another. That is why I think of an express rifle. But if nobody will object... Why, well, not the least bit. Tell me, Doctor. Do you like it here on this island? Well, it is not barren. Don't you ever want to get away from a forsaken mud heap like this? My friend, I am a chairman. My duty is here, as I stay here. Yes, I know. Between ourselves, that's exactly my position. But you are young. Mm, that's not the point. It's the importance of the job. The British don't rule Zanzibar. We hold the trade concessions from Said Khalif, and our residency has to protect them. But even you, Doctor, would be surprised at the amount of trade that we have to protect and the revenue that comes out of this island. Is it so now? You don't say so. I do say so. Is uh, it so much? More than you think. Of course, <laughs> I'm not allowed to give you any figures. <laughs> no, no, no. Of course not. I, I would not dream of asking you. How, how much would you say it comes to roughly? Oh, come now, Doctor. As one gentleman to another, you're not asking me to give away secrets. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's only a joke, you understand? Right? Uh, please do not try to up-trip me. I, uh, I would try to pull your leg and uh, it was only a joke, believe me. Yes. <laughs> it's all in the game, as it were. Yes, all in the game as gentlemen. Oh, doctor, you're quite uh, a humorist. Uh, you're not dependent. Not at all. No, as I was saying, I uh, hold a rather important job. Of course, Mr. Richardson holds an even more important one. He's been very friendly with old Said Khalifa on this job. Um, of course, you know what that job is? Of course. He's the British consul. What is the matter with you? You're not smiling any longer. Are you looking at me like that? So that's it. That's the game. 
You made exactly the same mistake that he did. <laughs> yes, who did? Dr. Schmidt, have you met the great lord of the witch doctors? The maker of spells and the tamer of lions? I am a good Christian. I pay no attention to what natives say. I, I, I do not believe in witch doctors. No, neither do I. Not in this one, at any rate. Artwin, the witch doctor who came here tonight and said that he was on a mission for the British Foreign Office. He's an imposter from the word go, and you're working with him. Oh, don't upset your chair like that, Dr. Schmidt. Because if you fall on it, you may hurt yourself. I have not hurt myself, young man. Oh, yes, you have. The fellow who came here tonight addressed Mr. Richardson as the British Consul. That might have been a slip of the tongue. But then you see the letter on the table there? I have eyesight, I thank you. That letter is supposed to come from the Foreign Office. And it calls him the British Consul, too. I heard it read aloud. The Foreign Office may make mistakes. But they don't make mistakes like that. That letter, Doctor, is a forgery. It was forged by a German, and probably by the German who calls himself Barney Hicks, or the great Mephisto. He's in the back room now. No, he's not, Governor. He's standing in the doorway behind you now. Yes, I thought I heard you. But don't turn around to look at me. I'm just warning you. Have you got anything to enforce that? Yes. I've got a 500 express rifle that could me all over the opposite wall. Carl. Well, if you fellows are going to shoot me, I wish you'd speak English about it. Carl, I beg of you. No, no, no. Don't fire that rifle. Exactly. You see, Carl, I'm turning around. This is all day. Now, now, Carl. You see what the doctor means, Carl? If you fire that rifle, you'll send your gunboat out of that harbor just when you need it. Isn't that the signal, doctor, to send the gunboat away? Carl, I beg of you. Yes, it is. Very simple, economical German signal. So, you two killed Said Khalif. That is slender. That cannot be proved. Had to do it, I imagine. Said was the one chief that you couldn't buy or frighten with your witch doctor, so you got rid of him. Tomorrow morning, the witch doctor would have appeared. He'd have scared the daylights out of a weak and superstitious son, Nobi. I and... told you I was fairly good at my work, Governor. And I am. Yes, and then the witch doctor would have taken over everything. The British resident had to be bamboozled for 24 hours to keep him out of the way with a ghost story about a, a British agent. And there was a gunboat in the harbor in case of trouble. Slight mistake there, Governor. There is a gunboat in the harbor. Yes. It's really worked out beautifully. The Emperor should be pleased. I don't think your white queen will be very happy, though. I'm the great witch doctor to that frightened mob over there. Say it is dead. And there's a German gunboat in the arbor. Listen. I think I hear something. Whoever's out there, stay back. Whoever's out there, stay back. Bill, listen to me. Say it's alive. He's alive. This is impossible. We can see him breathe. We don't even think he's badly hurt, but he's still in the cage, unconscious. Still in the cage? You mean they can't get him out of there? If he wakes up or they attempt anything nearer, we'll tear him to pieces. The whole crowd over there is nearly crazy, but they don't dare go into the cage. Well, gentlemen, you should have been more careful. If they do get Saeed out of there alive, you're done for. Be quiet. Listen. Nobi and the rest of the natives are coming up here now. See here, miss. Are you talking about the old boy's son? Nobi, yes. He wants to see the witch doctor. The witch doctor? This puts you in some slight trouble, Carl. Uh, listen to me, miss. I couldn't get that old buzzard from the... out the way from that line, even if I... I've got to get out of here. Too late now, my dear witch doctor. The natives have surrounded the house. Who's that? It's Nobi. He's coming down the hall. Seema, Abu Dusame. My Nobi. Speak wide language. Paris Sultan's warned. Witch doctor. Much respect. Fallen floor. Go ahead. Play your part, Carl. Play your ruddy part. Get up again. Great medicine man. Father hurt. In cage with lion. You come. Say something, Carl. You can't be a dumb wizard. You come. My dear Nobi, my friend. The witch doctor can't understand you. Be witch doctor. Not speak everything. But witch doctor. No, no. It is not that. He does not hear you. He's in another world. See, see, see how his eyes close. See how he sway. I know this. He saved my father. Or maybe all of you. We will kill all white people here. 
Witch doctor saved my father from lion. You come. Nobby, listen to me. You needn't worry. The great witch doctor can save your father. Go in cage? No, not go in cage. Strike with fire? Yes, that's it. Strike with wizard fire. Open heaven. Flash great light. Nero scream and die. Father save. Carl, you must not save him. If he remain alive, he will talk. Then the natives will know. You are not want to save father? The witch doctor does want to save your father, Nobi. You see that gun under his arm? Gun? Gun no good. Not use gun. Only wound lion. Lion in pain, kill father. No, that's not like your muskets, Nobi. It's an express gun. It's... It's a magic gun. Magic gun? Listen, Nobi. Magic gun save your father with one shot. Just like that. Lion fall over dead. Your father well again. And our friend. We use gun. Give me gun. No, you could not use it, Nobi. Which doctor can use it best? Tell him to use it. Tell him to be sure that he hits the lion. Oh, look here, Harris. I've had enough of this. Yes, Nobi. If he wants to hit Nero with that white fire, he can strike the lion dead before you could wink your eyes. Then do. You'd better try it, Carl. And you'd better not miss him, or you know what'll happen to every white person in this room. My hands are shaking like... Magician with shaky hands? That won't do. I take your shoulder. You follow. Yala! Ngompa! All come! By palace door. All caught over river, bright as day. Thousand torches, all make light. Now do. Now do! See how quiet they get when nobody raises his hands. They're praying. So are we. We won't do it. You better. I told you that. They're out of hand now. Oh. If you miss, you're no witch, Doctor. And if you had any thought of hitting Saeed instead, just imagine what they do to you. I can't see it. These torches blind me. You do. I think the old man's moving. If he stirs, the lion will kill him. You know what that means. <laughs> That's right. Up with a rifle. My hands are shaking. Be careful your sights. It's a point blank shot. No. <laughs> Allah! Who oh could? All right, Nobi. The lion is dead. They can go in and carry your father out now. Lion dead? German magic is great magic. Yes, Nobby, it is. But English magic is greater. English magic better than German magic? Yes, Nobby, and I'll prove it. Turn around. Look out towards the harbor. I stand here. I wave my hand, like this. Nothing up my sleeves. I wouldn't deceive you for the world. I wave my hand towards the gunboat in the bay. The gunboat sails away. English magic, Nobi. English magic. And so ends The Lord of the Witch Doctors. Tonight's story of... Suspense. Next Tuesday, when CBS again brings you Suspense, our story will be The Devil in the Summer House. The broadcast for next week only is scheduled for 10 p.m. Eastern Wartime, a half hour later than usual. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, Bernard Herman, the composer-conductor, and John Dixon Carr, the author, 
are all collaborators on... Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. In just a moment, Suspense with Madeline Carroll. Hello. Oh, hello, Tom. Where are you? Thought you were driving over tonight. Couldn't get your car started. Well, what's wrong with it? Uh-huh. Well, sounds like ignition trouble to me, Tom. Why don't you call Ed's Auto Electric, best service station in town? He's an Autolite man. Really knows his stuff and believes in preventive service. You know, fixes things before they happen. Carries Autolite parts. You, you know, Autolite. Spark plugs, batteries, complete ignition systems. Yeah, that's right, the works. Oh, uh, oh, by the way, Tom, Autolite has that swell high-tension show on the air, Suspense. Ever hear of it? Well, why don't you tune in? It's coming on right now. Suspense. Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Starring tonight, Miss Madeline Carroll in Anton Leder's production of The Morrison Affair, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Oh, Mr. Ballou, there's a woman outside. She doesn't have an appointment, but uh, she must speak to Mr. Ballou privately. All right, I'll see her. I'll lay you six to five. It's a divorce. She's got that nothing must get in the paper lure. <clears throat> Will you come in, please? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ballou. Please sit down. Uh, Dottie, buzz me when it's half past. Okay, Mr. Ballou. We can't be overheard here, can we? No. Now then, Mrs. I'd rather you didn't take notes. Oh, well, all right. But I do need your name. I'll tell you later. Uh, do lawyers have any kind of code or rule against revealing confidential information? <laughs> like priests? Yes. However, you want me to promise before I hear your case? Yes. All right, if it makes you feel better. I've handled hundreds of divorces. Oh. And never lost a patient. It uh, is a divorce. Yes, in a way. But he's dangerous, and there's a child. The courts usually lean toward giving the mother custody. I know, but, but Mr. Ballou, I'm in desperate trouble. I'm afraid. You can't understand till I tell you. Well, then? You see, I'm English. My husband is American. He grew up here in Boston, a very prominent family. The, the Morrisons. He's Dr. Paul Morrison. Yes, I know Dr. Morrison. Oh? Uh, that is, I've heard of him. Then you know he's a surgeon. I met Paul in London in 1939. We were married very soon after we met. And then England went to war, and Paul decided to stay in England to help out. He was different then. So deeply concerned over human suffering. The war changed him. Changed him hideously. But those first two years in London, we were happy. Almost completely happy. Quite suddenly, America was in the war. And Paul had his orders to return to the American Army Medical Corps. We spent the little time we had left at a cottage in the country. And all the time I was trying to forget the one thing that had been preying on my mind ever since they told me at the hospital that... that... But I couldn't. And so finally, even though it was our last day together, I went up to London to do what I had always known someday I would have to do. It was late afternoon when I returned. Who is it? Oh, darling, where on earth have you been? I'm sorry I'm so late, Paul. Never mind about being sorry. Come over here this instant. Give me a kiss. <sighs> Want to know something? What? You're a heartless hussy going off and leaving me alone all day. Our last day. Do you think I'd have gone if it hadn't been important? Now look, darling, I'm a doctor, too. I don't know what doctor you want to see this time, but none of us can perform miracles. I don't believe in miracles, Paul, and I, and I didn't go to London to see a doctor. I went to find out if we could adopt a child. Adopt a child? I know you've always been against the idea, Paul. Darling, this is no time but... to go into a big, complicated thing like that. 
I've got to be on my way home by this time tomorrow. It's not this time tomorrow I'm thinking about, Paul. It's all my life. If I can't have a child of my own, then I want to adopt one. But, Sheila, I... I sort of halfway picked out one at the orphanage today. What? His parents were killed in an air raid, and, and, oh, Paul, you've always wanted a boy. I've wanted a son, yes. But adopting a child involves certain risks. There are fundamental laws of heredity. Now you're being plain old-fashioned. You can call it anything you like. It's out of the question. Why? Give me one reason why. You know the reasons as well as I do. All I know is I'm a woman and I want a child. Sheila, come here. Look at me. Maybe I'm old-fashioned or overcautious, but if we got a child that way, picked him out like something on a grocery shelf, you might feel he was your son, but he wouldn't be mine. And the son has to be for both of us. Or not at all. <laughs> stayed on in London for more than six months after Paul left. It was ghastly there for everyone. As for me, I lived in a fever of loneliness, worse than loneliness. Then my mother asked me down to the country to wait out the war with her. It was a summer evening when I took a crowded train from Paddington, and I sat alone in the compartment, numb with my hunger for Paul. You must understand, that day I wasn't myself. I wasn't accountable. You see, I had a double kind of loneliness. When the conductor opened my compartment door for other passengers, I didn't even look up at first. Here we are, missus. I'll let you. Oh, thank you ever so much. It's the window seat. Ma'am, I want the window seat. Now oh, then, now oh, then, you two. I reckon the missus is going to want some of their fresh air for the little nipper. Here, you can have my seat if you like. It doesn't make any difference to me. Oh, it's very kind of you, miss, I'm sure. Mum, I want to see the guards then. Not now, Johnny. But, Mum, you promised. Missus, I'll let you know when we're near Reading Junction. Uh, oh, thank you. No trouble at all, missus. Uh, I hope Mary's not taking up too much room on the seat, miss. No, no, not at all. Well, she's shoving and pushing me, ma'am. Now, Mary. I'm not I'm either. I just need back. more room, ma'am. I'm a you just figure. stop it. Mary, stop rummaging in my carry-all. There's nothing in it to eat. Oh, dear. Children can be such a trial. Oh, what? Now, now, hush. Yes, I know you're hungry. Can I hold him for a minute? What, what, miss? Mary's a pig. Do you two like to look at pictures? Here's a magazine with all sorts of pictures about America. Oh, My husband sent it to me. Oh, that's kind of you, miss, I'm sure. No, thank the lady, thank her. Thank Come you, on. Thank you Yeah, that'll keep them quiet. My mother ought to be two people, that she ought. I'll hold the baby while you fill his bottle. Well, if it won't trouble you. Oh, no, no. Yeah. I don't mind. Yeah. I sat there, scarcely breathing looking down at the baby in my lap. It was as though I'd never felt warmth before. He stopped whimpering and looked up at me with very big brown eyes that seemed to hold recognition. He's taken a real fancy to you, miss, and no mistake. What's his name? Jamie. It was his father's name. He was killed last week in a bomber over Germany. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. But at least you have the children. Oh, yes, miss. But sometimes, I don't know... Sometimes I think it would be better if, if I didn't have this last one. Oh, no, you can't mean that. It's not easy, miss, with no man to provide. You said you're married, miss. Do you have any children? No, I have no children. Uh, yeah, baby. You'd know if you had one. Knowing all the things I won't be able to give him. I can't help thinking he'd be better off if I left him on someone's doorstep, so to speak. Someone... Well fixed, like you. You'd regret it all your life. But it's his life I'm thinking about when I say it. Of course, I'm not brave enough to do it. But I wish I was. Oh, well. If wishes was horses, as they say. We're just pulling into Redding Junction, missus, if you still want to get that cup of tea. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Mary. Come on, Mary. Mum's going to get us yeah. something to eat. I want to see this pies first. Well, you can look at the magazine when you come back. No, no, run along, bus. I'll be on wait for me outside. All right, Mum. Come yeah. on, lady. Well, wait till I get my coat I'll on, take Mom. Jamie now, miss. I'm going to sit right here. Why don't I hold him till you come back? Oh, uh, I wouldn't want to bother you. Oh, it's no bother at all. Well... You won't have any trouble with him. He's always been a good baby. Mom, come on, I'm coming, Mom. I'm coming. I'll wait. If you're sure, miss. Quite sure. Oh, yes, I'm quite sure. Maybe you'll say what I did was wicked. 
that she didn't tell me to take her child. But I know she did. She made her decision and I made mine. After a few minutes, I got up and carried the baby down the corridor. I was trembling, so I was afraid I'd drop him. I managed to get off the train and made my way across the crowded platform. It was nearly time for the train to pull out. Hurry up now, train's leaving. Then I saw the woman, her, her two older children coming toward me. I stepped behind a post. Oh, she's a pig. Mary's a wicked pig. Too far. Oh, she's a pig. Now we've got to hurry. Now we have to hurry. I stood there and watched the three climb onto the train. Then it began to move. And it was the brakes or a train whistle. If only I hadn't imagined it was something else. Above the racket of the train, it sounded like... Like a woman screaming. For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Miss Madeline Carroll in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hello. Oh, it's you again, Tom. Swell program, eh? What? The name of that Autolite service station? Well, it's Ed's Auto Electric. Uh, just look for the big Autolite sign down on Main Street. Uh, but wait, here's more dope on Autolite service. Listen to Frank Martin. For expert ignition checkup and repair, stop at your nearest Autolite service station. Highly trained mechanics working with specialized machines are ready to give your car the best, most complete, most reliable ignition service possible. And when it comes to replacement parts, why, money can't buy finer ignition equipment than Autolite. Autolite is the world's largest independent manufacturer of electrical equipment for automobiles. And many of America's finest cars and trucks are equipped with Autolite distributors, coils, generators, starting motors, batteries, and spark plugs right on the assembly line. So, friends, if you want truly reliable ignition, parts, and service, call on your nearest Autolite service station or the car dealer who sells your make of car. service stations are listed in your classified telephone directory under automotive electrical service. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Miss Madeline Carroll as Sheila in The Morrison Affair, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I can't file for your divorce, Mrs. Morrison, but until you and your husband turn the child over to the British consul. My husband doesn't know. He thinks it's his child. He suspects something's wrong, but... Well, then make a clean breast of it. Tell him. Oh, no, you mustn't. He mustn't ever know. He'll kill me or Jamie or both of us. How on earth did you make your husband believe? That was easy. I figured it all out on the way to Mother's. I took a bus at Reading Junction, then another train... It was almost midnight when I got home and let myself in the front door. Mother was waiting up. Is that you, Sheila? Yes, Mother. Oh, you've had me well. Don't want to... Sheila! Is the fire still lit in the kitchen, Mum? Yes, but... Don't ask questions now, please. He's hungry. I'm going to heat him up some milk. Whose baby is it? He's mine now. What do you mean, Sheila? Who's was he? I don't know. Here, hold him while I get the milk. Oh, shh, baby, shh. You mean you've adopted him? I stole him. Sheila! I don't ask you to understand, Mother. I only ask you to help me. Because I'm your child and because I can't ever have a child of my own. But Paul won't let you keep this child. If he thinks it's his own, he will. Oh, look, the poor little mite's starving. Yes. It may be years before the war's over and I see Paul again. He looked forward to seeing his son. But he's bound to ask where his son was born. He was born here. But there are records of such things, Sheila. The date, the place, the parents, the doctor. I know. Mother, telephone Dr. Lucas. Dr. Lucas? Why, he, he's a charlatan. He's not even a real doctor. Oh, does that matter? He's greedy and that's the kind of man I need. Tell him I want to see him tomorrow. Because tomorrow... My son, Jamie, will be born. That night before I went to bed, I cabled Paul at his last APO address. Why haven't you answered my letters? Or don't you like my news? His answering cable came in the morning. 
What letters, what news, we'll phone. It was going to be easy. Paul had traveled so much. New York, Baltimore, three months in the Pacific. It would be easy to make him believe that some of his mail had gone astray. I waited all day for Paul's call and for Dr. Lucas. That miserable little man took his time about it. Ah, uh, Mrs. Morrison, I'm late, but your mother assured me no one was ill. No, it's about my son. Why, I didn't hear that you I'm had having a... difficulties about his birth record. I've uh, lost the certificate and I need a duplicate. Why, Mrs. Morrison, I'm sure if you write As to... As a matter of fact, I want the record changed. Changed? I want the certificate to say that he was born here today. Mrs. Morrison. It can be done, can't it? It's, uh, rather difficult. You mean it's expensive? Yes, very expensive. There's the risk to a doctor's reputation. How much? A uh, <clears throat> uh, thousand pounds. All right. No, I'm afraid it will have to be twelve hundred pounds. All right, but that's all I can pay. Here, you, you can write it out under this lamp. One moment, I'll find the form. Yes, here it is. He's the son of Mr. and Mrs. Paul Morrison. Excuse me, please. Yes? Go ahead, Major Morrison. Hello? Hello, Sheila. Paul! Paul, darling! Where are you? India. I turned the whole army inside out to get a priority. Can you hear me all right? Fine! But, darling, why didn't you answer my letters? Well, I answered every one I got. Then the, the important ones got lost or something. You haven't heard the news? What news? You're... you're going to be a father, Paul. Did you hear me, Paul? Yes. But, Sheila, that seems impossible. But it's happened all the same. Any day now, you'll have a son and heir. Oh, you've made up your mind. It's going to be a boy, eh? Well, that's what you want, isn't it? Yes, it's what I want. But it seems like a miracle. I was dead certain that I... Something wrong, Mrs. Morrison? I was cut off. Operator! Operator! Yes? Operator, I was cut off. It was a call from India. Didn't you hang up? Certainly not. I was cut off. Well, I'll try to get your party back. Yes, try. But it's all right if you don't. Uh, what is the name of your son, Mrs. Morrison? Uh, Jamie. Jamie Morrison. Jamie Morrison, born July 3rd, 1942. You know, Mrs. Morrison... Heredity is tricky. There's nothing wrong with my son's heredity. And then there's always the danger of being found out, as long as anyone knows beside yourself. At first, some nights I dreamed that Jamie's mother had come to fetch Jamie. But that was only at first. I buried my guilt, buried it deep. Four years went by. Then the war was over and Jamie and I sailed to join Paul in America. The day I arrived in New York, I may have been nervous, but I was sure at last of happiness, as sure as I'd ever been in my life. Oh, Paul. Paul, darling. My dear. Oh, I've never seen you look better, darling. Motherhood suits you. Is that my daddy? Yes, Jamie. Well, well, how do you do, James? My name isn't James. It's Jamie. Jamie? Yes, I, I've always called him that. I don't know why. It's a kind of nickname, I suppose. Well, from now on, we'd better settle for James. We Morrisons never appreciated nicknames. Funny about his eyes. His eyes? I've got to look up my Mendel. Can two blue-eyed people have a brown-eyed child? They must. We did, no matter what Mendel says. Well, he's positively the first Morrison with brown eyes. But why not? He's the miracle kid. kid. Blue eyes, brown eyes. I rolled the phrases around my mind, hunting their real meaning. I was oversensitive, of course, but, but from the first day I felt that Paul was hostile to Jamie. Where's my miracle kid? He's taking his nap. What do you want with him? I'm driving down to the rifle range with a friend. I thought I'd take James along. Oh, but he's too young, Paul. Hmm? Too young for what? to play with guns. Oh, that's just why I want to take him along. The sooner he knows how to handle guns, the better off he'll be. Mommy, Mommy, where are you, Mommy? Here I am, Jamie. Mommy, I fell off. Oh, darling, darling, what's happened? I fell off the horse. 
He went too fast and jumped around and I fell off and hurt my knee. Yeah, I brought the iodine. He's more scared than hurt. Oh, not iodine. Use peroxide. It won't sting. I told you he was too young to ride. Oh, it was a gentle horse. Jamie lost the seat when it started to trot, that's all. We'll do better next time, won't we, kid? I guess so, Daddy. There won't be a next time. Yes, there will be, Sheila. Jamie, go up to Mother's room. I'll be along in a minute to fix your knee. All right, Mummy. There's candy in my bureau. You know where. Yes, Mummy. I do. Paul, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to make my son like my son. He's my son, too, you know. What you're doing to him, Sheila, he's not anybody's son. He's a zombie. I swear I'd rather see him dead than what you want him to be. I suppose it was then that I first realized what I would have to do. That someday, someday soon, I'd have to get Jamie away from Paul. I was frightened. I even began to carry a gun in my bag, and I began to make plans. I'd start again, build a new life for myself and my son. Then yesterday, I knew that I'd have to hurry, that I couldn't postpone my decision any longer. I found out when Paul came home from the hospital. He came directly to my room. Ah, there you are. I want to tell you something, Sheila. What is it? What's happened? A big day at the conference. Oh, you mean the medical conference? Yeah, a psychiatrist from Chicago named Drake read a paper on psychosomatic medicine. Terrific. And then there was a curious report on euthanasia. You know, mercy killing. Interesting, but extreme. In what way? Well, the doctor delivering the report favors not only the mercy killing of incurables, he advocates weeding out and purifying the race by studying heredity and eliminating those whose heredity is questionable. <laughs> Real crackpot. Horrible. Sheila, while his report was going on, though, I began to wonder... About you and Jamie. About me and Jamie? Yes. I wanted to ask you, is there something about Jamie's heredity that you don't want me to know? Then I understood. The danger was real and now. For myself, but mostly for Jamie. Paul was playing with me like a cat plays with a mouse. This talk about mercy killing, heredity, this subtle, cruel talk, threatening me with Jamie's death, announcing in advance the mercy killing of a child who is inferior because he isn't a Morris. That's why I've come to you, Mr. Ballou. I can't risk Paul's getting custody. I have to take Jamie away first, far away where Paul can't reach him, and then get a divorce. Mm -hmm. I want you to tell me where it's safest for us to go and get the papers I need. <clears throat> Mrs. Morrison, I promised that whatever you told me would be confidential. I'm sorry I made that promise. If I hadn't, I'd go to Dr. Morrison and tell he him wouldn't. that his wife carries a heavy load of guilt. A very heavy load. And it's coloring everything she does. You think I'm insane? I think you have dangerous delusions. And you won't help me? I can't, Mrs. Morrison. A psychiatrist might help you, but... Only if you go to him now before it's too late. Mrs. Morrison! Mrs. Morrison! Yes? You're to go to the hospital. Dr. Morrison said for you to come right away. What is it, Elsa? What's happened? It's the little boy. Jamie! He got hold of one of his daddy's guns. He's done it. He's killed Jamie. Jamie was playing with it, and it went off when it was pointed right at himself. He's hurt bad. Take my blood, Paul. Take it. I'll do anything. Sheila, get hold of yourself. You're hysterical. We have to know his blood type first. Now, the lab should be calling back any minute. Paul, I, I'd rather you didn't operate. Ask Dr. McDonald. Well, this isn't McDonald's kind of a case. I... Don't you trust me, Sheila? I thought you might be too nervous being his father. Am I, Sheila? What? Am I his father, Sheila? <laughs> Dr. Morrison speaking. All right. It's the lab. Hello? Yes, Brooks. It's what? You're absolutely sure. You checked twice? I see. Yes, thank you. You gave the results of the blood test. Oh. We can't use your blood, Sheila. You know from the blood test? Yes, Dr. Morrison. Get the boy ready for operation. I'll start immediately. Yes, Doctor. No, what, Sheila? No, don't tell me. All I know is that your blood is type A and mine is type A and James is type B. Wait here, Sheila. Don't do it, Paul. Do what? I won't let you operate. I won't. I won't. Get Dr. McDonald. 
or I'll kill you. You're out of your mind. You can't shoot that gun. I can and I will before I let you touch Jamie. Now that you know he's not your son... I've always known it. You're lying. From the first moment I saw him. It's a proven medical fact. Two blue-eyed people cannot have a brown-eyed child. And all your cruelty was deliberate. At first I thought you'd been unfaithful. That Jamie was your son and another man was his father. But the blood proves he's not yours either. You adopted him. I stole him and I'm not going to lose him now. We're all ready, Dr. Morrison. Thank you. Wait here, Sheila. Paul, I warned you. Mrs. Morrison, don't! <laughs> He fell like a sack of dry leaves And liquid the color of dark grapes Seeped through and spread slowly Across the front of his surgeon's jacket Then people came and dragged me away I've seen no one since Except those who guard me And my lawyer, Mr. Ballou Who came to tell me that Paul was dead And that Jamie would live the operation was performed successfully by Dr. MacDonald. Then Mr. Ballou began to talk about how to defend me against the charge of murder. Why not tell them the truth? Let me tell you the truth, Mrs. Morrison. After you shot Dr. Morrison, he could have lived. He had to choose between his life and Jamie's. What could he do for Jamie? The bullet had lodged in Jamie's brain. It would take hours to find a brain specialist as good as Dr. Morrison. But he didn't operate? He ordered them to take him to the operating room. Then for an hour and a half, he stood at Dr. MacDonald's elbow, directing every move of his scalpel. When the operation was over, Dr. Morrison was dying. But Jamie would live. And so, in my defense, Mr. Ballou intends to plead insanity. But I wasn't insane then. Nor am I now, I know that. I'm merely a selfish woman. Everything I did, I did for myself, not for Jamie. I can see that now. But Paul gave his life for his son. And no matter what happens to him now, Jamie had a father. <laughs> Thank you, Madeline Carroll, for a splendid performance. Miss Carroll will return in just a moment. Hello, Tom. Yeah, I knew it was you. What? You just called to say thanks for telling you about Autolite? Well, don't thank me. Frank Martin's your man. Well, friends, you'll thank and congratulate yourself for depending on your Autolite service man because of the way your car will perform after it's had his expert care. He's got the skill, equipment, and those great Autolite parts to put your ignition system in top shape. Look up your nearest Autolite service station. It's listed in your classified phone book under Automotive Electrical Service. And keep in mind, wherever you go, Autolite means spark plugs. Ignition engineered spark plugs. Autolite means batteries. Stay full batteries. Autolite means ignition system. The lifeline of your car. And now, here again is Miss Madeline Carroll. It's been a great pleasure to appear with this fine cast on Suspense. It's a program I've always enjoyed hearing, and I'm looking forward to next week's story, in which that rising young star, Bert Lancaster, appears. It's another gripping study in... Suspense. Madeline Carroll appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, whose current production is The Luck of the Irish, starring Ann Baxter and Tyrone Power. Tonight's suspense play was written by Pamela Wilcox, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. In the coming weeks, suspense will present such stars as Gregory Peck, Edward G. Robinson, John Garfield, and others. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to... Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. And next Thursday, same time, hear Burt Lancaster. This is the Autolite Suspense Show. Drive slowly. Death and danger travel in fast company. Good night. Switch to Autolite. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Herbert Marshall in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents part one of the most famous of all literary puzzles, Charles Dickens' unfinished novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. Our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Well, if it isn't Oscar, the singing limousine. Every car sings when it's got what I've got, Arlo. Ah, uh, you don't have to tell me, Oscar, I know. You've got ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. The spark plugs that are world famous for quality and performance. I'm starting the year right, Arlo. Ah, uh, you sure are, Oscar, because Autolite spark plugs are ignition-engineered to give top performance at all times. They're specified as original equipment on many leading makes of our finest cars, trucks, and tractors. My Autolite spark plug dealer told me spark plugs were the very heart of my ignition system. And he was right, too. So, friends, have your spark plugs checked by your nearest dealer who sells Autolite spark plugs. To quickly locate him, just look for the Autolite spark plug sign or phone Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. And remember... From bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents Charles Dickens' The Mystery of Edwin Drood, starring Mr. Herbert Marshall, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. This is the last night I have to live. And I will set down the naked truth without disguise. I was never a brave man, but the task comes without much difficulty. I can speak of myself as if I had already passed from the world. For while I write this, my grave is digging. And my name is inscribed in the Black Book of Death. It was in the organ loft of the assembly hall at Cloisterham College, where I first began to learn how a man's mind can become a thing of horrible wonder, a part, a writhing, tormented thing, beyond his poor power to control. I'd gone there, as I so often did, for the peace and quiet, for the song of birds, the scents from gardens and woods that joined with me and my music. And it was there, suddenly without warning, that my mind filled with those words. Words long forgotten, only half learned at best, somewhere in the dim past. When the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness, he shall save his soul alive. The wicked man? What does that to do with me, with John Jasper? Simple instructor in music. Jack! And why should I be filled with a strange sense of guilt? Are you in there, Jack? The wicked man. Me? The wicked man. Jack, are you in the organ loft? Jack? Well, uh, who's that? It's I, Jack, your nephew, Edwin Drew. Edwin. I'm out here in the assembly hall. Edwin. Edwin, my boy. Jack. Jack, it's good to see you again. Let me see what the past three months have done for you. Uh -huh. I can't say they've done you a bit of harm. <laughs> no reason why they should. But tell me of yourself. You look a little tired. Tired? Oh, nonsense. Never felt better in my life. Not worried about something, are you? Some strain you're under, perhaps? In this sleepy old college town? Oh, but look here. Come into my office. We're wasting all this time in talk. I've been saving a special welcome for you, my boy. Sit down and rest your weary bones while I make it ready. Oh, oh Jack. Jack, I'm truly home again. I can see that now. No wonder you love it here at Cloistrum. Is that what you think, Edwin? Well, who could think otherwise, looking at you? You're respected, your talent for teaching music admired and looked up to. You'd be duty-bound to love it. You're wrong, Edwin. I hate it. What? I hate it. Jack, I'd never dreamed. Well, no, no, let there be an end to such talk, Edwin. We've delayed our toast much too long as it is. To your future, Edwin. No, Jack, hold on. I'll not make that the first toast upon my return. 
Oh, why not? There's a much better one to drink to on this day of all days. To my future wife, Rosa. Of course, Edwin. To Rosa. As we stood there, Edwin and I drinking to her, to Rosa, I began to realize why those words about the wicked man had come to me just before his return. It had been a warning. A warning that might have already come too late. Good evening, Rosa. Have I startled you? Why, why, no, Mr. Jasper. It was only that I... You were expecting someone else? Well, uh, Edwin said that he might get here early. I'm sorry I disappointed you then. Oh, no, it, it isn't that, really. Oh, I'm being quite rude, aren't I? Please come in. Thank you, my dear. Uh, you look most charming, Rosa. I'd swear that gown was purchased in London expressly for your party tonight. Oh, you surprise me, Mr. Jasper. I didn't know you were so observant concerning women. Concerning women, Rosa? Or you? Why, me? I'm only one of your music students. No, no. You're a good deal more than that to me, Rosa. I'll open the parlor. We can wait there for the other guests. You said I was a good deal more to you than just a music student. What did you mean? Edwin's my nephew. You're his betrothed. Surely the love I bear for him extends to you also. Oh, I hadn't thought of your feelings toward me in just that way. Had you thought of them then? Allow me to be frank, Mr. Jasper. I'm going to marry Edwin despite the fact that I do not love him. You do not? Oh, as a brother, perhaps as a very dear friend, but not as one should love a husband. Then why marry him, Rosa? Because I couldn't bear to see him hurt. Because I promised both my parents and his that we would marry. There's nothing that can change your mind? No, Mr. Jasper. Not even if you loved another? I do love another. The other guests. Rosa. Oh, excuse me, please. I, I must let them in. <laughs> I remember little concerning the party that followed, being too occupied with my own thoughts. But two incidents do stand out as foreshadowing events to come. The first, a conversation between Dean Chris Barkle and his protege, Neville Landless, a strange and intense young man, but newly arrived from Ceylon. Yes, of course, my dear. She's a beautiful girl, Dean. One of the most beautiful it has ever been my fortune to meet. It uh, might be best for you to curb your admiration, Neville. Rose is already spoken for. In Ceylon, that is not always a reason. I need hardly remind you, my boy, that this is cloisterum in England. I warrant her fiancé would not take too kindly to your attitude. Fiancé? Young Edwin Drood. Ah, yes. I now understand his air of proprietorship. Obviously, he is not one who appreciates his good fortune. May I ask, oh. Mr. Landis, the exact meaning of your remark concerning me and Rosa? Edwin, really, I, I, I didn't don't know that mind, you... Mr. Drood. It seemed to me that you were taking the young lady in question rather for granted. I merely commented on it. A manner of comment that hardly comes under the heading of civility in England, Mr. Landis. Though perhaps your somewhat heathen background may account for oh, it. Oh, come now, gentlemen, this is hard to the Nor time. Nor does it place. seem very civil for you to comment so upon a stranger here, one who has not had your so-called advantages in upbringing. Perhaps the best civility is to mind our own business. If you will set me that example, I promise to follow it. You take too much upon yourself, sir. In my part of the world, you would be called to account for it. By whom, for instance, Mr. Landis? By me, sir. At your earliest convenience. Oh, gentlemen, gentlemen, please. Edwin, Edwin, let's have no more of this. I word between the two of you. I don't like it, my boy. Nor do I care for certain comments made in my presence here, Jack. This is hardly a matter of moment, Edwin. We are all hosts here to Mr. Landis, a stranger newly arrived. You should respect the obligations of hospitality. Shall it be over, then? So far as I'm concerned, Jack, there's no anger left. Mr. Landless? None, Mr. Jasper. So be it, then. The incident is over. 
When it became time for Rosa to play, I took my place at the piano beside her in order to turn the pages of the music. I stood there watching, watching her hands caressing the keys like two white, tender doves, seeing her lips pursed tenderly in concentration, the curve of her soft cheek, her eyes intent upon her music, yet finding moments free to glance up into mine. A tide of emotion welled up within me as I watched. And then I saw it begin to overtake her, too. It was evident in the trembling of her hands, the color draining from her face, her quickening breath. Oh, no, I, I can't bear it. I can't bear it. Oh, take me away. Please take me away. <laughs> It was then the decision was made. It was then I knew that the end result was as fixed in time as the inexorable approach of death. In this instance, the death of Edwin Drood. is bringing you Mr. Herbert Marshall in Charles Dickens' The Mystery of Edwin Drood. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. You know, Harlow, this is the first time I've had Autolite resistor spark plugs under my hood. Well then, Oscar Otto, you're in for the ride of a car's lifetime. The Autolite Resistor Spark Plug is the greatest advancement in spark plugs for automotive use in the past 25 years. They sure step up my performance. That's because Autolite Resistor Spark Plugs have something extra that gives you something extra. That extra is an exclusive Autolite built-in 10,000 ohm resistor that makes possible such extra advantages as smoother engine performance, quick starts, and double spark plug life. Extra special, eh, hello? Right you are, Oscar, and the Autolite resistor-type spark plug is only one of the complete line of Autolite spark plugs for every use. So, friends, see your nearest Autolite spark plug dealer. Have him check and replace worn-out spark plugs with ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, either standard or resistor type. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Herbert Marshall in Elliot Lewis's production of The Mystery of Edwin Drood, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I have said that a man's mind can become a thing of horrible wonder, a part. So it must have been with mine that night. For I know now that the plan, the complete, the perfect plan, was born the very moment that Edwin Drood led Rosa from the room. Oh, the poor girl. She's quite evidently overwrought. Yes, quite overwrought. Little wonder. With the strain she's had to bear. It can hardly be conducive to one's nerves when a fiancé becomes proprietary and overbearing. It would appear that your earlier differences with Edwin Drood still rankle, Mr. Landless. I believe I have my anger well under control, Mr. Jasper. Though the same can hardly be said for the circumstances that provoke Oh, you. come now, Neville. It is hardly becoming to maintain such a disagreeable attitude. Hardly becoming, perhaps, but a natural reaction. And one that can be as naturally overcome. And just how would you suggest this to be done, sir? Through friendly discussion over a friendly nightcap, Mr. Landless. Shall we say at my gatehouse? Within the hour? Will Drood be amenable? He's already accepted my invitation. Then I shall accept also. Thank you, Mr. Landless. You shall not regret it, I assure you. I took my leave then and pursued my way through the silent cobbled streets of Cloisterham. My path led me beside the city's venerable crypt. That strange jumble of old walls, 
ancient druidic stone are decaying monuments wherein dwelt the bones of centuries of cloisterum's dead. Upon reaching it, I forsook the cobblestones of the street for the rubble of the crypt. Beware that their mound by the yard gate, Mr. Jasper. Oh, is that you, Duddles? Aye. Well, what was it you said? I said, where the mound, Mr. Jasper? Why, uh, what is it? Lime, that's what. Lime? What you call quick lime? Aye, quick enough to eat your bones and your boots. With a little handy stirring, quick enough, surely, to eat your bones. Really? Now, you, you use it in your stonemason work, do you? Aye. Though it's little enough stone work for dirdles these days. What with the mayor and them wanting to learn where the old ones is. Oh, yes. Searching for the final resting places of ancient druids, aren't you? Aye. Try and task it is, too. What with the way they're buried here without no rhyme, no reason. Scattered about like in walls and under passageways. At best, I'd say it was an impossible task. There was... <laughs> not for Durdles and his armor, it's not. Hammer? How can that possibly help? Well, look you over here, Mr. Jasper. Here's a wall. Take it is. Over six feet. Crumbling bad in spots. Hard to tell just what might be buried there, if anything. But Durdles will soon put an end to that mystery. Yeah, he taps, you see. Solid here, an old one. So I goes on tapping. Hollow here, nothing. I tap some more. Here I find solid. Uh, hollow again. There you have it, Mr. Jasper. Walls hollow. Oh, filled with rubbish and what not, I wager, but hollow, plain enough. Like most of the walls around here, plenty of room in them for a hundred more bodies, it need be. Yes, I dare say. Well, thank you kindly for the most illuminating lecture. Well, no. You didn't say why you come visiting here in the first place, Mr. Jasper. I... I don't believe I know, Duddles. I don't believe I know. When I arrived at my lodgings, Edward was already there. And no sooner had we got the fire blazing and made ourselves comfortable than Neville Landless put in his appearance. Please to sit down, Mr. Landless. Whatever small comfort you find here, consider to be your own. My thanks, Mr. Jasper. Turn up the lamp on the desk, will you, Edwin? I'll prepare some mulled wine for that nightcap I promised. Of course, Jack. You'll probably notice, Mr. Landis, that I have the lamp so arranged as to illuminate a painting over the chimney place. I had noticed it, Mr. Jasper. You'll recognize the subject, of course. Miss Rosa, I could hardly fail to do so, though the portrait is far from flattering to the original. Oh, don't be so hard on it, Mr. Landis. It was done by Edwin, who made me a present of it. I'm sorry, Mr. Drood. If I had known I was in the artist's presence. I doubt that your remark would have differed, Mr. Landis. Perhaps it would not have, Mr. Drood. Oh, come now, gentlemen. Let there be no more of this. The wine is prepared. So. And surely no lady, or at least the portrait of one, should intrude upon the drinking habits of good friends. For you, Mr. Landis. Thank you, sir. Edwin. Uh, thanks, Jack. And now, for the first toast of the evening, I should like to propose one to my nephew. A most fortunate man. A toast in truth, Mr. Jasper. I shall drink to it. Thank you both, gentlemen. Yes, Mr. Landless, I ask you to observe my nephew, for he is indeed one of the most fortunate men of the world. And an enviable state, if I truly possess it, Jack. How could you doubt it, my boy? A family estate that eliminates the burdens of economic necessity? Rosa, eager, waiting to supply you with the greatest blessings of domestic bliss and love. Quite different from your prospects and mine, is it not, Mr. Landless? Yes, quite different, Mr. Jasper. Upon my soul, Jack, I almost feel apologetic for having my way smoothed, as you describe. Almost, but not quite. Perhaps it might have been better for Mr. Drew to have known some hardships in the achievement of his possessions. And why, pray, might it have been better for Mr. Drew to have known hardships? Yes, Mr. Landless. Tell us why. Because they might have made him more sensible of good fortune that is not the result of his own merit. 
Have you known hardships, may I ask? I have. And what have they made you sensible of? I have told you once before, tonight. You've told me nothing. I told you that you take a great deal too much upon yourself. You added something else to that, if I remember. I did. I said that in my part of the world, you would be called to account for it. <laughs> that part of the world is a long way off, I believe, at a very safe distance. Say here, then. Say anywhere that gentlemen may be found. What would you know of gentlemen, Landis? You may know a common thief or a common boaster when you see him, but you're surely no judge of gentlemen. I have taken all I'm going to take from you. Here now, Edwin. Stand still. Mr. Landis, give me that bottle. I'll give it to your precious nephew. I warn you, Drude. I'll cut you down someday for this. I swear it. scene had gone well, I thought. Very well. And after Landis's enraged departure, after I had calmed Edwin down and sent him home, I waited for what I knew would inevitably follow. It was close to midnight when it did. Uh, may I come in, Jasper? Of course, Dean. I... Uh... I understand you had some uh, difficulty with my protégé tonight. He told you? Oh, there was no overlooking his wrought-up state when he came home. I questioned him at once. It must have been rather uh, difficult. Murderous might be a more exact term. Murderous? Surely you exaggerate, Jasper. I hardly think so. But what could justify the use of such an expression? The facts. I feel certain that if I had not been there to intervene, he would have laid Edwin dead at his feet. Oh, Unbelievable. And yet, he did repeat to me the warning he gave young Drood. That he'd cut him down someday? His exact words, yes. I think, sir, that you have in your charge a most dangerous man. One who might well attempt to carry out his threat against Edwin's life. Oh, no, 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 I can't believe that, Jasper. I'm confident that if we could get them together again, get them to shake hands upon it, all their differences could be resolved. You're much more optimistic than I. Surely it's worth a try for your nephew's sake, if for no other. Talk to him, I'll talk with Neville. I know he'll meet with Drood whenever and wherever you say. Very well, Dean, I'll try. Though I say to you now, and you are my witness, I'm convinced that unless Neville Landis leaves Cloisterham, the end result could be nothing but tragedy. It was two days later that Dean Chris Parkle brought me assurance of Neville's willingness to cooperate. Immediately, I sought out Edwin Drood for a dinner on Christmas Eve. Just the three of us. And so the stage was set. And the hours flew. And the ugly streets of Cloisterham turned bright and gay with the holly and the mistletoe. The dinner in my lodgings went cheerfully and well that Christmas Eve. The holiday spirit burned as brightly as the fire in the hearth. There was peace on earth to all men of goodwill. Not even the unseasonable storm that began to rage outside could dampen the gaiety of the evening. Rather, it served as a challenge, an opportunity to heighten the feeling of good fellowship that seemed to be born that night. It was sometime around midnight when the two men, arm in arm, took their departure. You would suggest something like this, Jack. Fancy going to see the river at this hour on Christmas Eve. Only a madman would suggest such a thing. And only two young madmen such as you would take up such a suggestion, if indeed you are to take it up. <laughs> Nothing could stop me from it now, Mr. Jasper. It's unbelievable that that sluggish, muddy stream could ever become a raging torrent. Nevertheless, you'll find it is so, Mr. Landless. One of the few worthwhile sights to behold in Cloisterham. Our river, reborn at the height of a storm. I warn you to be careful, however... The footing will be treacherous. <laughs> you're a wicked man, Jack. To inflame us over the idea and then attempt to draw us back. Well, you'll not succeed in stopping us now, eh, Neville? No, Edwin. Nothing will stop us now. Then come along. We'll be on our merry way. There is little I can tell you of the night that followed. For there is little that I remember clearly. I know only that when dawn finally broke, I found myself in the organ loft, playing, my clothing wet through, 
And burning within my brain was a memory. A memory of a man walking alone through the wind and rain in the black of night. A man walking through the deserted streets of Cloisterham. The streets that suddenly, unknown to him, were no longer deserted. memory, I said it was. Or was it a dream? I did not know. But as I sat there in that organ loft, in the dim light of Christmas morn, there was one thing I did know. Edwin Drew would never be seen again. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite, world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. They are members of the Autolite family, as well as are the 98,000 Autolite distributors and dealers in the United States and thousands more in Canada and throughout the world. Our family also includes the nearly 30,000 men and women in 28 great Autolite plants from coast to coast and Autolite plants in many foreign countries, as well as the 18,000 people who have invested a portion of their savings in Autolite. Every Autolite product is backed by constant research and precision built to the highest standards of quality and performance. So remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. Next week, part two of Charles Dickens' unfinished novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood, at which time we will attempt to solve this literary puzzle. Our star, once again, Mr. Herbert Marshall. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The Mystery of Edwin Drood was adapted from Charles Dickens' unfinished novel by Sidney Marshall. In tonight's story, Terry Kilburn was heard as Edwin Drood, Betty Harford as Rosa, Ben Wright as Landless, Joseph Kearns as Dean Crisparkle, and William Johnstone as Durdles. Autolite resistor or standard type spark plugs, Autolite stay full batteries, and Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is the CBS Radio Network. Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Herbert Marshall in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents part two of one of the most famous of all literary puzzles, Charles Dickens' unfinished novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood, 
Our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Hello, Senator. How's our legislative leader? Harlow, what's this I hear about you being up for assault and battery? Oh, that's a stay full battery, Senator. The Autolite stay full. That fit, fine, and famous battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Then you're not in trouble. Ah, uh, not with an Autolite stay full, Senator. Fiberglass mats protect every positive plate against shedding and flaking to give the Autolite stay full battery longer life as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. And my Autolite battery dealer will substantiate that story, Harlow? He sure will, Senator. And he's the expert who services all makes of batteries. Friends, to quickly locate your nearest Autolite battery dealer, call Western Union by number... And ask for Operator 25. I'll gladly tell you the name of your nearest Autolite battery dealer, where you can get an Autolite staple. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents Charles Dickens' The Mystery of Edwin Drood, starring Mr. Herbert Marshall, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. When the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness, he shall save his soul alive. So it has been said, so it has been written. But what of him who strives to turn away in torment and desperation and finds that he cannot? What is it that will happen to him? What is it that will happen to me? It was on a gray Christmas morn that I, John Gasper, instructor in music at Cloisterham College, sought the answers to those questions. I sought them within myself, within my music, within the paling stars seen dimly through the organ loft windows. But no answers came, only a memory or a dream. I seemed to see a man walking alone through the deserted night blackened streets of Cloisterham. The deserted streets which were suddenly no longer deserted. I was at my gatehouse lodgings looking for him who should have been there, looking for the man I suddenly knew would never be there again. Edwin! Edwin! Chris Parker! Dean Chris Parker, open up! John Gasper. Open up, I say. Uh, uh, Jasper? What is it, man? My nephew, Edwin Rude. Where is he? Edwin? Yes, he went to the river last night to look at the storm with Neville Landless. With Neville? Yes, and he never came back. Where is he? Oh. Ask Landless where he is. Neville's not home either. Not home? I, I, I'll be down directly. <laughs> As he joined me, the dread realization of what might have transpired was clearly writ upon Dean Chris Parker's face. Hurriedly, he roused a number of cottage servants from their holiday beds, and a search was begun. A search for my missing nephew, Edwin Drood, and for the Dean's missing protege, Neville Landless. There it is, the river. The river they went to see at the height of the storm last night. You you never saw them again, Jasper? No, neither one returned. Was there any quarrel between them? Any hint of the disagreements they'd had upon other occasions? None. 
The Christmas Eve dinner had gone exactly as I'd planned. They'd shaken hands. Apparently had resolved their differences. And when they left, they went arm in arm. Uh, tell me, Jasper, whose idea was it to visit the river? Was it Neville's? I'll not cast doubt where it may be undeserved. It could have been anyone's suggestion. Mine, Edwin's. I don't like this, Jasper. Oh, there's a feeling about it all that strikes chill to my bone. Oh, hark, one of the searching parties. They found someone, Jasper. They found... You take yes. your hands off me. What right is it? Edwin Brood is still among the missing. Like this? Easy does it now, Take sir. them off. Easy if you please, Mr. Landis. Take your hands off me. What right have you to seize my person like this, will you? Take them off me. In a moment, sir, in a moment. Uh, there you be, Dean Chris Barker. We found your man, as you see. Yes, Joe, I see you may release him. Aye, sir. But it's belligerent he is. I'd be aware of him if I was you. Didn't want to return with us at all, he didn't. What is all this, sir? What is the meaning? I was out for an early morning walk when these blackguards seized me bodily. They forced me to return here and said it was by your orders. As it was, Neville. But why, sir? Surely there's some explanation. Why? Where is my nephew, Landers? Your nephew? Yes, Edwin Brood. Where is he? Why ask me? Why should I know of Brood's whereabouts? Because you were the last person in his company, and he's not to be found. Speak, sir. Where is he? Uh, Stay, stay, Jasper. Permit me to question him. Uh, uh, Neville, you left Mr. Jasper's residence last night with Edwin Drood? I? Uh, Yes, sir. You went down to the river together? Yes, to see the reaction of the storm upon it. How long did you stay there? Oh, it's, uh, oh, ten minutes, more or less. And then? What drew took leave of me. Did he say where he was going, then? Well, yes, to return to Mr. Jasper's. That was the last you saw of him? The very last. If something's happened to Drood, I most certainly had nothing to do with it. What are those stains upon your jacket, Mr. Landless? Huh? It stains? And that walking stick you're carrying, Joe. The same stains are upon it. Aye, so they are. Bloodstains they be, Mr. Jasper. And the stick, to whom does that belong? Why, to Mr. Landis, sir. We took it off him. Had to, the fuss and all he was putting up. Well, of course they're bloodstains. I fought with these men, thinking they were footpads. If their blood has been spilled, it must be theirs or mine. Uh, Neville, I think you'd best accompany us to the authorities. my suggestion, we repair to the residence of Cloisterham's Lord High Mayor, Mr. Thomas Sapsee. And as we stood there in his parlor, the rendering of authority was as I knew it would be. Not unlike the person of Mr. Sapsee himself. Unimaginative, dull, stupid. Well, gentlemen, this all seems quite clear to me, quite clear. <clears throat> And I am one who has spared little pain, little pain, gentlemen, in training myself to see things clearly. They may be clear to you, sir, but they are far from being so to me. Patience, young man, patience. Justice will be done here of that you may rest well assured. Yes, well assured. <clears throat> and now, allow me to enumerate the situation. Point number one. There have been several witnessed quarrels between the two young men in question. Oh. The missing Edwin Drew to the here present Neville Landless. The quarrels had been repaired, sir. Mr. Jasper himself bears witness to that. I have stated there was no quarrel or apparent difference at your last meeting, Mr. Landis. Quite so, quite so. One meeting without quarrel, several with. The scales are unbalanced, I quote. Particularly, one might say, as the subject or object of those quarrels was the fiancé of Mr. Drood. Well, surely, Mr. Sapsey, it is not necessary to bring a young lady's name into this. I apologize for the necessity, Mr. Jasper, but it would seem to me that the charming and delightful Miss Rosa is truly at the heart of the matter confronting us. At his heart, yes. In one respect, I am forced to agree with you. There is no doubt that Landis was extremely envious of Edwin's good fortune in being betrothed of Rosa. Yes, as I say, the heart. <coughs> now, point number two. The two gentlemen disappeared together into the night. Point number three. Mr. Drood never appears again. Point four. Mr. Landis is apprehended upon the heath, obviously fleeing close to him, and is returned only by force. Point five. Unexplained bloodstains are found upon his person and upon the stick he was carrying. I was not fleeing Cloisterham, and the bloodstains are not unexplained. Circumstances indicate otherwise, Mr. Landless. Yes, otherwise. And the taking of a fellow creature's life is to take something that don't belong to you, you know. Taking of a fellow creature? What, what madness is this? Oh, Mr. Jasper, surely you don't believe that... My interest I... lies only in the return of my nephew. 
And it is never to return in seeing that justice is rightly done. Yes, precisely what I had in mind, Mr. Jasper. Precisely. My further suggestions to Mr. Sapsey were immediately carried out. Placards were posted, the river dragged. A feverish search began. Days went by, then weeks. And the end result was nothing. No trace of Edwin Drood was ever found. Finally, when all hope was abandoned, Mr. Sapsey delivered his final resolution. Uh, it uh, would appear, gentlemen, that the uh, mystery of Edwin Drood has not as yet been solved. No, not solved. However, certain horrible suspicions as yet remain. In the interests of all concerned, therefore, I make the following suggestion. <coughs> it is that Mr. Neville Landless remove his presence from the city of Cloisterham, and unless there comes a time when certain horrible suspicions no longer exist, that he remain away from here forever. Late afternoon of that same day, I went to see Rosa. We met in the garden of the seminary house. You wish to see me, Mr. Jasper? That is a desire which has lived with me for a long while, Rosa. Only the unhappy circumstances of the past few weeks have prevented its fulfillment. And you feel that Mayor Sapsey's announcement has now cleared the way for you? Not for me. For us. Grief does not come to an end with an official pronouncement, Mr. Jasper. Surely even the natural sadness you feel must be tinged with relief. Relief? You no longer are faced with the prospect of a forced, distasteful marriage to Edwin. You're free of your promise to your parents. Now that Edwin's gone, there's... There's nothing to prevent our getting married at once. Our getting married? I'm sorry I put it so bluntly, my dear, but we waited so long, kept our love for each other buried so deeply. Surely you can't blame me for speaking so frankly now. No, and with Edwin gone, there's no need for me to be silent. You have my solemn word for it, Mr. Jasper, that there is not one drop of love in my heart for you, rather only loathing and hatred. Rosa! I've always despised you, though I tried to hide it for Edwin's sake despised you because you pursued me with your eyes, with your thoughts, whispering to me in your mind of your obscene love, even though I was engaged to Edwin. Edwin, the nephew you so falsely pretended, was the dearest thing on earth to you. Rosa, you're overwrought. The strain of these past weeks. You refuse to believe. I can't believe it, my dear. I love you, an old man. The man I love, the man I still love, is Neville Landless. Landless? Yes, Neville, the man I was going to marry. What do you mean, Rosa? You were going to marry Edwin. No, Mr. Jasper. You told me you were. That was before Edwin and I released each other from our vows, Mr. Jasper. Released? Then, Edwin didn't have to die. No, Mr. Jasper. Whether Edwin was alive or dead, I was free to marry the man of my choice. is bringing you Mr. Herbert Marshall in The Mystery of Edwin Drood. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hello, our committee is investigating. And what have you found, Senator? That the Autolite Stay Full Battery needs water only three times a year. In normal car you? Now, that's not all, Senator, because the Autolite Stay-Full battery gives longer life, as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. Yes, Harlow, and you know what's responsible. Why, those fiberglass retaining mats that surround every positive plate to reduce shedding and flaking and hold the power-producing materials in place. And we've found the Autolite Stay-Full battery is the favorite of millions of car owners. From coast to coast. Thank you, Senator. Friends, see your Autolite battery dealer. He services all makes of batteries, and he has an Autolite stay full for your car if a replacement is needed. To quickly locate him, phone Western Union by number and ask for operator 25. I'll tell you the name of your nearest Autolite battery dealer, where you can get an Autolite stay full. 
the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Herbert Marshall in Elliot Lewis's production of The Mystery of Edwin Drood, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. How does one relate the ending of a world, the stunning collapse of all that has meaning, of all that is life? I will not attempt to do so. For everything that can be said was said on that fateful afternoon. And so the story of Edwin Drood was over. Or so I thought. Good day to you, Mr. Jasper. Huh? Oh, it's you, Duddles. Aye, him what is known as old Duddles, it be. Come to pay another visit to the resting place of the Orans, Mr. Jasper? I no, 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 Duddles. As a matter of fact, I hadn't even noticed that I was walking past the crypt. My mind was elsewhere, I imagine. I thought perhaps you might be coming round for another lesson in burying dead bodies, Mr. Jasper. What's meant by that about, Duddles? Well, now I recalls one night old Doddles gave you a lesson about finding bodies of the old ones. Tapped here and there with his hammer he did. Pointing out the hollow walls. Remembers, don't you? Oh, yes, yes, I believe I recall something like that. An evening without anything to do, idle curiosity. I could have been, Mr. Jasper. Though it didn't seem as such on last Christmas Eve, it didn't. What about last Christmas Eve? Why, you was down here again, Mr. Jasper, tapping the walls with Doddle's hammer yourself, you was. You're mistaken. I was nowhere near the crypt on Christmas Eve. Perhaps. Perhaps. And I'll wager you had a bottle or two of holiday cheer beneath your belt at the time. Perhaps. Though, I would have swore it were you. <laughs> Mr. Jasper, come in. And who may you be, sir? Datchery's the name, Dick Datchery. Came calling, found you out, made myself at home. So I note. This? Favorite of mine, mulled wine. Thought I'd prepare, honor the occasion and all. The occasion of an absolute stranger making himself at home in my lodgings. Not ordinary circumstances, hmm? Quite agree. Nevertheless, honorable occasion... Then perhaps you'd care to explain, Mr. Datchery. Gladly. Gladly. (sighs) Perfect, sir. Won't you join me? I'm awaiting that explanation, sir. I bring you greetings, sir. Greetings from whom? Your dear boy, Mr. Jasper. Greetings from Edwin Root. Greetings from Edwin? I sent you the best. Apologizes for not writing. Trust you're not worried. Told you, didn't I? Honorable occasion. Huh, indeed, this is an occasion, Mr. Datchery. I've been uh, worried sick about the dear boy. You found him well? Blooming, best of health. Where is he? Where did you meet with him? London, some lodging house. Kept meeting on stairs, natural thing. Of course, quite natural. Business took me to Cloisterham. Told Edwin. Made me promise a greeting. Here I am. Care to try the wine? Quite good. Uh, my apologies, Mr. Datchery. I, certainly I would. Toast to Edwin. To Edwin. Ah. Mm. Perfect. Well, you're on my way now. Beauty over. Uh, One moment, Mr. Datchery. I I must write Edwin and tell him how happy you've made me. What's the dear boy's address? I haven't got it. He moved. Didn't say where. Then there's no more you can tell me about him, where he can be reached? Nothing. I see. Wondering if it's a tall tale, Mr. Jasper. No real greetings. No real, Edwin? Surely that's a possibility, Mr. Datchery. Ordinarily, not now. Mementos. Wanted you to have them. To remember him. Oh, duty's fully discharged. I'll be leaving. 
Good day, Mr. Jasper. Excellent one. I scarcely heard him leave this Mr. Datchery. I was staring at the object he'd placed upon the table. A watch and chain. Edwin's watch and chain. He'd been wearing them the night of the big storm. The last night he'd been seen alive. Mr. Datchery! Mr. Jasper, one moment, please. Huh. Good afternoon, Rosa. Oh, have you heard the news, Mr. Jasper? What news, Rosa? It concerns Edwin Drood. Edwin? Yes, he's alive, Mr. Jasper. Edwin's alive. Oh, did you hear me, Mr. Jasper? Did you hear what I said about Edwin? He's alive. That's a rather astounding statement, Rosa. I know. I, I could scarcely believe it myself. But, but here. This came to me in the post today from London. It's a letter from Edwin. Oh, isn't it wonderful, Mr. Jasper? We were all so certain that he was dead, that, that someone had killed him on the night of the storm. And there, there in your very hand is the proof that he's alive. <laughs> No greater horror can visit the mind of man than the certain knowledge that he has suddenly become mad. And such was the horror which dwelt within me that fateful day. For it was the only explanation that was left. Edwin was dead. He had to be. The memory or dream that had lived with me since Christmas morn was too clear, too sharply etched for there to be any doubt. Edwin was dead. And yet within a single afternoon, two people had brought me proof that Edwin was alive. Proof was clear, as sharply edged as that memory. A sane mind does not exist in a world of such paradox. I'd gone mad. Time finds no haven within the dread confines of madness. Nor was that an exception. Somehow, without my knowing of it, the day was gone. In what had been a sunlit sky... A night-darkened storm lay muttering ominously. My mud-spattered gaiters, bone-weary legs spoke mutely of hours of aimless wandering, hours of doing fruitless battle with that thing of horrible wonder apart, which was now my mind. And then I was where I'd been destined to be all along, the one place where the truth could be found, incontestable truth. I entered the venerable crypt of Cloisterham. Flashes of lightning etched in weird relief the rowing habitations of the dead. Half-standing pillars of stone assumed the attitude of watchful guardians, grinning evilly from their sentry boxes of the night. And the broken wall toward which I made my way was an ancient catacomb. Concealing within it the secret that only I knew was there. I climbed to its top and looked down upon the rubbish that almost filled the hollow space between its sides. A rusty spade lay nearby. I seized it and began to dig. Again, time became meaningless. There was nothing but the feverish labor of uncovering the truth, of finding a rusted watch and chain that could not possibly lie bright and untarnished on my table, of uncovering a skeletonized human hand that was incapable of writing the letter I'd seen. And then the labor, too, became meaningless. There was no watch, no chain, no hand. There was nothing in there but rubble. Looking for something, Mr. Jasper? Landers. I asked you if you were looking for something, Mr. Jasper. What are you doing here? You were ordered to stay away from Cloyston. I came back, Mr. Jasper. Why? What are you doing here? Same thing that you are seeking the truth. The truth about what? The mystery of Edwin Drew. There is no mystery. Edwin Drew is alive. Is he? Ask Rosa. Ask Mr. Datchery. They'll tell you. They know he's alive. No, Mr. Jasper. You killed him last Christmas Eve. Edwin Drew is dead. He's not. I tell you. How could he be? If he were dead, why isn't he lying in this grave? The grave in which I... The grave in which you buried him? No. There was no grave. Only a dream. It was all a dream. What was a dream, Mr. Jasper? Everything. Following him back to the river. My hands around his throat. Hiding his body here in this wall. It was all a dream. Can't you understand? 
I've been driven out of my mind by a dream. I didn't do it. But you did, Mr. Jasper. You're a fool, analyst. Look for yourself. This grave I prepared for him is empty. He isn't there. No, but he was here until two weeks ago. Two weeks ago? That was when a London detective and I found what was left of him. Actually? Yes. With the help of Durdles and his invaluable hammer, we found Edwin Drood. Found the watch which identified him. You told me just now how you killed him. The watch? And Rosa's letter? Written several years ago. Reposted from London. Shall we go now, Mr. Jasper? Go? You took me before the authorities once. Now it's my time to take you. <laughs> Prospect of the gallows make you happy, Jasper? Here's a way, Lenders. At least I'll go to it. Knowing that I wasn't mad. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite, world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. That's why during the early months of this year, as we did a year ago, the Autolite family will join together in saluting the leading car manufacturers who install Autolite products as original equipment. Our Autolite family includes some 30,000 men and women in Autolite plants in the United States, Canada, and many foreign countries, and the 18,000 people who have invested a portion of their savings in Autolite, as well as thousands of Autolite distributors and dealers, and the many leading manufacturers who use Autolite products as original equipment. Our Autolite family will salute the DeSoto division of Chrysler Corporation on the next Autolite Suspense television program. If you live in a television area, check the day and time of suspense so that you will be sure to see this program. Next week, we recreate an historical puzzle as we attempt to locate a sunken treasure... The story, based on fact, is called Gold of the Adomar. Our star, Mr. John Hodiak. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The Mystery of Edwin Drood was adapted from Charles Dickens' unfinished novel by Sidney Marshall. In tonight's story, Ben Wright was heard as Landless. Featured in the cast were Betty Harford, Joseph Kearns, Ramsey Hill, Charles Davis, and William John Stone. And remember, next week... Mr. John Hodiak in Gold of the Adomar. This is the CBS Radio Network.